stunning Algarve coast of Portugal. It's the venue for the second race in the 2021 FIA World Endurance Championship, the eight hours of Portimao. It marks the first visit of the World Endurance Championship to this roller coaster track that was built around a dozen years ago. It produces fantastic visuals for the driver, an enormous challenge for the car. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Portimao. Martin Haven, Alan Manish, Graham Goodwin, Louise Beckett and Duncan Vincent, your crew ready to take you through eight hours of very close quarters racing on this demanding circuit. And among our big news stories, Alan, the first new hypercar since the beginning of the season, the Glickenhaus has arrived. Fantastic to see it. We've seen a lot about it in social media all the way through its build-up process and then testing was live there. You could follow it online, but now to see it in the flesh and actually out on track, proving that actually it's got a little bit of speed about it as well as some looks. Second round of the 2021 season. We began in Spa-Francorchamps a month ago. Very similar kind of circuit, a real old-fashioned feel to Portimao. Although it's only a dozen years old, you really feel that it could have been built in the 1950s or 60s. We then head on to Monza before Le Mans in August, finishing off our season with Fuji and Bahrain on the calendar. So we've got six-hour races, eight-hour races, and 24-hour races in this championship. Four classes as ever. Hypercar now is the top category, and that includes Le Mans hypercars, which are racing here, and the yet-to-come Le Mans Daytona hybrids, which will also compete on a level footing. We've got LMP2 prototypes, and then in our GT classes, GTE Pro and AM. And whatever you're driving, Alan, this is just a fantastic circuit, the kind that makes an old guy want to pull his race suit back on. <laughs> Certainly when I was out there looking at uh, the cars in practice, it does give you a smile, especially as it rises up from turn five in the middle of the track through seven, eight, dips through nine, and then up again, 10, 11, and then a huge roller coaster through 12, 13, up to 14 before that long, long dipping downhill, adverse camber right hand leading onto this big long start and finish. And with air temperatures being quite a consistent 22 degrees, the track temperature is the thing that everybody's looking at because that's been going from the 34 as it is now, 10.30 local time, up to 50 degrees Celsius by the middle of the day. Well, there is the SCG 007. Let's hear from the man whose dream this is, Louise Beckett's with Jim Glickenhaus. Well, yes, it is the first time we've been here in Portimao, but another first for the WEC is that Bickenhaus has finally joined us. Welcome, first of all. How are you feeling ahead of this? I mean, I feel the excitement. Oh, it's so emotional to be here. I mean, the WEC is the pinnacle of sports car racing in the world, and to be competing in the top class, the Le Mans hypercar class, this is the first time the two Le Mans hypercars, Toyota and us, will race each other with, of course, the grandfather at Alpine. But um, it's history, it's emotion, and it's passion. And there's just been so much work leading up to this point. Absolutely. I mean, this car went from a sketch I made on a piece of paper or a napkin, I don't remember. And then we did the design, the engineering, the aero, the testing, getting the drivers, tweaking the car, trying to keep it a little bit like the old days, like a 917, a 512S Ferrari, a Lola T70 in the look. And I think we accomplished that. And along the way, I mean, the 21 and a half million social media interactions we've had with fans, it's just been an amazing experience. Well, Jim, you are certainly one to follow on Twitter, that's for sure. It's great to see oh, it all play you. out. Um, how important was the look to go along with the performance for you? Oh, it was really, really important. I mean, I think to keep this going and to get the fans in, the cars cannot just look like a a formula where they all look the same. And I think it's important that if you go back to the great days at Le Mans, where you had the Ferrari P34s, and you had the Ford GTs, and you had the Lola T70s, and the Porsches, and the Astons, these were dream sports cars as prototypes. And I think the WEC and the ACO is bringing that back 
and I think that's what's going to keep this going for a long, long time. And I really look forward to convergence when companies like Porsche and Audi and Acura and Peugeot will join, and I look forward to Ferrari joining Le Mans Hypercar, and 2023 will be the first um, opening teaser in the Glickenhaus Ferrari Wars, the movie, of course, that will come out. Yeah, it's going to be great. Thank you. I'll speak to you during the race. Thank you, Jim. Thank you so much. We're going to need eight hours. Graham Goodwin, he summed up the future of Hypercar there, didn't he? Named almost everybody except BMW, who BMW North America's boss accidentally splurged on social media a couple of days purpose. ago that they are coming as well. So it is the dawn of what could be an absolutely epic era of sports car racing. It's two things. That was great to hear it from the horse's mouth. I'm not calling your horse, by the way, Jim. <laughs> but uh, but the, the two things coming together here, the opportunity for the manufacturers and the opportunity to, for people of passion and vision. Um, I hope Jim's not going to be the only one on that list. I don't think he will be as things actually roll out, as people see the opportunities to perhaps, you know, um, to perhaps benefit from the investment that people like Lickenhouse have made in the chassis yeah. to do what they want to do at the back of that car and to wrap it in any way they see fit. That's what this could mean. It could mean a Lickenhouse chassis called something completely different. There's no reason why not. Exactly. There's all sorts of opportunities, and we are going to see some extraordinary grids and some extraordinary racing here in the WEC, over in North America in the IMSA WeatherTech Sports Car Championship, and in particular from 2022, 2023, and beyond that at the Le Mans 24 Hours. There is a brand new, shinily golden era coming, and that passion is the, the, the door opening for that. Looking here all the way through our GTE AM field. We didn't quite get the Kessel Racing Ferrari. Kessel Racing joining the season, the series for the first time. So Roberto Lacorte in the Cetilar Racing car lying second. And Team Project One's Egidio Perfetti will be our GTE AM pole sitter just ahead of fellow Porsche driver Christian Reed in the GTE AM qualifying. Like everywhere else, it's a single driver uh, shootout now. There's Egidio. Had some very quick laps, a couple were disallowed, but in the end managed to get one together and put him, Matteo Cairoli and Ricardo Pera in second place on the GTE AM lineup. A big event on pole position in the GTE AM lineup, uh, just ahead of Christian Reed. Manuela Gosner setting the lap for Iron Lynx that put the Iron Dames car in fourth place. Well, let's get down to the front of the grid. Alpine having their first French pole position here in WEC. Let's hear from Nico Lapierre. Another first indeed. Alpine making it your first pole in Hypercar. Nico, you've got to be happy with that performance, but we know it's going to be a tough eight hours for you. Yeah, sure, but it's always better to start in the front. You know, it was a great lap from Mathieu yesterday. Super exciting qualifying, and it was really close, so we are pleased to be here. Obviously, we know it's eight hours, it's going to be hot. Traffic is difficult to manage here as well with a lot of blind corners, but uh, it's, it's looking good. So we see uh, there's a big question mark about uh, fuel, so we see how much longer Toyota can go on the stint and how much harder we have to push on track. But uh, no, I'm super excited about uh, being here and starting from pole position for Alpine. Are tyres going to be a factor for you? Or an it issue? was not so bad, to be honest, in the free practice. And it looks like Toyota had the same kind of deck that we had. So I don't think tyres will be a big uh, issue right here. I think it will be more about traffic management and uh, fuel uh, long, long stint. And are there points, you were saying to me yesterday, points where you can take advantage, they can take advantage on this yeah. track? Yeah, we've seen that the lap time is made completely different. Like, uh, we are very fast in the last corner they are much faster in first and second sectors so um, we're going to see how does it affect on the on the race if they can overtake us or not at the beginning hopefully not <laughs> but um yeah let's see i think it's going to be an interesting battle yeah i think it will be thank you very much you're welcome thank you thank you nico thank you louise two very different cars from very different starting points and and what you want in endurance racing is cars that look different sound different and have different strengths so there's really only one notifiable straight and you're looking at it here. So if the Alpine can be quick down that straight 
and distance itself from Toyota before the Toyota advantage comes in with their hybrid then. Maybe Alpine have a good chance to stay in front. Yeah, they will have at least one further fuel stop with the fuel mileage. We can talk about that as we get into the race. 52 car there. Uh, which got its lap time back, by the way, after mm. qualifying. And uh, to note there, some yellow highlights on that car that will help us to pick out between the two uh, Ferraris this week. Yeah, some idiot won't be able to spot that, though, I can guarantee. <laughs> <laughs> one, one quick thing to add, a couple of quick things to add about that Alpine effort. It's the first ever overall pole position by a French team in the WEC. It is, of course, the first for Alpine. That's astonishing that that could Amazing. even be a fact, given the, how much of a sort of French-based series this has always been. And good to see the, the grouping we've got here, plus Nico Lapierre, amongst mm. our, what we, uh, we call an alumni from Portimao in years past. Nico Lapierre winning back here in 2010 in the Le Mans series in a Peugeot, operated by Orica. Jimmy Bruni, a couple of race wins in GTE back in the day when he was with Ferrari. Uh, more recently, Christian Reed in that group. Three wins here mm. in the ELMS for Christian, looking to make it four here uh, this weekend. There's a few drivers for whom this is absolutely brand new and a few for whom they probably have their regular room in the hotel where they normally stay for European Le Mans series. Interesting to note in the GTE Pro class that the Ferraris have stuck with their two-driver lineup. For the first time, we've got the what we expect to be Le Mans lineup of three drivers in both of the factory GTE Pro Porsches. So Fred Bakovigi you saw joining there, Michael Christensen joining the sister car. And it hasn't been announced, but you would expect that those triumvirates will also race together at Monza so that they are ready to go. Uh, best wishes being sent back home by the uh, Porsche team, so they're ready to go to Le Mans. Let's hear from Brendan Hartley at Toyota. You can see it on the car there, the 100th anniversary of uh, international racing for you. Brendan, can you make it a good one? I hope so. It's, it's, it's a long way around here, eight, yeah. eight hours. I mean, I know it's, it's, it's eight hours, but this track's quite small for these cars. Uh, we know the, the gap between the hypercar or the, you know, the XLMP1 is, is much tighter with the LMP2, so traffic's going to be quite a different element as, as it was in, in Spa, but yeah, we feel good about it. It's going to be a tight race with the Alpine. Hopefully, hopefully Glinkenhaus will get through the, the LMP2 traffic as well. I know they had some, some small issues in qualifying. So yeah, it's going to be a tough one, and hopefully we can finish on the podium. And it was really close for you yesterday in qualifying, actually. Very. Yeah, we, we actually decided to, to try and qualify on an old set of tyres. It's a long story, but it was definitely the wrong decision. So we, we, we just got out at the end to put another new set of tyres. Um, I think we only had eight seconds crossing the line before we, we, man and, yeah, we managed to put it on the front row, which, which was nice. But we put, we put ourselves under a bit of unnecessary stress, let's say, to get the, 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 the second place. Uh, how are you going to manage it? It is really quite hot here. The wind is an issue, especially with the undulation of the track. Yeah, it's windy. I'd say our car's been quite good in the windy conditions, um, less affected than, than the old LMP1 car. Um, but the undulation in the track and, and the fact that there's a few blind corners makes the, the traffic quite quite difficult. I think that's going to be a big topic. Right. And But yeah, the, Al the Alpines on the long run, they look like they we're quite a similar pace. Maybe they're even faster. We're going to have different strategies on fuel. So yeah, we'll have to see at the end. We've got a good eight hours ahead of us then. Thank yeah, you. Tough one. Cheers. Thanks, Brendan. Yeah, no, no doubt about it. Everybody reckons this is going to be really tough on pass. He said there's a few blind corners. What he actually meant is there are two where you can see where you're going. Ben Hanley having a last minute chat there in the Dragon Speed car with teammate Juan Pablo Montoya. And uh, just to uh, bring a little bit of pressure to the Danish uh, lineup. Kevin Magnussen, his dad Jan racing here this weekend. Kevin took pole in Belle Isle, Detroit for the IMSA race and then went on to win it. Jan, one pole position down in the dads versus lads racing stakes already today. So those guys are high class. They need a class win. Whether they get it or not remains to be seen. But the good news is that Kevin and Jan will be sharing a car, we believe, for the Le Mans 24 hours. 100%. So a difficult family dinner to come for Jan Magnussen unless things <laughs> turn, turn the right way for them here. They have a tricky uh, session in uh, qualifying high-class racing. This is the real team racing car run by TDS 
uh, racing. The 70 car with Esteban Garcia, Matthias Besch uh, stepping in here for Loic Duval, who's busy elsewhere this weekend, and Norman Nato. It's a great LMP2 field here. This, this circuit does suit those cars. Remember, there's a different specification for LMP2 here. So there's no real comparison to be made with the times we've seen recently from the uh, ELMS cars. Toyota, they're here to race, of course, today, but they'll be back on Tuesday for their big Prix Le Mans 30-hour endurance test with a new test driver, Ryo Hirakawa, uh, part of the Toyota Young Drivers uh, program here uh, to replace Sebastian Buemi, who's off, I think, on Formula E duty. This is the 34 car. Well, this is into Europol competition, our Polish team. They've been right up there. Yep. Uh, all week, and particularly with that car in the hands of, of, uh, of Alex Brundle, they found the speed. I think they're still working hard on finding the, the rhythm in the pits. Uh, it is work in progress from that team. Big investment from them uh, in the engineering side in the off-season, including uh, their chief engineer, the ex-Tota uh, uh, engineer, Rafa, who's now uh, in charge of the 34 car, and it looks a completely different setup. WRT with two wins from three starts in the European Le Mans series on their first full-time venture into LMP2. They did race once previously, two or three years ago, with an LMP2 car, but they are on very fine form. The Alpine guys, Nico Lapierre and the crew, uh, feeling fairly relaxed with pole position. Phil Hansen there shares with Wayne Boyd and Paul de Resta. So Phil Hansen is now the only driver in that car who did the Spa race. Wayne Boyd in for Fabio Scherer, who uh, tested positive, unfortunately, a couple of days ago. Wayne Boyd has raced for the team in LMP3. He's a reigning uh, Michelin Le Mans Cup LMP3 champion, in fact. So he knows this track well, and it's a great chance for him to step up to LMP2 at the World Championship. Here's the local hero. There is no Felipe Albuquerque in 22 because he's in Belle Isle, uh, was in Belle Isle, or probably still is in Belle Isle, Michigan, for the IMSA race. Uh, so uh, we could have had two Portuguese drivers on the grid, but we have Antonio Felix da Costa, the reigning Formula E champion. And, of course, local knowledge will be key for him, although he's never raced here. Uh, it, like so many British drivers, don't get to race on the Silverstone Grand Prix circuit in junior categories when he was racing in Portugal. And in all the categories he's raced in, he never once came here. So although it is, quote, home, it is not a track he knows any better than a lot of the field. We're going to hear now the Portuguese national anthem. And there is our grid lined up for us. So will we hear that at the end of the eight hours of Portimao? Well, we'll wait to see. We will have, of course, podiums for all our class winners. Hypercar, LMP2, Pro-Am, GTE Pro and GTE Am. Looking here at Racing Team Nederland, third fastest in the LMP2 category, Fritz van Eerd, Jop van Eutert, Guido van der Garde starting, loving the sun shield on the front. I am speed. ka -ching. Very good indeed. Lovely little touch there. The team are so much fun to be around and really enjoying their racing. 
And there is the big LMP2 field at the front of which were the two Jota Sport cars. 38 started by AFDC, Antonio Felix da Costa, Jesu Roberto Gonzalez, and Davidson. Both Jota Sport cars with a very solid lineup indeed. The LMP2 pole, though, went to the number 28 car. That will be started, or that pole was earned by Tom Blomqvist. He shares with Stoffel van Dorn and Sean Galeal. And talking of uh, former Jota run drivers, yeah. bumped into Jasmine Jafar in the paddock last night, who is fermenting plans to return. He is, and uh, I was looking to see what was, that was all about. He's bringing some young aspirant engineers uh, from Malaysia to work with a number of organizations, including the Center of Excellence that is Jota, of course. And that's great to see in these straightened times actually to get investment going into the likelihood that international motorsport will return to Southeast Asia at some point. But he was in good form, and yes, um, I think uh, there are plans afoot, aren't there? Definitely. I mean, he would love to be racing back here again, but at the moment, putting back some of what he's got out. Third on our grid, and the third of our hypercars, is the number seven Toyota. They lost their best lap with track limits, and again, like the number eight, had to have a last gasp run to try and get themselves ahead of the LMP2 cars for a long while it did look like we might have an LMP2 pole sitter. Number eight was the better of the two Toyotas. It will start on the outside of the front row. Sebastian Buemi, Kazuki Nakajima, Brendan Hartley, the winners in Spa over number seven. They are our championship leaders and there are points and a quarter or a half, Graham, for this race. I have forgotten that code it's, of it's detail. 100, it's 150 yeah, percent. So, so race points and a half. Race winner here is 38 points. So put into context finishing second here is two more points you get for winning a six hour race and nico lapierre is the starting driver for our pole sitter the alpine elf matt Mutt, run by philip senior's senior tech team and as the toyota drivers have been very happy to point out as often as possible it is a grandfathered lmp1 car it's not exactly as it ran as a rebellion uh, what's more the next time we see an Alpine Elf Matmut on the grid. It will be a brand new chassis. So they are still working hard to bring their performance up. In the Glickenhaus, Richard Westbrook will take the start in this absolutely unique looking car. It's got no other sort of echoes or chimes of anything on the grid. It's a very bold project. And Jim Glickenhaus, you know, he made movies with money that he made in the stock market. And he was used then to having an idea and creating it on celluloid. Now he's had an idea and has created it from carbon and aluminium and alloys and rubber and oil and gas. And uh, it, it's the same deal. Have an idea, make it happen. And of course, as Daniel Serra should after qualifying have been the very last car on the grid but a lap that was disallowed because of track limits at turn 14 was reinstated for him and for one other car and so they end up actually in the middle of the gt pack with their gte pro rivals and just ahead of egidio perfetti the white nose car there from project one that is our gte am pole sitter but he didn't actually by at the end of qualifying look like he hadn't recorded a lap that had been allowed. So we have 32 cars on the grid. What started out as an overcast, cloudy and temperate sort of 18 degree morning has uh, seen the cloud burn off very quickly indeed. Onshore breeze is helping with that overnight, but it is going to mean that the track temperature continues to rise. This surface that was relayed in uh, preparation for last year's Formula One Grand Prix here He's going to absorb the heat very quickly. Hey, Kevin, post Ferrari's new tyres. Copy. Talked to Kevin Estra on the track walk a couple of days ago and said, from lap one, you're going to be looking after the tyres, aren't you? That's what that was all about. That teaches us, perhaps, 
that Estra is not on brand new tyres for the start of the race. Here's our grid. Uh, Nico Lapierre for Alpine leads away from Sebastian Buemi and Toyota driver Jose Maria Lopez. Tom Blomqvist is our LMP2 pole sitter ahead of teammate Antonio Felix da Costa and Guido van der Gaard lining up third in P3. Phil Hansen and Robin Freens for United and WRT are row four of the grid. And the easiest car on the planet to spot from space, Alex Brundle for Inter Europol, ahead of Norman Nato in the real team P2 car. Then the Glickenhaus, that's the hypercar of Richard Westbrook with Ben Hanley alongside in the 21 Dragon Speed entry. And as fueled back in the Dane train, ahead of our GTE Pro, uh, of, ahead of rather Bytska Visser. Then Miro Konopka, who hopefully will take the start for ARC Bratislava. He's alongside our GT Pro pole sitter Kevin Est, James Collado in the Ferrari and Jimmy Bruni on row nine and row 10, Daniel Serra and Am pole sitter Egidio Perfetti. Right behind him, fellow Porsche driver Christian Reed and Roberto Lacorte, the best qualified Ferrari in the Am class, ahead of Francesco Castellacci, Manuela Gosner, Francois Perodo, and Castle Racing newcomers with Takeshi Kimura, a slew of four Ferraris ahead of the best Aston. Marcos Gomes starts the 98 car ahead of Tomino Fuji in the D-Station car. Mike Wainwright for GR in his Porsche with Ben Keating's Aston alongside him. And the final row of the grid, Claudio Schiavone in the 60 Iron Lynx car and Dominic Bastian, the oldest man in the field, in the Dempsey Proton 88 car. So that is your 32 car lineup. And we will hear in just a moment from our race director, Eduardo Freitas, at home here in Portugal, where he started his marshalling career some 30 years ago. Great view there of the driver. Super calm, but just agitated to get on with it. We're ready, the door is closed, the team have left him on his own, and he now wants to start this race. And Alan McNeish, you've been in that position so many times. If you're sitting on pole, the thing you are going through in your mind now is, how am I getting away from the rolling start? When are the lights going to change? And where on earth are those Toyotas going to be? You've got a plan, you need to execute it. Well, certainly if you're on pole position, it's very different if you're on the second or third row. In pole position, you're controlling the field, running to the line you'd control when you accelerate. And in theory, you're trying to block any attack into that first corner. If you're second or in the LMP2s, as we see now reeling off the grid, for example, uh, the 22 car there that was very quick but didn't maybe get uh, the qualifying that it thought it was going to have. It's how do you then try to make hay? How do you attack, get one or two cars at the beginning? So you've got a strategy, but that strategy is affected by what everybody else around you does. Just a little moment of palpitation as 7.09, the Glickenhaus kind of rolled away a little bit slowly. Looks like Westy is up to speed though in the car, weaving to build a little bit of heat because although the tyres came out of the oven, they've been sitting and cooling rapidly, haven't they? Look faster than a cup of tea, these things cool down. Yeah, they cool down behind the safety car if you don't do that. Try and get some energy into them and you weave around. You also hit the brake pedal very hard, accelerate hard, and that brake pedal heats up the brake discs and pads which then goes into the rim which then goes into the tire and so therefore there's quite a few things you do with the hybrid system and the Toyota they've got other systems that allow them to influence it as well but here we see the Glickenhaus that was a little bit slow as you said off the line they had a couple of electronic issues with the gearbox in practice but hopefully that's not uh, afflicting them through the course of this race. Uh, safety car driver Pedro Cachero. I have a feeling we will see him probably during the course of this race. It is a tight, twisty, it's a relatively short lap. Monza will be the shortest lap in the World Endurance Championship at just over four and a quarter kilometers. It's 4.6 k's here. Uh, and look at this, you know, cars vanish from sight and then pop up over the brow. And if that happens for the cameras, then Alan, it's the same for the drivers. Stuff's over the brow that you can't see. You are really reliant on the marshals here. You certainly are. You're always very reliant on the marshals anyway, and they do a superb job. But at the same point, at this type of corner, there's a lot of different lines and traffic's going to be a big factor in this race. How do the LMP2 cars sort of get through the GT cars? Because at some points, the GTs are as quick in the apex speed as anybody else on the circuit.
Actually, right here, through here to this tight left-hander, I've seen a lot of P2 cars shoot up the inside because they've got the aero grip that will allow them to do it as the GT cars have to wander out wide. Now everybody's got to line up side by side. They should have done in theory before the previous corner, but getting ready in preparation for the safety car to pull into the pit lane, and that will leave the 36 Alpine, who is going to be on pole position, able to lead. Let's hear from them now. Okay, Nico, I wish you a good start. Good start, Nico. Thank you, thank you. OK, well, here we go. You can see that the GT pole sitter, Kevin Escher, has been asked to hold the GT field back a little because they don't want to have everybody piling into potentially a big accident. Eight hours of Portimao. Race two of the FIA World Endurance Championship is about to get underway. The blue car is the pole sitter. Red and white alongside starting their 100th World Championship race. Toyota, hypercars first, second and third. LMP2 car in fourth place. What is the P2 pole sitter Tom Blomqvist going to do? Great start from the Alpine of Nico Lapierre. Watch the P2 cars, racing team led and get van der Gaard around the outside. The GT cars have closed already on the back of the Glickenhaus that runs out wide. And just about everybody makes it through. Bright yellow Kessel Ferrari, around goes 28. And That's it's leading LMP2. Tom Blomquist spun it around. It, not sure if he got a tap there, but just in the middle. As you can see, a lot of cars weaving around, running wide off circuit. Porsche leading GT cars also uh, running wide. And I think it's a real struggle at the moment to get the tyres up to temperature there, Mark, Martin. 22 United up to second place behind the 38 car of Antonio Felix da Costa. That chrome red and white, that's high-class racing. Good start for them. And for the boy Brundle, Alex Brundle in 34. The Inter-Europol car up to fourth position, but our P2 pole sitter facing the wrong way in traffic. Not a great start to their race. Certainly not for Jota. They were 1-2. Antonio Felix da Costa as well has dropped down to third place. And that's already with his teammates spinning. So for the, certainly for Jota, it's not the ideal first half of the lap. It was, a, it was an odd start there, guys. We saw the uh, the LMP cars backing themselves up to take the, uh, the, the the light change, but the GT cars came past it at a pace. That's why they're in amongst the back end of the LMP twos as well as an instant at uh, turn two. Fit of the head shakes there. No front end grip in the high class racing machine, and through goes Brundle. He's leaning on those not yet up to temperature tyres. He wants to move up for into Europol, and that was a good bold pass. He moves up to eighth place. That's fifth in P2, but here comes oh. the high-class car coming right back at him. The outside line is the one to have here, Alan. It's uh, well, that's it. That's exactly the braking problem. We saw that this was caused by low tire temperatures at the beginning in the uh, previous corner. Brundle was he was quite robust. He got his elbows out. He pushed and shoved but ultimately he's managed to keep the place. However, one person that had a very good first lap, very, very slow up to the line to make sure the Toyotas didn't have too much time to use their hybrid boost uh, was the Alpine, and that was strategically very, very good. We'll hear from Nicola Lapierre. Beautiful start, Nico. Beautiful. Well, I think that's quite clear. He's got a nice 2.3 second gap over the Toyota. He can control the situation now. All arms and elbows in GTE Am. The car with the blue highlights is Christian Reed. Started second. He's leading ahead of Egidio Perfetti. But look at the D station, Aston. Aston did not qualify strongly. Have they got more in race pace? Tomo Fuji in that D station 777 car in amongst them. And he started four cars from the back of the field. We saw saw this in Spa. The car didn't qualify strongly, but as soon as the race started, he was right on it, and behind him, just a couple of cars back, is the 98 Aston, Paul Dallalana starting that one. And he's all over the back of the Iron Dames, Ferrari of Manuel Agosta. So there's been a lot of changes in GTEM in the first lap already. Two and a half seconds to the good uh, Nicolas Lapierre. He's got the hammer down, knows how to win here. Won here more than a decade ago in a diesel power Peugeot. There's the leader in LMP2, but also in Pro Am as well. Guido van der Garde, certainly the pro in that Pro Am side of things. But uh, Racing Team Netherlands have got themselves to the front. And uh, right behind them, Robin Frins in WRT. Now, WRT struggled a little bit in qualifying, but they seem to have sort of got a bit of a feel for it. However, behind is Jota, and Antonio Felix da Costa still struggling, hasn't quite got the pace that uh, we maybe saw from them in qualifying, because Phil Hansen 
who is fourth in the United, also sport flashing the lights. And I would say that Hans is definitely the quicker of those two. But he needs to make the move soon because at the moment, Van de Garde and Frins are just starting to eke away and he doesn't want to get held behind the Costa too long. Yeah, it's clear from the body language that Phil Hansen believes he's the quickest driver as well in that pair. Here's the 51 Ferrari in second place behind Kevin Estra is the better of the two Ferraris in qualifying. James Collado starts that. He shares with his world champion teammate. So James Collado right behind Kevin Estra. And Estra in a world of good form at the moment. Won the Nürburgring 24 hours last weekend. Came here and blitzed everybody in qualifying and is leading in GTE Pro as our race leader outright, Nico Lapierre, cruises across the line north of 300 kilometers an hour in that uh, Alpine. Yeah, but quickest on that last lap was Sebastian Buemi, the Toyota that was second, only a couple of tens quicker, but it was in that first and second sector of the lap, and the Toyotas, I think, are starting to come into their sort of speed performance area at the moment. But certainly Robin Frins is right on the back of uh, Guido van der Gaard at the moment. Frins is the one that looks to be making most of the sort of attacking moves. It's about 131, mid-131s at the moment, the pace in the three leading hypercars. Two seconds off that, the LMP2s, uh, with the clicker now still trying to make its way through that traffic after being caught up in the melee at the start. Yeah, the problem with the Glickenhaus uh, is that it's quick, but not in the areas of the circuit that allows it to overtake very easily. Yep. And so it's got to sort of muscle its way and sometimes be a little bit patient. I think their game is very different. Their game is their first race. They want to make sure they execute a clean and tidy race from the drivers and also from the teams and the pits and everything else. And so I think it's a little bit more thought of the future as opposed to the, the here and now. It is a brand new team put together for this campaign. So yes, they'll learn more from eight hours of going round and round in circles than they will from 20 minutes of fighting their way up and then having a major issue. GTE Yam battle, Dempsey Proton 77, 56 Team Project One car, that's the Mentos Porsche, and behind 777, the D-Station racing Aston. They've now got company from behind in the form of the 54 AF Corsa Ferrari of Francesco Castellacci, the young Italian, all over the back of this battle. The Aston, though, Tomonobu Fuji sticking his nose almost down the inside of Egidio Perfetti. And it does look as though the Aston has got more pace right now than the Porsches and the Ferrari, perhaps even more than any of them. Yeah, the Astons could be on a minute. Remember, they've got different tyre options. And the Aston Martin, as he's gone down the inside, beautiful manoeuvre, very, very opportunistic there. Just Perfetti gave a little bit of a gap, and then, boom, he was straight down the inside. Looks like Perfetti could lose two positions as well, with the Ferrari yeah. going through as well. Door open there anywhere from turn 13 14 and suddenly you're in real trouble because you're offline you're on the dirtier part of the track and here comes Chetilas Roberto Lacorte in the blue Ferrari and Paul Dallalana meanwhile in LMP2 Graham it's still just as busy for the lead uh, while well, we're watching LMP2 quick lap time still coming Sebastian Buemi was closing that gap there's been a response from the Alpine quick point to make about Tono Bufuji to remind you guys he was stellar at the start of the race in Spa both Fuji, Sam, and Castellacci, the two silver drivers starting this race, would expect them to come through. Most of the GTM teams have, uh, have opted to start with their bronze drivers. Race directors have looked at the incident for Antonio F uh, for Tom Blomqvist got getting turned around or being turned around as Fuji goes through to take the lead of GTE Am. There'll be no further action on lap one. And Fuji-san has the lead for D-Station Racing, which of course is run by TF Sports, the same as the uh, pale blue Aston Martin that started by Ben Keating. And a change for second comes the Ferrari. Castellacci goes by Christian Reed as well. Yeah, but just outpowered them. It Whoa! Looked like, I think Reed's got a problem. There's a big lock up no, there. That was, oh, was Fuji. Fuji. Yeah, but he a big lock up. But look at Reed. He's just dropped from first to third, and it's very, very slow in acceleration. That's not normal. That's not sort of traction tire limited at this stage of the race. Oh, up the inside, Dallalana on the Italian gets by the Ferrari. So the Aston starting very strongly. I wonder if the cooler track temperatures are helping them at the moment. Will that pace fade as? Well, if the sun continues to boil this tarmac and, and raise the track tip. Wouldn't be surprised if they were on a slightly different tyre compound that may be suited exactly as you said, Martin, for this 
tire is circuit temperature at the moment. It's only, and I say only 34 degrees, we've had 51 as we see the Settler car oh. diving down the inside. Perfetti went from leading down to fifth yep. in the space of less than one lap. And now sixth. Yeah, so busy times there. 29, Racing Team Nedlin leading in LMP2, narrowly from Team WRT. And we know WRT from years of GT racing, but clearly they've now run three races in European Le Mans. They won two of them. This is their second World Endurance race. They have really got a handle on that. And here comes Paul Dallalana. He goes through as well. Chetelage Roberto Lacorte easing Christian Reed out into the boonies. He is struggling, Porsche. isn't he? Yeah, can't hold on. I mean, you know, with uh, so this right now, the Pro-Am uh, manner, we've got the uh, the LMP2 class and GTM doling out the entertainment now, the gentleman drivers. <laughs> Absolutely fantastic stuff. Yeah, Egidio Perfetti, the white car coming back underneath Christian Reed and free wide, Ben Keating decides maybe that's not the greatest idea. Another big lock-up ahead. And I uh, don't think that was the Chetelar car of Roberto Lacorte. This is all busy, busy stuff, isn't it? Kessel Racing's Takeshi Fumura, uh, Kimura not quite with this group. As they start, he's behind Ben Keating in eighth place in the class. Ben Keating in that bright blue Aston at the back here, looking for a way through. And that might come at the end of this long front straight. Marcus Gomez, not Paul Delano, starting the uh, non uh, Beg your pardon, correct. It's a uh, Brazilian stock yard champion. So what entertainment this class. It looks like very much that if you get overtaken once and muscled out, then you just can't recover. You can't clean up the tire and get the grip back very quickly. We know it's not abrasive. We saw how difficult it was in the first laps for drivers, but uh, we saw it now with Perfetti and also with Reed there. They, they just get shuttled straight to the back. Absolutely. Yep. Ben Keating there, by the way, in the third different Aston Martin. He's raced, oh, he's, he's run so far this season. <laughs> right. His brand new car written off in testing at Spa, and then uh, the replacement the LMS car arriving. This is another brand new you asked Martin this weekend. And that's going to be a good, not good vibrations, certainly, in that <laughs> car after the lockup. That was a long, long lockup. That one you really want to try and get off the pedal and do some cadence braking where you go on and off the brakes just to try to make sure it doesn't end up square. Perfetti, that's a dive bomb. Yeah, throws it into the chicane, runs out wide. Christian Reed comes back at him, and Ben Keating going, Come on, boys, settle down a bit. I'm coming through. Not here, he's not. They're enjoying this, aren't they? Yeah. Well, it's a wide enough circuit with so many options on lines at corners like this that you can have that type of racing. And that's one of the things I like about it is that it gives options for drivers. It's not a single line circuit. And uh, it's a blooming tough circuit, but not single line circuit. Almost every shot you see of this trio get into a corner, there's a cloud of tire smoke. I mean, that's, that's going to spell long, hard sessions for these tires. If drivers are locking up now with four laps on the tire, then it's going to be a very tough time going forward. Seven Toyota in third place. Goes around Claudio Schiavone in the number 60 Iron Lynx Ferrari. Right in front is the GR Racing Porsche of Mike Wainwright. So he's already on lap seven in traffic. Are you going to start to catch the traffic now? Yep, that well, was half a lap ago. He was probably already in the traffic by that stage. But Jose Maria Lopez lying in third place. It's 4.9 seconds back from the leader. Well, there was, they've overtaken two of the GTE cars, but now there is a huge gaggle of the GTE cars. In fact, if you look at all of these ones here, all the way back to about, what, 10th, 11th in category, then that's what uh, Lopez has now got to overtake. But he can use this to try and catch his teammate, yeah. uh, Sebastian Buemi, who's just a couple of seconds up ahead. Now, here is our race leader, right behind Ben Keating, and not too far behind is the yellow Kessel Racing Ferrari in the colours of Car Guys, which, of course, there it is, top of the brown, which we've seen uh, so far in the World Endurance Championship. Saw them having some pretty ambitious races last year. Ben Keating still trying to get by Christian Reed, And for the race leader, this is where free practice actually pays off. Up the inside here, he was just a little behind Egidio Perfetti. Oh, Perfetti, though, bobbles off the kerbs. 
and that was uh, an open invitation for the leader to go through. First opportunity in this traffic to see what we've seen all season so far in the WC and the European Le Mans Series. Traffic is a much bigger issue this season because of that re-stratification of the classes. Well, here he goes, through on the inside of Christian Reed. Now, here is the Northwest AMR Aston. This is third, looking for second. We could have an Aston 1-2, closing in behind is the Alpine. The Alpine's actually been able to sort of make a little bit of a break from Sebastian Buemi in the Toyota with that first couple of cars in traffic. It's been quite nice by Nicola Lapierre there. He's uh, he's probably gained about another half second with the knowledge as well that now he's got a little bit of clear space, as you can see, before he gets to the next group of cars. And then, of course, he gets to the back of the pro class and then into LMP2. Here's our P2 lead battle. It is still racing Team Lelian Netherlands. Gera van der Gaard leading Pro-Am as well from Robin Freens in the WRT car, and in the pits is 88, that's Dominic Bastien. Now, they qualified at last on the grid, he's obviously had issues going by the Iron Dames Ferrari, and that car with Manuela Gosner is in 10th in the AM class, it's gone backwards since we left the grid. Uh, refueling first before they do anything else, that's just standard. It's not that he's down on fuel, purely and simply top it up, and then do whatever it is you need to do from there. Door is open on the 88 car. So whatever it is. Battery issue. Looks like it could be an electronic yeah. issue. And, and that is so often the case. If it's got all four wheels and it's not a light, generally with a modern race car, it's electronics. Uh, through that traffic, by the way, Nicolapia has definitely taken a leap forward. What have been a lead bobbling around 1.9, 2.2, 2.3 seconds. Now almost five seconds. So the Alpine has managed to get through that traffic quicker than the Toyotas. So that's nearly five seconds in 10 laps. If they can do that all the way through, take half a second a lap out of Toyota, that's unlikely, yeah, but... but it, that was due to target. traffic, though. Yeah. He was able to gain a chunk due to traffic. The average has been about two or three tenths of a second maximum. Yeah. And uh, so that'll ebb and flow. I think at this moment in time, if I was Nicola Lapierre, I'd be thinking, right, OK, thank you. I've now got a breathing space, so I can be a little bit more strategic in traffic. Robin Frins definitely not thinking that at all. Guido van der Garde, he's the one that's just lock locked up a little bit. Frins has got a run at him, but not quite enough. But there's a lot of pressure on Guido van der Garde there. I have to say, we know both of them very well, and both of them are absolutely attacking racing drivers. Yeah, they're at turn three. There's been a spin. Think that's the real team racing car. Yeah. Norman Nato's in that car and had a little bit of a pirouette down at turn three, back on his way again. And look at the inside, Robin Fries really piling the pressure. He's appearing in places that that, that uh, Gero van der Gaard doesn't want to see him. But that's the thing, he's always just trying to move around. And that with Robin, he actually takes a different line. If you look into this next corner as well, he will normally tuck in a little bit tighter than Guido van der Gaard. And not on this occasion due to the lap traffic of Perfetti in the GT Yam car, but normally just can tuck it in that little bit tighter than uh, Guido van der Gaard at the moment. It's got a, as you said earlier, there are a few corners here where it's sort of pick a line, any line. There is the Glickenhaus, and there's the rotation for Norman Nato. Now, was he assisted from behind? The 88 car had just come out of the pits. I think it was a small, small touch, and inten unintentional. I'm not sure whether Nato closed it down or the Porsche ran a little bit wide, but a little touch just at that moment in time was enough to send it around. Uh, we're hearing from Louise in the pit lane that the 88 car did have a battery change. It's got an electronics issue. They're not sure whether that will cure it or whether it's the alternator. Top three in GTE Am being passed in one fell swoop at the hairpin. And, yeah, again, not, uh, uh, Robin Friens didn't have the opportunity to run out wide and carry momentum. So, in fact, that fell nicely as through comes the Jota Sport car of Antonio Felix da Costa. He's trying to fight his way through in the corners. And you see the minimum speed of the GT cars is, is higher than the LMP2 cars in some of these turns, and the P2 car loses out. Well, the thing is that actually Castellacci, who was in the Ferrari there, he isn't caring about the Jota Sport car. What he's interested in is taking the lead of, yeah. of Am at the moment. And so he's in his own fight, but he's got to be a little bit careful of what's around and about him. At the same time, so does Antonio Felix da Costa. 
Well, what, what Castellaccia was hoping to do, I think, was let Felix da Costa open the door and, and push the GTM leader out of the way, and he'd follow through. There's Fritz van Ed, the boss of Jumbo Supermarkets. He's the man who uh, puts the Racing Team Nederland into Racing Team Nederland. Nero van de Gaard, part of that all-Dutch lineup, And a massive supporter of Dutch motorsport, including, I believe, a personal sponsor for what Max Verstappen. Oh, very much. And he has jumbo race days as well at Zandvoort, has had for years, where entry is free to anybody that wants to come, puts on a massive show there. He loves motor racing. He does. And he loves racing here in LMP2 in the World Championship. Free rides, amongst other things, in a two-seater LMP3 car driven by Jan Lammers. <laughs> Not sure if that's a, a, a really exciting prospect or quite terrifying because you know that Lambers would be out to scare you. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so here's our lead battle in P2 then. Robin Friend still giving chase in the battle of the low countries, really, isn't it? With uh, the Belgian WRT team behind the Dutch racing team Netherlands outfit. In third place, just dropping away a little bit, Jotas Antonio Felix da Costa not getting breaks in traffic, but Ant is pulling away a little bit from Phil Hansen, Alex Brundle and Ben Hanley. Seeing much comments on social media about uh, just how spectacular the racing is at this track. It was a revelation, I know, to Formula One that when they came here. No secret to followers of the Le Mans series, the European Le Mans series, but uh, every time you see a race at this place, it gathers more and more fans. A spectacular piece of tarmac. Yeah, properly is. Came here in 2010 for World Touring Cars, and if you, if you think this is good for these guys, imagine a bunch of touring cars. Well, let's take a look at the start. And straight away, Nico Lapierre executed his plan. Big lockup for Richard Westbrook among uh, the rest of the field there. Got it in neat and tidily. This is going down into the first corner. He saw the lockup by the Glickenhaus. Everybody sort of just trying to make their way a little bit and looking to the right, see what it is. And this is what happened to Tom Blanco. He was oh, down. It was his teammate. It was, his teammate. It was knocked down by his teammate. My goodness, Antonio Felix da Costa, the Jota Sport team, must have been pulling their hair out at that one. Very, very lucky for Blanquist that he didn't get tagged by anybody else. Everybody else made it through without hitting that LMP2. That's unbelievable, actually, given how many cars they were following. And lots of cars running out wide. Alex Brundle there. And this is the view of them coming, charging down the hill. Look at the huge lock-up there for the AF Corsa Ferrari. You can see there, that's the overlap. The, uh, as we said at the start of the, uh, start of the race, with the back there, the RP field backing themselves up. They were already on the gas for the GTE yeah. field, so when we got into the braking zone, GTEs are already amongst the P2s. Right, we now have an all Aston battle for second place in GTE. Am Francesco Castellacci has got by for the lead. We didn't see that, but Tomonobu Fuji right ahead of Gomez, and this is Castellacci in the Ferrari. Getting down the outside, that's where most of the grip is. Cuts the nose off the D station, Aston. That was a big, bold move. It certainly was. It was quite a few laps in the making because that battle's been swinging since the first corner. But uh, Castellacci's now got himself up there. But, you know, something I honestly did not expect. There's two Astons on the podium at this moment in time. <laughs> when you looked at uh, the performance that they had in qualifying yesterday, we wouldn't have bet after 12 laps, two Astons there. Stop the count. <laughs> Another thing, if you look at that, Kevin Estra, who was the star of qualifying, in my opinion, yesterday. Two laps that were good enough for pole position, delivered them bang, bang, without a question. He's got so much confidence at the moment, but he's also leading by a good uh, four seconds. However, it's not from Jimmy Bruni, his teammate. It's actually James Collado in the air Corsa. And Ferrari seemed to struggle a little bit more yesterday, but like every race I've seen from the last five, six years, they always seem to be able to pull something out, and especially as the race evolves, they seem to get better and better and pull themselves back to the front. Yeah, there's been times when Collado has been able to just claw back on Kevin Astra. They've got, actually, the AOC Bratislava uh, Ligier between the two of them. That's a mark of the pace that's coming from the GTE uh, Pro Cars at the moment. Uh, but that's Astra Collado battle has got chapters to write in the next, <laughs> what, seven and a half hours. No kidding. Look at the Chetelar, the blue Ferrari coming up behind with Roberto Lacorte. Did qualify third ahead of both of these cars. The Ferrari probably didn't bring its tyres in at the beginning of the race as quickly as the Astons did, because they 
they came forward like they were fired off the deck of an aircraft carrier by a catapult. But now the Ferrari with Francesco Castellacci leading and Roberto Lacorte coming through. Meanwhile, battle between the number one car, and that is the, high, uh, the uh, Richard Mill Racing Team of Bikes Gavissa with Tom Blomkis recovering, the man who was on pole on board with Bikes Gavissa. And Blanco is going the long way around the outside. Now he's going to try and insinuate himself between the Astons on the inside and does. And back behind him is coming the high class racing entry as well. Uh, beg your pardon. Uh, that is uh, the uh, real team racing car of Norman Nato, the blue car that had a spin earlier on as well. Traffic is going to be a big part of this in every single class. Yeah, and that's the only place where it's not. There's Paul Dallalana watching with interest his Northwest AMR car in third place in the AM class, GTE AM. And now look at lap times in the Delta, and this is something that I always did when I was a driver, was a Delta between your fastest lap and your average lap. Uh, then 36 Alpine that's leading this race overall, Nicola Lapierre. This car is extremely good. He's had it 31-1 is his fastest lap. His slowest lap is only at 33-6 in the depth of the traffic. Let's listen to him. Sorry, Nico. I have just the noise. I have just the noise. Problem of radio. Ah, I thought he said originally, I'm just the lawyer. I mean, hang on a minute, what? <laughs> just... <laughs> That's multitasking. So I think that is now a one-way, shorter ship radio rather than both ways. He's not getting shipped to shore, so clearly Nico can't talk to the team. Down the inside comes the real team car and a change for second. And I'm not surprised, Tomonobu Fuji can't have much rubber left on those tyres. He's doing monster lockups at least once a lap in the D station Aston so through goes the AMR car oh, and he's going slowly yeah puncture very very slowly for the uh, Aston right, Martin yeah. coming into the pits I would suggest going yeah. down to Louise Beckett uh, and she said there's a lot of smoke coming from that car earlier with the lockups but I think it's now gone through to the canvas of the tire you would think so, wouldn't you? An, an early pit call for them will put them on the back foot. However, with seven and a half hours, who knows what kind of full course yellow pit stops and strategies are going to come in. Triple seven, though, sinking like a stone. He has come into the pits, though. Tomonobu Fuji is our second pit caller. Uh, here you see him going up the hill. And that's, I think, when it all goes a little bit yeah. wrong. Runs wide, right rear, or right side, anyway. Now, were all those lockups cause or effect? Was it well, locking up the tyres that has caused the problem, or was there an underlying problem that has caused all those lockups? You, know, you see a little bit of rubbing as well, yeah. and uh, they're doing a bit of work refueling before they do anything else. It's going to go. Uh, <laughs> apparently, Louise Beckett's down there. She said, God, you can smell the sort of the burning sensation as it's been there. When you sit. And they're going to be doing all four tyres, obviously, to try to keep uh, the balance between them. When you say cause or effect, it's usually an effect. You have the first lockup, and if you don't get off the brake pedal quickly, it creates a sort of flat spot. And then automatically, the next time, it just goes to that point, and it's it's like a little bit of a, an area where it, it just sits at the bottom, and then it multiplies itself on from there. And you've got to be very, very careful after you hit that first flat spot to try to then be much more careful on the highest brake pressure, which is probably about three, four tenths of a second into your first attack onto the brake pedal. Riding on board with Joto Sports Antonio Felix da Costa, lying in third place, chasing the LMP2 battle of Racing Team Lederland and Team WRT. Those guys are probably a couple of car lengths apart. He's about two seconds back from the leader, so you can see them just occasionally where there's a bit of a line of sight. There you go. Sweeping down here, that's one of the sequences up to the top of the hill where you can actually get a view particularly when you're in GT traffic. It's a really good way to pop, pop through. Oh, yeah. Well, there you go. That's shredded the living bejesus out of that, hasn't it? 
A lot of damage on that inside edge. Too much yeah, camber. Nah, no, remember there's a lot of camber on the road here, and that inside edge gets a heck of a lot of kicking round about the last corner as well without breaking. Just because of the load on it, then it drags it through the long, long right-hander. The Aston Martin team was telling us before the race, Alan, that they felt they were nowhere on tyres, and I do wonder whether or not it's just they've taken a chance on something it's not paid off. Could be. Uh, uh, he, he had too many lockups to me yeah. to be just a, a, a debris or something like that. I think that's due to. There were some absolute monster lockups. This is a battle now between third place GTE and Roberto Lacorte in the blue Chetilar Racing Ferrari and Egidio Perfetti. Through comes the race leader, and again, popping up the hill there on the inside. That is a real favoured overtaking place up into the, uh, turn 13 for all of our P2 cars. And Egidio was Big getting bubble. close, but ran out wide down there between two and three. Great times coming from Roberto Lacorte at the moment. He's matching or just a couple of tens off the times for the silver drivers ahead of him on the road. So he's loving this uh, period of time in this new Ferrari for them. Here's the Glickenhaus making its way through. Richard Westbrook and the 709. Made that car down just outside the top ten at the moment overall. You're absolutely right, Alan. This is a conservative run problem, isn't it? Yeah, they have to finish. They have to learn as much as they can from eight hours. There's Jim Glickenhaus. Westy, of course, has had made plenty of miles in Porsche 911s over the years, so he knows exactly what's behind him with Kevin Estra. Kevin Estra there, the leader of our GTE Pro class. Great view on board with Richard Westbrook popping up to the top of the hill. This is about the highest point on the track. Let's hear from Westy. Yeah, rear and left tire pressure's gone too high. Optimum will probably be about 1.8 bar of pressure, somewhere about there. If it goes above two on any circuit apart from the mall, it's a nightmare for grip. You just can't break because you get no lateral stability as you turn into corners like this next one. You can't get the power down either, and then it also just creates some wheel spin, which then amplifies the problem again. And the only thing they can do is to try to take some brake temperature, which also amplifies it, and put it to the front of the car. That's why they said brake balance forward, brake balance forward. The hybrid cars can do a little bit more playing to achieve that brake shift or the shift of temperature. But for them, it's just about a case of getting that brake balance forward. At the pit stop, the, the next set that will go on will be compensated. We just saw a change of position there. Francois Perodo dive bombing Ben Keating at the hairpin, and that moves him through into eighth place, or up into seventh rather, ahead of Ben Keating, who's now eighth in GTE AM. Yeah, I mean, Francois, I think, recovering from what was a pretty poor start, that yeah. huge lock up into turn one, and my guess is that's been troubling him since. <laughs> yes, very probably. Just ahead of them, Christian Reed in the 77 Dempsey Proton car with Takeshi Kimura in the Kessel Racing Car Guy livery. Right now, Kessel Racing have done decades of GT racing and they have joined a fairly illustrious club as they make their FIA World Endurance Championship debut. Great. They do indeed. Your this stat. is, my apologies, uh, <laughs> yeah, this is their first non Le Mans WC sta uh, start. It means they join an exclusive club, Martin, of teams that have competed in every current. Uh, ACO Run Championship, the Michelin Le Mans Cup, the U European and Asian Le Mans Series, now the WEC. They have appeared, of course, at Le Mans previously, both under their own banner and actually uh, helping out the Scuderia Corsa team to uh, race win in GTM. But it's a tiny club, TF, Cor uh, TF Sports, AF Corsa, uh, into Europol, uh, the others in there. And if you include the Le Mans 24 hours on top, as a WC round, then you can add uh, Nielsen Racing and your international to that club. That's it. Well, there's the rest of the Kessel Racing crew sitting there watching the action. Here is our overall race leader, past the first half hour of eight hours of racing here in Portimao. And the car looking as quick and relaxed in the hands of Nico Lapierre as you might expect. Well, let's hear from the team, see what Nico's got to say for himself. Nico, on voit ta main droite à la caméra. OK, so they, they clearly can't hear Nico. Something has happened with the radio plug or with the radio set in the car or the helmet. 
but they're saying we can see your hand on camera in the onboard which they've clearly been able to isolate so gesticulate to us <laughs> but, you know, no pre-planned hand signals and he obviously can't get on the radio and go this means the tires are, are, are screwed or this means uh, yeah maybe thumbs up if they're giving him a signal box this lap box this lap he can give them the thumbs up that he's heard and understood you always should have a backup in case a radio fails especially you know you, you can have them and uh, in normal circumstances that is a pit board being waved or some signal to the car and then the car having a some signal back whether come towards the pit wall flashlights double flashlights whatever it may be but that should be pre-prepared yeah. in this situation it's been very agile where they said well actually we've got a camera on you all the time so we can have a look at that they're assuming he can hear them though he might not okay, Jose, for turn 14 15 try to keep the car straight on the exit as quick as possible to have a better exit turn 14 and turn 15, probably try to as well do a straighter line on the exit if you can. That it's is more like what Seb was doing, seems to work better. A little bit of information there to Lopez, which is uh, information they've gained from Sebastian Buemi's data, 22 laps in, coming out of this corner. Just try and straighten it off. Don't hang on to it with a wider line with steering lock, that scrub will not actually benefit you. Try maybe to take it a little bit later apex and a straighter exit on that and on the previous corner. Yeah, and also the hairpin, I think, getting in deeper and really veeing it off, making it a, a very much tighter hairpin so you're straighter earlier. And that's obviously their rear traction limited. On board with Antonio Felix da Costa. Not necessarily. All the problem takes the load off the front left. Yeah. And it's that front left performance is the thing that they'll be looking at there. If you can actually try to get equal load on all of your four tires, normally with a two-wheel drive, it's trying to get them on the rears, but all of your four, then you distribute the energy over four instead of two. Diving down the inside of this GTE AM battle and hoping the door doesn't close and that they've seen you. Whoa, had to carry a little bit more speed in there than he really wanted to, just to make sure he was alongside this car, the 77 Porsche of Christian Reed. So that's a great onboard view of, of the issues in traffic. And there you can see Ben Keating and the Kessel Racing Ferrari of Takeshi Kimura. Kimura had got by, Keating has retaken that spot. Francois Perodo, the 83 car, being uh, warned about track limits. Predominantly, that is turn one, but there are others. The exit of the hairpin, turn five, is being policed as well because you can gain a lot of ground by running wide and keeping up momentum. Yeah, he's right with uh, Christian Reed now for fifth in class on that recovery drive from Francois, so maybe trying a little bit too hard right now. Remember, a million miles away from the first fuel stop window for the first of the cars that will come in. Uh, there's going to be a variety of uh, options here. The first of the hypercars that should pit will be the Alpine. Remember, it has a smaller fuel tank than the other three cars. It's a very, very important point because they have to scramble away. They're seven and a half seconds. They've got to get away because they have got that negative delta that there's a potential at the end of the race they might have to do at least one more stop. Yeah. So not, not this first stint because that will be slightly shorter, but in a regular stint, it'll be something like 31 or 32 laps for the Alpine, 36 to 37 laps for the Blickenhaus and the Toyotas, we believe. Francois Perodo with the chrome highlights on the Ferrari down the inside of Christian Reed at the hairpin, sails down the inside, and that was telegraphed a long way ahead. Christian Reed had the option to try and close him off and did not. So Perodo picks up that spot. He's got to keep his nose clean. And from the pit lane, Lou pointing out, of course, that Alpine, when they come in, will obviously try and fix the radio, but that, that'll be door open push a few connectors and hope that it works and then shut the door and get on with it because you don't want to waste time now where there might be an option to survive without the radio. I should say, by the way, the 777 did emerge ahead of the uh, number 88 car. So after that uh, puncture for Tornobu Fuji, uh, now sits 12th in this 13 car entry. Big boost, by the way, for that entry next time around, just a few weeks time in Monza biggest gap I think we've seen so far since uh, the first corner between LMP2 leading racing team Netherlands Guido van der Garde and second place team WRT with Robin Frins. And, uh, 
It's a little bit on the green stuff on the outside, and Robin, clearly whatever's good enough for Van de Gaard, I can do as well. <laughs> That's that one, two, three segment, which is effectively one really super long right-hand corner. And this is part of the issue as well when you're in traffic, if you're where, whoever you are, is that if you have to compromise one turn, it's very rare here that that is just one turn. It compromises three or four or five in a row, and suddenly you find you've lost a lot more time. Well, now Robin Frins has got to be thinking a little bit because it's un they have to double stint tyres. And uh, the closer it, he is for a longer period of time behind Van de Garde, the harder it is on that front left tyre, which is the weak point for the LMP2 cars especially. And so therefore in that long, long second turn 14 and then also in the last corner as well, it really puts a lot of pressure onto that tyre. So that gap now that he's got gives himself a little bit of clean air and he actually gives the tyre that little bit of breathing space and it gives it a little bit more potential in the second half of the next stint. Yeah, you say, I think you're absolutely right, uh, as always, uh, Alan. The tyre allocation for LMP2, qualifying in the race, I always like to acknowledge, it's six and a half sets. So six and a half sets, remember, it's just over 40 minutes for uh, tank of fuel uh, for the LMP2 cars. They are absolutely going to have to uh, double stint multiple times in this race. Yeah, you have one lockup early in a stint with a full tank, and, and suddenly, you know, this is the year in a world of hurt for the next hour, hour and a half. Yeah, it's same allocation, by the way, for all the other classes, with the exception of GTE Amp. They get 34 tyres for qualifying in the race. That'd be something that would be of a major relief to Francois Perodo, I'm sure, who's going around on full threatening bits at the moment. I think we're seeing a little, sorry, apologies. I think we're seeing a little bit of uh, tyre management as well from Estra here, as uh, now, uh, it's Estra. actually, sorry, yeah. uh, Jimmy Bruni. Yeah. And uh, this is a situation where these are always thinking, and especially Porsche, they always think about what the end of the race is going to be, especially that last stint. So Jimmy Bruni will hear a little bit of his radio. I have a big oldest here. Copy, Jimmy, any vibrations on the tires, or is it just pure balance? No, all the vibrations on the last moment. Okay. He's having to defend, yeah, it, it's vibration. Wouldn't be surprised if it's pickup as well, and also potentially a little bit of rear tire pressure. We heard Westbrook in uh, the Glickenhaus talk exactly about that, and this is a case of survival right now. This pair, 11 seconds behind the lead pair in GT Pros, they've dropped right back from that battle, which, by the way, still the lead battle still has the number 44 LC Bratislava car between them. It's what, five, six and a half seconds uh, is the gap between Kevin Estra and James Collado. There's 11 seconds back to this battle, and it really probably is a battle now. Yeah, it is. And if they are balancing their tyres on the 91 car, we heard from 92 Kevin Estra's engineer, both Ferraris on new sets, and it may be that Porsche are using tyres that have maybe only done qualifying, you know, three or four laps, but it takes that edge off in the first couple of laps of the race, oh. and oh, sliding out a little wide, Jimmy Bruni oh, doesn't want to give right. it away, but... Well, to be honest, yeah. Bruni was on his line, it was just an opportunistic dive there, and I have to say, quite a nice one yeah. from Daniel Serra, who launched it up the inside and didn't really give Bruni very much opportunity apart from seed the position. Uh, just to remind, if you're watching the TV stream, the 52 car is the one now with the added yellow head uh, highlights on the splitter and on the mirrors. And Bruni getting pushed out, and then he's dropped back very, very quickly. Daniel Serra's the man we're riding on board with. Well done, well done. Focus in front, focus in front now. All right, so he has spent 40 minutes trying to make that move and eventually sees a tiny opportunity where Jimmy Bruni wasn't expecting the cutback. A little bit of rubbing, Jimmy Bruni running wide, yep. and the running wide has meant that he's dropped back quite a lot because he's lost a lot of uh, grip just because it's a little bit dirty. This is quite nice and well set up by Daniel Serra. Cracky stuff, wasn't it? Yeah, forced Bruni to defend that inside attack and then cut back underneath him at the top of the hill. That's a good oh. bit of thinking racing, isn't it? Force the other guy to be where you need him to be to make the pass you're actually thinking of. Yeah, but it's also lovely camera work as well. Yeah. 
nicely done. 29, Gerda van der Garde among the drivers who's just been warned about track limits. So too has Pachito Lopez in the number seven Toyota as we watch the battle for the LMP2 lead. So too has Alex Brundle who is in the, oh, ho, ho, in the uh, racing, uh, the uh, inter Europol car racing team led and come back as Robin Friends has a proper Formula E style lunge there into the pits comes Beitzka Visser for the first LMP2 pit stop. Yeah, pit stops will be now for that. That was uh, Robin Friends trying to take a little bit of an advantage as we'll see it again. Uh, this is on board with the jumbo car, Guido van der Garde looking to the right, but Robin was completely over the curbs on the inside. He looked to be a little bit quicker at this moment, but uh, as you can see, it's still Guido van der Garde that is now leading the race again. Yeah. It'll be interesting to see just in the way that the, the LMP2 teams are approaching this, both cars pit right now, who on a second stint on the tyres is going to take a disadvantage at the end of that yeah. second stint. Well, I'm more interested at this moment in time, sorry about that, right. is who actually gets out of the pits, who can refill and get back out of the pits quick. Remember, Jota were able to gain a couple of seconds oh, yeah. every single pit stop. Antonio Felix da Costa has not pitted. He's gone one more lap. So Jota lead. No tyres out at... Racing Team Netherlands, doesn't look like any tyres out. See the Goodyear tyre engineers checking all the tyres. Everything looks OK, and it will be fuel and go. It's one heck of a first stint for these two cars. Absolutely. Real battle from the very start. You'd expect it, though, uh, from these two men. Yeah, it's, it's gone there. You see the jumbo car that's already gone, and then the yellow car's gone. So actually, uh, they have gained a little bit. And it's slow to start as well for Robin Frins. WRT coming out further back than they came in, just ahead of the United number 22 car. Alpine in the, from the lead. Alpine is in, race leader is in the pits. So Tota lead, and go through with a 1-2, and we said that this was a predicted point at which they would come in. Yeah. I think about 31, 32 laps for Alpine on a regular fuel stint. It's less uh, for the start of the race, of course. Tyres are ready just in case. Door goes down. Fuel is still going in, so they're filling up the oil system, the driver's drinks bottle, and wiggling the radio connections. Right now, it'll be Nico, radio check, radio check. Remember, there is that us? minimum time with the fuel line attached yeah. in hypercar as well. So we're caught out Tota in race one. So, stoppers in LMP2, Racing Team Ledland, WRT United, Dragon Speed High Class and Richard Mille all stopped on that lap, as did the Alpine. And Alex Brundle is in as well for into Europol. He was in sixth position in LMP2. Yeah, he's gone around in another lap than the first batch. Here's our new race leader then, the number eight. GR010, Toyota Gazoo Racing's Sebastian Buemi leads in Portimao after just three quarters of an hour. Checking inside the inter Europol car, looking at the tyres. Their Goodyear technician. Maybe Rumble stays in. Ah, oh, driver change here. And this Toyota. is 28. So Blomqvist is out takes over, didn't spot the helmet. Christian Reed with a black and white flag for abusing track limits in the 77 Dempsey Proton Porsche. That is your final public warning. Next time you will be collecting a drive through. So time to lead the race for the first time Ooh. with Sebastian Buemi, uh, 3.9 seconds ahead of Jose Mira Lopez. Tire change. Was that left side only left side on only. the 28? Yeah, there's going to be a lot of that. We saw an awful lot of left side only rehearsals. Okay, so you are now P1. P1. Alpin has pitted. Alpin has pitted. They should have something like a six or seven lap advantage on fuel over the Alpine. That is, of course, going to mean deeper in this race that the Alpine will have at least one additional stop. And that Jose Carlos Gonzalez gets in there, looks as if it's had, well, we saw it having a little bit of a nudge. The left front uh, is slightly damaged. That was with their sister car at the second corner of the race. And it's going to be left hand side. Oh, no, the right front as well, they're going on. I would think Roberto will now go in for a double stint. I'd be surprised if they don't give him a full set. 
Left sides only. Yep, yep. All right. Okay, maybe they're single stinting the drivers because of the, the heat. No, it's not hot enough. I think it's just more a case of their strategy with tyre. Because what you do is you work back from the end of the race already to the beginning. Yep. Uh, also, by the way, for the first time in the race with this pit stop cycle, we've got a one, two, three, four that is all hypercar. Yes. Uh, because up into fourth place, because they've stayed out as the LMP2 cars pitted, comes the Glickenhaus in the hands of Richard Westbrook. He's a minute and 26 behind the Toyota leading the race. He's going to be lapped very soon. I would think before the pit stops, actually, the Toyota will uh, put a lap on to Richard Westbrook. And a lock up there by Westy as well. It's going to be interesting to see, isn't it, what uh, pace comes out of this car when they've adjusted for that uh, tyre pressure problem that Westy was reporting earlier. I would think it's going to be the middle of the race towards the end of the race where I'm going to be looking at the averages, trying to understand where they are. You know, with all the traffic right at the beginning, where they qualified, everything else, something flapping underneath yes, it. I spotted that as well. Which... Nice pickup in the truck. Is that a bit of right, tyre like... debris? I don't know what it is, but... Uh... Miro Konopka being dive bombed by, is it Alex Bungle in the 34? He stays in, Miro Konopka. All, all, all of our yellow cars in one go. And Konopka getting hit <laughs> as well and breaking into, into the hairpin. Yeah, that was by Takeshi Kimura in the yellow Kessel Racing Ferrari and Alex Bungle in yellow and green into Europe. There's nothing better about that yellow, was there? Uh, Ta -dum. Ta -dum. Talking of yellow, Racing Team Netherlands still leading in LMP2, but it was five seconds the difference in the pit stop between Guido van der Gaard and Robin Fritz. Wow. We saw WRT dropping back, and Robin also a little bit slow to get the engine fired up to move forward, but five seconds was a gap there. And the other change, by the way, that pit stop is United Autosports up into third position now ahead of the 38 Jota car. Yeah, slow pit stops for both Jota cars, but they both change drivers. Uh, 1 minute 11 for Inter Europol, they didn't change driver. 1 minute 10 for Dragon Speed, they didn't change driver either. So the uh, the Red Bull racing of that first round of pit stops was racing Team Netherlands. 1 minute and 4 seconds for that full fill. In the pits at the moment, Miro Konopka. Yes, I'd forgotten we have four yellow cars because racing Team Netherlands, of course, also predominantly yellow. And here we see Ben Keating in the blue Aston behind Christian Reed. This is the battle of the two uh, seventh and eighth place uh, cars in GTEM. 77 ahead of 33. Trying to get my head around 33 being Ben's number this year. Right behind, here comes the Alpine. I oh, know it's not, I beg your pardon. That's the real team racing car. Oh, that's a hit on Whoa, Christian Reed. Oh, yeah got distracted by the P2 car coming back down the inside of him and Ben Keating then found himself offline on the dirty stuff and not on the brakes early enough. And uh, race, I think he'll probably have a discussion with the stewards or the stewards will be having a discussion as the 91 oh. leading uh, Porsche comes into the bit. Sorry, that's Jimmy Bruni's car comes yeah. into the bits. That's he early. Flying, yeah, but remember, he had problems. He did. He was struggling, he said he had vibrations and the left rear was struggling as well. Little error there with the fuel supply. They've got a cap on the end of the dry brake nozzle to stop grit getting into it. The photographer forgot to take his oh lens cap off and it went on, it didn't go on. And then he remembered. Was that a late call then? Uh, it's possibly or possibly just one of those checklist jobs that didn't get checklist jobbed. Late, late call doesn't Fronts. matter, he's got to be ready. Full set. Get rid of those ones. Now, can they shave them, do something with them, and get them back and use them again later in the race? Because a, a set that does one stint isn't really helping you much. No, no you can clean them. You've got like a heat gun which cleans all the pickup off the tire, and uh, then you've got a chance of recycling that tire. It'll go back into the oven directly, so it will never really go cold and then be heated up again. Well, our two Jota cars that collided on the first lap are back out and racing with different drivers. Let's hear from pole man Tom Blomqvist. Tom Blomqvist bringing in the 28. You started on pole. Unfortunately, you couldn't keep that. Uh, tell us from your point what happened. Um, well, first of all, since... I mean, first of all, it's obviously a big, big shame, a big blow to our race. Uh, thankfully, we have eight hours to try and, you know, make amends. 
Uh, but yeah, it was, I mean, it was a bit of a messy start. You know, the hypercars aren't so quick uh, in some of the corners. So uh, Van der Garde, I think it was, uh, managed to get around the outside into the hairpin. I was kind of in the middle, I had power on the left. And I think someone hit me on the inside and spun me around. So nothing really I could have done. Because I was, I was a bit basically stuck in the middle there. So uh, yeah, really, really a shame. You know, it's, we're a long way behind. But like I said, you know, it's a long way to go. So hopefully we just need to keep our heads down, keep focused, and, you know, try and, try and yeah, make our way towards the front. It is a real, real shame. I saw your teammate uh, Antonio in the sister car, Antonio, come over and speak to you. So I assume he was just uh, apologising for that incident. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I didn't know it was obviously him at the time. I thought he was actually on my on my left because it was a car I saw on the left as well. But yeah, I mean, these things happen in racing. But you know, it's obviously a big shame that's the two cars from the same team. So yeah, obviously, yeah, pretty disappointed right now. And uh, yeah, hopefully we can have something to smile about in seven hours time. Understandable, Thank but you. yeah, hopefully you will, good. thanks. Well, probably a very good call from the team not to tell him who had caused the contact. Oh, somebody hit me, we saw it, we saw it. Just get your head down, charge on. And Antonio, straight over, mate, really sorry, couldn't avoid you, da da da. So yeah, there wasn't a stewing, fermenting, uh, resentful Tom Blomqvist popping out of the car into the garage. So that's great team management by Jota. Right. Don't add fuel to the potential fire. Well, fuel potential fire. This is being investigated by the stewards. As we saw Paul Dallalana just get locking up and uh, having a bit of a... Keating. He hit both. Ben Keating, sorry. Yeah. He hit both cars. He did just tag the 70 car as well. And the 77 car is still in the pits there. You can see a little bit of... Uh, rubber and debris that won't necess necessitate a change of bonnet but uh, it may necessitate a pit lane penalty yeah so the uh, stewards are confirmed as being as looking into that incident yeah well as you do with any racing incident whether they decide a penalty is justified or not remains to be seen and they'll hear they'll look at telemetry they'll look at on boards they'll look at footage from the outside they'll hear from the drivers if they can and then decide on uh, whether or not Somebody has been a naughty boy. Christian Reed now leaves the pits in the 77 Dempsey Proton car, but this is already a tough first hour. Dempsey Proton's two cars are the tail end Charlies in the entire race. Can we get a bit of an aesthetic update, by the way, as we're watching what's going on track? An aesthetic know, update? Indeed. Graham on Goodwin, Dempsey the ace, the, the <laughs> ace into well, the pits. Yep. Yeah. I'll, I'll do, we'll wait until we've uh, gone through the pit stop cycle here. Now, this is not the leader. This is the chasing Toyota of Jose Maria Lopez. They're in second place, and Alan, now they are already trying to find a way to jump their teammates. Well, they are one thing, but also at the same time, I'm interested uh, where, as we see the what was the leader prior to their pit stop, Alpine, where they're going to come out relative to uh, this Toyota, as they know it just drops into its position. It's right at the end of the pit lane. They should come out in front. It's 28 seconds to go through the pits, plus the fuel hose needs to be connected for 43, or was it 34? Anyway, plus 34. 30 seconds. So that gives the 36 car a minute. They should be back in front, but, yeah, but it's not going to be by much. Tight. Yep. It is coming into the last corner through the bump in the middle of the corner, and then the pit lane is on the right-hand side now. Quite a long way down is the Toyota. He goes across the line to move up into second place. Sebastian Buemi was 10 seconds ahead of the number seven car at the end of the lap, but the seven car was in the pit lane there, so Buemi probably had a three or four second advantage. Will that be enough? WRT saying that they lost time with the fuel rig rather than anything else in the pit lane in their battle with uh, Racing Team Netherlands. So that's the five seconds difference. And it is number eight, the race leader on pit road. So seven hours, two minutes or three minutes to go as he comes onto pit road and 37 laps completed. Yeah, and the Alpine is exactly in the same position as it was with Lopez. This is going to be pretty tight. The good thing for the Alpine is that he's got clear track and no traffic, so he will be absolutely flat out, and I'm sure they're going to be in the radio as well. Tell him to get on it on this lap on the clear, um, the clear circuit so that he can try to maintain the lead. Yeah, the gap back to the number seven car will be about three or four seconds, maybe no more. Question is, where does number eight fit in? 
have number seven somehow been able to perform an undercut and get ahead of their teammates shouldn't happen 10 seconds been added to the next 33 car stop that's the ben keating four horsemen uh, aston martin the tf sport run car i don't think there's any chance that uh, lopez will be ahead because they didn't change tires so there's no potential of that but as you can see it's a lot lot closer here Ooh. as uh, the alpine has gone through and retaken the lead yeah battle on so Alpine back in front after the first round of stops, but Graham, they stopped how many laps earlier? It's about, I think, six. We're going to, I'm just going to double check that, but I think six it was six laps, laps uh, that they've got in hand here. That is going to translate to at least one additional stop at the end of this race, yeah. even assuming we, we stay green. So Slickenhouse is the only car that basically at the front that hasn't stopped. But this is the same lap, isn't it, for the Totas? He's coming around to complete now. He was almost yeah. a lap behind. So if he pits now, he's on the same lap count for fuel stints as same, the Totas Same were. fuel use, yeah. Uh, but if he goes through and no, completes, he's, he's coming in. Yeah. So. Well, now, what's going to be interesting as well, and maybe Louise is close enough to, to see, is how they deal with their first ever World Endurance Championship racing pit stop. It's not the team's first ever race. Glickenhaus have raced in the Nürburgring 24 hours for a, a number of years. But uh, this is their first in World Endurance. So we're going to see a driver change as well. Briscoe, I think, is getting yep. in the car yep. as Westbrook gets out. You can see the kangaroo on the Aussie's helmet. Oh. That gets Richard Westbrook. Now, the driver intuitively lost ground. 77. Dempsey Proton car, Christian Reed, the hairpin a favoured overtaking point. Francois Perodo picking up a spot as Christian Reed dropped down the order. In GTE Pro, a very ambitious move by Daniel Serra, catching Jimmy Prize as they swap for third. Ferrari running second and third, Porsche first and fourth at the end of the opening foray in this eight hours of Estoril. The Glickenhaus. Had a few troubling issues in free practice. None have since appeared. Their job solely to race on for eight hours. Francois Perauda with a right front puncture that shredded not just the tyre but the bodywork. Dropped the championship leaders in GTE Am after their win at Spa down to the tail of the field. And they have so far lost nearly half a dozen laps in the pits. Alex Brundle moving up into fourth place for Inter Europol at the expense of Jota's Roberto Gonzalez into the second stint. And after the first of eight hours, the Alpine still leading in hypercar. Been a busy first hour. So far, a couple of yellow flags for little bits of debris and innocent spins. No major problems but there's been a little bit of contact in traffic, 38 car and the uh, 21 car making uh, a little bit of contact. Dragon Speed's 21 with Ben Hanley, who was up behind Roberto Gonzalez and was a bit impatient, Alan McNish, trying to get through. Luckily for leader uh, Nico Lapierre, it happened just close enough uh, far enough away that he didn't get caught up in it. Yeah, Nicola Lapierre sort of just in a watching briefing, as you said, but uh, there's a little bit of frustration came in there, I'm sure. And uh, it is a wide circuit with multiple lines. We've seen it actually in a couple of occasions where people get dragged into situations that they're maybe not quite expecting. But uh, everybody back on their way again. Yep, so the reaction... ...did Tomonobu Fuji having a puncture in the D-Station racing car, losing ground. How did you find it? We've just seen the highlights there and watching that start. Let's yeah. start there. Well, first of all, it's just great to be here. You know, new team, new project, new concept with Hypercar. It's just great being here. Unfortunately, uh, we have an issue with our tyres, the way we're working them. So after three, four laps, they're just blistered. So no way to double stint the tyres. Um, we could barely make one stint then. So. We've got to use this like a test session now, as I was just telling you before we went on air. It's um, got to find a way to make this be less aggressive on the rear tyre, because the pace is there. When the tyre was good, felt like we could get through the LMP2 traffic. Once they, they just went off a cliff, and 
you could feel the blisters and it's just a matter of hanging on and bringing it in for Ryan to get in and hopefully we can make some changes. Just control the pressure, control the heat in the tire and just use this as the test session going forward now. So they are the solutions that you've got right now? Yeah, exactly. It's just a way of, because generally the car is good. It's nice to drive, but we're not getting the best out of the tires right now. And we've never had this issue before, but we've never tested at such a high energy circuit. And um, yeah, we completely, completely melted the tires and both rears. So it didn't look pretty when they came off. Uh, because also it looked at the beginning that people were actually struggling to get yeah. the tire pressure up. Exactly. No, it was, it was tricky after two laps, but you know, we were in the same boat as everyone else, and then the peak of the tyre came, and it's like, oh, here we go. Let's get through the LMP2 traffic and see where we are in relation to the Toyota. But then it went downhill very quickly. And then it was a case of trying to control the pressure by going forward on the bias and looking after the rear tyres. But once they blistered, that was it. As soon as you tried to push, then the problem escalated. But listen, we're just happy to be here. This is a long journey. It's um, we have learned so much this weekend. Um, and we're just going to continue to learn and take in all the data and come to Monza much stronger. Yeah, run your own race effectively. Thanks very much, Richard. Thank you. While we were hearing from Richard Westbrook about the travails of the rear end of this car, there has been a change in the lead battle for GTE Pro. And of course, as James Collado got by Neil Jarney, so Porsche clearly playing at tyre preservation as well. And the uh, Jota Sport car of Roberto Gonzalez now being chased by Norman Nato for real team. Stewards will look at that attempted pass from the uh, car behind him, which was Dragon Speed's Ben Hanley. Hanley did get through in the end, but only after tagging the car into a spin. Yeah, it did, nearly did uh, uh, block the track for the race leader, didn't it? Uh, that uh, that uh, pass came just before we had four wide down the main straight yes. uh, with both the GT Pro leading cars. But Collado pulling away now, and now Collado has got Miro Kanopka between him and the Porsche. And in the uh, fast bubbling melting pot that is GTE Am, by the way, Tomonobo Fuji in the green D station racing Aston Martin having come from sort of the middle and to the back of the field to the front, went back and is now back at the front. So D station lead Aston Martin. A of course is 54 with gentleman driver Thomas Floor at the wheel in second place. Paul Dallalana in the 98 Northwest Aston is in third, ahead of Chetelar's Giorgio Senagiotto. So we didn't document that. He took over from Roberto Lacourt, the starting driver. So Senagiotto is their bronze rated driver. He's in the wheel, at the wheel at the moment, ahead of Andrew, uh, Scott Andrews rather for uh, Kessel Racing. They lie in fifth and Ben Keating is in sixth position. I'm not sure that Ben Keating has served that 10-second penalty, so that may yet come in. But he's ahead of Ricardo Pera in the Project 156 car. And Rahel Frey took over the Iron Dames car that we saw from onboard in traffic just a while ago. Meanwhile, going by Senna Giotto is the Jota Sport car of Roberto Gonzalez and Norman Nato in the blue machine now cutting past the Ferrari. Has lost a little bit of ground, but trying to close in as they go past the Northwest AMR car that is Paul Dallalana's third place AM machine. So you can see third and fourth in the background. The uh, Senna Giotto driven Cetilla Ferrari is fourth. Not much between them, even less between these two cars. And there's the Brains Trust at Jota Sport running their two cars, which unfortunately came together on lap one and are now down in seventh and ninth place. Sean Galeal taking over the 28. And a lot of flapping bodywork at uh, the back of the second LMP2 car that you're looking at there, uh, which is uh, the real team racing car. It looks like Norman Nato has got, uh, certainly at the pit stop, they'll have to do something about it. However, in the Porsche pit, then they're talking about the delicacies of how you get onto the throttle there, trying to conserve what it sounds like, those tires. You need to be gentle on them. That's Kevin Estra trying to brief Michael Christensen, the new boy in the team this year. And of course, he was the man who was in that car last year. But 51, Alessandro Pierguidi, James Calado, former world champions, leading the class at the moment. And that uh, was a replay of the, re the, the pass for the lead which uh, came as they came out of turn 14 down towards the final turn. 
couple of three laps ago now. Paul Dallalana with Giorgio Sanagiotto right behind him now. And again, the Ferrari seems to bring in its tyres a little slower in the stint than the Aston Martin. But, Alan, you want to be ahead at the end because the last stint will be the end of the race. So if you're coming in a little later, maybe that's not such a bad issue if you can keep that pace advantage over Aston longer on, on in the race. Uh, certainly, that's where the points are. It's when the chequered flag drops, and before that, then it's just all hot air. And, uh, <laughs> and I think that's for just some, us. The hot air actually is too much into the rear tyres, as we saw. We mentioned about the Glickenhaus earlier on, and uh, we heard uh, Westbrook talking about how they are trying to do things, looking at uh, the, the Ryan Briscoe, and his average at this moment is about a second a lap faster than what Westbrook was able to do in the first in. So clearly they have improved with the rear tyre pressure adjustment however is it going to still be enough to be able to make it all the way to the instant as it looks like the ferrari's just slid nice and gently down the inside and taken away the position now so it's a settle our racing ferrari up to third aston martin down to fourth it's been engaging stuff for gtm from the very beginning let's look at this again that is quite a nice easy maneuver in reality it's very gentlemanly Yep, you set it up early enough. The guy on the inside has two options, let you go or have a crash. That is silver, the outside, rather. silver driver Sonegiotto against bronze Paul Delalana. Augusto Farfus, last in the World Endurance Championship in uh, LMP2, and before that as a factory BMW driver in the uh, 8 Series. So he BM8. makes his uh, reappearance. He'll be driving that Northwest AMR machine as well. BMW, of course, latest make to confirm. They're coming with an LMGH come up initially for the IMSA with the Tech Sports Car Championship. But I am hearing there is potential for at least a semi works effort in the WEC as well. Yeah, it'd be good to see that. More manufacturers is more fun. Alex Brundle just putting his fastest lap of the race so far in there in the inter Europol competition car. It's in fourth place in LMP2. And uh, looking at this, this gap has actually dropped out. Nicolas Lapierre has pushed the gap out to now 12 seconds. The last couple of laps, he's been about six, seven tenths of a second quicker than Boemi. Now, Boemi is in a little bit of traffic and uh, Lapierre's had a little bit of a cleaner run, but Lapierre consistently, after the pit stop, has been able to extend his gap. He has to keep doing this because they will have, if it runs green all the way through, an extra shop in comparison to the Indeed. Toyota. Yeah. Mark of the seriousness, by the way, of this, uh, this Alpine Elfmet boot program is the fact that uh, this week, the team have taken delivery of a brand new chassis. Uh, not an X Rebellion car, brand new chassis to that same design, which is their, supposed to be their Le Mans race car. So they've now got two chassis available. It will not be, as far as I'm aware, and as far as the team would confirm, at any point we're going to get a second car entered anywhere. But, uh, let's have a listen to Sebastian Birimi. Okay, sir, how is the general balance? General balance comment, please. The Daniel car, I'm still getting much more than just yesterday. Copy. Oh, oh. That's a, a rarity. Normally it's calm, Seb, calm. The tyres are totally transformed after yesterday, so everything uh, ticking all the right boxes for Sebastian Buemi at the moment. And key, Alan, is not necessarily what the gap is to the number 36 at the top of the pile. Really key, I think, for Buemi and his teammates is where they are in relation to the second place car in the championship, which is the other Toyota hypercar number seven. Yeah, but let's come back to the points at the end of this race. Because this is points and a half, if they can win and their sister car is third, then it's a huge delta in points yep. and it will swing the championship. So therefore, I think they're very much focused on the 36 car with a little bit of a watching brief over the seven. They can understand and control the seven. They can't understand and control the 36. <laughs> Or maybe they can understand it. <laughs> they can't, yeah, they can't necessarily control it. Now they're catching the battle. This is Bytska Vissa in the red car. And uh, who was behind, uh, who's behind her? That's the high class car trying to get by, isn't it? I think trying to put a lap on the uh, Richard Mill Racing Team number one machine. 
Hightos currently being driven by Anders Fjordback, who started the race. He's had an enterprising first couple of stints as well. And that he remains in fifth place in LMP2. Down the inside comes Sebastian Buemi. Anders was, uh, it looked quite out of his regular pace in that first stint. Oh, Buemi's gone a little, sorry, apologies there. Buemi went a little bit wide there, got a little bit out of line, had to sort of get out the throttle and then sort of wait as he sorted out as the car fishtailed. Managed to get it sorted out and on his way again, though. Very easy as you fire up the left hand steep hill out of that hairpin. 88 back out. And that is uh, Dominic Bastien. Now they have. They're off, they're, they're, they're off sequence, weren't yep. they? As was yep. this car with the puncture earlier in the race. Yep. So, uh, of course, as Thomas Floor now takes the lead of GTE Am. And here are the two Jota Sport cars. Sam Hignett hopefully lying down in a darkened room somewhere and not watching this. As 28 and 38 are nose to tail. Roberto Gonzalez with Sean Galeal behind him. Galeal with that bright yellow nose on the car. Let's hear from Gonzalez and the 38 crew. Yes, should we I do? Fastest, fastest. Okay, Sean Galel, the Asian Le Mans Series champion. Galel is faster Ooh. than you. Oh, yeah, that's a bit yeah. squeezy, squeezy. Uh, who did take over from Mike Wenright? It was Ben Barker, as we guessed it probably would be in that uh, black GR car. second uh, set of pit stops for the LMP2s very soon. Uh, they've done 28 laps, so basically got one more lap before they'll be starting to pop into the pits. And then after that, very soon, we should also have Nicolas Lapierre, who's leading this race on the double stint as well. Now, this is going to trigger our LMP2 next round of pit stops. Richard Mill Racing Team was the first car in. Bites Kavissa is out. And uh, Rahel Freno... That's not easy, is that? That's Tatiana not Rahel, Calder. that's Tatiana Calderon. That's Tatiana Calderon gets in. So, uh, yeah, Rahel Fry in the uh, Iron Lynx, Iron Dames car. Tatiana Calderon sharing with Sophia Flush and uh, Baiskovica, the uh, Dutch girl doing the first two stints. So we now have both, or all of our Colombian drivers. Yes. Uh, well, I, I would imagine Montoya might be about would you put in? Uh, would you put in Henrik Hedman it's at the speed? You'd, you'd think it would be Henrik Hedman next yeah. in. Yeah. So WRT into the pits and third United Autosport. There WRT second in LMP2 driver change. Robin Frins is going to be jumping out of that car. I'm guessing that's Ferdinand Habsburg. Yes, I from think the, uh, the size of it. Lack. <laughs> yes, exactly. It's the big F on the helmet that gave him away. I, I think it's the fact that clearly he had his feet in grow bags every night <laughs> when he was sleeping. Uh, driver change at United as well. So yeah, that, that means Geda van der Gaard stays out another lap, and that's really good news. They're quick in the pits, and they appear to be parsimonious with the fuel as well at Racing Team Netherlands. Remember, uh, they, Dragon. though, are a Pro-Am entry. Dragon Speed in. Yeah. Racing Team Netherlands Pro-Am, and so a high class and real team. Pro-Am cars now one, two, three. And a change. Sean Galeo has breezed by Roberto Gonzalez. We didn't see it, but I imagine that might have been uh, engineered on the front straight. Oh, very slow roll away. They didn't want an unsafe release at United. Yeah, I WRT think they, are on their way as well. The, the engine seemed to be a struggling to start, certainly WRT at the first stop and United at that stop. But we are going to have Toyota coming to the pits in a little while. But under fight, actually, because the 7 is quicker, Maria. Cover with me, seconds and seconds. Yeah, yeah so we are working it, we are working it. It's a long race. Sebastian Buemi's got a problem, he's losing seconds and seconds, but that gap to his sister car, you look behind, was six or seven seconds only three laps ago. Now it's down to under two seconds, as Buemi can't get past these LMP2 cars either, and that is also creating some problems. And that was a much more Sebastian Buemi race message, wasn't it? Now, look again, the number one car, had just been passed by High Class when they were out on track. It's now back in front of the High Class car. Leader is in, driver change, and Andre Negrau will take over from Nico Lapierre. 
radio. Remember, they had the problem with the radio, and so they'll also try to look at the radio plug to see if there's something they can do with that at this stop. Yep. It was hand signals during the second stint as well. So, leader in, and the leader from LMP2 in as well. Real Team Racing take the lead. Yep. So, Racing Team Medlin, we get a van der Gaard. High class are in with Anders Fjord back, and I think he will hand over the car as well, having double stinted. Jose Maria Lopez now can smell Sebastian Buemi's panic almost, I think, closing right in, and that's... Well, this happened at Spa, didn't it? Number eight had an early problem. Number seven looked like they were going to win the race for most of it, and then the tables were turned. Out comes the Alpine. And it is back down to third with Andre Negrau at the wheel. So they stop after 58 laps completed. 59, 59 laps completed for them. Jose Maria Lopez, second overall. In reality, third, but uh, with when the pit stops do play out in maybe seven or eight laps time, then uh, they will be back down into that second and third place. However, his eyes are fully fixed on the back of the car ahead of him, which is Sebastian Buemi, who's been released from that traffic now and is a little bit more up to speed. I um, mean, in fact, on the last lap, a little bit quicker than Jose Maria Lopez. Meanwhile, in LMP2, wholesale driver changes. Real team yet to stop Norman Nato still lead. Sean Galeal in second ahead of Roberto Gonzalez. They'll be the top two ahead of Fritz van Aerd in 29 as he leaves the pits. Ferdy Habsburg takes over in WRT 31. Wayne Boyd makes his world championship debut in the 22 United car. It's okay, it's okay. I have the radio, I have the radio, clear and load. Let's go for our separate <laughs> OK, perfect. Let's go. Bingo, stingo. They have communication. Philippe Signot there with his... Uh... Uh, Grey hair looking at the monitors, that will be very good news for the team. Ship to shore has been re-established. Yeah, but you've then got to ask, right, OK, why? Check the helmet straight away of uh, Nicolas Lapierre, because uh, if there's nothing that's really changed in the car, it can only be one thing, that's the helmet, and so therefore switch to the spare helmet or alternatively switch radio system. Yeah, uh, Louis saying they are, in fact, checking the helmet, and they'll plug it into the system in the pits. If he can hear them in the pits, then he should be able to hear in the car as well. Yeah, or give it to MRTC, who are the company that do it, and ask yeah. them, get the professionals to do it. Never a bad idea with electricery. Who else has changed? Louis Delatraz has taken over from Alex Brundle in the Inter-Europol competition car, so that's his uh, first laps today. Norman Nato in the pits for real team, which puts us Jota 1-2, and fourth and fifth overall. And finally, Lopez squeezes by the high-class car. Dennis Anderson at the wheel of the high-class car. Not sure who's going to take over from Norman Nato. Henry Hedman is, an, is in at Dragon Speed, so we'll make quite decent team managers yet. Tatiana Calderon, we saw in at Richard Meal. Miro Konopka still in the ARC Bratislava car. Having done no laps at Spa, he's obviously going to do all of them here. Um, <laughs> And uh, those are the yeah, wholesale changes. Everybody has changed. Into the pit, though, both unexpectedly Jotas. coming both Jotas. No. Is that late for them or very, very early? Alan McNish would answer, but he's halfway no, no, this down This is the their Kit second Kat, stop. They're, they're just, they've just stretched it a little. They but, have uh, stretched it a, a little, a lot. The only yeah. car yet to stop is, uh, well, real team is in, and Esteban Garcia takes over. So it's gentlemen drivers a go-go now in LMP2. They were at least one lap later in the first stint, so it looks like they can get an extra lap out of the fuel. So for them, they're thinking strategically end of the race as opposed to performance at the beginning of the race. Rahel Frey, who's taken over in the 85, uh, 86 Iron Lynx Ferrari, the Iron Dames car, has already been warned for abusing track limits. It's run out, and Mick Hedman, I think it was, on track together, a uh, lap apart. Line of GTM traffic in the way of the, the Toyotas here. And this is an all-Ferrari lead battle. Ferrari didn't quite have the qualifying pace that they'd hoped for, so this is Thomas Floor. 54 with the new door after he got clattered after uh, in right. free practice and Giorgio Senna Giotto in the Cetilar racing car a 
again, I said it yesterday, I'll say it again, I love a blue Ferrari. I know, you know, red is everybody's favourite, Rosso Corsa and all that, but I love a Ferrari in blue. I'm just odd. Yeah, I know uh, Giuseppe Risi fundamentally disagrees with you. <laughs> I know. Uh, but he uh, likes everything in Rosso. I was going to mention another Ferrari. I'm not sure we've noted it, but back into the race has come the 83 car. Alessio Good. Rivera is at the wheel of that car, but spent 14 minutes in the garage, one four minutes in the garage. So they are laps down. Seven laps that's... behind their, the last of the sort of relatively reliable running cars, yeah. which is uh, Christian Reed. Marco Seafried taking over the 88 Dempsey Proton car. Christian Reed still in 77 after both those cars had issues. And as you say, Alessio Rivera, the last car on the road, the 83 Ferrari. Which in remember. Lucky number 13, Chiva change, a lead change rather, as Giorgio Senna Giotto dives up the inside of Thomas Floor without any contact. Please note there, Antonio Felix da Costa, these things are possible. And here comes the pro Ferrari around the outside. Is that the 51 car of James Collado? I think it was. Collado now. 18 seconds ahead of the second place car in GT Pro, that's Neil Charney. But let's hear now from Nico Lapierre with Louise Beckett. First of all, Nico Lapierre, can you hear me? Yeah, I do. And yeah. I hear you, which no. is brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, tell us about that. I mean, that must have been hard work for you. Yeah, it was. I mean, um, we had a good start and we stayed in front of the Toyota, which was the first target. And then uh, we were pushing as much as we could. We know we have to open this gap to do the, the, the extra stop because they are much, much longer than us on fuel. So it will be at least one more stop. We know we have to open the gap and I was trying to do that as much as possible. As you know, we had a radio problem in the middle of my first hint. Uh, they could not hear me anymore, so it was not so comfortable. But in the end, we made it and we're going to fix it for the next hint. So the team brought you in looked at the helmets and they now know what the issue was do they yeah i think there is a problem with the microphone so try to fix it at the stop but it was not working so we're going to change the helmet and have a new one for the next thing i mean for you it, it didn't seem to be that big a problem because of your drive but how what issue does that cause a driver i mean we had a puncture alarm and i was a bit uh, lost and uh, it was it was not comfortable uh, let's say it was not a big issue but uh, it's much more comfortable when you have the radio, also in terms of fuel usage and everything. But in the end, we managed it good with the team. We had the onboard camera, so they could check everything, and it went fine. But I will happy to, I will be happy to find my radio again <laughs> next week. <laughs> I'm sure. Thanks very much. Thank you. I did wonder whether or not there might be a part of this, which might have been a bit of Kimi Raikkonen moment. Leave me alone. I know what I'm doing with no radio, but uh, apparently not. He's going to be happy to hear from the Cinetec Alpine crew. It's been a very good race for the team so far. Uh, we're just closing in now on the pit stop window for the Toyotas. They're lapping just 1.6 seconds apart and a minute and three seconds ahead uh, from the, the seven car. Sorry, the seven car is ahead of the Alpine by a minute and three seconds with that pit stop to balance yeah. back out. And, uh, and the Toyotas are only a second and a half apart, so they're very, very close together. So the deal is that the car of Andre Negrao, the Alpine, is one minute five seconds behind the leader, and the two Toyotas spent a minute and seven in the pit lane. So it should come out in front by inches. Yeah, it should. Uh, uh, Louise pointed out for the pits, I don't think we've noted it. That pit stop saw Anthony Davidson, uh, another driver change there for the 38. So they've single stinted their drivers. There is going to be a drive-through penalty for the Dragon Speed car. That is for the contact with the 38. That was where um, Roberto Gonzalez was turned around by Ben Hanley. So it's about 28 seconds through pit lane. And also a report to the stewards uh, on the 21 for not respecting blue flags. So not a great couple of minutes for the Dragon Speed here. That's the... Yeah, this was very honestly, it was... It left front to right rear, it wasn't quite far enough alongside. I think he was actually trying to get out of it yeah. and not quite able to do it. Not sure it was an intentional sort of dive down the inside, it was more of a case of trying to move out. But anyway, whichever way it's a drive through penalty, it's a 28 second loss, 30 second loss um, to do that. And also now being reported to the stewards, as you said, for not respecting blue flags, not being a good five minutes for Dragon Speed. It hasn't, and they're not, uh, they're not. 
a, a great position in the race overall at this point either. 13th overall, 9th in the LMP2 class. It's not been their best afternoon. Yeah, they are going pretty slowly around the outside, actually. It's Henrik Hedman, I think, just keeping out of the way. Being lapped by the second and third place cars in LMP2. Race led now by Ferdinand Habsburg in the Team WRT car. Wayne Boyd is running second, and this is the change. There is Wayne Boyd, yeah, going through. Henry Hedman has just been told off for not observing blue flags. Yep. That's why he stayed out of the way of the battle for second uh, place quite in right. LMP2. Yeah. So Wayne Boyd up into second position in LMP2. The gap to Habsburg ahead, under 10 seconds. We'll keep an eye on that one with Fritz van Erd, car that led the race convincingly. Is this uh, a third, too? it is, yeah. GR racing there with a stop. And TF Sport also at Ben Keating on pit road as well. So Kessel, Project One, with the LMP2 leaders right behind them. Halfway through a sandwich. Uh, ben Keating also had a drive through from using track limits. Yep. So that's why he was in the pits and has gone again. So Ferdy Habsburg looking for a way through the traffic, finds it neat and, in a neat and tidy fashion. So wide moment there for the Interiorpol car. And, uh, that is Louis Delatraz now aboard that car. Second generation racer, fourth place overall last year at Le Mans with Rebellion. And guesting here for Interiorpol with Renga van der Zander busy on the other side of the Atlantic this weekend. That's a change, 56 and... Kessel car. It's a bit of a clear yes. track now ahead for the well, for the 31, sorry, 36, the Alpine. There's a bit of a defence going on there. Ferrari, Porsche, Matty again. That was a change for fourth position in uh, in GTM. Yeah, Ricardo Perra just squeezing through and almost overcooking it into turn. Well, overcooking it into turn, almost giving it away. You know, some days you think, yeah, maybe I should have stayed in bed. 88 Dempsey Proton Ferrari with all their early issues. They are eight laps, nine laps now behind the field. Marco Siegfried has just been, uh, or the team has just been told that Carl and Marco Siegfried is currently driving, will be investigated for his pit stop. I say, Martin, you're not exactly Mr. Motivator for the team, <laughs> suggesting <laughs> you should have stayed in bed. It's well, new sporting director uh, looms for Haven. It's going to be a, a, an interesting race if they can ma make up 14 laps before the end of it. I don't care how many hours are left. You'd be struggling to make up 14 laps in a P1 car in six hours, as the one has shown us over the years. Sean Galeo ahead of Dennis Anderson, that chrome red and white high-class entry. Kind of loosely the Danish colours. I'm not sure chrome red is particularly the flag of Denmark, but... It's the 21st century version of it, I think. Sending it down the inside of... It is still Ben Barker in a GR racing car, so what if they had a slightly out-of-kilter pit stop there? Right behind the number one car, ARC Bratislava. Is this a driver change? Are they finally going to figure out how to get the super-glued hands of Miro Konopka off the wheel of the car? You're not allowed to drive more than four hours in any six. And that is a driver change. So Mira Konopka completes his first World Endurance Championship driving stint without major drama. Good news for him and this team that he has nurtured for so many years in so many different championships. You can see from that, uh, Mira's been working out in the off-season. They work, they, they race in so many different series. This, this team does the Krebetic 24-hour series, it races in... Asia Le Mans. Uh, Asia Le Mans, it races in all sorts of European racing, V to V and, and uh, the ESET V4 Cup and so on. And here they are in the World Championship as well. A little outbreaking there for the D-Station Aston, Satoshi Hoshino loses a spot. Also races, by the way, in domestic MX-5 Mazda Racing, and one of the drivers is the team manager here, Michaela. Master Konopka. Master Konopka. Another offspring of Mira Konopka. They're great fun, the Slovakian squad. They yeah. take their racing very seriously. They don't take themselves overly seriously. Well, it's I, good I to think, be about them in the paddock. I think kind of, you know, arch enthusiast from a, from a very different background to somebody like Jim Glickenhaus, but with that same burning Absolutely. passion. Absolutely. Yeah. Here's our lead battle still. 
Less than two seconds between Jose Maria Lopez chasing and Sebastian Buemi leading Alan McNish. Looking at it, Andre Negrao, who's in third place in uh, the Alpine, he's going to have to get a little bit of a move on because he's slower than these two at the moment since uh, the changeover from Nicola Lapierre at pit stop. And uh, right now he's about seven tenths a lap slower than these two. And the Toyotas are only going to get quicker as the fuel load drops off at the end of this second stint. And it's on exactly the point now whether it would be a Toyota came out in the lead or the Alpine would actually take the lead. Absolutely spot on. Uh, he has had a bit of traffic the last couple of laps, so he's got a heck of a lot of traffic the next few laps as well, Nicaragua. Uh, 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 so I think he's going to struggle to up the, up the ante here. We've got about maybe five laps before the Toyotas come in. Or are we going to see Toyota driver changes or are they going to stay in? should see Toyota driver changes because I've done a double. Both uh, Lopez and uh, Boemi have been in from the start of this race, so I'd expect to see driver changes as well. But I don't think the driver changes is going to be the limiting time factor. So but that might mean tyre changes as well, and that might make it a longer stop than they've previously done. So it, it, it's going to be squeaky bum time for Alpine, though. At this point, though, it is going to be with the, the deltas on average laps, it's going to be right on the bubble. A couple of points when you watch the super slow-mo of the number eight car. The GTE Pro battle, they of course, is James Collado pulling away from Neil Yarny. He's 18 and a half seconds up. Now, in comes the number 91 car. Jimmy Bruni. This is... Remember, he pitted early he because he had uh, some issues with vibrations and things on his first set of tyres. Well, there's a clue here. This is about 58 minutes on the stint, and it is going to put him unless we get a caution out of his fuel window, isn't it, at the end, of this, uh, at the end of this race. It's 34 laps in total on this particular stint. So it was seven hours and eight minutes to go when he pitted last time. It's six hours and ten minutes to go now. With the second, and it's a driver change. Yeah, 37, 38 laps for GTE normally. And so therefore, I think what they've done is tried to look at this in a strategic option because they were behind and then split it more equally through the course of the rest of the race. They weren't going to catch that gap up, and they've got Estra at the front fighting for the lead of the race anyway on, on sort of different performance level, and I think Porsche have uh, changed their strategy on this Jimmy Bruni car. Yeah, no driver assistant there as they adjust the steering column to suit. Yeah, it used to be in 911s that you move the seat forwards and backwards. Now the seat is fixed and the rest of the car moves forwards and backwards. Fred Mako takes the 91 car out. That was changed for safety reasons, but the seat in the, in the case of an incident is actually a fixed item. And uh, ultimately, I think a better way to do it. Absolutely. It came in that same range of changes that includes the roof hatch on the GTE cars, which is for extrication of emergencies. Five LMP2 cars all diving in for the same at bit of tarmac, and this is a battle for position, I think. Number 20 high class, Dennis Anderson with Anthony Davidson in the Jota Sport car, not able to squeeze through, but they come up behind the ARC Bratislava car of Thomas Jackson. Get by the Ligier, and here's Ant Davidson's view. Undoubtedly, super high pro driver versus Dennis Anderson, the uh, less experienced of the two. But again, gets the break in traffic going by the Iron Dames car, Rahel Frey. Rahel is sixth in GTE Am. Matteo Grassoni in the 60 Iron Lynx car that was the last car on the grid is actually giving chase seventh in that category. There will be driver change, by the way, for Tota. Uh, it'll be Mike Conway, Brendan Hartley, taking the wheel of the two leading cars. This is uh, 34 now. This is... Louis Delatraz. Yeah, and and he's, that's a change for the lead. No, it's a change for fourth. For, for oh, bigger part, yes, for third. For, uh, yeah. Prince Renaud, the bronze-rated drivers drop back a little. Yeah, Louis Delatraz normally drives for WRT, uh, which is leading this race with Ferdinand Habsburg, but in the European Le Mans series. And so making a bit of a switch from uh, Formula 2, as he was uh, one of the leading contenders in that category across the sports car racing. Very much a young driver with his eyes on the hypercar class, though. This is a little bit of an apprenticeship just to show what he can do in performance, hence the reason jumping into anything that he can get his backside into just to say, hey, look at me. 
Yeah, and indeed won the first two races in the European Le Mans series. Looking to get a hat trick last time out, didn't quite come off for WRT. Penalty at the end of the race dropped them even further back down the order, but uh, that battle's a light in the European Championship. The one here in the WC. Oh, oh, that's not going to work there. Henrik Hedman with a P2 car in each mirror of his Dragon Speed car. And again, Anthony Davidson on the dirt as the gap around the outside closed. Uh, WRT's car number 31 being reported to the stewards oh, for speeding in the pit lane. That's now, the leader. That's I don't the know leader. whether that was coming in with Robin Freens or going out with Ferdy Habsburg, but either way, the race leader in LMP2 has a party oh! coming and contact. That's the Glickenhaus and both. At 77 the... and 88. No, 77 no, so and triple, triple seven. seven. All the sevens, definitely. So what happened there? Bit of rubbing on the side right rear wheel as now Ryan Briscoe is trying to get things moving. Now, this is what happened in FP2. The car down at the hairpin selected false neutrals and would not go any further. Is that the end of the rows for the Glickenhaus? Could be a full course yellow safety car. And you see the Glickenhaus just going down the inside. Oh, oh. no. I have to say that was Ryan's fault. He's yeah. just moved in to get position. The Aston Martin wasn't, uh, he hadn't cleared it completely. And let's go to the team radio and Ryan Briscoe. Oh, guys, we've lost our own. I'm in first gear, but it won't go. Yeah, that uh, radio message is actually after the incident when he wanted to go down into first gear, but the incident with itself was caused by something else. It was just not quite clearing the Aston Martin, who was also positioning himself to overtake the uh, the 77. However, he has now got drive and is on his way back. And I looked a little bit slow, and I presume for a pit stop because, again, as we said earlier on, this car was actually looking at uh, making it to the end of the race as opposed to necessarily the fastest. With a bit of vibration on the right hand side, which also hit. Here's Briscoe's radio. Now, uh, fit this lap, the clutch is slipping. Um, yeah, probably damage as well. Yeah, being very cautious, bring it back as slowly as you think is reasonable. Uh, there may be a penalty to serve. Did you see, by the way, in that replay, how lucky did 22 get driver change here? Mike Conway taking over number seven. They've stopped first, ahead of number eight again. Yep. Number 22, United Autosports, which is possibly going to take the lead in LMP2, nearly got hit by both Porsches there. Okay, André, all is green for us, all is green. I confirm, full attack, full attack. All is green for us. Stop it, guys. We go straight to you. Turn 8 in second gear is better. Turn 8 in second gear is better. Stop it, guys. Stop it, guys. A little bit of information as now he comes down the start and finish straight. He's picked up the pace a little bit, uh, Andre Negrau, and the Toyota just coming out of the pits. Gets a new set of tyres for that Toyota as well. Louise Beckett just confirming from the pit lane. Yeah, as the uh, Alpine was in the braking zone, you saw the number seven car pull out. The, the Dolly's going under the 709 car. Well, it has to. If it's got a slipping clutch, then they have yeah. to take it back in to check to see where that is. And the thing is, if he's been trying to get away and it's been in first gear and not moving, then uh, chances are that it's also overheated then. Yeah. So we saw the engine uh, and gearbox system coming apart. And Just watch, bottles, watch 22 and here. Yeah. Now, a big lockup for Wayne Boyd, but oh, how did that miss him? How did that miss him? Very unfortunate for all of those cars. So the wheel is straight, um, tyres need to be changed. But the clutch is slipping, so there's a problem with the clutch. Yeah, those off. You can have any amount of people in the garage, but there's a limited nut to four in the pit lane itself as the Toyota is in the lead there. You can see the 36 coming two corners from the end of the, end of the lap there, Graham. Yeah, indeed. So Andre Negrau is now trying to make up the ground. And where is McGraw coming down through turn 15 now as they go to work with the tyres? Driver door not open, no driver change there. Buemi staying in. Drive through penalty for 21. Oh, was released. This is going to be the lead. Oh, where it's is just it? tyres, no driver change. And he's through. He's through. There's the number seven car, is it behind? No, that was, oh, the, no. No, that was WRT. No, WRT, OK. So the Alpine retains the lead. 
Yeah, but the gap's significantly less than it was. It's down to five seconds. Remember, it was over 12 seconds when Nicolas Lapierre pitted at the end of his second stop. It's now down to six seconds as actually Brendan Hartley has just popped out of the pit lane. And that includes, by the way, five seconds quicker in the pits than the Alpine last time. Wow. So they've lost more than that gap, if you see what I mean. They gained some back in the pit lane. Jim Glickenhouse watching on. He's used to this. You don't get through a Nürburgring 24 hour without having to fix your car at some stage. So this is standard stuff for him. This is a new team, though, of engineers. They're taking off the rear ends. They obviously feel there's a little bit more work to be done. And yeah, the car certainly... It's not easy access if they have to take off the tail to take off the engine cover. to know that inspecting in through the back. Yeah. So it looked to me, that, that replay, he had a bit of a bobble, didn't he, coming down the hill as he started to get into the braking zone. That took his trajectories. We've got another yellow flags out at turn three. Um, took his trajectory onto collision course, the sideways impact, and then all those three cars turning around. And quite right, it was the how close, the 22 car. 77 has been in and out of the pits. Is that it? No, that's 88, isn't it? Jackson Evans has taken over the 77 car, 88 looping Marco around Seafried. with Marco yep. Seafried at the wheel. So again, those two cars are the tail end of the field. And here's the battle between more yellow cars. Paul Dallalana ahead of Scott Andrews in the Kessel Racing car guy livery car. There really has been drama galore in GTM. What I'm really thinking now is that if I'm sitting down trying to uh, boil this down from eight hours into a one-hour highlights program, what do you cut? You know, we're only, we're only two hours in now exactly, and we've already got enough for a, for a one-hour program. There's another six hours of this lunacy still to come. Two hours in, six hours still to go. And up the inside, Scott Andrews defending very hard of that line, gets by Paul Dallalana, moves up into fourth place, right on the two-hour marks. That's a good move by Scott Andrews in that Kessel Racing Ferrari. Yeah, knows his stuff, has won uh, races in the European Le Mans Series for United Autosports and an MP3 uh, Scott, based in the US. Oh, big, big lock-up as he comes into the pits for the 98. That's going to be speeding in the pit lane. He definitely wasn't down to 60 k's as he flew through there. Here's the 34 into Europol car. He's currently in third place in LMP2 with Louis Delatraz. Let's hear from Alex Brundle with Louise Beckett. Alex Brundle, full of smiles under that mask, and so you should be. That was a great run from you. There were some great battles. High class, I've written in my notes, argy-bargy. So where do you start with that? Yeah, a little bit of argy-bargy in the early laps. We had a little bit of better pace than the high class, so I really had to try and make a move by early on, but got it done eventually and uh, carried on through what was a pretty decent stint, to be honest, for, for us. And uh, now Louis is doing a great job on track. It's important for you and the team to get that great run, but I mean, and also, shall I say, the colour of your car really stands out, so you can really see it fighting through all the traffic. Yeah, you, you can't miss us. Uh, we're, yeah, we're out, we're out there, and it actually really helps in the traffic. You know, the GTs can really see you coming, uh, but I actually quite like it. Quite like the colour scheme, and it's good to be seen out on track. How much of an issue is traffic? It's, uh, I kind of described it earlier on in the weekend, it's almost IMSA traffic, you know, out here this weekend. There are a lot of cars, it's the biggest wet grid ever, isn't it, here? So, yeah, a lot of cars out there, and uh, obviously apart from uh, 24 hours of Le Mans, but uh, yeah, a lot of cars out there and having to thread our way through, but it helps the old hands like us uh, get a little bit of an advantage. All right, thanks, Alex. Did yep. he say old hams? Uh, uh, I, 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 I very, very much think he probably, probably did. I think it's great to see a motorsport commentator making his uh, making his living as well as a race yeah. driver. It's good yeah. to see that. Uh, 709, Blicken House back out onto oh, track. Yeah. This was the issue. It's not going to get this no, time. No, that was the incident that put them into the pits. And there will, I'm sure there will be a penalty to serve for that. But again, for Jim Blicken House and the team, it's all about getting miles on the car. And Alan, it's not, being it's able not to fix speed, things. Though. Hold on a second. Yeah, it's not, watching it? replays here. The car's gone out of the pits, but it's not gone out of the pits at speed. 
And so therefore it's uh, being overtaken by quite a lot of other cars. So they're checking something. They thought there was possibly a clutch issue. That was reported by Ryan Briscoe. They came in, uh, they changed the nose. They also checked in at the back. There seems to have been something possibly on the hit. However, now that uh, he's coming back, I would suspect probably back to the pits once again. Triple seven in the pits, Satoshi Hoshino. He was the car that the Glickenhaus clipped to start. And then he, of course, was fired off into the back of 88 and 77. So the damage on that D station Aston will need to be checked. There it is. Yeah, that right. I think was the Q. most damage to the three. Uh, there was some rear damage, I think, to the Porsche. Yeah, but, uh, to both of them, I'm sure. But uh, D station back into the TF Sport. Aston Martin Garage, Tom Ferrier running that car, and the 33 car, which currently has Dylan Pereira at the wheel. Very inconsiderate, all that styling, and but that went into the design of that front car, the front of that car, and they bring it home like that. And I think we'll have another pit entry for the Glicken House as well as it comes towards the pit entry point. 88, the First, the car that was involved in that has just left the pits again. Two hours into the eight hours of Portimao and Alpine back in front in hypercar ahead of Toyota, who are second and third. Fourth overall is our LMP2 leader, Team WRT, with a potential penalty hanging over them ahead of United and into Europol Racing Team Netherlands, going strongly and leading the Pro-Am category. In the GT Pro class, the AF Corsa Ferrari now 22 seconds clear of its closest Porsche rival. And in GTE Am, Chetila lead a Ferrari 1-2 ahead of AF Corsa with Team Project 1, the best of the Porsches in third place ahead of the Kessel Racing Ferrari. So Ferrari coming on strong in both GT categories. And after one outlap following damage, 709, the Glickenhaus is back in the garage. Now. Doesn't look to be very fast action there. Um, you know, the, they had to take the tail off. Briscoe getting out by the looks of things. And so that could be either a very long stop or the end of the day for this particular vehicle. Yeah, well, I'm sure Louise Beckett will be down there to find out what's going on. Little uh, team engineering conflab going on there. You know, we've got six hours here. They, as Duncan Vincent in the background, also going to get the scoop. Uh, they have got a long time to fix this car, even if it needs a clutch. Yeah, as soon as, um, as, soon as I try to go full throttle, it just starts flipping, and I don't have drive. Yeah, their clutch issue then, as soon as you go throttle, you can get partial load onto it, but when it really needs a frictional bite, then it just spins up, and uh, then you, it's already overheated, so it does need a clutch change if it's going to go any further. They're clearly now planning how to do that best, but if they can do that and get the car back out, they could run for at least for another four hours and learn an awful lot about this car in race trim. They've already learned about tyre pressures and temperatures here and how to work with those. They had to do a clutch change and a gearbox actuator change yesterday after free practice. Got it done before FP3, got the car back out, so it's not like they don't know what to do with the car, but it's clearly not going to be panic stations. Get it fixed properly. Looking here at Racing Team Netherlands, that is Fritz van Aert in another one of our yellow cars. Yellow being the new black, clearly 92 is in from it was second place in GTE Pro, Neil Jarney. So it's now a Ferrari 1-2. James Collado ahead of Daniel Serra, 51 and 52. Porsche struggling on tyres. This had better be the result of a long-term plan to have lots of rubber left at the end of the race, Alan. Uh, James Collado took the lead. He was basically as a second quicker than Neil Yanni on average over that second stint. It was a massive, massive difference there. I'm sure Yanni at the end was just praying that that pit stop was going to come sooner and sooner. But uh, certainly it swung in Ferrari's favour at the moment, however. And you can see that rear tyre as well that came off the Porsche all blistered. Remember we heard about that from the Glickenhaus uh, saying about that, that yeah. tyre? It looks very similar there from the Porsche. Was that a full set or was that just left sides only? Kind of looked like left side it did, to me, it? but I would like to see it again. Maybe uh, well, there's a lot of action going on in the pit lane with the Glickenhaus and uh, the Aston Martin as well. So, <laughs> yeah, they're sure, sure we'll get to it at some point. 
So D Station are in and they've dropped behind both Dempsey Proton cars. Neil Charney in and out. He's still ahead of Fred Mako in the other factory Porsche. That had an out of sequence stop as well because of a tyre balance or imbalance will be the word. A warning flag for Matteo Cressoni for abusing track limits. That's the number 60 Iron Lynx Ferrari. In fact, Rahel Frey now putting in a big effort in the Iron Dames Ferrari. That's up to fourth place. Chetelar Ferrari first in AM. A, of course, a Ferrari second in AM. Kessel Racing Ferrari third in AM. Iron Dames Ferrari fourth in AM. And Ferrari 1 2 in GTE Pro as the second place to those. Daniel Serra stops and he steps out. As he steps out uh, by in pit lane to their store goes the GTM leader. Chesterland Racing also on pit road right now. So Ferrari looking very strong indeed. And there is the view of that Pipo Motor V8 in front, twin turbo V8 motor. And the transmission behind on the Glickenhaus. This is what a modern race car looks as you start to strip off the beautiful bodywork. Utilitarian. It's very robustly built, a big crash structure in the front there. WRT with the two Toyotas behind WRT 31 car. 30 Habsburg still leading in LMP2, but nothing between the Toyotas at all. Barely room for one to leapfrog a GTE AM car and the other one not to go straight through as well. Talia Conway's on a bit of a charge. We saw that with Lopez against Boemi at the end of the second stint. Hartley took up... Uh, the charge at the front, but it's Conway, I think that's the one that's going to be, I would say, overtaken. Though we still have got Alexander, uh, sorry, Andre Negro. He's eked it out a little bit. It's now eight seconds is a gap. It's not quite out as much as it was uh, prior to the pit stops, but he's starting to find his feet in that LP. He's got, he's got the pace, just not enough to offset that yeah. disadvantage. No, and, and they may need a little bit of help, but as we know in racing, sometimes helps co comes from the oddest quarters. The problem is there's only one of them and two Toyota Gazoo Racing GR010. So, it, it, you know, the odds are stacked in favour of Toyota. If they can run a clean game, maybe they won't be the fastest car out there, but being parsimonious on fuel, or having a big enough fuel tank, actually, which is what the issue really is. It's not the fuel consumption so much of the Alpine, it's the fact that it just can't carry enough fuel. Indeed, it's a uh, battle. Very close indeed. And, uh, change about to happen in LMP2, by the way, as we watch this, as the WRT car, that's the, uh, the LMP2 leader ahead. Yeah, but don't forget, they were following him at the beginning of the lap. Now, that's something you would never have seen with an LMP1 car, and that shows part of the problem for the hypercar drivers, is that on this track, the P2 car speed is pretty much on a pace with an LM, uh, with a, a hypercar. Well, certainly in the middle sector, the, the hypercar doesn't have the same boost acceleration that they had previously in the LMP1 either, so they can't dart between the corners quite as quickly as they could. And at the same time, we saw in uh, free practice, it was three or four laps of Toyotas were sitting behind LMP2 cars before they could get overtake, which was only at the end of the straight, Graham, where they've got a 10 or 11 kilometre an hour advantage. Obviously, when we go to Monza, that's a very different game with big, long straights. Yeah. But here, we've got 15 corners, and in Monza, we've only got six. Absolutely. Uh, 54 and 57, which were the two leading cars, uh, on that lap at least, in GTM, yep. follow the Chetelar car down pit lane. Uh, it is now the 83 car. Yep, the Iron Dames lead, Rahel Frey at sorry. the top of the pile. So the top three have come in, Chetelar, Air of Corsa and Kessel. Or uh, did Chetelar come in the previous yes, lap? They There's did. Kessel. Yes, they did. Yes. Yeah, so uh, Chetelar uh, gone back to Roberto Lacourt. So Lacourt started, Serna Giotto did the second stint, Lacourt back in for the third, which is an unusual way of was of skinning the cat. There was also a driver change there for Kessel. Didn't see who it was that got aboard. Scott Andrews got out the car. What's it? Is it Mikkel Jensen now? Could be. So we heard about a potential of a drive-through penalty for speeding in the pit lane for uh, 31 Team WRT leader in LMP2. However, now Habsburg's been reported to the stewards for not respecting blue flags as well. Now, is that when the Toyotas are sitting behind? Is he supposed to slow down to let them get by him? Or I not. It's not in the regulations. That yeah. you, to get it. It's not Formula One. It's a warning. It's 
and it, it's a warning that there's a quicker car coming up behind well if they're quicker surely they'd have gone by me yeah. by now you know I'd, yeah it, can't can't see that uh, that that's entirely fair just coming after these pit stops martin as we see another pit stop there um right hell fray the uh, am class leader in the iron links iron dames ferrari we are in a situation in this race where we've got a limited number of sets of tyres for all of the different categories. We have a situation where the, um, they have to protect them, they've got to look after them, but this is a tough circuit on them. And this race is going to be won or lost, I'm sure, in a couple of the categories, GT being one of them, GT Pro predominantly, by who can manage that tyre temperature, who can make their tyre last at the end of the stints. And uh, that's going to be the differentiating factor. Right, after a lap of following, the number eight car finally gets by 31, and that was probably a dive bomb under brakes into turn one. And now the number seven car. This is the second real uh, straight of any notifiable length down to the hairpin at turn five. Manages to get by underneath Ferdinand Habsburg, who continues on his merry way. He's been lapped now, so it's only the hypercars that are on the lead lap. Senior Tech Alpine 36 leading from eight and seven, the two Toyotas. Then the 31 WRT car ahead of 22 United Autosports that had a get out of jail card free in that big collision uh, with the Glickenhaus and two uh, Dempsey Proton cars. He's in third place, uh, second place ahead of 34 into Europol with Louis Delachaz at the wheel. So Ferdy Habsburg, Wayne Boyd and Louis Delachaz is your one, two, three of drivers in LMP2. And now they're struggling to get by the high class car. You know, you can't just expect everybody to roll over and get out of the way for Toyota because they happen to be Toyota. It's precisely what we said at the top of the race. It, traffic is going to be a much bigger issue in this era. It just is. Um, the stratification we got uh, means these cars are closer together than they ever have. The hypercar drivers do not have the, uh, the boost that they previously had in the LMP1 days. But, uh, Let's go and have a word down in pit lane now with Jim Glickenhaus to find out exactly what the prognosis is on the 709 hypercar. Jim Glickenhaus, we can see the 709 behind you. Uh, it's disappointment all around. Nobody wanted to see this. Yeah, no, it was fine. I mean, we went out on the first spin. Um, we had the tire pressure totally wrong. So we had big problems with the tires. We were slow. We came in, we changed them, we got the right pressures. The car was running much better, much faster. Um, our P max was really high, and we did it with 14. And then we had contact, and uh, I think the replay shows whose fault that was. And uh, unfortunately, in the contact, one of the cars stopped our, one of our wheels, our rear wheel, and it tried the clutch. So now we're in the box, we'll replace the clutch and go back out. Oh, good. So you will be looking to go back out. That's good tonight. Oh, yeah, we always go back out. I mean, you know, we're here to race and uh, we'll absolutely be back out. Um, you know, it was just one of those, one of those things, but um, no problem, we'll keep racing. How long do you think it will take until you can get back out? Um, I think about an hour. Thank you. As ever, upfront and honest about exactly what's going on. I think we know who was responsible for that. He said, well, you know, that's unfortunately what happens in racing. And Alan, battle for second and third place, number eight, Toyota. You said earlier on, Mike Conway on a charge. When is he never not on a charge? Mike Conway all over the back of the number eight car. Team Radio, I think, has been deployed there. Sebastian, Mike is quicker than you. Okay, we're going to swap positions, turn four, mate, turn four. Yep. Okay, well, that's... We've heard that many times before where yep. they have swapped positions, they don't want to, and they, I don't think they actually have got the luxury any longer of holding one or other up, because the gap to the leader is only 13 seconds, and for them to be able to make sure they've got a chance, never mind the double chance of being on the podium here, they've or certainly in terms of the victory, then uh, they've got to release Mike Conway because he is quicker at the moment, and then later on it may swing back in 
the favour of uh, the eight car with Brendan Hartley at the wheel. However, right now, Conway definitely has been able to catch up and has got a bit more performance. And the other thing on the, the balance sheet for the eight car, OK, you've lost a position now, but if Conway can engage the... Alpine and make it burn out its tyres or make a mistake, then both of you can benefit and then you can set about taking the place back from your teammate in the remaining five hours and 45 minutes. Well, certainly over the course of this stint so far, then Conway's been about three tenths of a second faster per lap, so 10 laps, three seconds. And uh, so if you look at it that way, then they can get themselves back into fighting for the position directly. And so independent of how it can affect the, the third place number eight car, the seven has definitely got to go for it. Now, what we heard from Nico Lapierre before the start of the race was that he believed the Toyotas would be quicker in sector one and sector two, so most of the twisty stuff. And it's really only the Cinetech, the Alpine, really only has the advantage in the final fast sector. If the Toyota can get in front and hold the Alpine up where it's got a speed advantage, then suddenly that brings the other car back into play as well. Very interesting, the Alpine just did the fastest final sector of the race so far on the previous lap. As the fuel weight is coming off, then it's getting much, much quicker, especially at those points, because it's a long, long right-hander, and uh, it's, uh, it's one that really does put a lot of energy into it, but that's where the Alpine is very quick. 10 second stop and go penalty has been awarded to 709. That's the Glickenhaus driven by Ryan Briscoe for making contact with first the D station Aston and then causing that multiple car pileup. Not a scratch on the back of the car that's just left the pits, number 22 United Autosports car of Wayne Boyd. But I don't know what he saw in the mirrors, Graham. What the team saw on replay would have given them uh, nightmares. Uh, yeah, that was bang on schedule, by the way, for Wayne Boyd. Indeed, here comes the leader. Now, this is again on schedule for WRT, but the potential is for one and possibly two penalties to come for the race leader into Europol. will take the lead here if they don't stop this time around. So Louis Delatraz, as I say it... Drive through for 31. It is, so that's yeah. the first of the process. So this is their which regular they, stop. Which they can't do now, so Indeed. they're going to have to do it separately. So it'll be out, back in, back out. And remember, still outstanding is the report of not obeying blue flags. Yep. So this could that. be a warning. That could be yeah, simply could well a be. warning as yeah. opposed to necessarily a penalty. However, this drive-through is 30-second time delta and something they didn't want at this stage of the game. Exactly right. So Louis Delatraz is in for into Europol. That bright yellow. It could almost be an Australian team, couldn't it? You know, if you paint a kangaroo on, green and gold, those are the Aussie colours. So that car in second place, and that cycles Jota through to the top because they've been running longer on fuel. There you go with the yellow nose, Sean Galeal, coming up to put a lap on the Richard Mill Racing Team car of Tatiana Calderon. She stopped a couple of laps ago. And Shami Lacey gets in at WRT. But uh, we'll drop in uh, at least third. I think yeah. Davidson will up into second place. A 28 from 38. WRT back out, but will need to come back in again for a drive-through. Now, how recently was it we heard from Tom Blomqvist, who started on pole in 28, got turned around by his own teammate in the first corner, and they were down in 10th or 11th place when Tom got out and talked to Louise. Here they are, back at the top of the pile. What a remarkable race it's been already, and we're less than two and a half hours in going to be their ability to execute both on pit lane and uh, on track. Sean Goodell having a good one here. He's six seconds or so ahead of Matt Davidson, 2014 world champion, remember, when a, uh, a uh, Toyota factory driver. The yes, there's a few Toyota factory drivers that are coming back to haunt them, aren't they? Nico Lapierre, Lapierre <laughs> would be another one. Yes, absolutely. There's the Jota Sport garage. And uh, Stoffel van Dorn there, just preparing himself. And nice, they're giving these young boys a chance, isn't it? Racing Team Netherlands are in. That was a full stint there by Fritz van Aert, 30 laps, uh, which was equal to what they did on the previous runs with Guido van der Garde. Fritz staying in. Dennis Anderson is in at high class as well. Job van Oetert has they did a driver in. change, so Job van Oetert yeah. has jumped into that car. So single stinting the gentleman drivers as well, and uh, that's probably not a bad idea on as physical a track as this. Lot of tyres coming off GT cars, looking very, very bullard. In is the race leader. So 
Andre Negrau at the end of his first stint in the Alpine. It brings the car down pit road. And the number seven Toyota and the number eight Toyota go by. They will be one, two again. So Van Oetert, Dennis Anderson stays in at high class. Louis Delatraz stays in at Inter Europol. So Jop Van Oetert in for Racing Team Netherlands. Racing Team Netherlands, high class and real team, the one, two, three in the Pro-Am class in LMP2. Two hours minimum remember, for the bronze drivers. That yep. is three stints across this eight-hour race. Oh, good point, yes. Good point, because they're doing roughly 40 minutes. That pretty much makes it two hours. And great high promotion shot of this Alpine. And it's Alpine French Blue. Came in from the lead, dropped behind the two Toyota Gazoo Racing GR 010s. There's Andre Negrau. Look how far ahead of where the car is. The eyes are having to look to deal with the speed here. Out of the turn three hairpin, firing it up the hill. Very steep here over the blind brow. Seen a big accident or two there in European Le Mans series races over the years when cars make contact. Then down to the hairpin. Uh, that would have been fuel only stop, I think, wasn't it, there for the yeah. Alpine? So a minute and three seconds on pit lane with a fuel only stop against a one minute and 20 for the two Toyotas, both identical times on pit lane. And of course, when, Toy also is stop. when Toyota stop in one minute seven, that's fuel only as well. So they are actually a little bit quicker in the pit lane. Yep. The refueling less, they've got physically less fuel going. But do they have to have their hose connected yes, for a do. lesser time no, or the same time? the same time? Okay, there you go. So although they're putting less fuel in, they still have to have the hose connected for as long. John, John, Pablo one at Pablo Montoya, <laughs> JPM I was going for and then changed my mind. JPM taking over from Henrik Hedman at Dragon Speed. So again, gentleman driver in and running through the cycle. Change, change, change with the stops. They had a penalty, we have to remember, for that incident in traffic, which uh, caused them to have a drive-through. Yep. And also they had uh, been warning, and it was going to the stewards for not obeying the blue flags, which is something that we've seen a few times around here, but not actually seen very much in the past. Well, let's hear from our race leader, Mike Conway. Hey Mike, just to let you know, the rear left tire of the previous tire set was quite worn out. So if there are some corners which are too open for the rear left, we can tighten those uh, corners for PC. Uh, saying the rear left was pretty worn out there, and that was uh, after analysis from uh, oh. the previous driver, as we see the... Very oh, slow, slow, Aston. This is the D-Station car. This has had a few problems. Satoshi Yoshino pulling yeah. off the track. Yeah, they had a radiator change, a front splitter change, and a bumper after an incident. I wonder if it's boiled. Could have done. Hot engine didn't look like it wanted to start there, did it? That was his outlap. Oh. This is the car that got tied up in that uh, trouble with the Glickenhaus. Yeah. Uh, did suffer damage. Yeah, the radiator being the biggest one that could have any incident like that. But it's stopped out on circuit. And it's at a point on the circuit as well where I'm sure the race director's looking at it and thinking, oh, could this be a full course yellow? Well, it's pulled off where there is yeah. a gap in the, the armco that the car can be recovered to a place of safety. And a right service, behind him there. Yeah, service vehicles can get up there. They're looking for a tow. Here comes the tow vehicle. Maybe the marshal's going to roll it backwards. This is the incident. Yeah. yeah, sorry, looking at it again, I don't think there was a bobble. I think it was just purely thought he was past him and not, and uh, that caused yeah. too much of a problem. <laughs> and look behind, the real team car on the inside, that dark blue LMP2 car, making sure he didn't get clattered by <laughs> the, the first of the Porsches as well. Looked to me like they, uh, uh, just ahead uh, of them, the United car was having a bit of a moment. That's done. That's it. The United car ahead of that was having a bit of a moment. Yep. TF Sport. It did, had a big locker. Race leader in in LMP2, followed by Ann Davidson and Charles Milesi. Milesi in the pit lane to do his drive through, so he won't stop. 38 and 28 do. 28 in front, 38 behind. Driver change in the mighty 38. As the 31 car rumbles by. 
Is that going to be enough for Wayne Boyd to take the lead? I think it might be. I think it has. Boyd is through, and indeed he's out the bits ahead of the 31. United Autosports lead the race so in LMP2. 38, that was Roberto Gonzalez getting back in, wasn't it? Because that wasn't Da Costa. So we went Antonio Felix Da Costa, Roberto Gonzalez, and then to and, and Davidson. And now we've gone back to Roberto. So Roberto clearly going in for his second of a minimum of three stints. Still double yellows up at the top of the hill at turn nine. We approach there now with the Aston Martin versus Kessel Racing battle. Augusto Farfas versus Scott Andrews. Struggling to get Shinasan to understand the instruction. Yeah, he doesn't want to give this up, but unfortunately he's going to need to. And once it goes behind that barrier, I think that might well be the end of their race. I think it is the fact that uh, the rest of the team are packing up the yeah. garage as we speak suggests that it's all over for one of the Aston Martins. Tough news for Andrew Watson, didn't get to drive it. Bobbling through goes the 22 United Auto Sports car. That's Wayne Boyd, our race leader in the World Endurance Championship. I'm just going to say that so they can clip it up. <laughs> well, there's dominant performance from them at Spa. And with, I don't mean it in the way this sounds, a somewhat makeshift <laughs> squad. Sorry, Richard Dean. Damned but, with uh, faint praise there. But <laughs> to, to turn that around to yep. this performance, pretty amazing. It's reasonably good parking. Charles Malaysi came through from the drive through into second place with WRT. Louis Della transfer into Europol lies third in LMP2, ahead of Stoffel Van Dorn and Roberto Gonzalez. So there was a driver change. Uh, Stoff stayed in, didn't he? He was in the. Oh, no, we saw him getting ready. So he's taken over 28. Um, so Toyota Gazoo Racing, Mike Conway and Brendan Hartley. Uh, and Brendan now doing that thing that every teammate does. Uh, Brendan, you need to let Mike through. He's quicker than you. Then hanging on his back bumper. As Mike <laughs> went by, he basically lobbed out a two-foot bit of elastic and is now attached to the back of the number seven car. And actually allowing Mike to open doors in traffic may not be a hindrance for Brendan Hartley either. Conway dies by the uh, 54 AF Corsa Ferrari. That's second in GTE Am, and that is currently driven by Giancarlo Fisichella. So you want to be careful when you're going by him. Anybody spotting that uh, the overtake was uh, done there in the incident zone for the 777? Double yellows have been withdrawn. The car now behind the barriers in place of safety, and that's achieved without a full course yellow. Well done, Marshalls. Last lap for Mike Conway, 1 minute 33 1. Behind him, Brendan Hartley, 1 minute 32 7. Rubbing in the fact that Mike is not quicker. And in third place, 1 32 3 for Andre Negrau in that Alpine. So honors pretty much even at the moment. The Toyota with a little bit more fuel on board. Yeah, but I think on the strategy side of things, things are looking very good for Toyota right now. Yeah. If you were to extrapolate this towards the end of the race with the extra pit stop of Negrau and the fact that Negrau is not actually able to pull the same sort of gaps that he needs to, they need to pull 12, 15 seconds a stint. Not just maintain the sort of gap after the the actual end of the pit stops. Uh, somehow they need to go into the final hour with a 90 second advantage, and that's going to be pretty tough to engineer. There's the United Auto Sports car number 22, our race leader in LMP2, and he is in fourth place overall because, of course, although we have four hypercars, the Glickenhaus is in the box having work done. That clutch change. And we have lost a car. D station has gone behind the barriers. And that is unlikely to reappear. So the triple seven Aston Martin is our first casualty after two and a half hours. Three different classes battling for the same bit of track. Hampton watching his teammate for the weekend, Wayne Boyd, and his other teammate for the weekend, Paul DeResta. And the, the wholesale front end changes, radiators and other bits and bobs on that D station car. There was obviously a little bit more after the shunt, and it may well be an electronic glitch that has stopped the car rather than something sort of 
like overheating because half a lap back, even with no water, be a bit surprised if an engine just dies after that. But you know, Whichever all things way, are possible. The yeah. car was running prior to the incident, after yeah. the incident and pit lane, then it wasn't running any longer. So I think we can be quite clear that it was as a result of uh, the, the shunt with the Glickenhaus. Yep. And even if it's just, you know, tripped a wire or trimmed a wire or, or caught it that is now shorted out and, and fused something electronic either way it's the end of their race so united leading from team wrt and into europol jota down to fourth and fifth after they stopped a little uh, different schedule stopping a little later racing team netherlands leading pro-am in sixth ahead of high class then richard meal in eighth in lmp2 real team Matthias Pesch, head of Juan Pablo Montoya in the 10 Dragon Speed car, 21 Dragon Speed car. And Thomas Jackson took over from Miro Konopka in the ARC Bratislava car. And a whole sea of yellow here, three quarters of our yellow entry, uh, no, four, three fifths of our yellow entry. It's racing Team Netherlands and ARC Bratislava armed in this particular little group of cars. Kessel Racing's Ferrari, Scott Andrews chasing Augusto Farfus that 98 yellow Aston. There's the 33 car that's had all sorts of issues, including a uh, drive-through. The uh, turquoise Aston Martin, Dylan Pereira at the helm of that car, and being lapped by the Chetelar car of Roberto Lacourt, and imminently by this car, Giancarlo Fisichella. So the 33 Aston Martin, Went forward very quickly at the start, but seems to be struggling for stint long pace, never mind race long pace. WRT car flashing the headlights as it and the uh, high class entry dive through this GTE AM battle. WRT cars coming back from that, uh, that drive through penalty, remember, for speeding in the pit lane, so yep. second overall. And uh, he's now looking to try to, to get, uh, I would say, back on terms with the lead Wayne Boyd United Autosport. But to do that, he's got to get past this high class yeah. pretty quickly. Yeah, Wayne's had to deal with all of this lot oh. already. And this, this, don't forget, the pale blue car in the middle is being lapped by these two Ferraris, 47 and 54. 33 is the car in the middle down in ninth place, but he comes back underneath the Ferrari, and that's bad news for Roberto Lacourt in the uh, Chetilar car because Giancarlo Fisichella in there like a rat up a drain pipe, straight by, takes the lead in the GTE AM class. And all thanks to the Aston Martin diving back past the dark blue Ferrari. Through went the silver car, 54, the air, of course, a Ferrari. Giancarlo Fisichella now leads in GTE AM. This is definitely a, a swings and roundabout snakes and ladders race for all categories. Not sure who hasn't had a chance to lead. In GTE Pro, though, Ferrari now first and third is the 92 Porsche, Neil Charney. 21 seconds back still from Alessandro Pierre Guidi. And that big change happened when they gave the car to James Collado for the second stint. It looks like they did something with tyre pressures, maybe, or management, and they have just jumped in front. Maybe they have used an extra set of fresh tyres to get track position and maybe dispirit the Porsches. We'll have to wait and see. Neil Jarney being warned. Uh, yeah, final warning for track abuse. Let's hear from Brendan Hartley. I'm not sure what you want to do, but I feel like I'm quicker. I think we uh, we keep the pace up. I think we keep the pace up. Well, that took a long time in coming, didn't it? We were, <laughs> even I said five minutes ago that Brendan Hartley was clearly trying to show the team that he was quicker than Mike Conway, and, and Brendan's leaving it on the table. Uh, I don't know what you want to do about it, but I think I'm quicker. So we may well see that there is a, a little sleight of hand change back to put the number eight ahead of number seven. I have to say, hard to disagree, he's not losing very much to Mike, considering you know, the drivers were reckoning you could lose easily three seconds a lap if you just hit the wrong bit of traffic at the wrong place. I think the, the two Toyotas have got very little between them at all at the moment. 
there's quite a few people being reported in the stewards at the moment for not respecting uh, track limits, but also not respecting blue flags. There's a general lack of respect yeah. out there, it seems to be. Well, OK, so 33 is that pale blue Aston we were just watching, and the two Ferraris were trying to lap him, and it is the leader in the class, but it's not the race leader. Do you have to give away to the leader in the class if he's not fast enough to actually get by? Then he makes a mistake and you repass him. I'm sorry, I'm, again, I, he wasn't deliberately blocking him. He was just driving on the racing line, and there's so little difference between the cars in any of these classes, it's very hard to get by. Now, this is four position. This is Team Project One, Egidio Perfetti, ahead of Michel Gatting, who on my interestingly, uh, on my uh, entry list, in comedy manner, has got a, a, a Great Britain flag alongside her name. She now. Yeah, okay. on our spotter's guide, as, as if she is indeed the daughter of former British uh, English cricket captain Mike Gatting. It is a second prize for penalty now confirmed for Team WRT for not respecting blue flags, so that's the second penalty uh, uh, run down pit lane for them. <laughs> Michelle Gatting, um, Running in Ferrari Challenge this year, and doing very well in that, by the way, and that, I think that's really helped to improve her general pace. Uh, we've seen much more depth to her performance in the uh, stints in the Iron Dames cars. Uh, I think if we looked at like for like pace last year to this year, I think we've seen an improvement from the Danish lady driver. And the more we've seen of Egidio Perfetti, the more we've, more we've seen of Ben Keating, the more miles they do, oh, yeah. the more instruction they can absorb, the more confidence they get, the faster they become, the more they... And it's not about one fast lap, you know, it's about <laughs> holding up Stuart their pace. decision number 33 gives a drive-through on car 31 for disrespect of blue flags. Car 31, drive-through for disrespect of blue flags. So that is not mm -hmm. going to improve the day for Vincent Ross et al. That will drop them back uh, off the back of Wayne Boyd and will cost them third position to enter Europol competition. Uh, Louis Delatraz, as you quite rightly said earlier in the show, Martin, who is one of the WRT drivers in the LMS, will be the first person to profit from their misadventure and will not lose, I don't think, a further position to the Jota car. It was always going to be one of those days from WRT when Van Sam Voss accidentally reversed his rental car into somebody else's, leaving our hotel this morning. I, I did think, I hope his day gets better. I, I feel that the flat cap will have been thrown to the floor. Well, the flat, the flat cap wasn't in evidence there. It may be uh, too warm for flat caps. Oh, that's a change. That's, yes. the, um, that's the... That's the ELMS rear end. It well, is. that's how many rear ends the 77 car has been through here. And that's going into the garage. That Cooper McNeil white, red and blue WeatherTech livery was what was on the Dempsey Proton car last week. Proton yeah. competition. Well, last Proton week. competition. Yeah, because there, there's a, there, the, there, was a, there was an important yeah. difference which relates to Le Mans entries. Yeah. See the damage on the side of the car. Yeah. Uh, if you're not uh, understanding why there's a WeatherTech rear end on that car, uh, Proton competition, a multi-layered collaboration with WeatherTech uh, this season, running the GTLM car in the IMSA program with Cooper McNeil. Cooper now part of their European Le Mans series program, which carries the full WeatherTech livery. So it's clearly one of the spares normally allocated to the 77 car in the LMS. So we're just, uh, we're just uh, a couple of series short of WeatherTech being represented in just about every yes. championship. That's sad to see. Yeah, it is, isn't it? Now, they've oh. replaced all sorts of bits and pieces and you then think, OK, they may have a major rear end issue from being rear-ended and they got collided into by triple seven they rejoined triple seven rejoined but eventually both of them have ended up out of the race and, and that is done. the end of it i'm afraid it was le rear left impact there was damage to the rear left of that car had an earlier incident uh, with damage to the front and the right hand side so a rather battered 77 car. Well, Kiwi Jackson Evans got to drive it. Matt Campbell didn't even sit in the car today. Their third driver, Christian Reed, you saw the team boss at Proton just uh, patting the boys on the shoulder. Okay, guys, well done. Sorry for that. Battle for position here between Tatiana Calderon and Matthias Besch, Colombia versus Switzerland. 
And in terms of the team uh, flags, this is France versus Switzerland. This is for eighth in LMP2, 11th overall, mm. with the top three cars in the Hypercar Class, of course. It's, uh, it's number one crew, the Richard Neal Racing Crew, stepping up to the WEC this year, approaching their third consecutive appearance at the Le Mans 24 Hours. I think it might. It's two ninth place finishes for that car. I think that's correct. On board with Jop van Oyten. That has all the hallmarks of being Jota Green in front. This is our battle for fifth position in LMP2. United, WRT and Inter Europol, one, two, three. Stoffel van Dorn ahead of Roberto Gonzalez, fourth and fifth for United. And Job van Oyter, the young Dutchman in sixth position, all over the back of the Mexican driver in the green 38. This yellow and black liveried racing team, Nederland car, looking for the move, dives to the inside. And Gonzalez, sensing perhaps that that was coming, just keeps the steering open, allows the car to take a full wide palabra per corner, and uh, through goes Job van Oyter. And just there you see that the second drive-through penalty for uh, the WRT cars, Charles Melissa at the wheel, and uh, that's been a real frustration for that, for that team. They were right up there from the beginning and fighting with this car, actually, for the lead of the race at the start through the first in the Robin Friends, but whichever way from there, it's been oh, no. Well, they've just passed a battle for position. The TF Sport Aston, the pale blue car, coming by GR Racing. So Dylan Pereira taking eighth place in AM away from Ben Barker and using those faster cars coming through. So those two faster cars were this one, Jan van Oyter, Racing Team Nederland, and Roberto Gonzalez in Jota. And that meant that the Aston could follow them through the gap inside the Porsche. Charmelesi has served a drive-through, drops to third place. High class versus, uh, real team rather, versus Richard Mille continues. Real team right behind now. And looking on the inside into turn three. Probably will need will need a fly-off handbrake if you're trying to get the inside there. That's a very tight turn indeed. Matthias Besch uh, looking maybe down into the hairpin. Tatjana understands that's coming. Just goes a little bit middle and leg. It'll lock up as she rotates and starts to climb up the hill out of turn five through the sweeping left-hander at six. Over the brow, you can't even see turn seven as you turn in. And then very tight right hander at turn eight. Climb again over the brow. And then down this sweeping dip through nine. Ground into the tarmac by the aero over the brow, turning into 10, shifting down out of corner 11. Again, sweeping downhill through here. Little shades of road Atlanta, I think, in that little section as you go down the hill up to corner 13. Right handed at 14. Again, off camber, dropping away and starting to plunge down the hill, sweeping out through the final turn, starting to climb back up onto the pit straight. Drive through for not respecting blue flags for 33. That's that pale blue TF Sport Aston Martin of Dylan Pereira. And that is from when he was being lapped by the leaders in GTE Am who couldn't get by him did get by him, made a mistake, dropped back behind him. I think the uh, deal with the blue flags is possibly being very over-enthusiastically applied here. Some of this is pure. These cars are being driven by drivers of equal standards at the same speed, and there's nothing to choose between the cars. If you're, quote, quicker, get past. The, the whole rule here is that the driver of, quote, the slower car is supposed to stay on the racing line to make him less unpredictable for the drivers coming up behind him. And to then say, well, you didn't move off the racing line to allow somebody through really under, undermines one of the first rules of racing. However, 
Safely through that little bit of traffic, Tatiana Calderon opens up a fraction more of an advantage over the LMP2 car. Alan McNish has been very quiet for the last three or four minutes because he's been scrolling through the rule book. Well, it's not actually, it's uh, the International Sporting Code. It's nothing uh, specific to WEC, but it's to every FIA category that uh, they're being focused on. And effectively, it's saying during the race, the flag should normally be shown to a car about to be lapped if the driver does not seem to be making full use of his rear view mirrors. When shown the driver concern, must allow the car to pass at the earliest opportunity. So there is a point there where they're enforcing the international sporting code as opposed to the FIA World Endurance Championship regulations. But uh, certainly there is abuse of the blue flag and there is abuse of track limits because now Alessandro Pierre Guidi has just been, uh, he's got his first warning flag for abusing track limits as well in the Ferrari. Leading now by 14 and a half seconds in GTE Pro. As you see, the real team car coming by the Kessel Racing Ferrari, still chasing number one. And uh, also behind Charmolese, both Stoffel van Dorn and Jan Verutet have got the hammer down. They're in the 32s, Malaysia in the 33s. They are 10 and 20 seconds behind, respectively. So drive-through penalty has been served by the TF Sport Aston. GR Racing have stopped Tom Gamble in the black car, taking over from Ben Barker. And one car out of the race for good, D Station. And Dempsey Proton very likely also out of the race. The other car that is a, a long-term resident of the garage is the Glickenhaus. We expect that to come back. Pit stop for the 91. Pro class Porsche, Fred Makovicki was in fourth place in GT Pro. Uh, estimated time to return to the track, by the way, from the Clickenhouse, just heard directly from James Clickenhouse himself, uh, about 30 minutes. Uh, they are in fighty mood and want to get back out there amongst it. Left sides only. Some of these GT teams are going to have full sets for the couple of uh, last couple of stops, aren't they? And I think that's got to be Porsche's strategy. Seven hours of swallowing this bitter pill of, of performance pain to have one hour, maybe two stints on the car with full fresh rubber to try and win this thing. And it's it's all, as Alan said right at the beginning, back time from the chequered flag. And I think the world of hurt they're in now, they're praying will come back to them. Well, now it's up to fifth, uh, sorry, 48 degrees Celsius track temperature. And it's two o'clock local time, give or take. And uh, this is the sort of hotter point of the day and it will continue at this sort of temperature for about another hour. And then it drops very, very quickly. We saw last night that it was dropping like a stone from about five o'clock in the evening through qualifying, which was at six o'clock local time. And uh, it was very quick to sort of drop 20, 30 degrees Celsius off the track temperature. Yes, yeah, But right now, this is the painful point. Certainly then, it was almost a, de a degree a minute, wasn't it? You know, it really plunged. And that would be two hours from the end of the race, or so an hour from the end of the race. So cars... Uh, shedding tyres that have got an awful lot of work done, but there's nothing that says when you've got an allocation of six and a half sets, they actually have to be a four, so two fronts and two rears. You can have, oh, you, you know, two-thirds of your allocation as left sides only, and only look at maybe using two sets, one for qualifying and one for the end of the race. Yes, correct, but you've got to also have them in the correct rotations, and yeah. it's also the amount that Michelin can physically bring as uh, there's a potential of a pit stop there sort of coming. I'm not quite sure what that particular thing's about. Bit but at rehearsal. the same time, Porsche, as you were talking about, um, you know, they've they've just done their second stint, uh, sorry, second tire change in that respect. And it still looks like it's really super tough on those tires. You know, the temperature, the blistering and things that we saw and we heard about earlier on look to be continuing. Oh, WRT versus into Europol. This is yep. for second place. Charmelesi sweeps around the nose of the car of Louis Delatraz and takes second place. But uh, that was pretty wild. Malesi clearly has got a fire lit underneath him, was not messing around there at all. Well, he is Vincent Vossen, he's here, and I think that's the fire that he needs to... But there was a 
pretty aggressive move. I think Delatraz, though, was on the very dirty, bumpy inside as well. So yeah. to some extent, there was very limited that he could do. And we see a nice slow-mo. Yeah, look at the way that that number one car rotates, just the back, just sliding away under power out of the hairpin. Tatiana Calderon still holding on to this spot. She is in eighth place in LMP2 ahead of Matthias Besch. Yeah, strong run from them. They're clean, they're consistent. They don't get into silly incidents. They kept it neat and tidy when they were at Le Mans last year and uh, did a strong, strong job. Well, here we go. Here's how it happened with the WRT car. All the grip was with Charles Milesi in that WRT machine. Going early on the defensive, Louis Delatraz effectively surrendered the spot because he couldn't stop as late because the track was so dirty. Tatiana Calderon bobbling around under braking. The last element of braking there, just as all the aero was bled off, the track gets a little steeper down into the hairpin. Yeah, it's uh, Toyota ready, by the way, for the number seven car, it looked to me. Uh, and in fact, uh, as I say it, uh, like Conway gets a warning for using track limits. Remember that gap I said to uh, Stoffel van Dorn to what was then Charme Lazy was 10 seconds, it's down to six. So Stoffel is closing in now on Louis Delatraz for third in LMP2. Leader is in the pits, Brendan Hartley now in front in the number eight car, as Mike Conway is, as has been the case, stopping a lap earlier than the number eight car in number seven. Certainly have. Will we see a driver change? No. So double stinting the driver. Will he have any tyres? Again, I think the answer is no, probably on that. And I'll try and hold them as, as much as they can. The Toyotas there will expect Brendan Hartley, who's assumed the lead of the race, being on the next lap. And then that, in theory, at this moment, should still pass the lead back to Andre Negrau. Uh, once that, that pit stop has actually resolved itself. Yeah. Porsche, by the way, confirming it's going to be a retirement for the number 77. We saw the body language there, but uh, Porsche tweeting out that it is an early bath for the Dempsey Proton car. Not been their day. So you auto out of the pits. And it's one, again, minute and seven. And you're absolutely spot on, Martin. Minute and seven for a fuel only stop against a minute and three for Andre de Grau. Yeah. It's 10 seconds to the good over the number seven car. Well, down in the pit lane, Duncan Vincent. And Duncan, you've been having a look at the tyres on the cars or as they come off the cars. There's an awful lot of very badly worn rears coming out of these cars. There certainly is, Martin. Uh, we've seen it on many stops and we've seen it from the word go. A quick chat with Alex Stielig off air there from the Porsche GT team, and he says it's the last corner, and it's just crucifying the tyres. They've got about a 50-degree track temperature, which doesn't help. It's not a very high degradation of track. It doesn't really you know, damage the tyres all the time. It's just the loading that goes through the left-hand side of those tyres through that last corner. There's nothing they can do about it. They're just going to have to manage it and try and almost drive Martin a little bit around the problem. I was just about to have a word with Rod, Rob Loipin as well at Toyota and uh, find out how they're actually managing to better the performance because we heard earlier on Sebastian Buemi said the tyres are great and they seem to be getting, as we know, a long, long set of stints from the tyres but up and down the pit lane, the GT cars are definitely in a tyre war with themselves. Thank you, Duncan. Well, we saw Tatiana Calderon, uh, beg your pardon, Sophia Fleurs ready for her stint. And Mike Conway did stay in the car. Brendan Hartley then, we assume, probably will stay in number eight and should pit this lap. If he manages to somehow go another one, then suddenly there's going to be all sorts of alarm bells ringing in the heads of the drivers of number seven. The engineers may know more of what's going on. But the hypercar battle continues to rage. The two TGR 010s versus the Alpine. Here comes the leader, a new leader for a single lap, Brendan Hart in a break car. Now then, this is going to be tight. Look how far behind on the lap the Alpine is. Just coming out of uh, turn five. Should convincingly pass uh, Hartley's but he passed Conway, who was leading the race. I beg your pardon, out of turn eight. Yes, 
should so do, should he? So it's a minute and seven on pit road for the for the seven car. It will be a fuel only stop. A little bit of attention in the cockpit, but that might be a drinks bottle or yeah. no, some kind of adjustment. It was drinks. That's drinks it was. It was drinks, yeah. One in, one out. Duncan Vincent is right there. Yeah, that's a drinks bottle change there. It's very calm as ever as you would imagine at Toyota. It's more a, a quick wash and polish here, isn't it? As they, they top the lovely hypercar up with fuel. You'll hear this just disappear the minute they give the arrow sign to go. A lot of fuel goes on the Martin. We've talked about this in the past. And there she goes. Well, audibly, there's the big difference between last year's LMP1 and this year's hypercar. The crackle of a normally aspir or, or of a, a, a normal engine. induction engine firing up, whereas last year, wow, how close they are, seven inches in front of uh, the number eight car. Last year, they whooshed away on electric drive only. Here, it's back to the, the sound of the engine firing up. Which is probably an approximate loss of about one, one and a half seconds in a pit stop by the time the engine fires up and you get up to 60. It's the initial torque of an electric motor is instantaneous. Yeah. And uh, that fires you to 60 and then fires you out of the pit lane from 60 up even faster. Well. We heard Brendan Hartley saying, oh, I don't know what you want to do about it, but it looks to me like I'm quicker. Well, what they did was, did they find anything in the pits? No, 107 and 107. So it's Brendan's in-lap that has undercut, or overcut, actually, as it is, the number seven car that stopped earlier. The 100th World Championship sports car race for Toyota as a racing entity in its various different guises with its various different cars that started, well, preceding Group C even. Driver change here, Marco Seafried is out of the 88, and I will guess on that being Julian Andlauer getting into the car for the first time. Dominic Bastian started it. I think he double stinted the car. And uh, Julian Andlauer, one of Porsche's young superstars taking over. Number eight got ahead of number seven. As far as they're concerned, that is honours even. They are 14 and a half seconds behind the uh, the Alpine. Looking there at 54, Gian Giancarlo Fisichella leading in the GTE AM class from Augusto Farfus, now up to second in the 98 Aston Martin. Not sure how many cars. Oh, and Tatiana Calderon has looped it around under pressure. Was there contact from Matthias Besch? Our cameras have caught it. No, Besch had gone by. Tatjana running out of rear end. I think she dropped a wheel onto the curb as she's turned in and just a little bit less adhesion from that. Here, you see it? Yep, yep. Oh, oh, eyes, eyes darting around. Now, I tell you what, that was quite impressive. First of all, didn't blink. Second thing is where her eyes were going, is where she's going, and then immediately to see what was coming in, if there was any incoming vehicle, and then where she needed to go again. Yeah, I was lucky. She didn't get beached there, just the rear end dipping into the gravel trap, but uh, got the car back underway uh, very quickly indeed. Um, uh, going back to the 88, Don Bastian didn't he sort of did double stint, he did a very short stint, yeah. uh, had uh, an outer sequence stop. So a bit and a bit, didn't he? He's done 48 laps. Yeah. So a full stint and a very short stint. So in terms of time, probably about the same number of minutes. Oh. Oops. That was a shoulder barge from Jan van Utet. Yeah, that's van Utet. He did get ahead of Inter Europol's Louis Delatraz, but just after that shot, Delatraz was the yellow and green car you saw just ahead of van Utet. And I didn't note, actually, which car it was that he clattered. However, I'm sure Porsche. the stewards have. I know it's a Porsche, but I didn't notice which one. Which one was it? Dempsey Proton, no. No, no, it's one of the factory, factory cars. cars. GTE Pro car. Ah, OK. So 91 or 92, either way. Michael Christensen having a bit of a snooze in the afternoon. Yeah. So uh, just a bit of a catch up with the overall uh, lead position. Uh, if I recall correctly, after the last round of pit stops, it was a 10 second gap from the Alpine to the first of the, the Toyotas. It, it's kind of hovered around 12 it to has. 14 a little bit for, for quite a lot of the race. He's a, he's a tiny bit further ahead this time around. Yeah. Uh, and that comes again four, four seconds um, quicker in the pits for the Alpine. That, and that seems to be their standard pit stop versus Toyota standard, which is 103 versus 1 minute 7. So, you know, in the end, 
you extrapolate Seven times forward. four seconds, it's only 30 seconds, and that's how long it takes to drive through the pit lane. So they're a minute adrift. They still need well over a minute in hand. Yeah. Of, although, of course, the final stop won't be a full fuel stop. It'll, but does it still they're have to be... They're coming out behind at the moment. They need to be in front and pulling yeah. away, and they need to be not maintaining that 12, 14 second gap, but actually extending Adding it to it by with every step. Every step you're step. right, you're right. It's the 92, 92 uh -huh. yeah. Thank you in the truck. Nicely done, everybody. Neil Yanni, please, if you could move a little bit left. I think, actually, Jörg van Oyter didn't even notice he was really was there. He was more looking where he was with the inter Europol car. He was trying to... Maybe he just got in a little hot into three and ran out wide. So, change of driver in the number one machine. Sophia Flörsch is getting yep. in. Tatiana Calderon just got out. Glickenhaus is back on the pit apron. So the Glickenhaus is ready to come back out. Tatiana Calderon handing over to Sofia Flersch. Bites Kavissa doing the early heavy lifting in this car. And this will be a double stint, I think, for Sofia Flersch. Yeah. Another abusing track limits for Delatraz. Uh, Delatraz, by the way, has dropped behind Jop for Dutert now and yeah. has tumbled after that pass. Five seconds further back. Yeah. Fanoit, who got by in a hurry, didn't he? Just after that little biff we saw at turn three and has cantered away. That, that, I'm, I'm guessing that might be tyres for Louis Delatraz because that does not reflect his real pace. 33 in the pit lane. This is Dylan Pereira and possibly a driver change. Our LMP2 leader, lest we forget, is Wayne Boyd. Wayne Boyd leading in LMP2 in the World Endurance Championship for United Autosports. And Wayne getting an unexpectedly late call-up, raced in European Le Mans Series last week in Le Castellet, went back home and was then called because they had a positive test in the team. The Clickenhouse is out and rolling with a new clutch. But that's something they're going to have to look at addressing because that's uh, a gearbox selector issue they've had and possibly two fried clutches on the car. Now, one was accident damage and, and you don't engineer necessarily against that, but it could be an Achilles heel, Alan. It certainly could be because, yes, there was an impact, but uh, there was nothing blocking the car from moving. And uh, so from that perspective, it's just a, it's a weakness. The car as well, looking at it, they take the tail off to take the engine cover off to get access to it and all of that suggests that the car is definitely designed for being on the track and not actually being repaired in the pits. Yeah. And of course the biggest problem there is this is a long homologation for this car. There's not a whole lot they can actually change in terms of the basic setup or the you, becoming the package. Can you not change the clutch? I mean the uh, you can change the clutch, but ultimately you've got to find out why you need to why change you're the clutch. Burning it. Yeah. And things like the the, the way the bodywork is, does that amount does that also include yeah, where which bits the mounting pegs it's come homologate. from and into which they go. The yeah, car's homologated, so therefore there's only limited things you can do yeah. for safety. For uh, you can do, you can apply for performance and you can apply for reliability within a yeah. certain time schedule. And you, if it's clear that it is for a reliability issue, then the FIA and the ACO, I'm very sure, will allow a change if it's to a specification that they accept. Yeah, certainly it as you say, hasn't necessarily been built around serviceability. And, and this was one of the big revolutions, one of the many revolutions that Audi brought in with their sports car program, is damage repair and serviceability was as high on the list of priorities as outright performance, because it doesn't matter how quick you are if you're doing zero miles an hour fixing bits. And that was something that became a feature at the international sports car racing. Once the others realized how Audi were taking uh, the advantage there. There was always a large crowd watching them go through those drills, you know, coming in, no warning of what the drill was going to be. It's front corner, rear deck, yeah. into the garage, on the jacks, da da da. That, well, if only we had somebody who was involved there that could tell us what that was like on the inside. Well, of course, all of it was pre planned as well. So it was engineered to be like that and no end of rehearsal Absolutely. in the garage. And things like. Sub assemblies. When you went out the back of the garage, everything was laid out exactly where it would have been in the workshop back at Yoast Racing. So every single tool and item was in the same place no matter where you were on the planet. And all of that makes a huge difference to how fast you are on track pit lanes are renowned for not being quick.
The eight hours of Portimao, round two of the FIA World Endurance Championship at the Circuito del Algarve, this roller coaster racetrack that's been open about a dozen years. The first time a World Endurance Championship field has come here, and the biggest in WC history outside of Le Mans, led away by the Alpine that claimed pole position. The first French pole position in WEC history. Toyota running second and third, and a big bunched pack of LMP2s and GT cars. It'll lock up from the brand new Glickenhaus in turn three and contact. Pole man in LMP2, Tom Blomqvist, being turned around by his teammate Antonio Felix da Costa. In the GTE AM class, it had been a struggling qualifying for Aston Martin. They came through early on, but Ferrari retaliated. And in GTE Pro, Ferrari also recovered some race pace versus Porsche that had been absent in qualifying too to take the lead of the field and move up to first and third with this robust move from Daniel Serra. Drama, though, for Francois Perodo. A tyre exploded, ripping apart the right front corner of the 83 AF Corsa that's the points leader. And the Ferrari-Porsche battles continued in GTE Pro and Am through the early first part of the race. Little tag in traffic. The high-class car earning a penalty for turning around one of the Jota cars. It's racing Team Netherlands, United Autosports battle, trying to chase down WRT, the early race leaders. Drive-through penalty for that contact for the Dragon Speed car. WRT still in front in LMP2, but paying not one, but two penalties. Penalty two coming up for Glickenhaus after this unfortunate uh, miscalculation by Ryan Briscoe, clattered out the D-Station racing car and the 77 Dempsey Proton car, both of which have subsequently retired with accident-related post-traumatic stress. Number eight and number seven, the Toyota battle. Number seven behind Anthony Davidson said, I'm quicker. The team agreed, let him by Sebastian Buemi. Buemi and then Brendan Hartley in turn have regained that second place for the Toyota. In LMP2, it's the number 22 United Autosports car that has led for hour three of the race as the Chetelar Ferrari lost the lead, the blue car dropping behind the silver AF Corsa car of Giancarlo Fisichella in GTE AM. It is Alpine that leads after three hours of the Portimao eight hour race. Well, not even halfway, and uh, way before we get to halfway, and lots going on. The Alpine leads now by 17 seconds again in this stint, pulling away from the two Toyotas, the eight from the seven. It's in a crowd from Hartley and Conway. Stoffel van der Vaughan uh, and Roberto Gonzalez have cycled round, slightly off the, uh, the regular pit stop strategy in the Jota cars. The third, 28 from the 38 with United Autosports. Paul de Reston out the wheel in third party. And the deal there with Jota Sport is that they're not off schedule because of incidents. They're actually running longer on fuel than their rivals, one lap per stint, which will give them eight extra laps before the end of the race, which is half a stint. So their final stop should be much quicker because they won't need as much fuel as their rivals. So not only do they keep popping up to the top in LMP2, 28 and 38, they're right now first and second in LMP2, but they're building an advantage in their back pocket, and it's hard to see how their rivals are suddenly going to find an extra lap on fuel. 22 United in third place in LMP2, 31, that's Team WRT in fourth head at 29, Racing Team Netherlands, Racing Team Netherlands with Fritz van Erd at the wheel again. They've just cycled through the pits again. He's only done a single stint. So he's going to have to do three separate stints through this yep. eight hours. Uh, remember, the uh, Team WRT car, a great stint, by the way, has been underway from Charles Malaisi. And in comes, that's the Alpine. Yeah, that's the Alpine behind the other car that looks like the Alpine, which is the real team racing car, and Giancarlo Fisichella, the AF Corsa that leads in GTE AM. So our race leader is in, in GTE AM and in Hypercar. It's going to be a driver change here, just uh, seeing Andre Negrau uh, removing the jack plug from the radio Yep. in preparation for the change. Car was started by Nico Lapierre. He did a double stint. Andre Max. And, 
Andre Negrao has done a double stint. And Magia Vazivier, as it says on the helmet, MVAX, uh, he's the man who set the starting pole lap to grab that pole position for Alpine. And as you said, Graham, almost unbelievably, this is the first time a French team has taken the outright pole in the FIA World Endurance Championship. Indeed, so certainly plenty of pole positions for Sydney to Alpine in the LMP2 days, but uh, the very first in the top class, the hypercar class. This uh, additional stop is beginning to wind its way out, isn't it, here? Yeah. Longer and longer. But, uh, to see what kind of pace Mathieu Vazivier can little, bring out this one. Little uh, lock up ahead of the number eight Toyota, who was the car in front. It was a red car. Was it the Glickenhaus or the... It's the Glickenhaus, isn't it? Not the uh, Richard Mill Racing Team uh, car. Didn't spot that one. Was just or high class. It's just a flash. It, it is, is the Glickenhaus, yeah. Uh, so the 92 car, by the way, has been in pit lane for Michael Christensen to take over from Neil Gianni. Yeah. <laughs> With the driver in that car. I think Porsche have got very significant tyre troubles here. And or, it's going to be very, very interesting to see how they manage those tyres because they've only got six and a half sets. But they're only using half a set at a time. Indeed. There's not been a full set change. Now, that may also be the case at Ferrari, in which case Porsche are just basically going to have to plug on for third and fourth. But you have to hope that they know that they have got something up their sleeves in terms of full sets. There's 52, that's our race second place car. Miguel Molina now taking over that car. Alessandro Pierre Guidi leading at 51. And we also saw, uh, who else just came down the pit lane? Thomas Florinier, yeah, of course, a 54 Ferrari. Uh, Cetelar, Cetelar. Uh, Cet Cetelar as well, coming in from second place, Roberto Lacorte. Well, Wayne Boyd has just stepped out of the number 22 United Auto Sports car. He handed that over to teammate Paul De Resta. How did it feel to lead in World Endurance? Wayne Boyd joins us after a very hot, sweaty stint there. We've got to ask, first of all, what was it like getting the very late call to join the team for this weekend? Um, <laughs> yeah, it was, uh, it was for, for firstly, I would like to say, you know, get well soon to Fabio. Obviously, it's a horrible situation for him to miss a World Championship race. But for me, it was an amazing opportunity to, uh, to have a go at it. And uh, definitely ended the deep end a little bit. There's a lot of pressure I'm, I'm putting on my own shoulders. The team are pretty cool with it. But, um, you know, I'm glad just to get that first double stint out of the road and get the nerves away. Your first ever weight race, and you led the weight race. Obviously, emotions must have been very high. I know. He told, he told me on the radio, we're now leading, and I was like, I, I don't even care. He didn't tell me, um, but I, uh, I was just kept, kept the cool head and just like sort of like did my my lap times. I was careful in traffic. I don't want to take too many risks and try and do any any heroics. I was quite happy what we did. And then we must ask about the car. How were the tyres holding up on the LMP2 Orica? They were pretty good. It was obviously a double stint on those tyres, so at the end they were um, they were starting to go off a little bit, but not not too bad to be honest. The um, obviously our, our car United have got so much experience. The car is very good. It shows that United also have a great stable of drivers. They can just call upon the likes of you to to step in and help. Well, see you so anyway. <laughs> no, I uh, was very very grateful for it. I was getting ready to go to work and uh, got the phone call. So it was uh, it was a bit of a busy day on Thursday, but. Uh, I'm very, very grateful for it. It's great to see you here. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, a faithful servant indeed. United Autosports, who said earlier in the show, has raced and been on the podium here in the years past in a Ligier LMP2, and two wins and a podium in LMP3, including uh, in 2020. We'll be back here again later this year in the LMS uh, with the Championship Defence in LMP3. Both Jota LMP2s on pit road, one of them already rolling and underway. Lead battle though, Martin, under a second now uh, with Brendan Hartley ahead of Mike Conway. Yeah, Stoffel van Dorn out, which should put Tom Blomqvist back in in our uh, rotation. And Roberto Gonzalez, the door was open there as well. I think there was a driver change in 38, and that should put Antonio Felix da Costa. It does. There's Ant's uh, familiar helmet. So driver changes back to their starting drivers. So Paul de Resta leads. And then Sean Galeo and uh, is out in favor of Antonio Felix da Costa. So there is the number 22 United Autosports car 
Paul De Resta not a bad super sub to have on the bench either, is he? Uh, no, it's not. It's almost like an Englishman, a Northern Irishman, and a Scotsman walked into a race. Yeah. What's the punchline? <laughs> We're about to see. In the well, well, let's find out. Yeah. Because United Autosport last year's European Le Mans Series champion, LMP2 champions in World Endurance Championship, and Le Mans winners have not had quite that vein of form so far this season, either in ELMS or in the World Endurance Championship no. race in Spa. So, you know. If you peak, it's very hard to plateau at that peak. It's very, very easy for the others to come back at you. We'll see what they've got here. GTE Am. Ooh, oh, grief. little fighter. Those are big curbs on the inside. And if that's not a broken rim, it may well be a couple of loosened fillings for the 33 car. Felipe Fraga at the wheel of that. Yeah, that was a hold my beer moment, wasn't it? Oh. Um, yeah, you know, Blimey. Sports taking that win, you're quite correct, in, uh, in WEC at Spa. They lead the championship committees here, but it's, uh, and that was a very, very solid performance. Yeah. But the LMS, they've not been quite uh, on form uh, to this point. Much better run in Red Bull Ring for them. But, uh, pushing, pushing hard, trying to be. It's always difficult, isn't it, after such a dominant season? Yeah. I mean, to add to the role of honour you had there. They also, the second car, second in the LMS and yes. taking the LMP3 championship. Yes, uh, and so, yet again. Absolutely. So yeah. aboard the car at the moment, they've got two Le Mans winners and uh, two LMP2 champions, both of them Phil Hansen, yeah. and an LMP3 champion, Wayne, uh, Boyd. Wayne Boyd. And and only one of them has raced in Formula 1. Absolutely. <laughs> so it's, didn't you know, know, it's... Didn't know Wayne had done it's, Formula 1. It's a starry lineup, isn't it? And, it and is. yeah, really good. There's Stoffel van Dorn just checking in on the data, I think probably before he goes online and, uh, and tweets about the, the first int in the car. Interesting to know as well, Wayne saying that the tyres on the United car only starting to really feel it right at the end of that second stint. The uh, head of communications for the World Endurance Championship, Rachel Cavers, has just popped into the boot, uh, booth with drinky poos, and that's either a biscuit or a choc ice, in which case, it's, do it's, your own commentary for the next time. Oh, Alan's gone off to get the uh, ice cream. It's, it's biscuits. I, it's I, I, biscuits. Just, just to make it's an important point we should make clear for our international audience. <laughs> it's not a choc ice. OK. So lots and lots going on. Four hours, 40... We're nearly... Well, we're not quite halfway through, but we're into the fourth hour three hours and 18 minutes already completed a lot going on uh, in the pits both iron links cars michelle gatting and andrea piccini in the 60 iron links ferrari that was started by claudio schiavoni looking here at the battle between brendan hartley the race leader and mike conway his teammate and on this track, whichever Toyota is in front, the other one always appears to be quicker. Which pretty much tells you there is nothing to choose between either of these GR010 hypercars or their driver lineups. Also tells you everything you need to know about professional racing. Cars. <laughs> yes. Gimme, gimme, gimme. Put me in, coach. Put me in. Uh, the, the change, by the way, since that last round of pit stops is that uh, the Jota cars, for the first time, I think in living memory, are now split by the, uh, another car, with the Team WRT car between the two. And WRT re recovering from not one, but two, count them, two penalties that involved a drive-through rather than even like a 10-second hold in the pits or anything. So WRT were leading quite comfortably after two hours and into the third hour, and then uh, a double miscue has cost them dear, but WRT are, we know from the European Le Mans series, capable of running a very, very strong race. So it'll be interesting to see how that one sorts itself out. It does look as though it's United versus WRT versus the two Jota cars. And Racing Team Netherlands, close or close about. Fritz van Aert in fifth place in the 29 car. It's his second stint. Don't forget all the gentlemen drivers in these cars have to do uh, three stints to Correct. get their minimum drive time through. So, for Racing Team Netherlands, they've had more time at the moment with the gentleman driver in than two of their rivals. So, there's still that to be played out. The, the interesting one as well is GTE AM, because for a bronze driver in GTE AM, in an eight hour race, you've got to do two hours and 20 minutes. That's a bit more, a tiny bit more, than two stints. 
Yeah, but you're mentioning about drivers and their AM drivers. Roberto Gonzalez in the 38 Jota Sport car, he's already done two stints. And Fritz van Aert's just on his second stint right now. Yep. So therefore, I think they're in the pound seat as it stands. At the moment, yes, they're fourth overall. But in terms of that particular in-fight, then they're in a pretty reasonable position. Yeah, and uh, when you look at the kind of the non-professionally ranked driver, uh, to have Wayne Boyd as that uh, non-professionally ranked driver in, for the United Autosports car, that too adds something else to the mix. Those top three, four, five cars in LMP2, it could be a real dogfight for the whole of this race. We are 38 minutes away from halfway. It's all died down in GTEM. Obviously, apart from this battle, Giancarlo Fisichella being blown by oh, by Thomas the Cheta racing car. Oh, it's Thomas Floor back in that car. Yep. Thomas Floor. Took over from Giancarlo at the last stop. And Giorgio Senna Giotto doing his second stint. Now, Roberto Lacorte has done two. Senna Giotto has done two. Senna Giotto is the silver. Am I? Yeah, but... Fuoco hasn't been in the car at all, as, as long as I can recall. So, uh, is that right? Uh, I'm pretty sure Antonio Fuoco hasn't driven yet. He's the gold driver. He's their best rated driver. That's correct. So are they keeping him for a final two hour mega blast to the line? Because they've got Roberto Lacorte. He's done two stints. Giorgio Senna Giotto is in uh, his second stint. They'll need to do one each more. Roberto will need to do a third. And Giorgio, who's a silver, not a bronze driver, might need to do another. Interesting times, um, and this is all part of, you know, the, the hidden game of chess that goes on with driver stints, with race stints, with fuel, with drive times. Well, let's get down to D Station Racing. Duncan Vincent is with the team. Their car retired out on track after that crash caused by the Glickenhaus. David Brewer is the race engineer for the 777 TF Sport D station car. Now, first of all, bad luck. Can you give us yeah. a, an update of what actually caused the failure and uh, how the car is? Uh, well, yeah, we had an unfortunate bit of contact with a Glickenhaus going down into the hairpin. Uh, it, damage wasn't horrendous, but it just pushed the radiator. And so uh, we, the guys did a great job, did the whole front end in 20 minutes, and then we've gone out and the engine temperature just gone sky high. So we just decided we better pull the car because it would end up destroying an engine if we haven't already. So just have to, have to see where we are now, really. You must have some great feeling, though, after the car runs so very well earlier on until the, until the flat spot and puncture, but it was at the sharp end. Yeah, it was good. I mean, we sort of flipped the strategy a bit on the other guys um, and, yeah, got a march on them. And I, I think everyone in now is really struggling with uh, tyre blistering as well. So... It's a real shame because we were at the sharp end and we could have maybe had a bit of a result, but yeah, it wasn't meant to be today. And you've shut the car off early enough to hopefully not have any long-lasting engine damage? I don't know. We'll, we'll have to see. The guys are looking at the data now. Um, yeah, it's touch and go. We'll see. David, thank you very much and sorry. No problem. Thank you. Well, let's hope it's go, not touch. And uh, they can bring um, the same engine back for Monza in a couple of weeks' time. It's a fine effort from D-Station Racing. TF Sport and obviously Aston Martin Racing in support of that effort. And the, and the cars look really super competitive as well. You know, that you've got to remember that the driver lineup, they don't have experience of this track and a number of the other teams do. Well, we're not so many in AM, but uh, a few do. You know, AF Corsa, quite a number of their crews have raced here in European Le Mans series and so on. So, Well, since we're unlikely to mention them again other than the highlights, I'll mention again Tomono Bufuji, a real standout mm. from this season so far. Both races so far, we've seen uh, the Japanese driver, regular driving partner of Shino San, uh, be really pretty spectacular. here at a change of position between the two Toyotas. There you go, the car behind is always the quicker one. Now, I don't know um, where Toyota's corner number nomenclature comes from, but everybody else, including the uh, timing officials, call the hairpin turn five. Uh, I think that's turn five. Yeah, but uh, it's always uh, make the move in turn four. Maybe it's just you know, waft off the throttle in turn four and let him whistle by down into turn five, which makes sense. Yep. The Clickenhouse now 
with Roman Dumas at the wheel. He's got a very different challenge. I think it's next weekend is the Pikes Peak International Hill Climb, where he's driving for the famous champion racing back into motorsport after some time away. The passing of long-time team owner Dave Mirage. Yeah, it'd be great to see the champion racing name back, a name that Alan has been associated with in the past as friendly rivals and uh, drove for them as well. I drove for Dave Mirage yeah. back in 1999. In the 911? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, GT1, he went out there and in fact uh, fought out a lot of races and then Latterly, uh, they were the factory team in the USA for our American Le Mans series programs, and so we won a lot of races and championships. And Dave and the whole family actually were great friends to, to me personally and also to the, to the rest of the Audi side. Uh, and it's really good that one of his sons is taking the champion name back to Pikes Peak. Yeah. It's going to be a heck of a campaign, there's no question about it. Very, very different to what they've done before but uh, I'm really pleased that, uh, to see that champion name back there. Yeah, great to see uh, historic names. Uh, you know, champion made a sort of big name for themselves in the way that Brumos did uh, a, a decade or more earlier, and they're still yeah, great to see them coming back as part of American motorsport, and hopefully a return to sports car racing as well. They're a very big sports car racing family. I think they are, it's, uh, you know, let's start with going up Pikes Peak, which yeah. is a bit of a challenge, <laughs> there's no question about it. Look towards the future. I'll just remind everybody that is a sports car racing fan, after Ford won Le Mans outright, they were the next American team to win the 24 hours of Le Mans outright, which was a hell of a challenge considering yep. they're a privateer team run effectively initially when I was racing for them in 99 out of a car dealership. Yep. His salesman was a chief strategist. <laughs> wow. And, uh, and that was just a, an incredible uh, transformation for a team that I don't think many people believed in. And there was a few times I questioned, but Mr. Mirage definitely delivered. Well, Great. Let's, let's hope their adventure next weekend encourages them back to do yeah. more because of a name we've missed without a shadow of a doubt. Great to see they've kept the heritage livery. Yeah, and, and yeah, that's all part of it, isn't it? Like Brumos, white with the red and blue stripes. If white they go in any other colour, you'll be going, is that actually a Brumos car? The uh, final on, on Dave Mirage, the great story about how he started his road to becoming a major car dealer is that at the time when he started with the Porsche car dealership, when the family started, you basically got a tiny incremental increase in the allowance from Porsche per year over the number of cars you sold. And so you could only grow little by little, inch by inch. Then the 924 came along and Porsche dealers in North America, frankly, didn't want it. They'd sort of suffered a bit with the 914 and went, oh, here we go again, I'm not doing that. Dave Mirage said, give me as many as you can give me. I'll take them all, sold them all at a cost plus a tiny margin profit. But you know, triple, quadrupled his volume in a year and suddenly, the next year, he could order that many 911s or whatever because that was his volume of sales for the previous year. And it's that entrepreneurial kind of excitement that he brought with him everywhere he went. So, yeah, very much missed, but uh, good to see the family name back again. He definitely have sold them in Scotland if he could have. There was no <laughs> question about it. No border was too far away for, for Dave. But uh, like you say, it's fantastic to see the name back and also Mike Peters and everybody else yep. from Champion are now going to take Romain Dumas and throw him up the hill at Pikes Peak as quickly as they can. Now then, battle here for fifth position as we get back to the plot with Egidio Perfetti for Team Project One. That's the white and blue car. And Man Manuela Gosner right behind in the Iron Dames row. There's Rahel Frey watching her teammate doing the driving. She will eventually turn around to the camera. <laughs> she said, right, enough of the back of my head, thank you very much. Let's just see the car on track. And again, this is a busy team. They race in the European Le Mans series with the same car and the same lineup. They race here in World Endurance Championships. So same as Richard Mill Racing Team, you know, it's it's miles and, and hours behind the wheel that's going to make everybody better and better and better. As we've seen with our AM drivers, you know, they just get better with every outing because they're absorbing more data, picking up more speed, learning more about the car and themselves, finding more confidence. It's like anything, you know, it's that famous, it takes 10,000 hours to be fantastic at something. Well, it takes a long, a lot of racing to get 10,000 hours under your belt. But these guys, you know, if you can do more championships, you've got more chance. 
Yeah, sorry, just a little bit of a jump back. Uh, WRT we were mentioning later on with their second uh, penalty. And their first penalty was speeding in the pit lane. It was actually Robin Frin, so I think it was on the way into the pit lane, 67.5 kilometers per hour in a 60 limit. And so that was a kind of slam dunk, unfortunately, for them. Just watching the lead gap. Toyotas are pulling away, and I think that's for the first time in a while from the uh, the Alpine. I think I, my guess is, I'm looking just over your shoulder at uh, lap times, they are quicker. Matthew Vazavier is not matching the lap times of Mike Conway and Brendan Hartley. It's not really been the theme so far. Or you could put it a slightly different way, Nicola Lapierre was, because uh, really they've kind of been more equal in tending to flick on to the other side with the Toyota slightly quicker um, ever since it came through to Andre Negrau and then in and I think Lapierre was pretty exceptional at the beginning especially when they got into traffic it was a traffic management if we remember where he was able to gain a significant part of his gap and advantage at the beginning but it looks as if the performance momentum as well as the strategic advantage is definitely moving towards uh, our Toyota cousins. Is this red on red contact or red on yellow and black? <laughs> That's the 60 oh, iron links oh. Ferrari needed that line, otherwise he'd have shot off into the undergrowth up the top of the hill there. But the factory Porsche trying to squeeze through was it 51 it or 52? Oh, I beg your pardon, Ferrari. It was 52, wasn't it there? Trulio Schiavoni aboard yeah. the 60. Miguel Molina threading the eye of a, a very tight needle there. Indeed got through but not without a little bit of a possibly uh, fluent Spanish swear words going on. I would imagine there was some uh, false Alessandro Pierre comments. Guidi leading in GT Pro in the 51 Ferrari that means James Collado his teammate is in the garage and of course that means Duncan Vincent has gone down to bother him poor old James Currently leading the GTE Pro class, uh, James Collado and my good friend Alessandro Perguidi. What I have to ask you, are you guys managing the tyres the same as Porsche? Porsche appeared to be in big trouble with the back tyres, with the left hand side tyres. I didn't know that, so um, it's good to know. Uh, we, we are struggling a bit with tyres. With these temperatures we have blistering uh, on the left hand side, it's very demanding on the left hand side. So. Yeah, we're trying to manage the blistering, but it seems to be unavoidable. Uh, the tyre temps are 150 degrees and uh, we just can't cool them down. So let's see. Uh, I think on safety terms, it's OK. Uh, it's just performance. We lose performance when we, when we have the blisters. And the track temperatures due to cool down later in the race, then it should come back to you, yes? I hope so, because it's flipping all out there. I'm sweating. But, um, no, it should do. And uh, let, let's see. Yes. Yesterday we didn't have any problems, so it, we're a bit confused. But let's see, uh, it's a long race, it's still, it's still two hours to go, so. I can sympathize with the sweating. I, I should also ask you, you are, you're staying with the two driver lineup here. Porsche have brought the three driver lineup. Will we see Ferrari introduce that at Monza maybe, ahead of Le Mans? Uh, I don't know. I, I mean, it's, uh, it's quite on the limit with two drivers here, because it is very physical, like I said. But um, no, I think for Monza, we'll keep the two. And then, um, yeah, for Le Mans, we'll introduce our third driver. We, we seem to manage better with, we, if we're two. It gives us more time in practice to uh, get the car how we want it. James, the best of luck. Thank you very much. Cheers, buddy. Thank you. So back to racing. Excellent stuff will be found there. Uh, finally confirmed by James Collado, both the Ferrari GT Pro and uh, Porsche really struggling on the left tyre dramas as well of course we heard a little earlier the same kind of issue with the Glickenhaus interesting to catch up maybe with some of the LMP2 teams to find out what they're saying about tyre life it's uh, very warm indeed and I wonder uh, Alan uh, James there talking about being a bit on the limit for two driver teams is that going to hit them further on here in terms of pure performance for the drivers ah, look they should be fit enough to be able to do it the end of the day um, I've done 12 hour races with two drivers or 10 hour races sorry with two drivers so I think an eight hour round Portimao is possible 
Uh, it is definitely not quite as comfortable for the drivers, but the, you know, I, I don't see a, a negative. I think there was an element of strategy for Porsche to integrate a third driver into the lineup prior to Le Mans. As, uh, as Duncan alluded to there, um, as opposed to necessarily just specifically looking at this race. However, it's always a compromise. It's a compromise for the drivers running if you do go to three, and it's also a compromise in the race um, if you stay at two. And so it's just whichever works for you. At the same time, depends what the driver that would be slotting in for your Le Mans programme is doing. If they're doing the IMSA Championship, for example, they would be in Detroit yesterday, so yep. physically unable to actually join everybody here in the World Endurance Championship in Portimao. It's Michael Christensen and Fred Macko uh, are the two additional wheels here this weekend, both ex highly experienced, highly successful. Michael, of course, an ex-world champion in the WEC. We watch... Uh, side by side that's the alpine going through it does that was just a tiny tag wasn't it from the i don't think it, they touched i think it was just more a case it was a bit slow uh, sorry it was a bit close uh, as uh, the high class sort of dived to the inside but the alpine had already done the move and as you saw Mathieu Vaxivier just saw at the corner of his eye i'm sure something coming at him but, and then had a quick had look. A look yes um, but uh, you know fought off to fight another day dennis anderson it was aboard the high class car He's actually just put in one of the fastest laps, um, certainly the fastest laps of his stint, a 32 0 in the last lap for uh, Mathieu Vaxivier. Yep. And so, you know, in terms of stint times, we were talking about the swing going towards Toyota. If he can deliver that sort of performance, then it should bring him back into the game with Toyota as well. 32 0 for him, 32 8 just sort of pop up for a WRT car. So the LMP2 and hypercar lap times are not that far apart, as we expected all the way from free practice. Uh, so I think it was a 33.8, wasn't it? Oh, possibly. But either way, it's only a second. Uh, what we were seeing yeah. uh, through free practice was the quickest of the LMP2 cars were ahead of the hypercars. Yes, we've seen that pick up for qualifying and again in race pace. As we did in Spa. We did indeed. So exactly the same situation there between the two categories. And I think at the end, the, there's more to dial in for a hypercar in terms of circuit, circuit evaluation, evolution, and especially with Toyota making sure the systems are correct. Now, and from that perspective, they've got simulation and simulator that uh, delivers. However, if it's a circuit you haven't been to before, or certainly not done a lot of running, and not many have done around here, never mind with the latest resurfacing, then there is still a little bit of uh, on-track adaption. Under pressure here for second in LMP2, Sean Galeil with Ferdinand Hamsberg looking pretty racy right now. He's the quickest man in the class, or so was previous lap, just pipped last time around by Antonio Felix Costa, Costa, who's 30 seconds back from this battle in fourth but when i watch it there the wrt car and we saw it from the first stint when uh, robin frins was there it it turns into the corner it's very sharp going to the apex of the corner and he can keep a tighter line in general it's as if it's a little bit more agile on the front axle than necessarily with Lajota that he's following with Sean Galeil, but also that we saw with uh, racing team Netherlands with guido van der garde at the beginning of the race so they're gaining their speed in slightly different ways both have come up through the junior single-seater ladder. Sean Galel probably two or three years ahead in the curve ahead of Ferdy Habsburg. But Habsburg already a gold-rated driver. So he started in uh, F3, F2, raced in DTM, and now in World Endurance. Will make his Le Mans debut in a couple of months. That has triggered a change in our Le Mans team. We lose Jamie Campbell Walter, at least temporarily, his manager, but we gain Ollie Gavin. So we're oh, do we? down a Scott and we're up a, a uh, properly heighted person indeed. Busy, busy pit lane action for every team. Time lost here, you never gain back on track. Four hours, 20 minutes remaining of the eight hours 
of Portimao, round two of the FIA World Endurance Championship. Our leaders, Toyota Gazoo Racing 1-2, Mike Conway ahead of Brendan Hartley with the third hypercar, Mathieu Vazivier in the Alpine in third. In LMP2, United Autosports lead with Paul de Resta. From 28, Jota, Sean Galeel under pressure from 30, Habsburg. You're looking at here in the 31 car, that's the battle for second. Antonio Felix Costa, fourth for Jota, ahead of Inter Europol's Jakob Schmikowski. Cooper doing his first stint in the Inter Europol 34 car, ahead of Fritz Van Aert, who's doing his second. In GTE Pro, Ferrari 51 and 52 first and third, Porsche second and fourth, hanging on to tyres that are blistering more than me in the sunshine. And that is a very high rate of blistering. You see the 92 car here of Michael Christensen, just ahead of Fred Makaviki. So, for, in fact, Ferrari up to 1-2 ahead of Porsches 3 and 4. And there is a battle for not being last between the Porsches in traffic. In the GTE AM class, AMR 98, Augusto Farfus leads the field from Chetelar's Ferrari, Giorgio Senna, Giotto, and the AF Corsa Ferrari 54 of Thomas Floor. But if Porsche have a long-term plan that's going to bring them back into it, there's an awful world of hurt between here and the chequered flag still to come. And uh, Louise has been down speaking to Michelin, talking about the hurt. And uh, in reality, pretty much all the GT teams, she said, has been running on the medium Michelin tyre, which is right on the limit here. Now, that was predicted, and it was something that they decided on. The teams can decide on what their combinations are going to be. Um, but right now, someone has switched onto a slightly different tyre, and uh, that is a sort of little bit of a tester case. And uh, that is Augusto Farfus. And Farfus, just been looking at his average lap times, is actually kind of a little bit up there. He's, he's on the same lap time as Christensen and Machiavelli. And so the GT AM is on the same speed as GT Pros. And he's now taken the lead in the GT AM class as well in that 98 Aston Martin that he shares with Felipe Fra uh, with uh, Paul Dallalana. Uh, so, and ironically, that tyre for hot weather was developed for a race that he should have been having at home in Brazil for Sao Paulo. So the Brazilian is benefiting from the Brazilian tyre to take the lead in GTEM. And if everybody else is looking at that, then they will be going, right, we're having them. Well, depends on allocation, but yes, uh, that's the, the idea in theory if it's, if it's available. The thing is, if you've plumped for everything in your allocation on one particular, it's like betting on black at, uh, you know, the tables in that respect. And so, therefore, there is uh, areas that, uh, you know, it's not just quite as easy as, oh, well, I would like some of that, please. Thank you very much. Louise is scribbling, there's enough. <laughs> so that should be, hopefully, they should deal with that. Of course, then we go to Monza in July. I'm not thinking medium is necessarily what you're going to be wanting in the heat of, a, of, of a, an Italian summer either. No, but yeah, you've got a very, it's a very different style of circuit. You've got high speed at Monza, so you need to take the camber off a little bit, so you've got good braking, you don't get the inner shoulders hot. But at the same time, you only have six corners, and a lot of them are slow. You've only really got a Scari and Parabolica, and Parabolica is the only long loaded corner. And we heard earlier on one of the drivers talking about it's a high energy circuit. That's the energy over the whole lap, over the 4.6 kilometers that go into tire. Here is completely on the other end of the spectrum to Monza. Yeah. And so therefore, it is a very, very different a car requirement and also tire requirement. Change here as throwing it up the inside. Ferdy Habsburg takes second place in LMP2 away from Sean Galeel. Galeel, a silver rated driver, Habsburg gold rated. So you'd expect that was the way that battle should have played out. And for Sean Galeel, the longer he made Habsburg wait, the better it is for him in the long run. That's the job when you are the top-rated drivers, the Platinums, the Golds. Your job is to set blistering pace when you're the silver or the bronze in the lineup. Your job is not to lose time that you don't need to lose. So you focus on doing your job and yet let the others get on with them. Not too far behind. You can see a yellow car popping over the brow. That's the racing team Netherlands car, Fritz van Aert. But that is a lap behind these guys. Bottas leading Pro-Am. It is still leading Pro-Am. Not 
Oh, in fact, about a minute ahead of high so, class so. of Dennis Anderson. And they've been the Pro Am leaders right from the start. And bear in mind, this is deep now into Fritz van Aert's second of three stints. Yep. So this is looking good for them in that class, even though it's dropping them back away from that leading group. Roberto Gonzalez having his head reattached. Tom Blomqvist suiting up and ready to go. So I would sense that there might be some Jota stops not too far away. This isn't quite like Le Mans, where you expect to have the driver in for the entire stint before he gets in, but there's Roberto just being manipulated. So really important part of the team management of all the elements is managing the driver's body. Because if your neck is giving you grief, it distracts your brain from what it should be doing, which is not crashing, which is basically, whoa, which is basically what racing drivers are doing when the car is up on its toes at its absolute limit. It's avoiding a crash by a fraction all the way around the lap. I think it's a given to win a race, you don't crash in that respect. But uh, right now, it is quite tough out there. It is hot, and there's only one place on the circuit, Martin, where you can actually really take a breath, and that is on uh, the start finish straight, which is one heck of a place to take a breath for sure, but it comes on the end of a very long demanding section in the final sector Mike Wainwright's helmet you just saw there ready to go Richard Mill racing team also standing by um, So out of the pits is Ben Keating in the four horsemen at that pale It's not really turquoise is it pale blue? Pale blue is not really the right way. We're going to have to come. It's not duck egg either. Anyway, that blue Aston Martin. So he's made his stop into the pits. Sophia Flourish. So she is on pit road. And the Richard Mill Racing Team number one car has been the first of the LMPs to stop. Every uh, LMP twos to stop. Everybody else should probably follow in next lap. And I think, I don't know, maybe Sophia will stay in. If not, we will cycle back to Beitzkevisa, who started the race for the team. And in a lap's time, we will have probably United, WRT, into Europol, Racing Team Netherlands, High Class, and the rest. And a lap after them should come Jota. 16 seconds is the gap, first to second in LMP2 with Freddy Habsburg taking nibble out of Paul de Resta's advantage last time around, 22 from 31. So keep an eye on that gap uh, because that's going to be significant as we get uh, deeper in. Pressurized oil canister being uh, ready there to pump oil back into the system. Car is clearly uh, using a bit. And we are waiting for Mike Conway, the race leader. Well, Duncan is waiting for Mike Conway, the race leader, to come in. Is he due just yet? Two more laps, we're here. Chuvak has actually been pretty much stabilizing everything. Again, even on the last lap, a lap, a second slower than the number eight Toyota Brendan Hartley and the number seven Toyota of Mike Conway. So this may be for the first time Toyota will stop, and then at the end of the stint, the Alpine may will stop. This may be for the first time that Alpine does not come back out in front of the Toyotas. So very quick laps being put in here by Mike Conway and Brendan Hartley in those to two Toyotas. And there again, you see that just ring of missing rubber. When it overheats, it blisters. The rubber comes away from the uh, metal banding underneath and just peels off in great big lumps. And normally, the pickup is a, a relatively even wear across, but the rubbish on the side of the track, that's where all that's gone. Yeah, but that's the blisters have popped there and it's yeah. pulled round. So if you just think of pure contact patch that's against the tarmac, it's a percentage significantly less. Yeah. Uh, it's overheated and that tyre is completely out of its window. Its window's in a different country, never mind, right there. <laughs> and so there's nothing you can really do about that. You can baby it and you would have to very much baby it in the final corner by effectively not driving flat out through the corner, yeah. especially at the beginning of the stints when it's got a lot of rubber on it. At that point, moment in time then you've got to be very gentle for the first when the weight comes off of the fuel when you're into that first phase of the corner trying to make sure that you just help it as much as you can to try to live at the end of the stint just saw high class is Dennis Anderson being passed by the inter Europol car of Kuba Schmikowski and that was putting a lap on Anderson Anderson being reported to the stewards for not obeying or not 
respecting blue flags. In this case, not pulling over quickly enough to let probably the leaders get by him. Which is effectively within one lap is the sort of guideline that's in the International Sporting Code, and that's the thing that uh, they've been very strict on today. They've, they've basically yeah. pointed at it, and they do that at times to time, focus on a particular regulation that's maybe over two or three races got a little bit out of hand, but on uh, this occasion, definitely track limits and blue flags. In comes the Toto. I suspect, Alan, on that front, it's because they've now learned how tough it is to pass with these new regulations. And, you know, if you've got someone who's not got their kind of race head on uh, and keeping an eye on what's going on with the wider race uh, with the help of the crew, it is going to affect this race very dramatically because, as we've seen, it is really tough to pass. Down at Toyota, Duncan Vincent. In comes the race leader, Mike Conway. And bang on his marks as a professional racing driver would be expected to do. The door opens and out pops Mike and in goes Kimi Kobayashi into that car and he slides himself over the side pod. Mike Comey walks right in front of me with his seat, specially moulded for his back. Tyres and fuel are expected on the number seven car and the number eight car will be expected to come in three laps after this. So a slightly longer uh, stint for the eight car. And as ever, very calm down here. The fuel always goes in first of all. Now, this is where the choreographed stuff happens. The pit stops, the art of a pit stop. Here we go. They do opposite sides, so back, right and front left, then they will swap round. In fact, they do complete sides. Interesting to see how Toyota work that. Completely different from what we've been seeing during the week from the GT teams. And then as Martin said, this is a big difference. The car moves with the engine, the internal combustion engine, rather than delivering the hybrid straight away. So, pretty neat stop for Toyota, just a little stumble from that left rear gunman as he uh, released. Well, that three laps that Duncan was talking about there that uh, will mean that the, the number eight of Brendan Hartley comes in later. If you extrapolate all the way to the end of the race, that's three laps less fuel it'll need at the end of the race, minimum. And three laps less fuel is probably about four and a half, five seconds. And that's five seconds on the pit's final pit stop. He will make less than this car. And so from that perspective, then, it's, uh, it's quite a difference. So strategically, they're looking very much at the long game in basically four hours and ten minutes' time. Yeah, interesting that the number seven car up until now has been at the lap prior to number eight, and yet in this stint, somehow, number eight has saved not one, but two further laps. 22 is in. Our LMP2 leader, Paul DeResta, stays in. So it will be fuel only and a clean of the windscreen. So the number eight will be coming down pit road as well. Brendan Hartley is the race leader. So the Alpine is up to second. There are scrubbed tires, not brand new shiny tires. So it might be the set that did qualifying. We heard from Brendan saying that they went out and did qualifying on an old set. They were trying to keep new tires for the race. That turned out to be an error and they had to change that. So it may be that that is the set that has done qualifying. Otherwise, everything else should be relatively brand new. Fastest lap of the race goes, as we speak, to Mathieu Vazavier. It's a 131.069. That is a significant jump forward. Well, that is quicker than Andy Suchek's Super League Formula record, 131.9. Wow. It's quicker than an A1 GP car ever went round here in the hands of Adam Carroll for Team Ireland, 131.4. But not as quick as last year's LMP2 lap record set by Mikkel Jensen in the G-Drive Aurus 01. That's a 29.67. I think two things just as uh, the erstwhile race leader Brendan Hartley comes in. First of all, the fuel load is coming off very quickly of that Alpine, so the car will be quite light physically. The other thing is the track temperature is starting to drop down a touch. Exactly right. It's funny because quite a lot of the ELMS guys have said, it's not like this in October when we come here. No, it really isn't. The temperatures are very different and probably a lot kinder on the rubber. Uh, what was the point that Lou was making about this tire that uh, our friend Mr. Farfus is on at the moment? It's he... a slightly harder tire, but yeah. basically it's for a higher energy circuit. It... And uh, Sao Paulo has got long, hard corners in high temperature. And also on a tarmac surface that is very similar to here because it's an F1 grade tarmac surface. Remember, the circuit was actually resurfaced because of Formula One coming. And uh, therefore, it's a different sort of rubber to tarmac 
uh, combination. Previous lap, he did his fastest lap of the race. He's within a couple of tenths of that this time around. He's yeah. a lot quicker than most of the drivers around him, other than, as I speak, a uh, lap from Julian Landlauer, the delayed 88 car into the 39s. But Farfus, really typically in the mid to low 40s at the moment, deep into his stint, so this is not new rubber anymore either. So he's consistently around that uh, mark getting qu uh, quicker towards the end of this stint. In comes the clicking house for full service stop. Yep. So Ryan Briscoe staying in. This is car seven, uh, Roman Dumas rather staying in, car 709, and they are topping that up as well with the pressurized oil system. See uh, on the side it said 0.5, so half a litre of oil goes in. The twin turbo V8 produced by Pippa Moteur in the south of France. It's a company that has predominantly made its name with four-cylinder turbo rally cross engines, which produce north of 600 horsepower. They've essentially assembled two on a common crankshaft. Possibly a little bit more engineering involved than I might have made that sound like, but that's where the knowledge has come from. So it's a twin turbo V8, capable of comfortably north of a thousand brake horsepower, which is running at around 650 here. Racing, uh, big part, into Europol competition in the pit lane, so to a high class. Kuba Schmikowski stays in, so too our WRT. Looks like Ferdy Habsburg stays in the car there as well. The Austrian fires up and leaves the pit stand. So Jota cycle back to the top, 38 chasing Antonio Felix da Costa, 28 leading Sean Galeal. And the gap between them is nearly half a minute. Paul de Rest, a third for United Autosports in 22. 29 racing team Nederland, Fritz van Aert continues to move back up the order as those around him make stops. He's leading the Pro-Am category, second in Pro-Am. Jan Magnussen now taking over what I think we can call the Dane train, the real team, uh, the uh, high-class racing entry car number 20. And Esteban Garcia, third in Pro-Am in 70 for real team talked about it yesterday and again I'll mention it today in Dads and Lads Racing Damsky style. Uh, Kevin Magnussen not only uh, grabbed pole position for the IMSA race in Belle Isle, Michigan yesterday but he also snatched victory in his Cadillac DPI. So it's one pole and one win so far the, for the Magnussen family this weekend. Neither of them going to Dad. Halfway through the race. Drive through penalty for the third placed car, a second placed car in uh, the uh, Pro Am category. So Jan Magnussen will leave the pit lane and head straight back in to serve somebody else's drive through. That was Dennis Anderson, not respecting blue flags. So, first job for Jan Magnussen will be to serve somebody else's penalty. Here's our race leader, Mathieu Vazivier. Four hours in and four hours to go. with that for, uh, for a moment, a little opportunity to see just how hard the driver is working around this Portimao circuit. That was half a lap and that was busy enough on his in-lap. So we're almost at the stage. How many laps ago did Toyota stop two or three laps for the number eight car? We're almost at the stage where the next time the uh, Alpine will drop a full fuel stop behind. Yeah, it is. It was five laps for Kamui Kobayashi in the seven and it's three laps now for Brendan Hartley. 
in the eight. I don't think uh, any of them can, of the two Toyotas can get rid of that little splash at the end. They'll equal it out going through the course of the rest of the race. But for Vaxivie, that was a 31 lap stint, 32 lap stint as he came in. And uh, that's five, six laps. Oh, it's five, six laps less than Toyota every single time. So we've got Toyota now that is leading second Nakajima and third Mathieu Vaxavier. But the leader is Kamui Kobayashi. Let's listen to his teammate, Mike Conway. The current leader of the race, Mike Conway, you've just swapped over. Kamui Kobayashi away in your car. First of all, I saw you having an in-depth talk with the engineer in the pit wall. What was that, uh, what was that about? Well, I mean, it's just, uh, as the slits are evolving, we're changing quite a few things in the car, and uh, we're just trying to relay all the messages to the next driver getting in. And, uh, it's, yeah, it's tricky to manage the, the double stint with the tyres, so just uh, just some advice and what happened throughout the stint, because it's a bit limited, the data they can see at the pit wall. So uh, just trying to download as much as I can to feed the information to the engineer. What tools do you have at your disposal in the car to manage it through the stint? Uh, we have, uh, you know, brake, brake controls, uh, traction control, and uh, some other settings. So quite a lot to play with. So you could manage things quite well. Uh, you just kind of have to do it early and chase it all the time. Tires seem to be a bit of a talking point in the pit lane just now. How are you guys coping with it? Yeah, for us, the stint was OK. Um, I think we stayed quite consistent throughout the run. There's definitely a drop. Did want to stint too, but uh, I think we still managed some decent times towards the end there, so um, it was okay for us. And finally, are you on the same strategy as the sister car just now, or are you kind of looking at doing something different? You took brand new tyres, they went out on a set of scrub tyres. Just now, yeah, I saw, I saw that. Um, yeah, not sure why, I guess they want to try something different, which, um, yeah, we were able to do that, so. Um, yeah, it's up to each car to do what they want, really. So they were able to go a lap longer in the first stint, which will help them towards the end as well. Make as ever, thank you. It's a pleasure. Cheers. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dunk. And uh, just want to say hello to Jamie Campbell Walter watching from the terrace in Mallorca on his laptop with a beer. We don't hate you. No, we do. We do. We do. We do. Absolutely. Uh, trouble brewing at Iron Links for not one but both of their cars. Their number 60 car, which Claudio Schiavone is currently driving, and 85 that Manuel Agosta is at the helm of, both under investigation for their last pit stops. Yeah, Manuel, Manuel Agosta is uh, running fifth at the moment. Claudio Schiavone a couple of places further back with uh, Matteo Caroli uh, between them in the 56 uh, Project One car. So here's how they lay after four hours. Toyota 1-2 ahead of Alpine. Jota 1-2 and LMP2 ahead of long-term leaders United and WRT. Into Europol Racing Team Nederland and High Class round out the top 10. Racing Team Nederland, High Class and Real Team are the top three in the Pro-Am category. AF Corsa 1-2, Ferraris ahead of the Porsches in GTE Pro. GTE Am, Aston Martin Agogo, that new tyre working for Augusto Farfus, ahead of the Ferraris of Chetelar, AF Corsa, Kessel and Iron Lynx. The Team Project 1 may benefit if there's a penalty for the Iron Lynx cars, as could GR. Glickenhaus after a clutch change still racing. Dempsey Proton and D Station after both being hit into an accident by Glickenhaus. Car in from the lead. Don't forget, Blonkist was the pole man. Got turned around in turn three on lap one by teammate Antonio Felix da Costa. And da Costa will likely, uh, he's in the pits as well, likely hand his car over to Phil Hansen. And I uh, beg your pardon, there's Phil Hansen. Get myself all there. There's uh, Paul DeResta, rather, of United Auto Sports. Da Costa will hand the 38 car back over to. Well, I would put Roberto Gonzalez back in, but again, I may not be a team manager. Has Antonio stayed in the car? I think he might have. I think
Dort was open driver's side. Yeah, I uh, know. It is a driver change. It is Roberto Gonzalez. Gonzalez. So this will be his final wow. stint. He's done two already. Yeah. Yep. And this will be his final stint. Then it will go to uh, the other two drivers to run to the end. I'm three for three on predicting putting a gentleman driver in now. I'm, I'm now going to stop. That's oh, th three that's for one. Well, that's going to be busy for us then for yeah. the next four. Uh, nearly, nearly well, four no, hours. I'm going to stop predicting. I three, uh, well, I'm not. I'm as Murray Walker said, I don't make mistakes, I just make predictions that are immediately proved to be not correct. Always the genius and uh, he will long be remembered. Yes, indeed. Out to the pits then. Let's build up to speed on board with the Jota. And Alan, this is pretty much a driver's eye view, only just about level with the top of the wings. Yeah, you basically uh, have got a an eye view line that's very low because the height of uh, the top of the car is about a meter so you're lower than that and at the same time the wheels and the tires the wheel arches are are pretty high so your view is quite a tunnel view in reality out the front it's better than they used to be the previous regulations were a little bit more closed again um, but in these regulations it's still not uh, open i would say like it is for example in a gt car one of the particular points if we think back to the Glickenhaus incident is getting used to that vision and also getting used to the size of the car around and about you and I certainly know very honestly when we went from the open top car to the closed car then it did take a little bit of time just in every circumstance to know where other cars were around you. I can, yeah. rem I can remember that eye-opening chat with Dindo at uh, Monza I think but he was trying to describe to us his, his view in the car, and it was eye-widening. The, the, limit, the limits to uh, to what the vision was in the car, particularly in traffic. Well, the, the, the actual regulations changed directly after that, and uh, then they mandated certain sizes and increased sizes because it was deemed to be too restrictive, yeah. and uh, they've just increased those again. And so from that perspective, I think it's all in a very positive line, but it's part of the ongoing focus on how to ensure that we've got good racing, but also we've got safe racing. Indeed. On board now with the number eight, this is Kazutakajima. He's about 10 seconds back here from Kamu Kobayashi, the two Japanese drivers from the team at the wheel. There'll be a third testing later in the week with a 30-hour test due for Toyota or from starting on Tuesday. We have a power. Uh, subbing for uh, Seb Waymi uh, in that test. We'll be off on Formula E duty, I believe. Sorry? Waymi? Yep, next week. Yep. That's why my Seb is not going to be here. So it's 10 seconds is the gap there. Then it's a further 48, 49 seconds now back to Matt Lesley here. There's the Glickenhaus. Two of the delayed cars here. The Glickenhaus just behind the Toyota with the AF Corsa Ferrari. That's a puncture early on ruining their day. Still outside the top 10. 11th in class uh, in GTM, the 83 car. In fact, uh, the Glickenhaus is the next one in the order behind, albeit there's laps between the two. Significant number of laps between the two. Roman Dumat, though, doing some decent times. He's in the 34s at the moment, but well, say decent at the moment. He's been doing, there's been laps around the time of the leading P2 cars right now which I think, in fairness, is more or less exactly what Jim Blickenhouse said we should expect here. Well, they've done a uh, full stint since they came back out after the clutch change from that incident, and uh, seven laps into the second stint right now, and uh, this is all a building process, as we've discussed before, uh, but right now they're running about a 35-2 uh, average on this stint, 35-0 if we take it just the course of the, the two stints so far. And that's relative to a sort of 33. So a couple of seconds down on Toyota or Alpine in terms of pure oh, performance. Trouble here. And it's trouble for the 86 car. That was uh, both going for the same apex, but from rather different lines. The 86 car in the hands of Mike Wainwright uh, runs off the track in avoidance just as the Alpine arrives. I think the big issue that uh, we heard Westbrook saying right at the beginning was tyre, tyre temperatures, everything yep. else on this car. And that's something that 
And it was one of the, the good questions from Duncan to Mike Conway. What tools do you have in the cockpit to be able to do it? And with the Toyota, they definitely have more things, more systems to be able to allow them to manage these than necessarily Glickenhouse would have. Yeah, they've also done significantly more testing so they can understand that car more. I would also add in that Pascal Vasselon, the technical director at Toyota, used to be the technical director at Michelin when I was racing the Formula 1. So does from help. that perspective, he's got a he's got an understanding what a tyre does. Yep. Kessel Racing uh, mid-stop and then uh, now on track with the 98 Aston Martin of Augusto Farfus, pulling away at the lead of this race in the 40 still against 42-9 for Giorgio Sinagiotto in the second place Cetelac racing car. In now comes the Brazilian though. This long standing campaign. Paul Delalana at the centre of it, the gentleman driver. He keeps after Martin racing in the FIWC with the end of the end of last season of the GTE Pro programme. Great to see AMR back here. Very different looking livery this year for the Northwest AMR brand on the car struggling very honestly with the different colour schemes on the Aston Martins because I, I just got used to the red of TF Sport <laughs> last year and then it's changed again and I'm fully expecting green, green, green and then a little bit of red coming in. Now we're blue, yellows, we're light blues, we're, it's, uh, yeah, it takes a little bit of getting used to. I'm sure by the end of Le Mans I'll be, I'll be ready. We're right there just by the end of the season. <laughs> it's always the way. With me it's the changes in numbers that sometimes come with seasons. Uh, with seasons. And, uh, it can be tricky just to pick them up as you're trying to read a timing screen quickly. Um, just wait, sorry, I was going to say to you, we had a picture of Farfus in there. Remember, we were talking earlier on that he had gone on to an alternative yes. tyre. And uh, that tyre actually looks to be in a very good window. And so from that perspective, he's able to match very easily the Porsches. Uh, in fact, a little bit quicker than the Porsches. So in there, I think there is definitely on that Aston Martin, then this alternative tyre is working really, really well. It's in the window and they can control it and work with it. But he's matching the GTE Pro Porsches. Yes, exactly. Uh, but he's got a less favourable BOP on that uh, Aston Martin. They are BOP differently. So he's their BOP to a different standard. So that that's pretty spectacular. Well, it comes down to the tyre working and Absolutely. it's in its window. Once the tyre's in its window, the driver can feel where the edge of the grip is. If the tyre's not in his window, whatever he does, it feels like it's just out of control. It's moving underneath him. He can't get uh, any sort of performance out of it. And as we can see, it is certainly a little bit hot out there, and that's cold water going in his head. That's Kimura Sam from Car Guy. He's uh, clearly suffered at the end of that stint aboard the Kessel car. Scott Andrews, by the way, has got back in. No sign yet, Mikkel Jensen in that car, I don't think. Martin? Significant there that the 52 Ferrari passed the 92 Porsche. The 52 Ferrari was already in second and the 92 Porsche was in third. So in lap that means Porsche are now a lap behind Ferrari. They need a bit of Brazilian blend in their tyres. They do. They're in, they need. they're in very significant tyre trouble here, aren't they? I think they need a safety car. Well, they can't actually even know the safety car if they're a lap behind. They're, nope. they're, they're on the wrong end there. of it. So. It's been one thing we've done over four hours and there hasn't actually been a hint of a full course he yellow or safety car. I know everybody's he telling me to be quiet, <laughs> but it shows you that there is, even although it's tough out there, yeah. and there's been some incidents, they've been able to clear them quickly and they've been able to get the whole system moving and uh, they've done a very good job. Well, one of the other things that's a similar kind of train of thought is this. We've got used to, in recent years, at this level of all sorts of racing, but we're here for the WC, let's talk about the WC, that the attrition rate has just gone down and down and down. And that's one of the other things that a team like Lickenhouse are going to be struggling with. It's matching that level of reliability that these heavily tested, homologated cars from major manufacturers are able to kind of grind out these laps time and time and time again and with so much customer data as well coming in, find out where the, the, the weak points are and engineer them out of them, Martin. Lee change in the GTE AM class. Thomas Floor has just sailed up the inside on Paul Dallalana. Dallalana fresh out of the pits. I'm not sure how many laps Thomas Floor has done, but he managed to go by Paul. Paul on full tanks and brand new tyres. 
not going to defend that too hard so early in the stint. Now, he's in the car. That means Augusto Farfas is out. Time to catch up with Louise Beckett in the pits. Let's talk about tyres because I understand you've gone on to the medium hot Sao Paulo <laughs> variation of tyre. Yeah, well, it is. It is a difficult call because even if the, uh, the outside conditions are pretty hot, this track it is not so high energy, so it allows you to be right in between, let's say, the medium cold and the medium hot. So uh, we did the choice. I mean, I look out for the tyre at the beginning and I could really literally keep the pace. When the team gave me the call that I was about to end of the stint, I did push a little bit more. So I'm very comfortable in the car. The car seems to work very well. Let's just try to operate at its best, and who knows, maybe we have a chance. Can you explain what you mean by medium hot and medium cold? Well, actually, to put it in a simple word, that is, to put it in a simple word, that is medium and, and hard, you know. We call the medium cold the medium hot, but actually, we might say we have soft, mediums, and hard. And the medium hot, uh, it is a way of calling the hot, the hard. So uh, literally was was the hard uh, on the car. Uh, but I, I do think also the mediums will be possible if you look out for them. Uh, of course, the hard ones allow you to push a little bit more and have a little bit more flexibility. But on the same way, they're a lot more fragile. So if you go offline or you slow down, you might lose energy on them, and you might lose also grip. So uh, I'm kind of in between on what to do. But so far, I think we did the right call, and, and we did a good job. From me seeing it, th those tyres that just came off your 98 were in great condition compared to others that I have seen down this pit lane. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, uh, luckily enough, uh, I've done so many endurance races, so you end up at the learning on how much you can push and how much you have to save and still be in the window. So uh, I think this track is literally about how much can you save on the tires without compromising the performance, uh, allowing it to get to the end of the stint and being fast. That's really informative, thank you. Thank you. Great debrief there from Augusto Farfus, telling us exactly what the tyre really means and, and, and the, the potential pitfall of it, maybe with a gentleman driver, if you're not keeping the heat in it, keeping it up in the right window, you're going to start actually destroying it as much as if it's getting too hot. It's actually as well a little bit track temperature related, and so therefore you've got a crossover between medium cold, and it's not necessarily cold 10 degrees, it's cold you know, activation like 35 degrees and above, and so therefore you look very much at the track temperature, you also then look at the energy in the tyre. I don't think they'll have a problem of getting enough energy in the tyre, I think they could have a problem of not cleaning pickup off the tyre, and once that gets in, if then you lose the confidence and then you don't actually aggressively turn in and load the tire. It's a bit of a, a downward spiral from that perspective. But uh, right round, right now, round here, it is a massive struggle if you're not on that tire in a GT car. Everybody is eating their tires. Even Toyota, we've heard them talk to their drivers about ways of managing it in the slower corners by, by making sure that there's less steering on, by really turning hard at the very lowest speed so that you open the steering up much earlier in the corner than you might want to not keep momentum just to try and keep the fronts alive so it's not just the rears it's everything it certainly is and one person that's keeping everything alive at the moment Kumu Kobayashi he's delivered a blind instance since he got in a 32.5 average Kazuki Nakajima a 33.2 seven tenths of a second difference which is funnily enough absolutely identical to Mathieu Vaxivier in the Alpine, but it's actually Kobayashi that is delivering the performance right now. And the, there's clearly a different game going between the seven and the eight. They're looking at things slightly differently, but Kobayashi is going for speed, I would have said, and, uh, and sort out the pit stop at the end. Absolutely. Now, back in LMP2, as we're on board with the number eight, uh, Ferdinand Habsburg just nibbling away at Paul de Resta, not very significant. Uh, closing of that gap and nibbling away at it but it's those two Jota cars who are what 15 seconds behind Habsburg and 20 seconds uh, seconds behind Blomqvist for 
Roberto Gonzalez that are looming there and are going to play a part here. The significant change, though, over the last hour or so, Martin, in LMP2, is that, that what was a five and six car battle for the overall has become a four car battle. And here's one of the ones that's dropped off that because it's a pro am car. Uh, and there's the smoke from the back of this car. Oh, yeah, now is that him with a tyre issue or is that something less manageable? It does look like it could it's be very tire early. rub at the very rear. It's, uh, this is only 13 laps on this stint. And they're getting ready with the trolleys. I think that's tyre rub. Has he got a collapsed left rear suspension? Well, a lot of smoke, Louis says. What does it it's smell not, of? Louise? It's the wheel. It's the wheel. It's, it's the, the hub. It's the suspension. Yeah. It's not the hub. It's the suspension has collapsed. That's exactly what I thought that smoke looked like. That's... So, well, we know that the left rear does all the hard work around here in that final corner. Uh... And that's really bad news for them. Yeah. And also, potentially, shockwaves for the rest of the field. Because if he's not had contact there, then that is the stress of the track. We've still got Watch three and a half hours to go. Watch on board. There's a lock off. The right hander. Does he touch the Ferrari? He did oh, he contact does. with the Ferrari, and that's what broke it. So it's not uh, a construction issue, it's a, reclu uh, a, a reducing gap issue. He made contact with. Which of the two Ferraris? I didn't read the number. Uh, I didn't see it. It's a uh, tire off. They're looking at the rear corner here. Remember, that's the Pro Am leader. So, high class racing will, in about a minute's time, uh, in about a minute's time, take the lead of the Pro Am class. Jan Magnussen at the wheel. Could be a win for Dad as well, a win for Lad as last night in the Emser. Well, Fritz van Eyde was getting ready to take the car over, or is getting ready to take the car over. Jan van Oyter there going for a gap that just evaporated in the sunshine. And, well, from the two Ferraris, Alessandro Pierre Guidi in 51, the GTE Pro leader, did a 141.0, and Daniel Serra did a 141.9. So, one of them got hit by somebody, there's only nine tenths of a second between the two of them. That's, if that was Sarah, then the car seems to have brushed it off remarkably well. Ferrari haven't had an awful lot of fortune with getting biffed by other cars and surviving. There's a new corner yep. all ready to go on, and that will be pre will have been preset, ready to match the settings, the suspension settings of the corner that is on the car for the race. But the odd thing was, Martin, when we saw the impact, it looked as if the impact was the front corner, not the rear corner. So quite exactly um, how the damage was done, whether or not there was a double impact we couldn't see from the driver's eye view, whether or not he clattered the kerb, I don't know. But um, the kerb was on the inside on his right. So Is there a sausage kerb there? Not sure. So yeah, you, but it's you bring right, me up to speed exactly left. where it happened, because I missed that. Uh, three? It was turn three? I thought it was turn right. three. Let's take a Sharp. look again. No, this is up at the top of the oh, hill. Sorry. So this is yeah, out of the right. hairpin. So this is out of five. Or is this up at oh, 13, that's, that's 14? A, that's a double hit. Yeah. That was a hit on the front and also on the yeah. rear. I oh. says Yop, no, no, no. And he knows. Great interview with him in the European Le Mans yeah, series uh, last bit. week, and he's saying, you know, sometimes your form is up and down a bit, but he said, I know it will come. Maybe he's feeling the pressure to just push a little too hard. Yeah. See, the real team race suits are in there as well, because TDS that runs real team also runs the Racing Team Netherlands car, so you can throw as many hands at it, drive shaft there, being held in that mechanic's hand. And there's the uh, well, if it's a hit that's on the wheel, and it looks like it's at a minimal angle, it's a hit on the wheel, then the shock has to go somewhere, and then yep. it goes in. And uh, things are designed to break at certain points, so you prefer a drive shaft to break than the internal the diff. Correct, correct. So to complete the point, as we see the new program leader, this is Jan Magnussen aboard the number 20 car. Uh, we initially had a battle at the lead of LMP2, involved six cars. Two of those have fallen back, one because it's a Pro-Am car, the other one just has lost a bit of its mojo. It, they had a, a poor stint a while ago into Europe all competition, and oddly, it was Louis Delatraz at the wheel of the car at that point. So whether or not that was 
tire related we don't really know at the moment he was on a second stint and so everybody tire. else so he was on it he was actually on a second stint and there's a big drop off was known everyone around him was on a single yeah, stint. I think that cost them dearly it dropped them away from that battle they've not recovered that ground so we're now with a effectively a four car battle at the head of the field and uh, there is the better part of a lap between fourth and fifth now uh, between the 38 car and Roberto Gonzalez. Remember, Jotep burning rapidly the required bronze driver time. Yep. You saw Geert van der Gaard helping uh, Fritz van Aert into the car. He will do his last required stint. United Autosport, Paul de Resta leading from 30 Habsburg in the 31 WRT. And then the Jota Sport car, Tom Blomqvist, ahead of uh, Roberto Gonzalez. Uh, just uh, the cue from the timing screen, instant between cars 29 and 51, it wasn't Sarah, it was Pierre Guidi. Wow. So, so he, he lost no time at all. So he got biffed and was still nine tenths quicker than Daniel Sarah. <laughs> Maybe it fired him out of the corner quicker than he might otherwise have gone. I don't think it would have dropped him really very much time at all with yeah. the, the side to side gentle impact. Manuela Gosna in the pits for Iron Lynx in the uh, number 85 Ferrari. Still no news of a penalty for them or the 60 car. They now will be running nose to, nose to tell. Car number one, I was just about to point out that Sophia Flourish and the Richard Mill Racing Team, remember how long they've been chased by Matthias Besch in the real team car? Well, real team have still not got by. So first it was Tatiana Calderon and now uh, Sophia Flourish. And in fact, Sophia has opened up a 20 second advantage over Matthias Besch. Now she will be on a fresh set and Matthias on an elderly set of tires, but Ferdy Habsburg trying to get by. And I think drivers now need to be warned by the team. If you see blue flags, don't hold somebody up for a lap because otherwise you're going to get a penalty. And that is much more than the penalty of doing what Sophia did there, which is pull off line, stand on the brakes and go again. Yeah, exactly, and that's something that uh, after about the second investigation, I would, if I was a team manager, I'd have been on to my drivers and advising the drivers before they got in and reminding them when you know a blue flag is coming. But uh, when you look at this, Van Habsburg has been absolutely dynamite these last two yes. stints. He's been a tenth quicker than Paul de Resto on both of them. Uh, and so it's a 30 lap stint before one tenth per lap quicker so pulled in three seconds and on these 19 laps so far again one tenth of a second right while you've got the laptop out flip the screen what's the track temperature doing because we're starting to see faster times coming in from a number of cars in certain sectors not overall lap times but quicker sector times I don't think Tom Blomqvist has suddenly discovered how to drive not the car. Not doing much. It's no, a little it's still bit of it's still, yeah, yeah, it's the rubber that's going down onto the circuit more than anything else. It's clean, it's tidy. There's not been there's no gravel to get dragged on and things like that. And I think uh, as well, the fuel weight is now becoming the determining factor. Everybody's understood what the tire situation is. Track temp is just hovering around the 50 degrees mark. Uh, so. You wouldn't nice, walk a dog in that. Nice 24 degrees outside. No, exactly right. If, if you can't survive in bare feet, then your dog doesn't need to be going for a walk no. now either. Uh, a, of course, uh, one, two, and a lap ahead of the factory Porsches in GT Pro. That's a pretty significant advantage they've got. They're going to have to have burned a lot of tyres recklessly if that's not a realistic advantage. Now, GT Am, the Aston Martin, 98 car still out front. Chetelar still second. Team Project One third. So we've got Aston, Ferrari, Porsche. A much more even-handed battle. Alan, because they've got access to more sets of tyres in AM, do you think? I mean, the, the deal is... I'm actually not sure. The deal is in Pro, they've yeah. all got the same number of tyres. In AM, it? they've all got the same number of tyres. We should see the same pattern if the Ferrari is fundamentally better on its tyres. Then the, 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 the Porsche should be a lap behind here in AM as well, but they're not. You've got a less of a compromise in AM because you've got more new tyres you can put on per stint to the end of the race. You don't have that double stint requirements to the same extent as you do in GTE Pro. And so then your pro driver in the pro AM section can be the one to take the double stint pain. And uh, in that respect, there's a. Was that a drive-through by for uh, no, It's a full, it's a full, full stop. It was a service. Ah, yes. 
because James Collado is now the driver, not Alessandro Pier Guidi. So uh, you're absolutely uh, right there. We didn't see the it, beginning of it, just the exit. I was just pits. checking to see whether or not that was a shorter stint. Maybe, yeah. maybe you had that damage, it was a full stint. Yeah, but they're at the entrance to the pit lane. Just as you come in, they're one of the first pits AF Corsa with about 10 garages as they come through. <laughs> and uh, the work, in fact, TDS, who run this particular operation for Racing Team Netherlands, are, are pretty close by. Yeah. And this has taken a, a bit of time. Of course, you know, he's, he's in there with bare hands. That gearbox isn't exactly going to be cool either. Everything is going to be hot, hot. You just remember, oof, as he, as he touched something that, that he probably didn't want to with bare fingers. Yeah, I think of course, all the heat from that Gibson is, isn't exactly dissipated very far. Potentially significant one to keep an eye on there. Warning to Kastakajima for abusing track limits in the second place, number eight, Toyota. Eduardo pointing out yesterday that in free practice, one, there was a 30, mile, a 30 kilometer an hour headwind coming from turn one up the hill down, uh, along the main straight. Since, it's been a 30 kilometer an hour tailwind pushing them further down into turn one, which certainly in free practice too led to an awful lot of cars sailing gaily past any, any hope of being in the same postcode as the turn-in point, but... Uh, They're struggling they, to get that. Sorry to yeah. interrupt you, they can't get that caliper off. Yeah. Well, they're going to have to just rebuild it. I, I mean, you know, Hold the problem on. is if they rebuild it around a, a new caliper, then you need to change the caliper on the other side as well, ideally. It certainly would in, in uh, you, a you, normal circumstance, but in a racing car, maybe not. Uh, I think quick. this has effectively taken them completely out yep. of any picture of anything, because right now they are uh, six, seven laps, nine laps down already on United Autosports, this particular car. So. For that team right now, it's making it to the end and at least trying to get past the 75% to get yeah, to the points. Indeed, and uh, yeah, they've fallen right off. One other quick uh, point to note. For all the time I've been watching these timing screens, uh, after we settled down into that first stint, the uh, Richard Mille racing car, the number one car, has been in 11th position because of the 29 coming back. The all-female crew up into the top 10, seventh in uh, LMP2 with consistent, pretty good times for the midfield. Not able, though, to challenge Jan Magnussen ahead at the moment, Sir Vyflersch. Yep. Uh, I'm just looking where Jan is. He's got a bit of a gap uh, to catch Kibbe in the Inter-Europe All Competition car. Uh, a bit of a disastrous moment for Racing Team Netherlands. Louise Beckett is down there and Job van Oeyter will be facing the press. Job van Oeyter for the 29 Racing Team Netherlands. I can see your disappointment. We can see the work going on behind you. What happened on track? Yeah, I think we all saw the images. Uh, I went for a gap in the basically in the penultimate corner, which Looking back on the video, it just wasn't there. Um, and I can only say massive sorry to everyone from the team. Uh, I'm the one who made the mistake here. And yeah, it shouldn't happen for sure. But we all try to fight as hard as we can. And sometimes with that, we take risks. And this was definitely unnecessary from my side. And uh, yeah, we were leading in class, which was would have been a very good result. Uh, but sadly, as you can see, we had a broken suspension. I was not expecting, like, I thought that if I go in, there could have been contact possibly, but not with any damages as, um, yeah, like this. It just, if you hit the wheels in the wrong angle, at some time they just break immediately, and that's what happened. Yeah, because you couldn't really see damage on the outside of the car, no. actually, when it came in. No, no, it was a... Uh, it was just like a light contact on the rear wheel, and that basically made a jump, but that's no reason why um, it's allowed to happen. It should never happen. This was definitely, yeah, I don't know, probably one of my worst outings in a car. <laughs> I'm sure the team appreciate that, but it is a team effort from all of you. Uh, do you, how long do you think it's going to take for the guys to get the car back out on track? Uh, I think we should be out in at least five minutes. Like, I know it will be last, but anyway, for the points, we need to go out and, and we need to finish so that we still get points for fifth. Uh, championship is long. 
so still a lot of rounds to go and, and we just need to keep on fighting but yeah it's it's uh, a big shame thank you and we also have to remember that this is points and a half for this yep. championship event as well because it's eight hours so therefore any drop down in the order alternatively in the case of the Richard Mille racing car here being moved up the order, then the actual bonus or the penalty is doubled. Absolutely oh, right. Fair, it's, it's actually one and a half. It's, it's not completely It's a double. significant. Yeah. It's. I think as we as we said, uh, the Spa race last time around. If you're going to have a problem, the six-hour race is the one to have it for. If you're looking for a, cha a championship run, well, that was that was a pretty substantial. Yeah, we've seen that a few times, that's down at turn three, and uh, the LMP2 cars are able to cut back, but the GT cars need to cut back to be able to get the line through turn four and up the hill. But yeah. that, I mean, you know, listening to, and watching the pictures and listening to Jan Van Utert, who's correctly, I think, horrified with himself, to be honest with you. That could have been the same. That could have been the same incident uh, yep. and a different lap in a different place. I think the unfortunate thing for him is not the incident to spin him around, it's the fact that uh, just the damage yep. for such what effectively is a very slight impact. Now, you'll see significantly harder impacts and nothing happens. The body works still fine and they just continue on. But uh, it was just that they're exactly the wrong angle. Now, these cars are designed to do things at seriously high force going through the suspension, through the dry shafts, gearbox, everything else. However, if it's at a slightly different angle, um, against the angle of drive, effectively, then uh, they're not designed for that, and they can, they can be like fragile, like very thin glass. Phil Hansen watching his teammate Paul DeResta leading in LMP2, with three hours, 20 minutes still on the clocks. And the fastest race lap, Mathieu Vazivier, 1 minute 31.0, some 30 odd laps ago just to put that into perspective still a 29.67 is the fastest sports car lap around this track lmp2 Mikkel jensen in the g drive Aurus last year in the european le mans series finale in very different much cooler track and temperatures track temperatures fastest ever lap around this circuit from lewis hamilton in the mercedes in last year's portuguese grand prix 1 minute 18.75. Talking to our driver, Pedro Cochera, the safety car driver, a couple of days ago, and he said, you know, even when you know motor racing and you're used to speed, he said, seeing what a Formula One car can do here just knocks you back. But as a punter, seeing the speed that the GT cars and these prototypes are carrying into some of these corners is just you know, verging on the on the insane, they are so quick on this circuit. All the rest of them having a bit of an airborne moment across the curbs. Uh, a not stellar lap from Tom Longquist at 132.184. I suspect that's the quickest we've seen in LMP2. To put that into context, that is one point one seconds off the fastest lap of the race overall by the Toyota, or and, the Alpine rather. And also seven tenths quicker than Kamui Kobayashi went in the lead Toyota on the same lap. Yeah. And this is what we saw in free practice, that LMP2 cars topped every free practice until qualifying, a hypercar did not top the timesheets. So we are starting to get potentially to a slightly cooler set of track conditions. Now that won't necessarily be detrimental to the hypercars, but it might be maybe more beneficial to our P2 cars who are a bit tire limited anyway. Well, some of them by the look of it, because Blomqvist is hurrying up to the rear of the Team WRT car. That gap now under six seconds. Richard did that. Half a, second United. Lap, half a second a lap faster as well, Tom Blomquist yep. than Ferdinand Habsburg. Admittedly, Habsburg's done a little bit more on the tyre, and so there is a tyre factor into that that we must consider. But uh, you're, there's no question that uh, he's on the march. Now, we have to remember that car as well, though, was in pole position. That car uh, yes. was spun around at the third corner by its sister car, and so it's been pretty quick over the course of this weekend. I think the most consistent car over the course of the weekend, but not in qualifying, funnily enough, was this car, the 22 United, which uh, was able to, I would say, over the course of its three drivers, deliver a very consistent, high-level performance. Do you know, it's almost as if they focus more on the race. 
Um, <laughs> no, I, but no, but I'm, I, I'm not yeah, being yeah. facetious. No, you know, no, it, all, it's almost did. like everything is focused on the race. And then if you know, if if one of them can get in and wring its neck and produce a qualifying lap, then okay, fine. I don't think they actually hit the sweet spot in qualifying. I don't think they didn't focus on it. I just don't think they hit the sweet spot. Uh, we saw some changes at the end of FP3 and movement around. They were trying, remember, they were trying to get Boyd in the car because he didn't drive on the first day uh, because of the fact that he would arrive very late, the COVID testing, everything else. So there was a compromise there from the beginning. And uh, so quality sims and things like that weren't ideal. Um, just, uh, I think they maybe missed it a little bit. Or I'm not saying they would have got pole, but uh, I think they would have been a bit closer than one. Mind you, in Belle Isle, Felipe's going, yeah, see? When I'm here, we get pole. <laughs> yeah, it's just... Oh, it's so, give me like, I mean, across the stint, so uh, it's a 134.7 average across the stint for Wayne Boyd. It's been two stints for Paul De Resta, the first in 133.74, a, almost exactly a second quicker, and then this stint a 133.8. Ma I mean, amazing consistency for De Resta. And the, and the other side of that coin, of course, is this is... First time in a World Endurance Championship for Wayne Boyd. How many races has he done in, F in an LMP2 car? Three now in ELMS. And, and he's only averaging a second less than ex Grand Prix driver Paul De Resta. So that's a big feather in his cap. I think his LMP2 career is one full season in ELMS, six races plus Sebring this year. Okay. And he'll race again, by the way, at Watkins Glen. As we saw Paul De Resta popping into the pits, the leader popping in. So that means WRT, Ferdinand Habsburg has overtaken. However, in a couple of laps, he's going to be coming in for a stop as well. So we'll keep a close eye on the actual pit stop times here, because as we know, Jota Sport are pretty quick as uh, now Racing Team Netherlands is back out. The five minutes prediction from Job van Oetert is pretty much spot on. Uh -huh. worth, worth pointing out, by the way, for those who may not have been here so far for the first four hours and 40 minutes, what on earth were you thinking? That WRT had not one but two drive-through penalties so far in the race. Otherwise, they probably would have been out front through all the pit stop cycles right from the beginning. So they haven't helped themselves, but they are still really in the hunt. They are, and that's come certainly in the uh, recent... Uh running from a couple of stellar stints from Ferdinand Habsburg. You're right, they'd, they'd be a minute up the road here. And uh, they'll be kicking themselves, I'm sure, for that. Jota, though, remember, off sequence here. And yeah. They're, they're, this race stays green, and they are looking very good. They haven't got a full stop in hand over anybody, nope. but their last stop will be later in the race and will require less fuel. And as the others stop in front of them at each round of stops so far, Jota have popped to the top. That will happen again, and it remains to be seen then how much advantage either one or both of them can eke out before they need to make that final shorter stop. So. It's, it's not about the final stint or the final in lap or the final out lap or the lack of fuel. It's every single lap now. If you can find a tenth on any one of these laps in the next three hours and 16 minutes, it might be a vital tenth at the end of the race. There's Paul De Resta just checking the data with the engineers. Yeah, Dave Greenwood there just on the, with his back to us as a technical director at United and uh, looking into the detail. Fans of Formula One will have heard his voice. He's uh, one of the ex-Ferrari engineers and also, I think he was at... Uh... Oh, I can't remember the other Formula One team he was at. He's good then. Yeah, he's got very good experience. Very, very good experience. It's, it's... Uh, he's got an understanding of performance and where performance lies, and that's not necessarily just in a millimetre of front right height, it's in the whole structure of the team. It's the unseen, unheard part of it, isn't it? And this is when we go on about strategy and rule sets that perhaps take away the, the influence of strategy and that technical knowledge, that's what we're talking about. It's the genius that sits in the pit lane or on the pit wall. Martin. I was just about to say that there's been a change in the power play between Real Team Racing with Matthias Besch in the number 70 car, the darker blue car, and Beitzka Visser, who took over the number one Richard Mill Racing team. They were in 10th, Real Team were in 11th. 
But that has now changed around since that pit stop. But Max Kavissa was right behind Matthias Pesce there. WRT in the pits. They surrender the lead to Jota. Tom Blomqvist and Roberto Gonzalez will go through. Gonzalo is only 40 seconds behind WRT, who aren't going to get a pit stop done in that short period of time. So good lap times, by the way, coming at the moment from Roberto Gonzalez. Yep. And then again, he's the less well-ranked driver in this team and laps in the 33s towards the end of his stint. So 30 Habsburg is out of the car. Uh, Alex Brundle is back in at, into Europol. Did Kubish Mikowski do a double stint there or was that a single stint? It was a double stint. It was a double. Yep. I had a feeling it was. Yep. Okay. Yep. So Delatrans he's got did a double one to do, it. hasn't he? And Alex did a double. So they've all, yep. all doubled double, through double, that double. particular car, yeah. Gonzalez has got five laps to go. OK, Tom Blomkist, fastest first sector of the race for the number 28 Jota Sport car. Fastest first sector of the race for Matthias Besch as well, for real team, the and number 70 car. And middle sector as well for Tom Blomkist. Yeah. He's just followed it up with the quickest middle sector. He's flying at the moment, Blomkist. He's finding the pace in the car. Yep. And Kobayashi on this lap, fastest final sector of the race for his Toyota. Oh, that was close. Yeah. There was the earthing wire, just caught it. As the car left, he just caught it to, uh, to, to take the thing off the, the galaxy panel, pull it to the back done. of the car. Driver's getting ready at Jota Sport. The car may be green, but all dark green race suits are not, obviously, what they've gone for. And there you can see the 60 Ferrari ahead of the Danish high-class entry. That's car number 20 in the pits. Jan Magnussen brought it in. And that is Antonio Felix da Costa. No, it's, no, it's Anthony, Anthony Davidson. Davidson rather getting ready to go. Uh, who's getting ready for the other car? I don't... Uh, at the moment, they could... Double stint, Tom. Yeah, I think, yeah, Blomqvist may well double stint, and Ant may be getting in for a double as well, I think. Because Galil has done three stints now, so okay. effectively he could be out of it, and it would leave it down to Stoffel van Dorn and Tom Blomqvist. So in my sort of basic team manager thought I would double stint Blomqvist now, then yep. uh, also take van Dorn possibly to the end. Yep. Well, keep him in and just tell him he's doing it. Matthias Pesch in the pit lane for real team racing. And this will drop them back behind. We should be a racing team high class. Jan Magnussen still in the pits, or the car is still in the pits. Charles Milesi took over at WRT. So it'll be his second stint. And 54A of Corsa Ferrari in the pits. Thomas Floor bringing it in. Number seven, Toyota, Kamui Kobayashi, our race leader in traffic, chasing one of the pro-class Porsches. Michael Christensen and Richard Leitz are at the helm of the two Porsches. This will be an interesting stint for Malesi in the WRT LMP2 car because he's done one stint before, but that was interrupted, if we remember, by the two drive-through yep. penalties they had to serve. Yep, yep. And so he did a four laps, 10 laps, and then 16 laps, and so it wasn't getting into the rhythm at all. Norman Nato has taken over the number 70 real team racing car. Mike Scavissa moves up to 10th for Richard Mill, ahead of high class and dragon speed. Henrik Hedman has brought the number 21 car into the pits as well. So dragon speed down in 12th. Here is the Alpine. Mathieu Vazivier, a minute 15 behind. And the gap, have we seen as big a gap between the two Toyotas? Kamui Kobayashi is nearly 18 seconds ahead of Kaz Nakajima in the number eight car. That is a big advantage. The, the, the two gaps that are growing there, yet you're right, it's first to second, and it's also the Alpine is falling off the back of this. They are about to release the Lapierre, and is this the in-lap? Uh, this is the in-lap for Kobayashi yeah. at the moment. Oh, for Kobayashi, yeah. OK. Nakajima, Looks... we've got a little bit to go, and it's also the in-lap for uh, Vaxivie. That was my question. So so the Toyota has now, or ha is now going to produce a full stop advantage? Yes, yes, yes. Wow. This is the this was the point that yeah. uh, they needed to be actually pulling away as opposed to as it swung around where they're being sort of caught and dragged in, and we see Vaxivi already pulling into the pit lane. 
as he does so for another fastest lap of the race for the Jota car, now leading the race. Tom Blomqvist, another lap in the 32 ones. Oh, he's on fire. It's at the it's end of the though. stint. He's got a couple of laps to go, he's, uh, but he's very, very quick. He's only two tenths of a lap on average over this full stint. Slower than Mathieu Vaxivi and the Toyota is oh, in the pit lane. That's going to be a penalty, I'm yeah. sure, for the Toyota Absolutely. as he came into the pit lane, got onto the grass somehow, and then lost the braking force and then banged into one of the, the pilots. But there, there's also RFID that was for, the, hit. for the tire recognition yeah. system for the stewards, uh, for the, the organizers. So, and because he was locked up on the grass, he'll have come through the speed limit going too quickly. So, speeding in the pits, hitting infrastructure that was not a good entry to the pits for Kamui uh, for Kaz Nakajima here we see it again uh, and he's Kobayashi locked rather. up for a long Wait. time you look at the black marks the tire marks wow as he's whacked it's actually not the RFID we're quite lucky there it's uh, just purely the 60 Ooh. pylon yeah and uh, so from that perspective then uh, not good and I would suspect there's going to be an inquiry into that yeah that's a big lockup. He carried too much speed in. He's lucky, actually, because there's metal barriers around something in the middle of the pit lane in what would be the hot lane. And out comes the Alpine, where it should not have been in front but of the with Toyota. The, with but a, with a t potential penalty looming yeah. as well for the number seven car. But a stop behind. But that is only going to realistically affect the battle between eight and seven. There's Philippe Signeau watching with interest. Yeah, but it bring, if there's penalties coming into it, it brings in the potential yep. of a safety car bringing the whole system back together. And uh, when you look at it there, it was a one minute uh, six pit stop time by the seven. Kamui Kobayashi and a 118 by Nicolas Lapierre. But that would have been driver change to uh, tires. Yeah. Tires, <clears throat> whereas yeah. it was a fuel only stop, I suspect, for Kamui Kobayashi. Yep which means he's had to go back out on the tyre that he's done a bit of damage to coming into the pit lane. Um, and you know, you're saying about speeding in the pit lane. How long does it take them in a uh, fuel-only stop? Uh, one minute and seven, one seven seconds. Yeah, a minute and seven. What has he done it in? One minute and six. All other things being equal, mm. he was too fast. Yeah, yeah. yeah I think he, he can't have been down to speed if he was locked up on the grass hitting stuff. No. He can't have been. And he well, I'm curious why he was locked up and pointing straight to the grass. Yeah, coming in too hot, or there's a potential issue with the braking. Yeah. Both both fronts were locked up, Mark. Yeah. Remember, we did have those cars in some braking troubles deep into the race at Spa. Yep. And we've got two more hours to get through here we and do. in higher temperatures. And it, you would think, Alan, a track that's probably a lot harder on brakes than Spa is, and you don't get any chance for them to cool down here. P2 leader on the pit lane after that yep. stellar stint from Tom Blomqvist. Tom Blom ahead of Roberto Gonzalez. Gonzalez will come in this lap as well. They're normally queued in the pit lane, although he's 40 seconds back. So Blomqvist, Blomqvist should have gone by the time 38 gets in. This is a punishing track in all sorts of ways. There's one notifiable straight down the front and then a short shoot down into the hairpin. He's back in. Or is that no. Kaz Nakajima? That is Nakajima. Yep. OK, it is Nakajima. Just behind uh, Roberto Gonzalez from second in on the yep. two. That's the car you can see in the distance there. The warning flag, meanwhile, for driver Roman Dumas. Oh. Track limits. Yeah, these rookies, you know, need to be reminded. Yeah. You won't have that next week at Pike's Peak. <laughs> 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 Yeah, you're either on the track or it, the track limits tend to be fresh air, don't yes, they? Yes, indeed. Yeah. Miro Konopka has retaken the wheel of the ARC Bratislava car in LMP2. They're in 10th place. For the time being, meanwhile, Wayne Boyd takes the lead in LMP2 with the two Jota cars. It's like off sequence there, of course, again. Yep. Now, seven continues on its merry way. It's a new fastest lap of the race immediately for Nico Lapierre, a 131.018. Wow. Yeah, Lapierre is determined to try and pile the pressure on Toyota. All he can do is try and pile the pressure on. That's, yeah. that's basically his job between now and the end of the race. 33 in the pits as well. You can see the turquoise Aston Martin and Ben Keating. Keating brought it in. 
door was open, but that's the right door, not the driver's door. And here is 28, Stoffel van Dorn on the outlap, just ahead of Charles Milesi. This is the battle for second in LMP2. The yellow highlight on the nose marks 28, not 38. 38 car from Jota Sport also on an outlap, and that is at Davidson in fourth place. Uh, am I correct that there's a timing glitch and the 36 has not been scored on lap here? Uh, it's not two minutes down on the leader. It leads the race. No, it's ahead of. Oh, apologies, they've, eight, all had a, they've, all, no, they've all had a stop, haven't they? <clears throat> yeah. And he did have a longer stop than the. They've done six stops at Alpine, only five at Toyota, and he stopped on the same lap as seven, and there's Malaysia oh. around the outside. That's wow. Billy Big Watts it's for Charles Malaysia. He goes around the outside of Stoffel van Dorn in the 28 Jota Sport car. Did he, over did he, put did he overtake on the... Uh, did yeah. he so he overtook, so therefore, normally, he should have to give that place back Indeed. because that was a long and lasting advantage. Yeah. If he had all four wheels off on the outside, especially at turn one, which is where almost every lap in qualifying was disallowed, then he will have to give it back. And somebody as savvy as Van Sam Voss will say, OK, just pull over, let him go, go again. You know you've got the car under you. Well, it's not as if Stoffel van Dorn's slow. No. And so it's not like he's holding him up too much. Tom nope. Blomquist there taking a well-earned drink, because that was a pretty dynamic stint by him. Stoffel so. is in here. It was that it's not his outlap this lap, but he'd just come off his outlap, and so Charles had a little more heat in the tyres. Carves his way through. Malaysia is not keen on giving that spot back. No, not, not at the moment. So he's not going to do it off his own volition. At the same time, talking about performance, then uh, Nicolas Lapierre, he did that. Here we see it again. Uh, and... There's no chance he's on the track, but he's going to claim that he was forced off. It's, it is a tough one. I have to be honest, if I was in Stoffel van Dorn's position, I would do the same, and if yeah. it was in Charles Malaisi's, I would do the same, and yeah. I would wait until I was told. Oh, oh, right, oh, that was close. Oh, that was. And that's how Malaisi was it. able yeah. to get a run yeah. to overtake van Dorn. Yeah, and that was the uh, Iron Dames car of Rahel Frey, which is in sixth place in GTEM. I think when you're on the outside, you leave yourself vulnerable to somebody just taking the road away from you. And Stoffel was entirely entitled to do that. He was in front going into the corner. And, uh, again, if I was Van Sam Voss, let him go. He'd been compromised on his run down there and yep. uh, felt he had to defend. Yeah. But Milesi was on the outside, and it was always possible that he was just going to get pushed further wide. And he did gain the advantage by using the runoff area. He gained a long and lasting advantage. Yeah. The, the way you always look at it is if that is a wall, then would he have been able to make the, no. the overtake? He would have no tanked way. it. Yeah. So Roman Dumas hands over, you assume, to Richard Westbrook in the Glickenhaus. And the car now has completed uh, 142 laps of the race. The leader is on lap 180A to Malaysi. Has got a front end that he's overdriving. He's trying to keep Van Dorn behind him. Yep. And Stoffel now perfectly placed to open DRS and breeze by. Oh, no, hang on a minute. Oh, dear, oh, dear. Look at the way that the WRT car pulled out that advantage out of the final corner. Well, we've known in Spa that straight line speed was not the setup strength of the Jota car. It was in other areas, and they've improved a little bit, but uh, certainly the WRT car is looking pretty sling in the straight, sorry, very slippery on the straight. Mm. Closing on traffic ahead, it's a Mon P2 car on a GT car, there it is, it is the Dragon Speed car on the TF Sport car on the challenge now for this pair. 33 we saw on the pitch a couple of laps ago, and Dylan Pereira is now at the wheel of that bright blue car. And as we see now just behind uh, the third place overall car, the 36, Alpine is on its way through. You said about pressure, Nicola Lapierre's outlap, a 131.0, his second lap, 31.1, his third lap, 131.3. And so he's just delivered three laps that are quicker than Toyota in the first three laps of this stint. It's called keeping the pressure on. 
or alternatively keeping the pressure off of uh, stopping them from lapping that car because he's a minute and 24 seconds uh, behind the number seven Toyota that leads the race. It's a 131-132 gap trouble. Yeah, Glickenhaus after the pit stop, remember they just came out of the pits and that car's going very slowly. And so Richard Westbrook is in the car. I thought initially they were moving to the side because of uh, lap traffic, but this looks like it's going to be coming back into the pits. Louise, I'm sure, will be running down to the red Glickenhaus pit to find out what's going on. Just being told she's at WRT at the moment, but I, I on her way that, very soon. I think that was, I don't run. I think I was, uh, that was my interpretation of it. Yes. Definitely. WRT around the outside of the Ferrari is on the inside. Again. Oh. Got the, Mike on the run here. Yeah. Here's a great opportunity for the Jota Sport car of Stoffel van Dorn. Goes by and right behind. Why is it always the Alpine at the hairpin where things are just about to happen in front of him? I've got to say that I think is two occasions now where there has been an advantage by being completely off the circuit. Yeah. And uh, he, was, he wouldn't have overtaken round the outside if he hadn't have been able to go off the circuit. In reality, it lost the position but uh, he's got to be careful of that as a general point because you can get away with it maybe once. Uh, however, you can't get away with it every single overtaking. Big lock up as well there from Malaysia. And Don lets the Alpine go. Well, again, the Alpine there doing the same job on the P2 as the P2s do on the GTs there. The P2 needed more, more room. And uh, again, Stoffel wanted to get rid of the Alpine before he got here, where he's trying to build up speed to the final corner. He didn't really need to catch the car, guys. Kessel Racing Ferrari there, but Milesi has to go the long way around the outside. High, wide and handsome, ladies and gentlemen. He does like the outside line, doesn't he? He likes the off-track excursion occasionally as well, doesn't he? You think, does he drive coach trips in the rest of the week? <laughs> so, the uh, Is spectator safari. It's the Jota boys enjoying life at the moment. A ahead of all of this, incidentally, lest we neglect to say, Wayne Boyd is once more in the number 22 United Auto Sports car, leading LMP2 here. And putting in some good times at the moment. Stoffel van Dorn in that battle last time around 135, 133.4 from Wayne Boyd. 138 for Charles Milesi that lap, 132 for Ann Davidson, 132.8. So Wayne Boyd with a 133.4, not far away from Ann Davidson's pace. 91 is in, the least well-placed of the two Porsches. He's in fourth in GT Pro. Fuel going in, we're going to take the cap off this time. Yeah, I, think, I think that's a one own, once only it's issue. It's not the kind of thing you do twice, is it? Yeah. So, left sides only, left sides only. Well, we were in a pit lane, Graham, on Thursday, Friday rather, watching left side tyre rehearsals up and down. Yep. It, it was clear that everybody looked at this track and, and looked at what Hamdi Lee, LMS, even if they weren't here, you know, people like Tom Ferrier were, going, yeah, this is going to be a left sides only track, isn't it? Yep, Ricard Leitz. And uh, he was here last year, of course, with the LMS, with the Proton Competition team, one of the mentors for Michael Fassbender in that program. But, uh, now aboard the factory car. And yes. Rex, uh, ex champion, of course, with the 2015. Uh, he was the GT Pro champion before it was F an official FI World Championship. Interesting how the young guns at Porsche eventually become the elder statesmen and then the senior citizens. I'm thinking of the likes of Christian Menzel, who mentors their junior program, and Xavier Masson, who's now in charge, uh, Sasha Masson, who's now uh, overlooking all of their young drivers. Five hours into the eight hours of Portimao race that started in warm and slightly cloudy conditions. Promise of good weather all the way through. Stark contrast to Spa Francorchamps, where you can never entirely trust forecasters. From the first ever French car to, or French team to take pole position, Cinetech leading away. The hypercar ahead of two hypercar rivals from Toyota. The number 28 G. Um, Jota Sport car leading in LMP2 all the way up to turn three where it was collected by its sister car 
and turned around Tom Blomqvist, the pole sitter, around the nose of Antonio Felix de Costa, by which time Racing Team Nederland had already gone around the outside from two to three to take the lead. Porsche qualified better than Ferrari, but that has been reversed in the race. Ferrari working their way to the front. Contact between Dragon Speed and the Jota Sport car, earning Dragon Speed a penalty. Racing Team Nederland for a long while battling at the front of the LMP2 field. Dragon Speed serving their penalty. Racing Team Nederland also the top Pro-Am car. Then the first big incident of the race, Ryan Briscoe just not judging the length or width of the Glickenhaus new hypercar, collecting 777 and 77. The Aston Martin and the Porsche both survived the initial contact, but not its after effects. Team WRT at the front of the field, battling with United Autosports, but their charge was hobbled slightly by a pair of penalties. And the Aston Martins that had rushed to the front early in the race in GTM, soon being closed down by the Ferraris. Porsche starting to struggle. All Ferrari battles, Chetila and AF Corsa's 54 machine struggling against each other for supremacy in the GTE AM field. Toyota executing team orders on occasion to move one or the other car ahead, depending on which was deemed to be quicker. And the Aston Martin with a battle for the lead on its hands with the 54 Ferrari. Aston Martin back in front, courtesy of using a new hard tyre. Big error by Jot van Eytert, a slight contact with the Ferrari, but just enough to break the rear suspension and the drive shaft of the Racing Team Netherlands car and leave them at the tail of the field. And that leaves the uh, number 20 high-class racing car second in Pro-Am behind Real Team, United Autosports leading in LMP2, the number seven Toyota leading the race outright. Next round of pit stops for GT AM cars underway with GR Racing and Dempsey Proton's 88 machine both in the pit lane. Martin Haven, Alan Manish and Graham Goodwin watching the action with you from trackside here in Portimao where Toyota are 1-2 with a potential question mark over penalties as the number seven Toyota hit everything there was to hit coming into the pits a little too quickly last time round. United Autosports, Jotas and WRT, the four cars in contention it seems for LMP2 honours. Ferrari a lap ahead of Porsche in GTE Pro but it's Aston Martin, Ferrari, Ferrari and Porsche in GTE AM that battle definitely seems yet to be decided. So that's it after five of our eight hours. The temperature now still remains pretty constant, air temperature around 24 degrees. It's just after five o'clock in the afternoon here in Portimao. And the temperature started dropping in qualifying around 6 p.m. where we are currently at just under 49 degrees, but in the Half an hour it took us to do qualifying. Temperature dropped from 40 to 25 odd degrees. So we could see a very major change in the final hour and a half or two hours of this race. We're watching the action LMP2 here. It's uh, worth a, before we get to go and talk about GTE uh, EM, let's go and have a word with Valzon Voss down in the pit lane with Louise at WRT. The number 31 WRT is putting in a great performance there and some great battles in LMP2. Yeah, well, unfortunately, uh, we had already two drive through uh, yeah. due to uh, some issues. One was, uh, one was not able to uh, engage the pit limiter in the first pit stop um, at the right time. Uh, the second one for blue flags. Uh, not always easy to understand and to accept them, but uh, well, we are still there fighting for, we are only uh, 16 seconds from the lead and uh, about three hours to go. You just laughed at me when I said it's not stopping you, but clearly it's not stopping you. Okay, it has set you back, but you're still showing you guys are strong. Yeah, but uh, we could have been a bit further. <laughs> yes, I appreciate that. <laughs> can you do? We've still got a long way to go. Yeah, it's still a long race. I mean, uh, 
it's not an easy race. There is a lot of uh, overtaking, and uh, I mean the the number of uh, of contact is quite high. Um, there is a lot of strategy going on, and uh, let's see what we can do till the end. May I suggest that maybe a tire strategy coming into play at the end there? Well, I know we are all in a different strategy, I believe, and uh, let's see uh, how, how we get on at the end. Okay, thank you. Now, where is the flat hat? Maybe I, maybe we need to give him a Panama for hotter races. I think, I think that would be the right way to definitely. But, uh, as we watch here at the 31 car with uh, Toyota getting by the 31. Um, GTM, we begin to get the big guns rolled out here again. And uh, mm -hmm. with what I'm watching at the moment, it's a battle for third position begins to develop. Jeff racing with Antonio Fiocco, one of the youngsters that Ferrari have got their eyes on, without a shadow of a doubt. Uh, with Matteo Caroli, uh, aspirant Porsche factory driver for some years now, um, in fourth. And that's a uh, oh, That's way, the leader. That is the leader. Paul Dallalana of this parish in the 98 Aston Martin, the Northwest car rotating at the top of the hill there at turn eight. The top of one of, one of many tops of the hills. Indeed. So the, 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 the two young drivers there, something of a battle here, and they're exchanging fastest laps. At the moment, Caroli. The quick with the two under the 140s more than once uh, uh, as he starts trying to chase down the Ferrari. The gap about 16 seconds. I'll keep an eye on that one because that could get very interesting. Got some fairly large gaps at the moment, but remember this is a pro am class, yep. and it's going to depend who's burned that bronze driver time. Right, as we saw that little replay, we cut back to the AMR garage and people getting ready for a car to come in. Does Paul Dallalana head into the pit lane or does he feel that the car's OK? Seems OK. Notice with the front exit exhaust just behind the rear wheel, when you get a side-on shot of the car, how smeared with black oil it is. The car is, the fuel that they're using this year, burning more oil. And so they have to keep topping it up because is just for some reason getting through more oil than it previously would have and that's streaked down the side of the car. And Dallalana coming to the end of a stint actually, he's done 34 laps in this one, but it's been a pretty blinding stint apart from that particular spin against Augusto Farfus who was in before, who was, as we know, quicker than the Porsche GT pros. As we see a replay of it, he just gets wide onto the gravel and then as he's trying to get it sorted out, it does a loop around. But uh, he was only a second and a half off Augusto Farfus on average through the course of the stint. So it was a pretty strong stint, but ultimately lost more in that one spin than yeah. uh, anything else. Yeah. And bear in mind, we were lost in some admiration of Farfus's pace uh, at the time, so a very good yardstick indeed for the bronze-ranked Canadian driver. Scott Andrews in the Kessel Racing Ferrari. Kessel Racing Ferrari Challenge, Ferrari Maranello Challenge. Uh, they race in the uh, GT3 series. They've raced in GTE and in Asian Le Mans, European Le Mans, Michelin Le Mans Cup. They have, this Swiss team have raced Ferraris for a, first, well, since 355. So they, they've had a long and storied history with it, having a pretty decent race in their debut here in the World Endurance Championship. As, as a background team, have a Le Mans win under their belts. They were the technical support behind Scuderia Corsa's win, the American team at Le Mans some years ago. It's uh, great to see them back here in a further collaboration with the Car Guy squad from Fuji, just uh, outside the circuit. Um, I see it comes to Lana. And, uh, that will continue through to the Le Mans 24 hours. Now, is he going to get left sides here, or are they just going to send him out on the tyres that he's already looped round into the gravel? By the way, hearing from the Toyota team that there is no evidence of mechanical issues with that number seven car coming in and biffing things in its way. And there's the ARC Bratislava car in the gravel, and this might be our first significant yellow flag period of the entire race. I just got went in a bit deep, got wide, got onto the dirty stuff and looped it around. It was uh you know, okay? up, yeah. Yeah, not uh, he, he, it all started as he was turning in. But just a little bit on Dalalana's car as well. 
the rear diffuser, uh, which is an aerodynamic device that sits at the back of the floor. It's broken on the left-hand side, whether that was broken in a previous incident or broken when he was bouncing across the dirt and dust and everything else, I don't know. But that will lose a little bit of stability from the rear of the car. And Miro Kalonka has the door open. We could go full course yellow here. He's at turn eight. That's the top of the hill on the sort of top right of your map there. You can see the little yellow highlights. Pit entry closed. We are under safety car. Pit okay. entry closed. We are under safety car. Oh, yellow flags and safety car boards out. That's straight a... to safety car. That's a minute gained by the Alpine. Yep. A game on. Now then. That's not a minute gained, that's a lap gained because the Toyota was not far behind him, so he'll go round he will. to join the back of the queue that will have the Toyota at the front. Alan's waving, Alan. Yeah, but uh, there's going to be probably about 18 or 20 cars between the Toyota yeah. and the Alpine, so it's not as if they're going to line up absolutely line astern. There will be some traffic in between of them, I would suspect. But Interestingly there, there's also about eight or ten cars between the two Toyotas yep. as well. Sir, 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 what groups of cars are imminently due pit stops, if any, i.e., are all the LMP2 cars suddenly going to go, safety car, we need a pit stop, and we're only two laps away. There's Bruno Carrera, he left the pits Summer like will. that with me in the car <laughs> yesterday. The other point I'd make, as I was just checking that one through, is this. The task ahead now for Lapierre completely changes. His task, since he got in the car, was to ensure that he pulled away and was not lapped by the Toyotas. Yep. His task now is to chase them. And yes. by the way, since he got in the car, he's taken the better part of 10 seconds out of the Toyotas. But this time he'll be chasing from behind them rather than Correct. from all, almost <laughs> in front Correct. of them, yes. Well, if it works out perfectly and the pits open up, 57, the leader in GTE AM, is absolutely one lap away from his wow. natural pit stop window. And that would be just heaven for them. And Paul Dallinana has just stopped under green. Yeah, just pitted. Everybody else is kind of in the middle. Yeah. Nicholas Nielsen as well in the 83 Ferrari. He's uh, very close to it. But everybody else is sort of mid-stint-ish. Uh, White Scarvissa in the number one car could probably do it. And, uh, but if you then go towards the end of the race, and that's where you extrapolate towards the end of the race. Even as Alan predicts, in comes Antonio Fuoco in the car guys, Kessel Racing Ferrari that leads in GTE AM. He will get a safety car stop, but will he get out before the safety car queue comes around? He, he can he only take emergency lap? service, can't he? Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, 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 closed. yeah. So you can only take five seconds of fuel. Yeah. We'll have to come to back get in around again. and go around again. So actually, that didn't work well for him. Did you see, by the way, in the inset shot in the ARC Bratislava garage, the old-fashioned equivalent of the Discord, which is one of the team guys saying to the cameras, "Just push him out." <laughs> Clearly, he's got fire in the hold, but he's buried in the gravel. And Miro Konopka only popped the door open so he could get a bit of fresh air, because otherwise, he's just going to boil. You know. Race drivers die in hot cars. We're two minutes away from this being a full stint <sighs> sequence for an LMP2 car home. Ooh. Which means Jota can take that short stop now, or Ooh. that stop now, and be on strategy to finish this race. Right, here comes the tow vehicle. And here can up and go, pull me out, pull me out. That's an amazing... But, uh, you know, you, you, not with Mirror Konopka, but it's amazing. I, I'm not sure that they speak, speak much Slovak. He may not have an awful lot of Portuguese either, but between the two, he is going to want to be pushed, pull, pulled out. And uh, oh, they don't want the flatbed. That's what the team really don't want. It's a turn eight. There doesn't appear to be any damage. He's just beached in the gravel. They could really, really do with not being stuck on a truck. Now, there is a tow rope on the back of that pickup. Safety car comes around. And Eduardo Freitas will, if he can, get the car snatched out of the gravel and back onto terra firma. This could be a four, five, six lap safety car, potentially. Because once the car comes out, there will be a lot of gravel there that will need cleaning. Air temperature still hovering around 24. Track temperature. Well, it's gone from 48.9 down to 48, and that's in 
some 30 minutes or so. So it remains stable. The skies are blue. The sun is still beating down. And uh, Gary Roberts, sure like the rest of us, pasty Brits, happy to stay out of that, I think, at the moment. He lives in the shadows. <laughs> Don't we all? Don't we all? That's why we're all... That's why all our French crew who come from the Côte d'Azur are all a very different colour to us. So safety car wave buys now. Look at that. How many cars were there between the Toyotas? Well, there's none now. There ain't many. And then there's also then uh, one, two, three. three. Three AM cars in front of the Alpine. And not too far back is the Glickenhaus as well. And, and again, this suggests to me that Eduardo thinks there's going to be quite... It's not going to be a brief safety car. We're not going green this time round because he's doing wave buys. He has to do wave buys at certain yeah. points. Once yeah. they activate, they have to do wave buys yeah. unless it's within the last hour, I think, and then the, or 30 minutes, and then they've got the flexibility to decide. But at the same time, they're obviously pulling this car out and they'll maybe tidy up a few yeah. other things that uh, are going on. That's that, actually what he does, isn't it? It's a yeah. bit of a tidy up. Absolutely. He's got a housekeeping list and it's all getting done. Now, I think what they're doing is lifting him up, squaring up. They're going to put him back on the track, facing in the right direction, which oh, he definitely you wasn't. Um, yeah, all uh, right, right. Fella, if you've got an engine, we'll put you... It's like you put your scale electrics car back in the grooves. Off you go. Fantastic. You make it sound so simple. It will. <laughs> Eduardo is making it simple. He's got him on. He's got him on the crane. Dangle him onto the road. Off he goes. Well, with the way that uh, things are at the moment, the safety car is at turn five, as we know. But the cars that were released on the start and finish line are now about half a lap ahead. So we've at least got another lap before that there could be any chance of it going green. Yeah, we've got to move that truck as well back out of the way to where it originally was on the hard standing. We've got to move the snatch vehicle or rescue vehicle. Miro Konopka may just opt to join the back of the queue, so we won't go green this lap. Chances are there'll be another lap after this. Yeah, and suddenly, when how many laps have we done now? Is this second lap of safety car, so the pit lane remains shut? They are on the second lap. Uh, the other thing, of course, those uh, intervention vehicles will have to be back to a place of safety. Yep. They've not moved yet. Well, they're not just to a place of safety, back to where they were originally placed, because really that would have given him the most options. Exactly, yeah. yeah. So they're strategically placed for a reason, to cover as many eventualities as possible. So Eduardo will want them back where they started their day. Yeah, so re remember, this is a reasonably short lap, and the, uh, yep. the second queue, if you like, the rather more fast-moving queue are rapidly making their work to the back of the yeah. safety car train. Safety car train rear is at the moment at turn 11 and the front of the chasers, if you like, is at turn 9. They're going to be with them at the end of this lap. And that will then give our safety car driver, Pedro Cachero, a chance to bring the speed of the train back up to actually allow everybody to get heat into their tires. Heat into the tires, we'll be complaining about the tires being too hot for the whole day. Well, drivers... I, think, I think the tires will be going, oh, thank goodness for that, we're going I through know. turn 15. Uh, just give me a break, give me another breather for another lap, throw some water at me, please. But drivers are like farmers, it's never the right weather. It's either too hot or too cold or too something. Safety car in the next lap. Let's hear from Paul De Resta. He's handed over the 22 car to Wayne Boyd. They lead in LMP2. Paul, it's always good to catch up with you yourself. Paul De Resta, driver of the 22 United car. You're the super sub this weekend, but you've been superseded in super subness by Wayne Boyd. How do you think Wayne's doing right now? Uh, it's obviously quite a big ask for Wayne to come into this race. Um, you know, he only got the phone call. Thursday morning, and then he kind of arrives here. Time he done his test, missed all of Friday. And when you do your first World Championship event, there's you know there's a lot of pressure and a lot on him. So to get in the car on Saturday, try and get up to speed. But we're both on the back foot because I haven't driven a car since Bahrain last year, and then to be put into this environment uh, to try and get up to speed's been tough enough for me. Never mind him. So I think we've been a little bit on the back foot just in terms of direction. Uh, but somehow we've managed to get ourselves to the front. It's just whether it's going to play out there, because I think on pure, pure pace, we're maybe not just quite where we need to be. We can see Phil behind you is suited and booted, ready to go. Have you had any chat with Phil in between stints? 
No, I think you've just got to go on with it. Uh, it was quite a short gap. I've just got out of the car after a couple of stints, due to get back in, obviously. Um, but, you know, with a safety car at this point in the race, you know, you're five and a half hours in. With two and a half to go, this is where it all gets a bit fruity, and ultimately strategy can play a massive part. Looking good for tyres? Tyres are fine. Um, as I say, it just depends if you went long enough in the stints uh, and where you were. We were a bit out of sync with the other cars, which I think um, was something that surprised us, how others have been able to achieve something. But listen, it's all about how you come here and do it. And it's been quite a tough weekend of, off the back of what they had a great weekend in Spa. Thank you, Paul. Cheers. Right, are we going to see the lights go out on the safety car? We are into sector two, uh, sector three of the lap, so we should have seen them go off if we go green this lap. That's normally the way it works at the end of timing. Sector two, the lights go off to allow everybody a chance to get themselves back up to speed. The, the queue has not quite joined up, and Eduardo may still have marshals out of their uh, safe areas doing debris collection. I know down at, at the uh, hairpin there was a big lump of bodywork sitting there just offline so that would definitely be on his list of things to get shot off. Also we introduced the uh, marker ball to the pit lane. Super interview by the way Duncan. Yeah, super. Yeah. Super great smashing. Super. Super. Uh, so safety car remains out. Now, uh, is the pit lane open and is anybody going to risk going in if we go green this lap? Not sure they are. So I think any chance of anybody doing a bit of a, a quick shuffle in and out of the pits has not happened. Georgia Gazoo racing with a pit stop in hand. They lead 1-2 over Rebellion. Rebellion is about the sixth or seventh car in the queue. Oh, Rebellion, Cinetech, Alpine, there it is. Yeah, all right, so it's a year ago. There you go, picking up the debris. Yep. Just Rescue talking about that pit entry is actually open. Yeah. And so they can come in this lap. However, it now, depends yeah. whether the safety car actually pops its lights off and comes into the bits as well, because it looks as if the circuit is pretty clean. Yeah, the bin men have been, so uh, handles out, bin men about, handles in, bin, bin men have been. Um, Still no explanation of Toyota's uh, entertaining pit entry. That's where the debris came from, and it was off the, yeah, off the back of the Porsche. So that's some proton bodywork. This is Ryan Briscoe just misjudging the length and the width of the Glicken uh, House, and unfortunately, ending the race for Triple Seven, the Aston, and Double Seven. Lights are still on, and the safety car flashing. Suggesting that another lap. Uh, no, they've gone out. Now. Oh, here so we go. It's quite okay. late one, but they've yep. gone out now. So it's going to be a restart this time by just as the safety car is uh, coming into the pits. The pits are also open. Yeah. So Pedro Cachero will now beetle off down the hill as quickly as is possible and backing up the field. Kamui Kobayashi. And no passing before the line. No, he wants to give himself the best run. And the no passing before the line might not just affect Kamui Kobayashi, uh, Kazuki Nakajima in second, but also the uh, the uh, Cinetech car, because it's right behind the United Auto Sports 22 car. And Nico Lapierre is wise enough not to try and make that move, but he really needs Wayne Boyd to restart quickly. And Boyd was a distance behind. No, he wasn't. Here we go. They both pull out to try and get down past the G. GTE Am cars, the Alpine has made it. It will be one, two, three for your one, two, three. Seven, eight, and 36 will be the first cars on the road with just a couple of seconds between them. Great move from Nico Lapier, timed it perfectly. He got the run just as he passed us. And, and in fairness, from Wayne Boyd at United yeah. as well, because he knew that the Alpine would be coming and he also wanted to get by the GT cars, and he did. Yeah, but Wayne Boyd's got Stoffel van Dorn right in his mirrors, who's got Charles Melisse right in his mirrors. Yeah. And so, therefore, it is a battle not just necessarily for one, two, three in uh, in hypercar it's also in lmp2 as well yep. this has dragged everything back into the game uh, for the top two categories five seconds cover the top four those are the competing cars in lmp2 and 13 seconds between the two ferraris and a lap back still to the porsches everybody's safety car procedures will be investigated but that doesn't necessarily mean that there will be any penalties to serve immediately to the pits we knew the 57 car would come in but also the yeah. 52 
from second place in GT Pro comes in as the race goes back to green. And number one as well, Bikes Kavissa pits for Richard Mill Racing Team and Nick Nielsen in the 83 AF Corsa car. When you talk about Daniel Serra there in the second place, car, he was in a very strong and easy second place, so therefore they can afford to do something a little bit different to try and pull them back in to fight with their sister car, James Collado, and also defensiveness against the Porsches. Oh, and there comes a neat little Porsche battle. That's the AF Corsa car, Nick Nielsen, with the Kessel Racing Ferrari of Takeshi Kimura behind him, although they are several laps apart after a, a big blow-up for that chrome Ferrari. Third car in the background coming Ooh. up the pits as we see this battle between the 20 and the 34. Oh, Alex Brundle round the outside and squeezed again against the, the curb on the inside there as Brundle now puts himself up into fifth position, I think. No, it was it wasn't full position, but it was it was fending off. Yep. Uh, Jan Magnussen, it was there. Turning the clock back 20 years, Brundle versus Magnussen, son of one and the original of the other. Absolutely. <laughs> First pressing. <laughs> First pressing. Absolutely. Whoa, 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 whoa. Do you really need to be riding the kerbs that much and fringing it's, the gravel? It's not really a kerb there, it's quite flat on the inside. So, you know, you, you already have on the track what worked out. If a car is in an area and it looks as if it's coming, can you go there or not? Yeah. Uh, the other car, by the way, that pitted uh, as a great race victory was the number one Richard Mill racing yeah. uh, team, Orica, Tatiana Calderon, back on track. Yeah, driver change there, because Bicecar Vissa brought it in. So I'm assuming Bicecar has now got to the end of her drive time, or they needed fuel one or the other. Seven is our race leader. Kamui Kobayashi is definitely intent on trying to escape Kaz Nakajima. And still no word on whether there is an investigation for or a penalty pending the number seven car coming flying in and hitting things in the pit lane a couple of stops ago. So Wayne Boy trying to fend off the attentions of Stoffel van Dorn and the news on drive time is. And uh, Tatiana Calderon has actually done the uh, sorry, Bikes Kavisser, apologies, has done the most in yes. that car. Two hours and 21 minutes, so she's easily she's through that. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, Flourish and Calderon have done an hour and a half each. So they will do the remaining stints, you would think, because uh, Bicecar started the car and she's done two stints since then as well. So uh, she doubled the last time, I think. Uh, anyway, she's done that. Well, Toyota reporting that there was no mechanical issue on with that pit stop, so it would appear that uh, it was a driver error. Ooh. Ooh. Brendan, Brendan having a quick chat with uh, Sebastian Buemi, you might need to save one extra lap. So they've already got two laps in hand over the sister car. Yeah, but this is trying to get rid of a splash at the end. They needed yeah. four laps of fuel and you couldn't get rid of four, but now with the safety car being out there, it's might brought them back lap. into the point where yeah. they're close. Use roughly about 45, 50% of the fuel on a safety car lap to a full uh, flat out lap. And we had three laps, four laps of safety car, so they may just about have done enough, but they're not confident. Ricky's car on the circuit right now is the third placed Alpine. A 131.3 plays a 131.8 for both of the totals ahead. The gap first to third is under two seconds. Wayne Boyd on the last lap that he's just finished for United, setting the fastest first sector that that car has done. So he's not losing anything to Phil Hansen or Paul de Resta in terms of pace. Stoffel van Dorn making sure he doesn't. A second behind. Charles Lacey now four and a half seconds back from van Dorn. And Anne Davidson six and a half seconds back from him. So the top four spread out fairly quickly in MFP2 as Wayne Boyd tows Stoffel van Dorn with him, or van Dorn pushes Stoffel ahead, whichever it is. But here is Lapierre almost close enough to Nakajima to reach out and pull himself along behind the car. Fascinating stuff, and it in an instant, did it, didn't it? And nothing whatsoever to do with the pace of the Toyotas or the Alpine. It was an LMP2 back Marcus mistake that has brought this thing back to be a nose-to-tail race between the top three. Yep, top three covered by 1.9 seconds, 1.3 of which is first to second. Much better run through the final turn from the Alpine as well. I don't think it's quite close enough here. They're closing, closing, closing. 
again quicker. 31-2 this time against 31-9s and 31-8s from the Totas. Well, remember what Nico told us on the grid when he was starting on pole. He said to Louise Beckett, they are better in sector one and two than we are, which then means we are better in sector three than them. And that's why he closes at the end of the lap but can he maintain that enough down the straight to be able to actually jump the car in front of him if he gets right up behind him like he is now? Well, what he's hoping for is that actually the number seven Kobayashi car just ahead causes enough of an aero wash that uh, the eight Nakajima can't get a very good run through the final corner. And uh, then that'll allow him because uh, the Alpine, I think, has got a little bit better front end on it at the moment in terms of balance, especially over that bump that is in the middle of the final corner. Fantastic stuff emerging here in Hypercar. Great fight as well. We'll get to it in uh, GTE AM, where the two cars were battling for, what was it, fifth place. Now with this rotation and the latest pit stops are battling for the lead with Antonio Fuoco in the Settler oh. racing car ahead of Matteo Caroli. Here we go. This is where he builds up speed all the way down to the start-finish line. So let's see how much the Toyota has to be light on its toes and feather the throttle of Fraction down the hill. Here comes the Alpine. They don't want to see themselves. We don't want to see them. That's Sebastian Webb and Jose Maria Lopez. He's got him. Has he got enough speed at the top end to go by the Toyota oh. around the outside? Nico Lapierre. Toyota driver versus current Toyota driver doesn't quite get through. Tried it round the outside. Once he was off the circuit, though, he did, uh, there's Bratislava car going very slowly as oh, well, looking as if he's uh, been off. Yeah. yeah. Um, but once he got alongside and he was off the circuit, he lifted off. He didn't try to continue the move, as we saw with some of the LMP2 cars. He lifted off and gave the position back straight away. Yeah, he doesn't want to have any potential albatross hanging around his neck. He knows he can do this car on speed. He's just got to be patient and line him up, lap after lap. Eventually, it'll be in the right place. I wouldn't be too patient, to be honest with you, because uh, at the same time, you've got a 2.8 gap between Nakajima and Kobayashi up ahead. Wayne Boyd in the pits, LMP2 leader, brings the United Autosport car in for service. Racing Team Netherland in as well with Fritz van Aert. Not sure if Fritz has completed his driving stints or not, but may well be swapped out. So, Phil Hansen will take over the 22 car from Wayne Boyd, who did a good job of just distancing himself a fraction from Stoffel van Dorn. Here he's lining up again, Nicola yeah. Lapierre, coming through this corner, if he can keep it, and the car's much better than Toys over the bump. Now he's got a real run in him, I'm yeah. sure this time he's going to have another crack at it. Will he try to go to the outside again? I would try and make sure if I went anywhere, I'd go on the inside. Yeah, and he's got the slingshot down the inside. Now he gets on to, look at the brake dust pour off those wheels into second place. Good move by Nico Lapierre. This is a really interesting battle, isn't it? The Alpine just with a fractional advantage where it counts, coming onto the only real straight in the place, but it can't carry enough fuel to run as long as the Toyota. And again, look at how much garbage is coming off the brakes. That, those uh, carbon brakes and, and pads are just being absolutely worked within an inch of their life. So now it's about the three-second gap, first to second, Toyota against Alpine. Uh, that was the end, by the way, of Fritz van Aert's uh, third stint. So that should be him done for the race in terms of the... Um, the minimum driver time required for a bronze driver. Teammates and rivals watching. Jose Maria Lopez wants to win this for the number seven car that leads. Sebastian Buemi wants to win it for the number eight car that leads. Secondary, of course, although primary in, in for the team is that Toyota win the race ahead of Alpine. Yeah, but the thing about uh, the Toyota there that's in third place, Nakajima, remember we heard about the, the uh, Bohemi was being told you might need to save something here. Well, the fact is they've got to try and save two laps to be able to achieve it. However, the sister car, the seven, that's leading seven laps. There's no way to achieve that. That's just uh, that's in the complete distance. So I'm not really sure that the Toyota defended too much after the first one, which was round the outside. And I think Nakajima thought, right, my game is actually later on. That was the ultimate fastest sector three of the race for Nicolapia. He is off and in pursuit of the overall leader. 
Well, that last shot of him coming down the hill there, I thought, blimey, look how much faster he is than the Toyota, or how much faster he is now, in fact, than anything has gone so far in the race down that hill. Eight tenths of a second quicker than the race leader on that last lap. 131.0. Still the fastest sports car lap around here is a 29.67 Mikkel Jensen in an LMP2 G-Drive car. And this is the pass. Not hard to tell when the Alpine's on the brakes, is it? No. There's a lot of brake dust That's coming from that right now. Dust. Now, they have done, sorry to interrupt you there, they've done five hours and 40 minutes, so it's coming up to the end of a standard WEC six-hour race. However, the brakes of these things have to do 24 hours at Le Mans, which is quite different to here in terms of cooling, in terms of brake usage and intensity. The, the, the point about that, uh, Mikkel Jensen lap, two points to make. One is there's been this resetting of performance in sports car racing worldwide, so we're not dealing with a standing target in two. The other thing was, my recollection was that came pretty soon after this circuit was resurfaced. So it was at its peak in terms of the available grip yeah. for Mikel. We're getting some extraordinary times there. So uh, this is still extraordinary stuff. We've got the uh, uh, fastest lap of the race goes to Mikel Lapier, 130.919 this time around. It's 1.2 seconds. He is catching hand over fist here. So almost a second out of the leader. Yeah, he's looking at 29s, isn't he? As the fuel load burns off, he's going to give this everything. Raul Frey is in the pits for the Iron Dames Ferrari. Antonio Fuoco in the blue Chetelar racing car leads from Matteo Cairoli in the white and blue Porsche. That's the lead battle in GTE Am. Matteo Cairoli is just seven tenths, or was at the line seven tenths of a second behind. He's even closer now. That's under half a second to uh, Antonio Fuoco, the leader. And of course, as Francesco Castellacci lies third, 10 seconds back, Paul Dallalana fourth, and he was in the pits coming out as the safety car came in. So a green flag stop for him, but in a different stint uh, rotation to everybody else, and the Alpine goes by Dallalana. He is now oh. one second behind the Toyota. And uh, the Alpine just walking into the corner there, Nicola Lapierre. He's definitely pushing, that's for sure. And he's loading the front of the car to try to get it in, and the rear stepped out. But it's much nicer through that final corner than the Toyota. He's able to keep the momentum through over the bump, and it looks as if it absorbs it so much better. Toyota bounces around, and the drivers have to then come off the throttle a little bit to stabilize before going. But now Lapierre needs to be right on the back of the Toyota because there's traffic coming up. This is his opportunity with his gaggle of cars that are coming. And that is the 60 Ferrari, that is the Iron Lynx car of Matteo Cressoni, moves out of the way. That's the only other real straight down here into Turn 5, the hairpin. And uh, Lapierre is right there. This is where he needs to be, isn't it? Give you, another, give you another lap time comparison here, and it came from Nico Lapierre. The last time he won a sports car race overall was in 2010, when he was at the wheel of another Orica run car in that time, at that point, the Peugeot 908 HDI FAP. His fastest lap in winning that race was a 132.375 from that epic machine. Yeah. And uh, those times, those lap times, are being beaten by the current generation of LMP2 cars on a regular race. Well, utterly pace. bizarrely, that, that lap I've just described matched almost the thousandth last time around by the lead car here. Yeah. One thousandth difference for the fastest lap of the race 11 years ago here in a Peugeot 908. That's, for me, a truer comparison here. Kui Kobayashi just squeezing through Lapierre, though still very close, very close, not quite close enough to sail by, but enough to put Kobayashi under pressure. Yeah, they're going to catch the Porsche around about turn four going up the hill, so impossible to get another run into the hairpin. Shame, actually, for the Alpine that the Ferrari was where it was. If he'd been able to use the full width of the road, he could really have been all over the Toyota into that first turn. And they go by the Porsche and the Aston. There is Philippe Signot watching with interest. Andre Negrau, I'm sure, was the man in the Brazilian hat. There's a fair gaggle of cars up ahead. 
This is at the moment where you've just got to try to work your way through it. You've got to look at what's coming up, two, three cars ahead, position yourself, and then be ready just to release the brake and nip in the inside if you can. Doesn't break in traffic well for the Toyota. They've got the LMP2 United Autosport car right in front of Phil Hansen, but the GR Racing Porsche is just being passed now by the Alpine. Little lock-up. Lock yes, pressure as he dives past Hansen. He's really fighting for this position, isn't he? Kamui Kobayashi leads, Nico Lapierre behind. Well, big lock-up there. You can see the smoke on the left front. Yeah. He got off the pedal reasonably quickly, but uh, it's enough to put a bit of extra energy into the tyre. As Lapierre's now into the pits. Yep. So the Alpine is in the pit lane, just shy of being able to take the lead of the race away from the Toyota on pace. 31 laps. Let's hear from the team. You confirm we keep the same tyre. You confirm we keep the same tyre. Nico clearly likes those tyres. The team are leaving them on. They're working well at the moment. Let's see how they hold up in the second stint. Well, the tyres will hold up better as the race progresses. The temperature of the track is coming down and going to go down even further. But if I looked at it after uh, the safety car, he was still able, to, as the fuel weight had gone, to deliver the fastest lap of the race so far. So certainly, yes, in his position, he can't afford to start changing tyres because you lose the pit stop time. Here's a replay of the first attempted pass on the Toyota. Ran out wide. Let the number eight car come back. Second time of asking. No mistakes from Nico Lapierre. Sent it down the inside. And a, a proper classic Portimao move. Yeah, probably six laps or something until the Toyotas start to look for their particular pit stop. But now the interesting thing is Lapierre has got probably half a lap without any traffic. And so on these outlaps, he's really got to nail it to try to get a little bit of advantage in his pocket and pure performance and potentially then come out ahead once the Toyotas stop. Watching behind here as a poor lap last time around improves again this time but uh, Phil Hansen struggling a bit here 137 then a 135 the drop time to all the cars around him was traffic yeah. but it was an extreme drop in traffic four five seconds well, Duncan reporting that there is a little bit of concern on the brakes at United Autosport so, and this behind by the way this is the GTM yeah. lead battle now this is Settler with Antonio Fuoco, and that is Matteo Caroli in the 56 car behind. This pair have been battling away either side of the safety car, and with the shuffle for the pit stops at the end of that safety car, this has now cycled back around to be the lead battle. Yep. Two Both. young men very keen to use this as a shot window, not just to actually bring it home for the team and for the customer, but a shot window as a future factory driver for Ferrari, for Fuoco, and for Cairoli, for Porsche. And both, it has to be said, have got pretty impressive calling cards here. Both running out wide, out of the turn five hairpin. They don't need to be doing that very often. But, uh, very easily spotted run wide. Three cars have failed to make it so far this distance. The Glickenhaus, the 77 and 777 cars from Dempsey Proton and D-Station Racing, which involved in a collision caused by the Glickenhaus. Unfortunately, it looks as though uh, Jim Glickenhaus's first race in the World Endurance Championship has come to an end. Um, what? Right, Glickenhaus has shown us being on pit lane at the moment. I think it's in the garage. Yeah, I don't, don't think that car is running. Was, uh, just saying that at the moment about it being in there, but confirmed in the garage, not moving. And the two Toyotas definitely are moving. Yeah. And into the pits comes the number 28 Jota Sport car. This is our pole sitter in LMP2, Stoffel van Dorn. You just saw chasing for the lead against the 22 United car, and that cycles and Davidson through into the lead in 38, which should follow him down the pit road. Yeah, he comes, he comes in from the lead, and... Davidson indeed. 
tyres are ready and goes round one more time. So he will be in a lap behind, at which stage Stoffel should have been gone. Well, we're hearing Duncan Vincent down at Glickenhaus, and it seems that it is the end of the road for their first race. Well, don't say that yet, Martin. It sounds like it's the same issue they had in free practice, so it's a gear selection issue. There's, I'm standing right at the back of the garage, at the back of the car, and they are just working away on a, a little device on the right-hand side of the box. The back of the car has now gone back on. I love it when the pace goes up and the tone goes up and we're getting into the, those moves, yeah. those strategic moves as well. They're going to define where the battles are coming for the end of this race, and you can hear it in the tone. Yeah, well, they're in the can. game, they're 1 2 at the moment. Okay, it's uh, got a still some things to run through there. But for Anthony Davidson, remember, he's just got into the car now at the beginning of this stint, and uh, he'll be in for a, a decent run towards the end of it right now. Yeah, sticker tyres as well. So, not previously scrubbed and uh, refreshed, but absolutely brand new Goodyear Eagles. So, Ann Davidson will stay in. Door is open on both sides. Tiny bit of precious airflow. When you're moving, the adrenaline helps to fight off the effects of the heat. When you're stationary, the effects of the heat become even more noticeable. Tire debris removed from the front of the car. Track four. And it's, it's hot out there. We've got to remember that these aren't air conditioned and cool and comfortable and everything else as we see a replay of the Toyota just using a bit of inside curb to be able to get past. Both those battling GTM cars, by the way, both given warnings for putting track limits. It's going to be a bit wild west down there. Task change underway for Ann Davidson. He stays aboard, as we heard. Through goes Stoffel van Dorn to retake the lead, and he's between the two Toyotas at the moment. Is it just uh, looking at Lapierre, he's actually on a bit of a mission and uh, on the first few laps of this stint trying to make sure that he uses the time in free air with less cars on track as uh, Davidson rejoins then uh, he's actually at a time that was about five tenths of a second quicker than Nakajima and Kobayashi. The cycles back round by the way uh, and Davidson comes out in fourth position since Van Dorn in the number 28 Jota He's got six seconds on Phil Hansen in the number 22 United Autosports car, who is just four seconds ahead of Charles Malaisi in the 31 Team WRT car, and then Ann Davidson. Uh, Alex Brundle is the next man back, but with, a re I think it's a lap gap now because of that safety car. Yeah, and the safety car put them out of it. Alex Brundle's basically on his second double stint. He started, punched his way up through, and uh, he's into his eight laps of his second double stint right now. With that Pro-Am class, and we're keeping on the WRT car, it's real team racing in the hands of Norman Nato, running ninth overall, sixth in LMP2, but leading the Pro-Am uh, class aboard the 70 real time racing car. He's got just under 30 seconds of a gap on Jan Magnussen in the 20 car. Talked about the Glickenhaus being in the garage. I see a Glickenhaus back out onto the circuit just for information. So it might be down, but it's not out. And uh, back on its way to do a little bit more mileage, get a little bit more understanding. Gear selector issues, same as they had in practice yesterday. They stopped twice on track with it. And uh, it seems to be their Achilles heel at this moment in time. But at least, it, and I'm not joking, at least they've had practice fixing it. And actually be able to do it in race conditions after it having happened in practice got to be better than learning how to do that under race conditions. Yes, and we've got Jota that's up there leading. Let's hear from the sister car, 38. This is Phil Easy in front of you. Phil Easy is on double seat tires, double seat tires. Yeah, 1.8 seconds in front of these eyes, Anthony Davidson, Melisi in the WRT double stint tires. You're on fresh ones, go for it. You remember, you heard that information on his inlap. Now we've got to push, push, push. Yep. Anthony Davidson's on a charge. This is for position, this is for third in LMP2. And then, six sec uh, sorry, four seconds up the road from there, we've got Phil Hansen, who's second in LMP2. Yeah, Phil's got the pace back heard about some potential braking concerns there. It's a, a concerning on one, I reckon. It's likely to be concerning on others. So this looks like fast and, it's fast and furious stuff between the top four. It's 12 seconds between the top four here. All having the two Jota cars having recently stopped. Van Duren from Hansen, Malaysia and Davidson. And from 
Remember, they tell a race, a bigger points haul, important stuff here for the championship. Like the intensity, just look at this and look how little the driver blinks. I've been watching that for you know the last half lap and I don't think I saw Anthony Davidson blink at all there. Focus, Focus and concentration. Yeah. Aggressive, terrier-like. We know some of those. Kobayashi leading the race two seconds back to Nakajima. Nakajima trying to save those two laps that they need to, to avoid a splash and dash. Kobayashi's got roughly one lap to go before he has to come into the pits. Done 37 so far with the safety car, possibly a little bit ekes out on it as well. But uh, it's going to be very soon for this leading Kobayashi, and that will leave Nakajima back into the lead of the race before he pits a couple of laps later. So at the moment, we've heard literally nothing about any kind of looming penalty for that uh, collecting the marker boards on pits in, or well, indeed whether or not there was a pit lane speeding issue for the Toyota. Nothing has been heard. No, there's been no investigation, which then suggests to me it's a slam dunk if there's a speeding penalty. Yes. It's, not a, it's not up for discussion. You can't really, and certainly in this situation, you couldn't argue too much about it. So it's either a penalty or not. So therefore, I, I would presume that he was below the actual speed limit when he did cross the line, even though he obliterated the board on, on his way through. Um, it certainly doesn't seem to be something that's investigated right now. And you heard the Toyota there, a big lift off as it came over the bump. Car doesn't ride it very well. That's what allows the Alpine and the, to be able to just gain the momentum through that corner and carry the speed down the straight. Very different cars, and as you said, Alan, repeatedly through this race, generating their lap times in very, very different ways. Here is the number 51 car. 21-second lead for James Gallardo over teammate Daniel Serra. It's 8.7 seconds back to the first of the Porsches. That is the number 92 car with Kevin Est now back at the wheel. And then further 20 seconds back to Ricard Leitz in the sister Porsche. Porsches and they're going to bounce back from their tyre woes of earlier in this race with the end of the sixth hour looming. Kamu Kobayashi leading the race. Here's uh, Nakajima, just 1.2 seconds back. So further 64 seconds before we get to Nico Lapierre coming along, but of course the Totas are going to have to pit soon. And it's going to be a set of scrubbed uh, Michelins we're hearing from Duncan in the pit lane. Alan? Yeah, and a very, very quick time though by Nakajima. As, he, uh, as we were watching Anthony Davidson still with that battles with Charles Melisi there, um, it was a 31.4 and then a 31.8 by Nakajima. Now, Nakajima's meant to be on this fuel economy run. I'm not sure if they've aborted that idea and uh, realised they're not going to be able to gain those extra lap backs and then just go for it again. Uh, because they also remember all in the fight with Lapierre, who is now struggling a bit in the midst of some of the traffic. Yeah. And so it's going to play out later on, and it's going to be super tight between uh, the Alpine being able to overtake the Toyotas after this stop. Jose Maria Lopez, he's ready for one of them now. Well, we're only two and a half minutes away from what a regular WC race would be, but we've got another two hours to enjoy it. But this is Ant Davidson looking for a way past Sean Malaisi. This is for third position in LMP2. It's been a battle throughout, initially with six cars, five cars, now four cars in the hunt for the win and the podium positions. You can't fit four cars on a three step podium. And you, you, there's still no real indication of which one's going to come out on top because the safety car might have compressed the, the sort of fuel overlap that Jota had a little bit. Is it going to give anybody the need not to splash and dash at the end? That might be the deciding factor. Stoffel van Dorn leads for Jota. Phil Hansen second for United. Charles Malaisi currently third for WRT. Looks like he's using a lot more road at the moment than Ant Davidson. Everybody watching very closely. New tyres in the pit lane waiting for Toyota number seven, the race leader. And a leader change because seven is on the pit road. Duncan coming towards you. Charles Malaisi 
hanging on. They've spent a lot of time chasing WRT, not a lot of time defending, but right now, trying to keep Ant Davidson in front. Alan McNish apparently not appreciating the free cappuccino that I've just brought him, <laughs> so he'd better sit down and tuck into his tunnocks. Yep, seven down pit lane. Yep. I mean, uh, shown some real pace. From Kaz Nakajima. Only oh, car... Sorry, says something from, uh, from Kimori Kobayashi. He's the only car in the pit lane right now. Marcos Gomez has left in the Aston Martin that he's taken over from Paul Dallalana. I think that's the end of Paul's driving duties as well. Look at the release mould, the release agent there, Sheen on the tyre. It's an absolutely brand spanking new Virgin Goodyear going on. A big lap here underway at the moment of Kaz Nakajima, quicker than he's been. The Virgin the Michelin going on, beg your pardon. In uh, the first sector, it's the ultimate fastest middle sector of the race from Nakajima on what should be his in-lap. Uh, race control getting their knickers slightly in a twist. Uh, warning Richard Leitz for abusing track limits in car number one. Well, that's quite a job for Richard Leitz, who's in car number 91. Uh, we did see just a the spell just a little while ago. It's a 131.006 from Nakajima. He doesn't pit this time around. So that's just what's... Uh, it's under a, a, a tenth off the fastest lap of the race. We have three of the four GTE Pro cars setting their fastest laps of the race at the same time. Oh, Nakajima's got another couple of laps before he has to pit and then he will have one more stop before the end. Lapierre, uh, basically, he's got two before he can get to the end. So Pachito taking over the number seven car, and we saw Sebastian Buemi ready to take over number eight. And it may be that this ends up coming down in the final two hours to somehow a knockdown drag out battle between seven and eight. So WRT and Jota battling for this final step of the podium at this stage of the race. And Davidson looking now for a way past the WRT car ahead. All sorts of things up for grabs here. Championship points, race wins, race podiums, yep. bragging rights, and the potential to be involved as a team and as a driver in the next era of sports car racing. It's all on the table right now. Yeah, none of which appeals right now. Right now, it's there's a car, get in front of him. That's the basic survival jungle instinct of a racing driver. In car in front must pass in number eight Shima. down the pit lane. I'm not saying that drivers have got no imagination. Drivers <laughs> have got no imagination. But uh, when you're in the thick of the battle, you know, team orders and, and the future and all the other stuff, that's of, of secondary concern, because if you can't focus 100% on getting by that car, then all the rest of it is mere bagatelle. It's not going to happen. I see in front of me just now. Duncan Vincent, we see you there. Yeah, well, Sebastian Buemi done a few limbering up moves. He's now sliding himself into that car. Brand new tires going on here. I did get pulled a little tip bit earlier on that the scrub tires come in very quickly quicker than the brand new tyres with the releasing agent. So if they're in the heat of a battle, they would rather put on the scrub tyres. Right now, though, the brand new tyres will be going on. The drinks bottle change has been done. And the Toyota, once again, ready to be given four new boots for this stint. I think that will be him into the end as well when they do that, as now uh, Lapierre comes through the final corner as uh, we see one of the LMP2 cars just overtaking. So the Lapierre will go into the lead of the race hand side of uh, the Toyota. Now those Circuit. didn't look like scrub tyres, they look like as shiny as anything else and the only problem is of course you don't go out and scrub in all of your sets of tyres necessarily you don't have enough time to do that and enough uh, effort to waste that you can do that so Nico Lapierre resumes in the lead for Alpine, seven pit stops for them compared to six for Toyota and they are still in front so they've already spent more time on pit road and they still are narrowly in front by 12.9 seconds. They've spent more than a minute stationary longer than the Toyotas. But we also need to remember that there was a safety car that brought them back into the picture. They were out yep. of the picture. They were a minute and 15 seconds behind. 
and so therefore a complete pit stop cycle behind. Yep. But uh, now they're back into the picture and at least I've got something to fight with. And mercifully, not a full lap behind. The Toyotas hadn't quite got to lapping them. If, a, if, a, if the safety car had waited till about now to come out, they may possibly just have been able to lap the Alpine and then there would have been no way back. Then they would have been stuck and stuffed a lap behind. But as it is, 36 leads from eight and seven. Yes, the same number that was on the Senior Tech Alpine in LMP2 for a number of years is on the Alpine run by Philippe Signo's team in the hypercar category. Sebastian Buemi, fresh out of the pits, just squeezing in front of Jose Maria Lopez. Lopez with one more lap of heat in the tire, could not use it to get back in front of Buemi. And it might be that this ends up being the battle for the lead if they outfumble the the uh, Alpine. Well, it's going to be purely and simply down to the number of pit stops at the end of the day, and that's something that is definitely strategically against the Alpine, because yep. it can only run 31, 32 laps maximum, 31 laps on a stint, whereas a Toyota can go up to 37 and 38. And so even at the end, they refuel less. And so therefore, it's a, it's a penalty that I'm not sure they're going to be able to get around today. Big day for Toyota Kazoo Racing. You see from the front of the both these cars, the finals that have the number 100. This is the 100th World Championship sports car race for the make, uh, including the Group C World Sports Car Championship, and of course the WEC where they came in. It's a late addition as well, near full season entries in 2012. 31 World Championship race wins they have had as a brand, 30 of which have come in the hybrid era. Yeah. That's astonishing. All the cars they entered over all those years, and they got one win. And, and how many did they come close to? Oh, sorry. Uh, you know, again, that's another 30, isn't it? Chetelar, a little bit of wheel spin as they leave the pit box. That's Antonio Fuoco, who came in as the leader ahead of Matteo Cairoli. So Cairoli now owes us a stop, because that's the sixth for Chetelar, only five for Project One for their Porsche. And in fact, Project One is the only car in GTE AM that has only completed five stops, so we expect him in a min min minutely. Yeah, Caroli will, uh, will have the, uh, the hammer down. Something about that pit stop from Duncan. And so there's Robin Frins just yeah. getting ready, WRT, currently uh, in third place in LMP2. Racing son of a racing father. His father never raced much at international level, but has done a lot of racing in Porsches and the like in things like the uh, uh, Dutch Supercar Challenge. So yeah, so uh, Robin, uh, in fact, I think, I, I may be wrong, but I think his uncle might also have done quite right. a lot of races. There's yeah. at least three uh, racing. Not a looming battle, by the way. It's in GT Pro, and it's Kevin Estre back aboard the number 92 car and closing. Uh, reasonably rapidly on Daniel Serra for second. Chetanar now back in the lead, that blue Ferrari of the GTE AM class, because Jose Zarek's Team Project One can't run on thin air. Matteo Caroli is in the pit lane. He comes in from the lead, and that means Giorgio Senna Giotto, who's retaken the lead, uh, retaken, or has been put back into the car, has retaken the lead. It depends, because um, it they depends were very, because. very close. Mm, they were close. So it was a 1.19 on pit lane from the Ferrari. Who has taken over, though, from Matteo Cairoli? Or does Cairoli stay in in the Porsche? There's the Chetelar car, where's the Porsche? It has not left the pits yet. No, I think it's a tyre stop for the, the Team Project One car. Uh, Still on pit lane. Yeah, looks like it. So full service. That will be their penultimate stop. Let's hear from Toyota. OK, we're going to swap back on four. Or five, as the case may be. Uh, so seven uh, being shuffled forward ahead of eight. I think the reason for that is that seven's in the battle with uh, 36 for second place overall because both of those cars have to do two more stops whereas Sebastian Buemi can make it on just one more stop and I think he'll be into the end 
and it's going to be a real tooth and nail fight for that second place between the Toyota and the Alpine. The Alpine's got to take a little bit of care over its brakes. Oh, oh, oh. And Davidson trying to get by, sorry to jump in, Al. The uh, red, white and black car. Oh. That's WRT down the inside of the Iron Lynx car. Is that Claudio Schiavone at the wheel? No, it's Andrea Piccini. Surprised that Piccini didn't anticipate a P2 car lunging him there. But uh, through just in the end went Charmy Lacey. But Ann Davidson is all over the back of him. He really hurried Malacy into this move. I have to say, I don't think uh, Malacy lunged there. I just yeah. don't think the Ferrari had looked in his mirrors uh, late enough in the braking area to, to see what was going on. <laughs> Robin Freen's little reaction there in the pits going, oh, come on! Yeah. Maybe that Andrea Pacini didn't quite see that. He's been a, a, a good servant of Iron Lynx over the last few seasons. They've had a lot of success with uh, with himself and his and his brother in their cars. It's uh, Ricardo Perra, by the way, and then a wheel of 56, and uh, ah, it was, so it was a change. Uh, 135, so lost 16 seconds on that pit stop, and they are trailing by 16 seconds. Yeah, it was close as you like, wasn't it? So Ricardo Pera, silver driver, and in the 47 car uh, is Giorgio Senna Giotto, also a silver driver. Cracking stuff out of P2. Yeah. And how much more fun do you think those guys are having in that Chetelar car? Oh, Whoa! Got it, got it. As Milesi runs out wide, Davidson goes around the outside, Milesi comes back, eases him onto the rubbish. And Davidson has to tuck back in again. So Chetelar probably having a lot more okay. fun with that car as Davidson this time goes to the inside of the hairpin, says, right, you can have you the can dirt and stuff on the outside. But it comes out a little tighter. What, Malaysia is a bit of a fighter, isn't he? He's certainly, OK, he's made a couple of mistakes here, but he's fought his way to keep it back into position. Some of it I'm sure Anthony might have some thoughts about, but uh, ultimately he's kept the car ahead. He's a scrapper, isn't he? Makes a mistake, wrestles his way back in front. He doesn't give up. Yep. And from that angle, it wasn't quite as aggressive as it, but from the angle we got it, but it was aggressive enough. It, it's very difficult indeed for Anthony to complete that manoeuvre. Ooh! There's a Porsche ahead of a Ferrari for the first time yep. in who knows Told how you. long. He was catching, catching. Wow. That's uh, Kevin Astro. Hang on, so he's come from a lap back. So did the Porsche get a lap back they, they, behind they, the safety car? They, Were they waved by and the Ferraris weren't? This is the move. Whoa. Not, not made easy there, but he didn't need it making uh, easy. Yeah. Another cracking run here from Kevin Estra underway. It's pro on pro, isn't it? And that's why uh, we have shuffle in the pit lane because instead of Duncan complaining about it being too wet, Louise is complaining about it being too warm. She's saying it doesn't feel like the temperature's gone down much. Well, it hasn't. Here we go again, and he's done it. Made Whoa. the move. Made the move this Good time. Good move by Ant Davidson. Had it done before the near instant site and then the next near instant site last time around. Yeah. But Ant Davidson finally makes it by. And now is likely, I think, going to clear off. The difference between the two cars in pace, definitely blunted by Charles Milesi managing basically to block the entire road from Anthony Davidson. And Ant already puts two or three car lengths ahead of the WRT machine. And only seven seconds back, seven and a half seconds back here from Phil Hansen, who's second, yeah. who is himself under 10 seconds back from Van Dorn. Grandstand finish beckons here, gentlemen. But that, this, that gap back to Hansen, or to, forward to Hansen, hasn't actually changed, even although uh, Davidson and Malaysi were scrapping like mad over the last few laps. Oh, they're going to release the Da Costa. Never a bad sign. So Antonio Felix Da Costa getting ready to take over the 38 car from Anthony Davidson, and that will probably put him in until the end of the race. And Antonio lives here in Portugal, not far outside Estoril. Of course, he. Only Portuguese driver in the field this weekend, with Felipe Albuquerque away in Belle Isle, Michigan, for an IMSA race this weekend, rather than being able to be here. So, ironically, we've got more Colombians than Portuguese on track this weekend. We can go uh, to the end without the extra splash. Both cars, we are racing, we'll have to do a splash. 
the Alpin and Cal 7 will both have to do a splash. Without rescue, we will not. So efficient driving is what we need. Okay, uh, just for a moment there, when he said both cars, I thought, what, how is number seven will need a splash? Okay, always listen to all the words in the sentence, as I tell my kids very frequently. So, 36 needs a stop, seven needs a stop. This is looking very strong for the championship leaders of car number eight. Yeah, they, they actually uh, need to have that extra stop, as you say, the two stops, in fact, in reality for both yeah. of them. Whereas Boemi can make it just through on that one. And there's not much that's going to undo that other than a very lengthy safety car. Because it's not going to save enough fuel for Lopez and definitely not enough for Lapierre. This is what the interesting thing is from a strategy point of view, what are Alpine going to do? Because this will be a double stint for Lapierre and uh, then there will be basically nearly two stints. Do they then switch him out and put someone else in, Mathieu Xavier, for example? I, I would think Va Vazavier seems to have lo not kept the pace up quite as well. I, my money would be on putting Andre Negrau back in for a double at the end. Alan's saying no. Great battle here between Iron Dames and Kessel. They trusted Negrau last time uh, yep. with some heavyweight stints. They've got a lot of trust in him. I think he was at least as quick as Mathieu Vazivier. Vazivier didn't quite seem to have it. Rahel Frey ahead of Mikkel Jensen. That is four position. Mikkel Jensen, the LMP2 lap record holder here. And next year, Peugeot factory. Okay. That's quite a stellar rise up the order, isn't it? From new kid in GTs up to LMP2 in ELMS. Well, remember, we were talking about him being the lap record holder here yeah. in LMP2. Yeah. Um, if you've not heard of Mikkel Jensen, you're, you're gonna. going to. <laughs> you're um, gonna. He is very quick. Yeah. Kind of quite reserved individual, but um, a, an absolute star. Yeah, Rahel Frey, very quick as well. Really good pair of hands. And uh, a very, very quick driver. I'm not going to be easy to pass here either. No, she's not going to let him go by no. in a hurry. But look at that. Look at the trust between them. You know, he is two or three inches, five centimetres off the back of the car in front. That could all go very, very wrong. Again, he gets the run on the inside, up to the top of the hill. Tight left-hander, through he goes. Very well judged by Mikkel Jensen. I'm sure the Give Kessel Racing crew will be happy with that. She never gives up. Rahel Frey doesn't even know how to spell it. Never mind pronounce give up. Never give up, never surrender. Yep. So really good move by Mikkel Jensen. And all of that moves him up into sixth in GTE Am. Andrea Pacini, the Iron Lynx car in fifth place. There is the Iron Lynx team. They run both the 60 and the 83 car, uh, 85 car rather. To the left of that picture, by the way, that was Shakimo Puccini, mm -hmm. who amongst other things looks after the GT3 programs. He's had a major role in the Iron Dames project too. Huge kudos, by the way, to Deborah Meyer, who is uh, one of the co-owners of Iron Lynx, yep. the driving force behind this program. And again, you know, fantastic individual enthusiast who's sort of pushing it all along. And, and you know, Philip Senio, who's running this Alpine as well, very much of the same fibre. He just lives to race. And there's his two cars. There's the yep. Alpine going by his P2 car, yep. the uh, Richard Mill Racing Team, which in itself introduces a real dynamic in this debate about gaps between classes. Yep. He's got uh, fish in both ponds. Yeah, but <laughs> I think. You know, we, we talk about singular laps and then we talk about races. And I have to say that uh, there was a lot of complaints about the class differentiation when we looked at the, the practice and qualifying. But now it's came to the race and there has been some decent separation between them. There is clear performance differences. And so I don't think it's uh, you're going to hear the same mumblings and grumblings from the drivers afterwards. I think you'll hear just as much from the Toyota drivers about how hard it is to get through traffic. Yeah, but 
look, traffic is one of the determining factors, always has been. Yeah. I think factor for them is the fact they don't have the insane hybrid boost capability that they used to have. The car is heavier as well, and so therefore it is a little bit more tricky. But uh, that's more in the ballpark than it is for the Alpine and also for the Glickenhaus as well. Yeah. And it's a, it's a, pass. a very well rehearsed team, a really superb set of drivers. And that means that they are less likely to leave those glimmers of hope. They don't have a gentleman driver in their lineup that they have to worry about, which most of the P2 cars have. On board with the 38 car, you saw Antonio Felix da Costa waiting patiently in the garage. And then Ant Davidson is called into the pits. Chances are Antonio will take over for the remainder of the race. Tyres waiting on the apron for Porsche. And somehow, having been brought back into the equation by the safety car, the question is, have they got anything in the tyre department that is going to help them battle Ferrari? Because Ferrari didn't see... Well, Ferrari didn't have the pace of Kevin Estra. No one had the pace of Kevin Estra in qualifying. But Ferrari, from the beginning of the race, have definitely had the whip hand. Porsche have just been nowhere. So Estra on pit road now, surrenders second place once again to Daniel Serra. Got the feeling that race isn't done yet. Yes, I agree, I agree. And, and the difference between second and third doesn't sound like a great deal, but it's one and a half times the difference between second and third and could suddenly move this team back into contention. Or keep them in contention. So Esther wipes a bead of sweat from his brow. Yeah, fresh, or if that's not the right word, but uh, fresh from a Nürburgring 24 hours win last weekend. Right. Certainly not jaded, judging by his <laughs> qualifying lappery. And it, we did say yesterday in, uh, in free practice, Alan, probably that's the way to do it, to go from the corridor of pain, the 25 kilometer jumpy bumpy corridor of pain that is the green hell, to this place rather than go from a sort of wide open modern circuit into that that, that inferno it's, it's definitely very different types of tracks both are up and down quite a lot but uh, one has got a tremendous amount of dark and rain about it and the other <laughs> one is 40 mile uh, well the other thing to say is with the weather delay they got last week there's only an hour and a half more track time at uh, Nürburgring last week <laughs> than we've had here <laughs> yeah, very point. true i did say to kevin estra after yesterday was the best thing about uh, Nürburgring, the picking up the trophy the fact you got 12 hours sleep at night <laughs> in a hotel bed yeah yeah, it was uh, pretty grim conditions. And Davidson is on a charge here. And the target is Phil Hansen. 132-0 from uh, Davidson last time around. Took a second and a half out of Hansen's effort. And that gap is now under five seconds. How has the gap progressed in GTE Am? Chetelas, Giorgio Senna, Giotto leads in the blue Ferrari. Behind him, Project One's Ricardo Perra. Catching him. 13.3 behind. When they came out for the uh, the pit stop for the Team Project One car, it was 16.9 seconds. OK, OK, so slowly, slowly creeping yep. closer. It's, it's tens and not much, much more than that. OK. Over 1,000 kilometres in the books for the GT leader at the moment uh, we should we shouldn't by the way uh, discount the third place car here it's in the hands of young gun Giancarlo Fizzi Keller and the 54 car it is still a one two three for the Ferraris Chetela for our, oh sorry one three <laughs> with the team project one Porsche in the middle yeah 51 Ferrari at James Collado and of course a Daniel Serra first and second for Ferrari Let's hear what the Ferrari 52 team have to say. How many laps? Six, six. It's funny, I was just looking at Daniel Serra. He's done 31 laps in this stint. He's got six more 
to go before they actually get to the pit stop. And uh, then from that perspective, he'll be pretty clear to the end. The issue is going to be, he's got more of an issue with uh, Estra because him and Estra are the ones that have got uh, the, the pit stop delta, whereas Collado pretty much plain sailing all the way to the end now. So why is he asking how many laps? Is he running out of tires? How long do I have to nurse these horrible uh, lumps of uselessness around? Uh, or He's been in for 79 cramp? laps so far, that's why. So he's getting cramp and hot and, oh, he's just, and bothered. And... He wants to know where he is in the stint. Yeah. Uh, and remember, okay. the, the advantage in those terms that uh, the Porsche guys have is they've got three drivers. Yes, that's a very good point. That's a very good point, well made. Just Come as well in. it's not 40 degrees of air temperature here in the mild at 24 degrees, because that would really be burning them up. Yeah. Estra, by the way, is continuing onto a double stint with this one. He's, at the moment, 71 seconds back from... Daniel Serra, but with the pit stop to come, in comes from second place, mm. Phil Hansen. Yeah, but Estra's got one more pit stop, Daniel Serra's got two more pit stops. Yeah. Phil Hansen was only a couple of seconds ahead of Ant Davidson as he peeled into the pit road, and Davidson has gone through. This would be Paul DeResta back in to the finish, I'd have thought. Yeah, one hour, 35 minutes, so it's... Two stops, isn't it? So it should be a double to the end. It's actually going to be... It's one stop. And a splash. So, yeah, yeah, the oh, two stints, yeah. One 30, stop 60 a, laps, and it's give or take, to the end. One stop and a trickle. Now they drop back down behind WRT. Charmi Lacey is now up to third behind the Jota cars. Here's our Pro-Am leader, real team, Norman Nato. Race for Rebellion last year with Matthias Besch. And Esteban Garcia, the third member of that lineup in the Swiss team. And they lead in Pro-Am from high class. Jan Magnussen appears now to have locked himself in the loo or, or in the cockpit and refusing to come out. And the third car is Ben Hanley in the number 21 Dragon Speed car. That's third in Pro-Am. Yeah, Norman Nato, as well as this uh, campaign, is also the test driver for the ACO's collaboration with Total Energy and others for the H24, the hydrogen fuel cell technology demonstrator. Hope we're going to see that new car race for the first time at Monza in the LMS, at uh, Monza in the Michelin Mont Cup. Wow. In a few weeks' time. That'll be cool. And uh, that car aiming for something like GT3 performance. Jan van Oetert back at the wheel of the 29 Racing Team Nederland car. Now that has come out of the pit lane behind Tom Jackson in the ARC Bratislava Ligier. And that is the battle for fourth in Pro-Am. And I think that is probably achievable for van Oetert. He could move ahead of the ARC Bratislava car. As long as he's, well, he's got an hour and a half to do it, I think that is definitely doable. And fourth in Pro-Am would be much better than fifth in Pro-Am. Nico Lapierre re reeling off the laps, our race leader, ahead of Jose Maria Lopez and Sebastian Puemi. But perversely, the way the fuel is looking, number eight should have the advantage the longer the race continues. And certainly number eight, I think, will have the advantage without question. They've got five more laps, give or take, uh, before they come in for their second last stop for Nicolas Lapierre. Whether they change drivers or not is the question, because he'll have done a double stint now, and he did a double at the beginning. Uh, Negrau is the driver that would be suited and booted, ready to get in if they did a driver change. Personally, if I was that team, I would try and stretch Nicolas as long as possible and see if he could make it towards the end, because without a question, he understands how the circuit is, he understands how the car is, how the tires are, how the traffic is in the other drivers around, and he's also been their quickest driver without a question today. Yeah, he's got everything going. He's got the experience, he's got the speed, he's got the comfort in the car. There's no doubt at all the fire is still burning bright. It is, but the gap's coming down a little bit. Jose Maria Lopez has taken about four seconds in the last 15, 16 laps out of Lapierre. So it's not as if it's plain sailing in it. It's down to the absolute details of it. And ultimately, the Toyota will have to take less fuel 
at that splash at the end of the race. And that could be the defining point. However, right now, 10.3 seconds is a gap between this late race leader and second place Jose Maria Lopez. But the real overall leader is Sebastian Buemi, 13 seconds back in third. Now, part of the question as to who finishes where might possibly be who's got what tyre left as well. We'll wait and see. Driver of car number 86, warned for abusing track limits. That's Ben Barker in the GR Racing Porsche. Now he's just joined the club with everybody yeah. else. The... <laughs> I think the only driver that hasn't is you, Alan. You've been sat in the booth for the last I six I think the safety hours. car driver also was able no? to make it through. There we see no, Negrau just ready, just in case. But I think that'll be a very last gasp. Look, can you do it? Two laps from the end. Can you make it to the end? Yes or no? And if the driver says yes, then you go and keep it that way. And if he says no, then you have to make a change. Yeah, Magnussen will hand over the high-class car when it comes in after his uh, long stint behind the wheel. 31 for WRT down the pit lane. And this will be their penultimate stop. They, too, will need a little tickle at the end of the race. Punchy stuff, wasn't it, from Jean Malaisy? Yep. Impressive. Nobody will be underestimating him in future, uh, will they? No, no. no. <laughs> Don't be pushing him in the playground. He's all the soft touch that Gabriele Tarquini isn't in a touring car. Yeah, yeah definitely. Charles out. Slightly shorter, more ginger Giancarlo Fisichella. <laughs> yeah, definitely. But no, good stuff and great stuff in LMP2. It's been really good from the start. And high class are in as well. So to Daniel Serra in the pit lane for AF Course, the number 52 Ferrari. Left side only again. Robin Frins in the car now. Yep. So Glickenhaus is back out doing its run towards the end. Richard Westbrook back at the wheel as out comes the WRT car. Westy doing 34s, one minute 34 second laps. So, not setting the world on fire, but again, it's about gaining knowledge of the car, working all the time with the engineers to perfect the setup, to learn what it does, what it needs. Testing is one thing, Alan, as you very well know. Racing is a whole different world. It certainly is, there's no question. That's when you find out exactly where you are in terms of performance. You know, there's no fooling the stopwatch, no fooling the other cars. And also where you are in reliability with other bits of rubber that pick up, you, the little bumps against other cars, the fact that you've got to start, keep starting and starting uh, them all the time. And so in that respect, it's where the real action is. And it's also where the points are at the end of the race. Louise Beckett saying that she was down at Ferrari the tyres that came off the 52 car still very blistered. Right. But really struggling still. And I wonder, that looks like a scrub set. It looked like they'd been written on rather than still had stickers. So is this a set that has just done qualifying? Have Porsche, as we've seen so many times, managed to keep fresh tyres to the end of the race? They always say it's like the Daytona 500, 400 miles to survive, 100 miles to see who's going to win this thing. You've got to be in it in the final hour, and you need a trump card. Is this uh, Estra coming to unlap himself before the 51 pit stop? I think it is. Yeah, it could well be. That is the 51 ahead, I think. Well, he's not a lap behind, is he? Because they were unlapped behind the safety car. No, I think he's a lap behind. It was close with the Toyota there. Okay. Just trying to dive down the inside, didn't quite get it done. Just shows they're still pushing like heck. And Lapierre into the pits. So Nico Lapierre's epic stints have been completed. And he will head down to the Alpine garage to hand over to Andre Negrau, who will do the remaining 90 minutes. Is that confirmed? Well, we saw him with a helmet on. It's unlikely they have both drivers helmeted up. Uh, we definitely have every driver helmet up, but you're right, Negrau is definitely getting in. I think it's all... Oh, 22? It's not... No, hi, it, uh, it's the real time. It's the traditionally misidentified real team car. And yeah. going in the wrong direction as well. Yep, yep, yep. Oh, that that's will, not good. That will incur the wrath of somebody. Might actually end up having a penalty for that, driving in the wrong direction. 
Oh still... dear, oh dear. He's... Did he cross the track again? He may, he yes, he did. Looped it round and made a right hash of that. Esteban Garcia, that's at turn eight. Yeah, it is, but he's on his way again, so thankfully there's no full course yellow or safety car. Yeah. Oh, we've got a big hit. Got a big hit from Ricardo Pera, by the look of it. Yeah. He did, and... Oh, and the WRT, WRT car got... Friends got caught there. Now, that's as get-out-of-a-jail get, that's as get out of a car as the 22 United car had when it almost got collected by the by the clattered Porsches that was on, four hours ago. That was on the WRT man's... Oh, look at the break. Uh, first yeah. flying lap on that stint as well. That was something that they we saw earlier on in the race and they had a little bit of concern about it because when you get to a certain thickness, especially on the front brakes, the wear, and it just goes up so, so quickly. Yeah. It's incredible how the wear rate just gets out of control and it's on the disc more than necessarily on the pad. Uh, that was tyre change, wasn't it, for yep. the WRT car? Uh, I think so. It was a full set going on to Andre Negrau. I, I would be surprised if they have any sets left. The reason I ask is that if that was his new set of tyres, he's just driven with the left-hand side of the car through the gravel. Yes, but at least it didn't flat spot them. So, Robin Freens, it might, it will have picked up gravel and he'll be needing to shake it off, but at least they haven't carved their way through to the canvas. 20 high-class racing, leading in Pro-Am with Anders fueled back. Let's hear from junior driver Jan Magnussen. The young Dane is with Louise Beckett. Jan Magnussen finally getting out of the 20 high class. That was an epic run from you. That was, uh, that was a long three stints, but uh, I, had a, I had a ton of fun out there. It's so much fun fighting with, well, fighting against, you know, the, the lap time, but also fighting against the other guys out there. Uh, super fun, so happy. Yeah, you're in the LMP2 class, but also within the Pro-Am category, and it's looking yeah. good for you, especially after that spin we've just seen. Yeah, no, so so right now it looks good, but there's still an hour and a half to go, and a lot of stuff can happen, but I'm pretty sure that, uh, that Den Dennis is happy about this. So, Kevin won yesterday. Yeah. Does that mean you've got to win today? Well, I don't have to, uh, <laughs> uh, you know. <laughs> I, I can wait for, for him and me to win on the same weekend. We can wait till August. That would be the better <laughs> one, definitely. Thank you. Thank you. I, I was about to say a, a, a driver with whom Louise Beckett can do, go eye to eye, but you could clearly see him looking down. Oh, and Jan Magnussen is not the tallest man. Well, I, I can just say you can quit with the heightest jokes. Oh, that's outrageous. <laughs> it's a, it, they've developed their own WC support group. Yeah. Now, of course, the, the other reason Kevin stayed in, uh, uh, Jan stayed in, is it's like three hours that he doesn't have to read Kevin's bragging on the family <laughs> WhatsApp group. Oh, ALC Bratislava, Tom Jackson has brought the car back in the garage. Did, has anybody noticed Ollie Webb's name no. actually driving? Yes, yes, he oh, did. Okay. He? Uh, well, what, what that does do is it secures the more. Uh, the greater likelihood yep. of, the f of the fourth place uh, for the delays 29, doesn't yep. it? That drops the 44 back. And there's Tom Jackson. And there's Miro Konopka. Miro Konopka in the background. Yep. I did actually see Ollie Webb a couple of days ago, so I definitely know he's oh, here. He's definitely here. But, yeah, yeah. But uh, I didn't notice at any stage him driving or didn't mention his name while the car was being talked about. So, ALC Bratislava with the, the only Ligier in the field. And they will be hoping to get that to the end of the race. Didn't make the start in Spa. It sprung a fuel leak, which is not ideal and not quickly fixable. We Jose Maria Lopez leading the race now from Sebastian Buemi and Andre Negrau. Yeah, we saw the uh, incident, unsurprisingly, between the 70 and the 56 under investigation. That could cost a win for Team Project One. They are rapidly catching the leader, Ricardo Pera. Eight and a half seconds behind uh, Giorgio Sonagiotto. He's half that gap since the pit stop. He's also sort of lockstep about uh, eight seconds ahead of Giancarlo Fisichella. So both those cars are catching the leader. Could that have just handed the win to the 54? And it's interesting, actually, now Marcos Gomez is back in the 98 Aston Martin. It hasn't got the pace that it had when Augusto Farfus was in it and took it to the lead of the class. Jota on pit road. Stoffel van Dorn, our LMP2 leader, comes in with 82 minutes 
and a half on the clock. They're spot on in terms of the fuel stints, aren't they? Tom Blom getting in. 38, Antonio Felix da Costa. These are the drivers that started. So Sam Hignett will be just hoping that he doesn't see them coming together again. And 38, much closer to 28 as they come into the pit lane than it has been on the last few stops. It's been an impressive race for Jota. Yep. It's, um... He struggled a little bit in Spa, yep. I think we have to be honest. And uh, they've managed to sort of uh, find their way with the setup. They ra raced the Goodyears last year, as you can see the damage there, and that's from the first corner incident. Um, and they they raced the Goodyears, but the Goodyear tire changed over the winter, developed in a different construction in the way that it works, and it required a different thing from the car and also from the driving style. And I think to some extent that last year's experience of the way to conserve the tire actually hampered them a little bit. And everybody else that had no experience just took it on face value. Went out and mullered it, and they were trying to look after it, and it, and yeah, didn't need to. But uh, clearly, they've had a little bit of a think. They've had a scratching in the head, and they've delivered a setup that, uh, without question, has put them in a good place now. 38 car picked up seven seconds on that pit stop up against the leader. Ooh. That was a much quicker stop. And here yeah. comes the United Autosports car. Paul the rest are closing in as well. Restoring they're all on 22. They're all on the same strategy. They'll all have one more stop to go towards the end. And the rest will have a little bit more fuel to put in. He's eight seconds. He stopped earlier. Eight seconds behind 38. And further back in fourth place, the other car that's in the hunt for a podium finish, Team WRT, the number 31 machine. Everybody else a lap back, starting with Inter Europol, Kubish Mikowski in the 34 car. And then our Pro-Am leader, Anders Fjordback, in number 20. And as we heard from Jan Magnussen, they don't have to win here, just to, for him to stay level with Kevin on wins per weekend. But uh, he might want to save it for when they race together. And that's a great opportunity for any father you ask, Derek Bell, you ask. Ask Hans Jochen Stuck. I'm sure Jan Magnussen will feel exactly the same. Martin Brundel, chance to race with your son. And then, you know, you might get that one day if you decide to come back to racing and <laughs> allow young Finn a chance. Yeah, I think I'd certainly still need the booster seat like uh, he did with <laughs> racing with Dindo and Tom. The fact that he's about, uh, you know, 10 centimetres taller than me already. Uh, should say by the way, just as an update, uh, Kevin Estra has now taken that lap back from James Gallardo, so he's running ahead of the 51 car. Yeah, minute and 41 is the uh, is the uh, is the gap. It's almost a full lap, but not quite. Newer tyres for Kevin Estra. So what have Porsche got? Can Jimmy Bruni engineer something? He's half a minute behind Miguel Molina in the second of the Ferraris, so that's the battle for third place, Molina in the 52, and Jimmy Bruni in the 91 Porsche. Well, what it does mean, uh, Martin, we've got uh, an hour and 20 minutes to go. Any safety car now, we know the pace is in the Porsche. Yep. Well, any safety car now, and suddenly things are looking an awful lot better for Toyota. L5 brings in the 85 car. She stays in. Still another 80 minutes to go. Into another stop. Yeah, so still a stint to be done before the final stop. Will they swap her out for the final stop? I think she's she's a bit like Walter Rawl, I always think. She's just made of sinew, so she'll probably go, no, no chance she's getting out. But you never know what effect the heat... Can the, feet, the heat is now going to start to ease away at 6.40, uh, 5.40, rather, in the afternoon. It's Michelle Gatting is now aboard that car. OK, so, so driver right change. Driver. All right, then getting into that realms of making sure they've cleared up on driver time for, particularly for the bronze and silver ramp wow. drivers, all of whom have to do 2 hours 20 in a GTM car. Air temperature's actually a little bit up at 24 and a half degrees. The wind has dropped then. Um, so it's still a bright, sunny afternoon here on the Algarve. Down the inside comes the 38 car. And is that a battle for position? Michelle Gassing ahead of Dylan Pereira. It is. She's fresh out of the pits, and this is the battle for seventh in GTE Am. This is a test. Yeah. Uh, highly rated 
Porsche Super Cup driver, Dylan Pereira, the Aston Martin, the 33 car. The only Luxembourg driver in the field. And as you say, highly rated, won two or three races in last year's Porsche Mobile One Super Cup and came within an ace of winning the title. Michelle Gatting, race winner this season in Ferrari Challenge, I believe. And a firm part of the Iron Dames project. This is now year three for this all-female crew in all competition in the European Le Mans series and now here in the FIA World Endurance Championship with new talent coming along behind in the Michelin Le Mans Cup in the shape of Dari Ampere and uh, Sarah Bovey joining her this year mm -hmm. for the support series for the Yellow S. And through comes the other all-female crew car, the number one. Here is the clicking house, diving up the inside and contact with the number 70 car, the real team racing car. Esteban Garcia has been in the wars in this stint. This time, though, not of his own making. Yeah, that was a little bit uh, unnecessary yeah. in reality because uh, clicking house was, you know, it's 52 laps back um, because of the problems earlier on. I have to say, though, Westbrook's been going very, very quickly yep. uh, with lap times in the 32s and the mid 32s which is only half a second to, you know, a second off what uh, the race leaders are doing. Yep. So they've got a bit more pace out of it, but uh, ultimately got into something he didn't need to do. It's a real engineering test session, isn't it, for them in in proper conditions, in race, race trim, with lots of rubber going down, lots of dirt coming on, uh, muck off line, other traffic to get by. Gives you a realistic idea of what the car will do. Well, Michelle Gatting is in the Iron Dames car, pulling away from Dylan Pereira, and her teammate Rahel Frey is ready to chat to Louise Beckett in the pit lane. Rahel Frey, you bought in the 85 Iron Lynx, and actually, you're looking like you haven't really been out. I mean, how difficult was it out there? It's difficult out there right now. Um, yes, we have air conditioning in the car. It's a big, big support. Never does two hours feel quite long, but uh, we are fit. Unfortunately, the conditions, um, they are difficult. The car is sliding quite a bit. We have some tire issues, um, but in the end we manage, we stay on track and uh, we are still running. There's major tire issues across the board actually, and I saw yours just come in and I can see the blistering all over them. So how do you deal with that out on track, trying to push but knowing that's going on on the tires. Yeah, the first 10 apps are quite, uh, they're quite important. Um, we just have to manage them well. Um, we can't push immediately going out of, of the pit lane. Um, but honestly speaking, I failed a little bit today because um, I had a huge drop for the, uh, for the last 10 laps. And uh, this is something uh, we have to investigate and we have to learn from it and uh, we have to come back stronger. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. I told you she was made of whipcord. Yep. Uh, you know, I, I've seen her get out of the toughest races looking like she's not done anything at all, and that's not exactly the case. Lead battle here in GTE Am, and this is Ricardo Pereira has caught Giorgio Sinagiotto. Half a second the gap as they went through the last timing beam. One thing I will say is impressive, we've seen some pretty extreme damage to those tyres blistering across the glasses. Uh, have we seen maybe one, two failures of tyres at all? Yeah, we've seen, uh, and it was predominantly the fronts, but that was from lockups Indeed. and things, as opposed to the blistering. Once they blister, they don't necessarily, the construction, once it releases the heat from the blister, it's not too bad. So here comes Perra looking on the outside of Sonigiotto, forces him to go defensive. Is this the opportunity for the Porsche man? This battle has been going on for quite some while, hasn't it? With, uh, I think, probably with all of the drivers in, in both cars involved in it. Giorgio Sanagiotto for Cetilar, just hanging on in front of Ricardo Pera. Tucks in, and is this where he's going to just try the dummy? That's not going to work. Now, he might get slightly better traction out of the corner by having used a different line, but that didn't work there. He'll want to get through quickly if he can, because not that very far behind is Giancarlo Fisichella. Yep. 7.8 seconds back is Fizzy. Michelle Gatti, by the way, great times coming from her. She is, at the moment, just pulling away a little from Dylan Pereira. Yeah. And Ben Barker. Also, some good times, but a little further back in the 86 as the Jota car comes through past these two cars. Well, 
just about past two cars. Chetelar, Giorgio, Giorgio Senna Giotto trying hard not to run offline and onto the onto the marbles, onto the dirt. Does allow the Jota Sport car to come through. Tom Blomquist is the leader in LMP2. Antonio Felix da Costa in second. It's Jota 1-2. Head of United's Paul de Resta and WRT's Robin Freens there. The cars in the hunt for the podium. These two in the hunt for the win. A, of course, is Giancarlo Fisichella in third. And here we go. Perra running out very wide. Trying to keep that momentum high. Looks like the Ferrari is better planted down the hill, though. Got good straight line speed, the Ferrari, mm. considering. But he's defended where he didn't need to. He compromised himself there, but there was no way the Porsche was going to be able to come down the inside. So now he's on a bit more of a defense mode, which is then compromising himself up the hill. Oh, oh they touched. touched. They touched the Ferrari, pulled across the front to take the line. The Porsche was already just there. No harm, no foul, ultimately, in the end. And Fisichello is coming. He's taken three seconds out of this pair with this battle underway. Not surprised. And behind them is the second of the Jota Sport cars. That's going to queue up to get by as well, so that will slow them down. And in fact, Fisichella is behind the number one Richard Mill racing team car, so there's only two cars between them. This was all caused by the fact of defending into the first corner when he didn't need to, and then into that corner because of the first corner, and ultimately compromised a little bit too much there uh, for Seren Giotto. And behind here, Da Costa needs to get a, sh a shuffle on as well yep. because Ooh. he's being caught that compromised the Ferrari. Yep. This could be the moment for... It's not really quite there, is it? Not quite. But uh, Paul de Resta is closing on Antonio Felix Da Costa. Could be in for a real grandstand finish in all of our classes, actually. Battle on our hands for the hypercar and overall win. Ricardo Pera here looks like he's got the move going on the inside. It's a long run oh. down to the straight, but he squeezes through. A little bit of... And they've touched. Look at the body work in the back. He did. He swiped him. Through comes the number one Iron Dames car. Through behind comes Paul de Resta. He will pull out of the slipstream of the number one, and that is Sophia Flersch, no Titanic Calderon now. Here we go, he gets slides down the inside into the final corner, the Ferrari turns in, and just boom, there, tags the left rear bodywork. Now, it hasn't damaged the legality side of it, I don't think, but uh, certainly it hasn't improved the aerodynamics. I don't think they put that through the Porsche. Oh! oh. Yes, yeah, Dragon Speed looped it around. Montoya. He's on the circuit somewhere. Yep. Oh, oh and he's, he's just stalled it. And he's, that's, 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 that's high, high class. class off. That's the leader in behind player. into Europol going. Well, it was in front, uh, and fuel back has just gone by. So that was a clash with the 88 car. Yeah, trying to get his nose inside. He was there. The 88 either couldn't or didn't give him room. The 88 in the hands of Dominique Bastia. And who would have thought that car would still be running at this stage after all the issues it oh, had the early yes, on here? <laughs> and then getting hit and there getting hit again. The drama. I do like the American way of things, keeping your foot planted on the throttle, whichever yeah. way it's going. Yeah. yeah. John Lacey was a big fan as well, Indeed. wasn't he? <laughs> so he's got it back and running. Yep. Yellow's removed at turn 13, but there'll be a lot of gravel around there, I'm sure. Yeah. Fueled by fluid Spanish invective, I'm sure. May I just say about when we're talking about lead battles and coming to the end, that safety car definitely has brought this race alive again. Yeah. Eight hours um, without the safety car, I think, would have sort of been reasonably static, certainly at the front in the hypercar. However, Andre de Grau is dropping lap time quite quickly to Jose Maria Lopez. The momentum swinging back to Lopez, even with the extra splash at the end, that he's going to be able to maintain that second place overall. Yeah, fuck. Firmly planted. See him, you see him just like click, 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 flicking it down the gears. Right, let's donut this thing around and get going. Crowd prepared for some spring flowers at some point there. Nicely dug up. Um, Lopez coming towards the end of his stint. He's got about four more laps to go, but uh, it's been a pretty stellar stint, actually. Consistent, Ooh. tidy from. Argentinian. Fastest race lap for this car, 131.103 on the last lap. The only car that has gone quicker is Nico Lapierre in the Alpine. Mm -hmm. 
as the Toyota is on its way. It's quite clean and tidy now, and it's also he's pulled about five, six seconds, uh, 6.8 seconds actually to Sebastian Boemi. But remember, Boemi is on a one stop to the end, uh, whereas we've got for Lopez and also Negrau. So for uh, th they will have to stop once more. And uh, at the same time, we're going to require a second stop for them. It's going to be different lengths of fuel, and it'll only be a splash, actually, for Lopez. But that's just enough with a 28-second pit delta anyway before they stop for fuel. We saw some aggression in defence, didn't we, from uh, Giorgio Sanagiotto. He's going to have to do it again because Giancarlo Fisichella is with him now on track for second in GTE Am as oh. in the pits comes number one and the Toyota. Yep. So that is Lopez. Race leader is in, and as you said, Graham, car number one is in as well. It's not showing, actually, uh, the number one car, but we could see it. That was... It was the Glickenhaus, that's why. Ah, it was the Glickenhaus, OK. So the red rear end My fault. misled us. No, I thought it was the same car as well. I think what will happen now is the Toyota won't do a full fill. I think they'll do sort of half to three quarters and split the rest of this race, the one hour and six minutes, in two yep. equal stints. That means they're ca carrying less fuel, which means they'll be faster overall over that one, one hour and six minutes. But still have to have the fuel hose connected, don't they, remember, for that time? Do they have to do that in the last one? Uh, it's not the last it's hour, not is it? It's not the last hour, and it's not, not their last the next stop. One. Oh, yeah, that's true. So you can you can underfill it, but you still have to have 34 connection uh, seconds of connection. Uh, Ferrari in the pits. That's the race leader, James Collado. Happy birthday, by the way, James. 32 today. Oh, happy birthday! James. He steps out of the car. One of our world champions, of course. Yeah. The introduction just a few years ago of a World Drivers Championship ah. World GTE. Four tire change, so Porsche may not have much of an advantage of tires left. Gallardo steps out, and that is a four-tyre change on the Ferrari. So that was the standard 67-second stop, or 67 seconds on pit road for the number seven car. And it's came out ahead of the 36 as well. Yeah, I think hopes are evaporating here at Cinetec Alpine, that they may be able to pull off some amazing blinder here. The Alpine has already made eight stops. It needs a full stint and another bit, so it will be a 10-stop race for the Alpine. Ten seconds added to the next stop of car number 56. That's Ricardo Pera for causing that collision with the number 70 Real Team Racing car. Well, could that hand the victory to the 54? He's just now with the, seven, the 47 wow. car and is going by for second position. So I think the Settler car is less of a threat for the win here than the 54. Wow. So it's 10 seconds extra in the pits. Let's hear from the Alpine team. Two news for us. There is stop. One more for number seven. But that doesn't cycle Alpine in front, Alan. No, I don't think it does. Yeah but it means they're not completely without a chance. What they're saying is they also need to stop again. There might be something that we can do. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not sure when that particular radio message was, but uh, it certainly wouldn't have lifted my heart completely. <laughs> However, it does keep a little bit of focus on for the driver. All right, well, let's see what the number eight team have to say. Five laps to go, five laps. Wow, he's going a lot longer on fuel. He's already done one more than the sister car. So they have a six lap advantage. How's that gone out from one lap to six laps? It's been consistently over the course of the race, from the second stop and then through, and they've just been able to maintain that momentum and uh, they're in a position to be able to sort of stretch the mileage. And they've done that purely on driving style. Uh, well, I don't know. They could have done it on mapping. It Fast could be their strategy. Yeah. So Fast if I look at the first one, Buemi, 37 laps on the first in, Lopez, 36. Buemi, 37, Lopez, 37. Hartley, 38, Conway, 37. Hartley, 37, Conway, 37. Nakajima, 37, Kobayashi. And then Nakajima, 40, Kobayashi, 40. That was the safety yeah. car one. And uh, now we're at Buemi, 35. And remember, Lopez has cut short that stint. 
a little bit. He could have gone another two or three laps later. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So it's effectively a three-lap advantage, and two of their drivers in the first stint on the tyre have found a lap over their rivals. That's impressive. Well, the first stint, you don't necessarily want to stop both your cars at the same time if you can. If you can, so yeah, yeah. give priority to one and uh, that priority usually goes with uh, the car that's leading. Looking at the brake dust coming out of the front of that Alpine, there could be a little bit of a long pedal coming for Alexandra Negrau here, because uh, in that, when it gets to this point where there's a lot of brake dust, that means there's a lot of wear. And when there's a lot of wear, the more wear it gets, the longer the pedal is, the more you have to pump it up to get the pressure onto the pads to go onto the disc. And uh, that ultimately just starts to bring performance away as well winding brake balance away from the front to go to the rear. That's good for the front brake wear, but it also heats up the rear tires. And we do know that the rear tire temperatures has been a discussion all afternoon. GTE AM leader is in the pits. Giancarlo, uh, Giancarlo Fisichella gets out of the Ferrari. From second and driver change Oh, from the second, yes. He yes. was catching Ricardo Perra, wasn't he? So we've got, remember, that the We've still got stops to come from the two leaders, Ricardo Perra and Giorgio Sanagiotto, but Perra, or rather the 56 car, is going to have 10 seconds added to its pit stop when it comes in. Right, so who is in for Fisichella? Is it Castellacci, or does Thomas Floor still have more time to do? I'm just checking that right now, but I think Thomas Floor has done his right. His I, I have a feeling he's done quite a lot. We are 40 seconds away from the final hour of the eight hours of Portimao here. And so we are getting ready to see who has got anything special left in the locker to decide the finishing order in race two of the FIA World Endurance Championship for 2021. Sixty minutes remain in Portimao to decide five class wins. In hypercar, Toyota Gazoo Racing lead one two from Alpine Elf Matmut. In LMP2, Jota Sport one two from United Autosports. High class lead the Pro Am category in LMP2 from Real Team and Dragon Speed. In GTE Pro, A of course are first and third with the Porsche GT team sandwiched between the Ferraris in second and their second car in fourth. And in GTE AM, Project One Porsche leading from Chetelar Racing Ferrari and the 98 Aston Martin cycling back up into third. There are a lot of fuel stops, driver changes, tyre changes and strategy decisions as well as laps still to be played out here. Martin Haven, Alamanish and Graham Goodwin in the booth. Down in the pit lane, Duncan Vincent and Louise Beckett. And the final hour, this is how they head into it after seven of our eight hours. Laps, uh, points and a half in these classes for their positions here. You can see the Pro-Am category still pretty tight for second place, but our current leaders, high class, have a lap in hand. And in the GTE Am category, again, it's the top four, five, maybe even six cars might still have something to say about the top half dozen. So the Algarve coast of Portugal, the venue for the second race weekend of the FIA World Endurance Championship. We go from here to the Autodromo Nazionale di Monza, Italy's Temple of Speed for race three, the final sort out before the big one, the 24 hours of Le Mans in August. But right now, who is going to come out on top? This is your race leader, the pole sitter, the number 28 Jota Sport car in LMP2. Well, they started at the very front of the field and an hour left, they're still at the front of the field. Graham Gooden, pretty straightforward race for them, really. Uh, no, no, it wasn't, was it? Uh, that was the clash between the two Jota cars that saw this car turn around and back to the back of the field. It's been a fight back, but it's been impressive since that moment for Jota. Uh, they've got, what is it? 10 seconds over Antonio Felix da Costa in the sister car, a further 3.5 seconds to a charging Paul Resta. That's not over. 31 seconds back to 
the somewhat delayed uh, Team WRT car. A um, few woes on track, including that runoff in avoidance. Uh, two penalties as in now comes. Che the well, Chetelar in the pits. Giorgio Sanagiotto brought the car in from what was second place, and that means Team Project One lead now for me, Northwest AMR Aston Martin. But the number eight Toyota, our race leader and hypercar leader, is in the pits. 54 Ferrari shutting the door. And bits of debris there flying off the real team racing engine of Matthias Besch that's second in Pro-Am. That 70 car seems to be magnetic to carbon fibre, doesn't it? it Definitely it, Everything's is. hitting it and it's hitting things. Yeah. So Sebastian Buemi relaxed. This should be their final stop. Should make it clear, by the way, that arm is not his. He's not triple jointed. That's somebody from outside the car. <laughs> Just making sure everything is A-OK -okay for the driver. That's a drink going in for Sebastian. Yep. Here comes the number seven car, Jose Maria Lopez at the wheel. Remember this car will have to stop again. Yeah. The seven car, the eight car, this will be them to the finish. 36, 37 laps to the end for Sebastian Bohemi. So that's an easy run to the end as he comes out of the pits. Now he doesn't come out in the lead of the race, but uh, with the total knowledge that Jose Maria Lopez will have to do that splash, probably about six, seven laps towards the end of the race. But uh, Lopez is actually looking at this fight where he is in comparison to Negrau in third. And that's exactly what those men are looking at as well in the race suits. Uh, zipped up, Philip Sino, the team boss. Could see Mathieu Vazavier and Nico Lapierre watching as their teammate Andre Negrau tries to put this car not just on the overall podium, not just on the car podium, but also between the two Toyotas. Number eight is probably not going to be achievable, but trying to get ahead of number seven, that's the big target for Alpine. And it's a very much more competitive race. And we go to the final hour of the race. I know pit stops and fuel have been all things to consider, but how do you see this last hour playing out? Yeah, it's, it's looking. It's looking. Up the strategy for us, which means that we can potentially not stop again where the other car and Alpine will have to do one more stop. So right now it looks good for, for us in car eight if we can keep everything together. Thank you. Cheers. So straightforward then. No other problems. Uh, certainly for as far as concerned, Alan. It's out of their hands now. It's down to whether or not there's drums ahead that uh, they can get uh, any kind of uh, result better than third. I think there's ultimately um, they've still got a little bit to play for at the end. You know, they're not totally out of it, but uh, there's been some absolutely fantastic highlights of this race so far, Martin. Round two of the FIA World Endurance Championship started at the circuit of Portimao in bright, sunny conditions, racing behind closed doors. The first ever pole position, an outright pole in WEC for a French team, Senior Tech Alpine leading away from the two hypercar rival Toyotas. Down into turn three around the outside of the pole sitter went racing team Netherlands Gera van der Gaard, taking the lead, and then worse for Tom Blomqvist. He was clattered into and turned around by his teammate Antonio Felix da Costa as Blomqvist tried to get back underneath the yellow racing team Nedland car. He drops the tail of the field. Porsche qualified on pole, the 92 car comfortably quicker than anything, but very soon Ferrari got by contact between the Dragon Speed car and the second of the uh, Jota Tour cars. Then the, the only major incident of the race so far and that was Ryan Briscoe misjudging the size 
of the new hypercar from Glickenhaus, clattering into 77 and 777, both of whom later retired. Battle for the lead in GTE Am. Initially, Porsche versus Ferrari. Porsche faded very quickly, Aston Martin came through, but the Ferraris have been resolutely quick. Racing Team Netherlands, big mistake here. Little touch with the uh, pro-class Ferrari, broke the left rear corner and the drive shaft and dropped them from podium contention to the tail of the LMP2 field. Leading in Pro-Am, the high-class racing entry. Little grassy excursion for the 98 car, Paul Dallalana blunted its challenge a little, but responding to tire wear, they have come back. Miro Konopka causing a safety car, the only one so far in seven hours of racing as he spun off at turn eight. The safety car bringing them right back into contention, giving them almost a full lap back to put them behind their Japanese rivals. Contact then behind Ricardo Pera turning around the real team car. And United Autosport in the battle for victory in LMP2 with Team WRT who led early on and Jota who currently lie first and second. Hard work for the brakes and the tyres and the drivers and everything else here. Senior Tech lie third, Toyota number eight in second but will not need to stop. Ahead of them, the number seven car, which will, in the GTE Am class, could be the battle of the Ferraris, but the Team Project One Porsche has the lead going into the final hour. And that's Team Project One Porsche on pit road. Ricardo Pera with an extra 10 seconds to serve in this final stop. An investigation over the 54A, of course, of Ferrari, which Giancarlo Fisichella has handed over to Francesco Castellacci. And that might open up the uh, uh, victory potentially to Chetelar Racing. Let's hear from Toyota. That's OK, sir. All good, all good. Car 7 will do a splash. Remember, 10 seconds to be added to this pit stop from Team Project One. Then we'll find out where we stand on pace. And really soon after that, we'll find out whether or not there's further dramas for 54. It is not done yet for GTM, for the overall, or for any of the positions on the podium. About halfway through the race, the number seven Toyota came flying into the pit lane far too quickly, left big black marks, clattered into something in the pit lane, uh, a... Uh, direction board surprised that there was no investigation for hitting items in the pit lane and also potentially for being over speed in the pit lane but apparently that was either invisible or nothing to see here number 22 is in and this should no it won't be the last stop will it for an lmp2 car they'll need maybe another five or six minutes of fuel if we go green all the way we have had no full course yellows, just one safety car. No, this should be the final stop for this car. They make uh, it? Yeah, they'll, they should make it, yeah. Got a 30, 31 lap stint to do. Okie dokie, in which case, that could, they are the first of our stoppers, so anybody else will stop for a shorter time because they are not time limited in the or, or mandated in the pit lane. Remember, with the 2021 spec for LMP2, they're going longer on time than they would have done previously, 41, 42 minutes previously. That's come out of it, and... Uh, yeah, but it's 48 minutes left to the yeah. end of the race. That's why that was why I had the slight question mark, but I will certainly defer to Alan and his ability to use the computer. And count. <laughs> I think Chetelar may have this. It, it's... I, I, well, I tell you what, if they don't finish on the podium, that will be an absolute shocker. Some somehow but yes they may well come out on top with their first world endurance championship win with that well be? it was a full stop the one minute 30 stop oh sorry it was 120 plus the 10 seconds for ricardo perry who's come back out in that car and uh antonio fuoco rapid young man is at the wheel of the number 47 car francesco castellacci is out in third place gap between the three is about 13 seconds for uh, the three podium position cars at the moment have project one made their last stop yes is surely just done but yeah. then the other two hang on a minute they've all done seven stops so, so the other two don't think, need to stop i think that's it it's now okay. on base 
remember the 10 seconds is burned that that's that's now yep. in the mix here so it's going to be about this oh that, that did, did look close yeah no, oh, this Montoya. is Montoya a replay again in trouble is that the same one that's, that's, that's the same one that's, that's a Montoya. replay but very close to another one going into the first corner as it came out of the pits after its final stop well duncan vincent and i were sitting on the ground at the pit exit and i pointed out to duncan that in a prototype or in fact, in almost anything, you can't see what's in the dip. And that's with us sitting without a helmet, a hands device, and a restrictive cockpit around us. Not surprising that there's been a couple of near misses there. Does Kevin Estra oh, was a stop at one? I think he does, doesn't he? Estra. Uh, well, the Porsches yeah. and the yes, Ferraris have made six each. No, he does. He's at 31 laps, so he's got maybe seven or eight laps yeah. to go before his final stop of the event. And 91 had an out-of-sequence stop because it had a, a tyre issue, didn't it? Why is 92 owe us one more? Uh, Jimmy Bruni owes us one more as well. The 91, okay. both both they, Porsches they both, do. They both have problems but, with tyres. But the Ferraris don't need to stop again? Uh, the Puer Guidi could be on a splash, but he should be able to do it. And Molina owes a stop. OK. So... I think in that respect, the 51 leading Ferrari is looking OK. The others are a stop. That is taking the race even further away, potentially, from Porsche. On board the 38 Jota Sport car, it's Antonio Felix da Costa. Not Portuguese, but lives in Portugal and clearly speaks the language fluently. And this is where it's all going to wind out, isn't it, for LMP2. Anybody stopping from here on in will not need to stop again. Not just Portuguese, clearly. <laughs> Antonio Felix da Costa, my, uh, I'm getting my head confused with him and Augusto Farfas. Antonio lives out near Estoril with his uh, brothers. Chasing down teammates Tom Blomqvist, 8.9 seconds between them. And Antonio, a second slow on that last lap. It can all be down to where you catch cars. Jota leading with Blomqvist, and if and when Antonio gets to him, they're going to have to be pretty gentlemanly about it. There is the Jota Sport team. Trying to make sure that everything passes off between the two cars as neat and tidily as possible, and whatever else happens, they end up with a 1-2 for Jota Sport. Robin Friens in third for Team WRT. United's Paul DeResta, the only other car that possibly could finish on the podium here. Uh, leading in Pro-Am, high-class racing, and has fueled back in sixth position, as up to fifth have come into Europol competition. Let's hear from Jota's Stoffel van Dorn. Stoffel van Dorn, it wasn't the best start for the 28, but um, both Jota's, in fact, have put in strong performances so far. Yeah, exactly. It's been, um, yeah, it's been a difficult start for, uh, for our car. We dropped back to last after... Uh, a hit between between both cars actually but um, the pace has been a uh, make up from everyone in the team we've managed to recover bit by bit every stint we, uh, we recover ground on the leaders and the team has been doing a fantastic job as well with uh, with the strategy so uh, we're back in the lead at the moment um, 45 minutes to go but the sister car is very close so uh, we've got to keep pushing and uh, hopefully we can bring it home have you got a stop to do uh, we still have one stop to do yeah the sister car as well so we're uh, we're kind of on the same strategy, um, so the gap we're seeing right now is, uh, is the real gap, so hopefully we can bring it home. All right, thank you. Thank you. you can see on the left-hand side all the P's, cars going in and out of the pit lane, WRT into Europol, high class and real team all stopping on that lap. WRT coming out, but into Europol have already left with Louis Delatraz at the wheel of the 34 car, taking over from Kuba Schmikowski. WRT Robin Fring stays in. Uh, Matthias Besch stays in at Real Team. Matthias Besch has been in since lunchtime, it seems, at Real Team. And Anders Fjordback brought the high class car in. Looks like he remains in the car, but there's an issue. Are they, what are they topping up? That looked like, was that a battery coming out? It might well have been, actually, and that could be a problem for high class. They lead in Pro Am. Real Team in second are two laps back. So that gives them. It's cause for concern. Three minutes, less than three minutes, two and a half minutes to get that sorted and to get the car back out to hang on to their lead. And as you heard from Stoffel, they will need to have 
further stops for Jota. And WRT and United are going to be a minute and change behind. In fact, right now, the United car is a minute and seven back. A minute United. and seven is a, is a pit stop. No, but United at this moment in time are, I think, able to go to the end. Robin Frins definitely owes a pit stop. There's no question Robin about it. It's just, United that's in the game. Pitted. They've just yeah. pitted. Oh, they just pitted now. Yeah. So Frins has just stopped. So the Jota cars will stop later. A standard pit stop will be about a minute and seven, minute ten. They'll make a shorter stop it could be three cars down into turn one very close together for victory in lmp2 and this is a major drama now for high class and at, at the same time as well uh, when you talk about that it looks like the alpine is just gaining a little bit of performance and the grau's been a bit quicker and bringing himself really close to jose maria lopez after yeah. their final stops as well Absolutely right. He's battling number seven, not number eight. High class are on their way. They didn't lose. Ah, they got passed by the Richard Mill Racing Team, but not by real team. Yet. Yet. So, well, let's hear from Louise Becker, who's down at the pit lane. It looked like a battering change, but... Yeah, there was a strong smell of fuel just now as, uh, as the 20 high class went past me, so... I'll go and speak to the team. I wonder if that was just a yeah. spillage. Yeah, I, well, I wonder... Turn the wrong microphone off, you idiot. Uh, wondered whether that is actually the car trying to crank and just over-fueling itself, and it's coming out the exhaust rather than out of, say, the floor well. Uh, Alan, the, uh, the United car, fuel to the end, how tight? Well, very tight. Very tight. So... It's tire. Gonna be down to tire. Yeah, well, the, the thing I'm thinking about is, will an extra lap, depending on where he is in relation to the overall leader, make a difference to United here? I think they're very edgy here. Uh, they're on the edge, but I think they're capable of doing it. They should be able to do 30 laps. So it's 30 laps, 31 laps. So uh, the, Wayne Boyd did 31 laps. They've been doing 30 laps all the way through. So I don't, I, I see it tight, but I don't see it critical. 40 minutes to go, it's 13.6 seconds between the top three overall. Jose Mira Lo Maria Lopez, 10 seconds up on Sebuemi, with three and a half seconds then to Andre Negrau. Pace last time around, all three of the top cars in 133.2. Tom Blomqvist, 11 seconds ahead of Antonio Felix da Costa, with Paul de Resta, 69 seconds back. A loose device in the cockpit of the high-class racing entry. Um, not what you want, really, things rattling about. Presumably something electronic which had broken free of its Velcro and was just attached only by the cables, which would have been rattling backwards and forwards like a bottle of water in a footwell. Well, what had been two laps is now a minute and ten seconds. Yeah. And it's, uh, it is Anders Fjord back from Matthias Besch for the win in Pro-Am now, 10th and 11th overall. How far back is Juan Pablo? He's only half a minute behind as well. So we've, got, so we've got the top three covered by 90 seconds, which is a basically just about a lap, isn't it? So that's very close indeed. 91 Porsche. Which does always a stop, as does yeah. the 92. Yeah. 92 at the moment is 15 seconds back, but with a stop to come. You saw Richard Leach animatedly chatting there to the team. Porsche been really on a hiding to nothing since the start of the race. All of that, you know, excitement and, uh, and positivity from pole position and a crushing pole position from Kevin Estra just evaporated as soon as the race began. The Ferraris just left them behind and in the end lapped them before the safety car came out. Now, I didn't quite get my hand, head around uh, Sinutech in as well, or the Alpine is in at Sinutech. Didn't get my head around whether the Porsches were waved by or whether they somehow managed to get a lap back during the safety car. I think they must have been waved by. Uh, this is the Alpine in for that uh, final, final stop, stop for them. Final stop as well for 91 Porsche. Final tear off being removed. And away goes the Alpine. It's got about 25 laps to go. So it'd be 25 laps of fuel in that car. Left side, the Porsche. Left side only, yet again. The Ferraris had four tyres on the last stop. Porsche only have a pair left. So 
It's a busted flush, isn't it? Porsches. I was thinking maybe they might have fresh set like, you know, we've seen before in the final hour. I think they've struggled so much. They're doing well to have two tyres left. GTM, by the way, as we see the 54 car, I think it was indeed that car running in third position. Francesco Castellacci is 4.8 seconds behind Ricardo Perra per second. They're lapping at about the same speed. Antonio Fuoco, though, is beginning to go away from the pair of them. Yeah, 12 <laughs> seconds covering the top three yeah. with just over half an hour to go. Well, this is the Glickenhaus's uh, major, uh, I was going to say contribution, but uh, to the detriment of 777, the Aston and 77, the Dempsey Proton car. And if United end up on the podium, how close was that to being the end of their race as well? Within maybe a coat of paint or two, maybe a little more than that, but it's been a pretty tough baptism for Glickenhaus. They didn't complete all the free practice sessions without issues. They had gear selector problems. That contact damaged the clutch, and they then had subsequent gear selector issues. So they've still got work to do, but it is a brand new car in its first ever race. Testing is one thing, and they have tested successfully over quite a lot of endurance running. But racing, that's where endurance really comes back to bite you in the backside. Next three or four minutes should see both Jota cars on pit road for their final stop, and then we'll see just how close Paul de Resta is with that run to the flag. Jimmy Bruni leaves the pits in 91. Going in is Kevin Estra in 92, which is second in GG Pro. That's Jose Maria Lopez. And Andre Negrau battle for second. What? But Lopez is leading, yes, but the number eight car will not stop again. Number seven must, and so must 36. 36 has just done its last stop. Yeah, so they've done their final stop. One minute 11 behind the leader, one minute and uh, 119 behind the leader. So that's the gap to Lopez. But we have to remember that Lopez will do a, a shorter fuel stop. But we're not sure that it can be any shorter in time. He'll have less fuel going in, but does the minimum time the hose remains attached still count? We'll find out after we hear from birthday boy James Collado. James Collado of the 51 is watching on at that Porsche pit stop and also at your teammate up. How's the rest of this going to play out for you? Well, um, it's tricky out there. All the cars are suffering with blistering on the tyres. It's quite severe, so we're just trying to manage that as much as we can. And, uh, yeah, we're quite on the edge on fuel to make it to the end. So Ale's doing a lot of fuel saving just to try and see if we don't have to do a splash. So, uh, so far, it's looking good. The Porsche's just boxed. So um, let's see. It's still, it's still 35 minutes to go. This sure is, thank you. No uh, very disappointed we didn't get even one little line of happy birthday to you from Louise Beckett. And there we go. So, yeah, Ale, uh, his teammate Alessandro Pierre Guidi, desperately feather, feather touching the car around, off the gas early, rolling it through the corners, trying to keep momentum rather than have to pick up the throttle, just desperately trying to eke every little smidgen of fuel out of the car that he can so that they are not forced into the pits. They are the leaders from teammates Miguel Molina and Daniel Serra, and they do not want to have to stop again. Yeah, the 52 car, though, in second place will have to stop, but pretty soon as well. So that will put the Porsche of Kevin Estra, who's back out after his final stop, into back into second place. So, yeah, marginal on fuel, says James Gallardo. That's what he's prepared to say on, on air. Yeah, marginal because they don't want to stop again. They know they probably need to, but if everybody else has to peel into the pits and it gives them a 30, 40, 50, 60 second margin, then suddenly, Alan, you can save an awful lot of fuel if you haven't got somebody breathing up your exhaust. Yeah, but that's very true, but you have to start very early in the stint to be able to do it because then your percentage of fuel save requirement per lap is much, much smaller, easier to understand, easier for the driver to be able to achieve 
and also less detrimental to your lap time performance. I bet they've been trying to save fuel for the last four hours. They've been I right up at the front of the field, haven't they, since the early early laps against Porsche. True to cars on pit lane. They are indeed. I'm keeping an eye as well on the pace of the program leader. That was a very slow lap indeed from Anders Fjordback at 142. No, 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 no. Something else come loose inside the car. 28 and 38. Here's Antonio Felix da Costa chasing Tom Blomqvist, his teammate. Jota Sport 1-2 at the moment. United in third place won't get to them, but it will be close. Uh, a lot closer. Actually, looking at it again, it is, it is going to be pretty tight for the rest of well, pretty tight. The, the ideal Formula One car, of course, runs out of fuel and falls apart as it crosses the finish line. Now, these may not be built to quite that extreme tolerance, but... You, oh, and fuel back has stopped. High class have stopped, and as fuel back, rather, has stopped. Well, and whatever was loose inside the cockpit, again, I'm guessing it's an electronics issue. It may well still be loose and have pulled out. Full course yellow here, or safety car? If it's a safety car, then suddenly all fuel bets are off, potentially. In 31 minutes, we will see the chequered flag being prepared. Uh, that is really tough for high class. Real team have already gone by. Matthias Besch leads, and Dragon Speed may go by as well within the next 30 or 40 seconds to move into second place. Racing Team Netherlands could end up on the Pro-Am podium here. Yellow flag's only at the moment. And yep. it's a really tough luck for the Danish team. Never have won a race in LMP2. Well, you'd hear in Formula E, the race director talking to the driver, can you restart? Not sure that we've quite got that ability yet here. That might be another step forward. But that would be something that Eduardo Freitas would dearly love to know. Can you restart the car? There's Richard Dean keeping Paul de Resta calm. The Jota cars have left the pits. It is still a local yellow up towards the top of the hill at turn seven. Where is the nearest um, assistance for the 20 car? And which side of the track is it on? It'll it's be on the outside between seven and eight. Because they've got to cross the track. He's on the right-hand side. but yep. the... That's the point. If they've got to cross that track, that surely makes it more likely. There will be some on the outside of the hairpin at the bottom of the hill, and as they come up the hill, they will be on driver's right, but they have to bounce across the grass. The good news is that he's not really in an obstructed position. Dragon's been through to second in pro by the way. Yeah. Could this be the rescuing of the, the day of Racing Team Netherlands? Yeah, well... They are seen very slava, by the way, have rejoined the race. It's a lot of laps back. But if the high-class car does not move again, then Racing Team Netherland will just, I think, Full get a podium. Yellow is coming. Yep. 30 seconds, 20 seconds to full course yellow. And that means everybody comes down to pit lane speed limit, 60 kilometers an hour, chugging around the circuit. Wherever you are in the race, whatever the gaps are, they remain frozen. So everybody down to 60 kilometers an hour, full course yellow is in operation. And into the pit lane, because the pit lane is not closed, comes Sophia Flush. Now then, where is the number seven Toyota? Where is the number 36 Alpine? And what about United? What about Jota? Jota have just stopped. We know they're good to go. Well, depending how marginal they were, United, this could help them. Yeah, yeah this I think will bring them into the picture without any, any issues. Uh, the question is for me is the Toyota in terms of Jose Maria Lopez. He's got 14 laps that he can continue to do in this stint. 
uh, but that would mean he'd have a five, six lap splash at the end. So I don't think it'll get rid of his splash, but it may mean that he can do it under a full course yellow speed yep. at 60K, which is effectively like a half free pass. So do it now is what you're saying? Yeah, 100%. Yeah, and that's what senior tech have to do. They have to bring the Alpine in the same way. But the way. Alpine doesn't need to do it. It's it's already had its stop. Yeah, yeah. It it's did its stop, stop under green, so effectively it's penalised the Alpine Ooh. because uh, yeah. this, the Toyota will be able to do its yeah. stop right. in this position. High-class car of Anders Fjordback is on the back of a rope. It will be under tow on the back of the rope, on the end of a rope. Horrible luck for them. Horrible oh. luck. And the seven crew are ready, and in comes the number seven. Followed in. By the 54. Yep. Or is that 83? Or was it the 83? I think it was the 83, ah. wasn't it? 83. Now, 83 is coming in. This is Nick Nielsen. Once the CR7 going for the off, I would imagine they would box. But then also we can raise our target because we won't, we can, the, the race will be shorter, so we can raise our target. Do you think if they box, we go ahead or not? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think they number eight. They're nailing their colours to the mast. Number eight is passing now. Yeah. Well, they have to. They've, you know, yep. that's track position for them. So yep. they will be leading the race with 27 minutes to go. They've got track position. Yep. There'll be cars in between, but there'll also be gaps in between. Remember, this is full course yellow. So it's not like the uh, the number eight car can actually close up onto the back of the. the sorry, the seven closes up onto the back of the eight. Yeah. Uh, Main time, by the way, the 36. The Alpine is only in turn five. Yeah. That has torpedoed Alpine's yep. hopes, I'm afraid, completely and utterly, and has taken away the race from the number seven car, potentially, but... No, I don't think it has. I think it's actually given the, the seven out. half a chance to have a go at Sebastian Buemi. Maybe. So the fight now is between the two Toyotas, whether uh, Lopez can actually have a go at Buemi, but both of them will turn up the power to Max to go for it in the last 25 minutes. Molina takes his stop now. De Resta did stop for fuel. Yep. The rest are stock for fuel. Well, so super tight then. They must have been effectively giving up uh, any kind of uh, chance of the win of the race on pace. But uh, has emerged, just checking, I believe, ahead of. He has significantly ahead of the 29. Ferrari the, um, trying 21. to make sure that Molina has the best opportunity to hold off the Porsche's brand new left side tyres and just giving him that little squirt of gas that he needs. This is handed. I think second place to the Ferrari. The fact that he was able to make that stop under yellow means... Yeah. Uh, means he, was, he was a minute and a half ahead. 20 seconds to remove full yeah. course yellow. He loses absolutely nothing. 15 seconds. Iron Dames in behind as well. Michel Gasser will stay in. 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Full course yellow removed, full course yellow removed. Right, 25 minutes to sort this out. Toyota number eight leads, Toyota number seven in second place. They no longer need fuel, 10 seconds, 25 minutes. That's the arithmetic. Okay, from turn seven to turn nine, we need to stay left, yeah. And there's no target, no target anymore. So full speed now. OK, so he's got gas to go, so is the number seven car. There's a 10-second margin, 25 minutes, have at it. At 10 seconds, there's a four-second margin. That's down to four seconds, OK. Because of the way that the full course yellow, uh, when they, so basically we'll see when they cross the line, but it'll be about yeah. four to five seconds. But as you heard, there is no energy save, fuel save. It is now full gas all the way to the end of the race. This is a sprint, and this is, to be honest, what we want. Yeah. We were robbed of the fight for second place due to the full course yellow, but we've been gifted a fight for first. Uh, Boemi was on a relaxed 25-minute run before this, and now he's going to have to work for his living. And the Absolutely. other one is up for grabs. The Jota car's off, nose to tail for the leader yeah. of me too. Oh, dear. Tom Blomqvist just inches ahead of Antonio Felix da Costa. Let's hear from Toyota number seven. OK, so see we are back in the game. We have it four seconds. Four seconds to count it. You can push to the end, they have to say. OK, Jose, we are back in the game. What driver doesn't want to hear that? You've got four seconds, you've got 20 minutes. Get on with it, Sunbeam. And if they win this one ahead of the number eight car, they take the points lead, because it's points and a half here. So there's more at stake than there was at Spa. Well, look at the pickup coming off the yeah. inside right uh, of the 
the Jota card. Now, at the end, it's not J the Jota card, it's just generally the pickup through that long right-hander right now. But Antonio Felix da Costa, he's got a sniff of something behind Tom Blomquist coming down to turn three. This is where they collided on the first lap of the race, spun Blomquist around. At that moment, did I ever think that Blomquist would be leading with half an hour to go? No way. But they've pulled themselves back into the game. They've done a really strong run, the Jota cars. Jota Sports looking to win a first WC race under their own name since Shanghai in 2019. Won with the Jackie Chan DC racing car in the final race of last season. It took two race wins, by the way, in the Asia Le Mans series in the preparation for this program uh, earlier this year. But uh, it's an important race here. Nerves jangling now. Yeah, they should be because this is at the moment where you could have a fantastic one-two, depending which side of the garage you're on, or like Sam Hignett, if you're in David Clark, if you're sitting in the middle of the garage and whichever one wins, fantastic, and the other one finishes second, even better. But ultimately, it also could quite easily, just in the lock of a break and a pinch, as we saw at that turn three on the first lap, how it can swing from one thing to the other. So Deresta is 21 seconds back from this battle. He's quicker significantly quicker at the moment than either of these cars. We've got 22 minutes to go. We'll keep an eye on that gap. They'll be keeping an eye too. Both these cars will be given full information on the state of play behind them. Miguel Molina, meanwhile, does his fastest lap of the race. He's got 20 seconds on Kevin Est. He's in the 38s. Est in the 39s. Molina 48 seconds behind teammate Alessandro Pierre Guidi, who leads the race for Ferrari in GT Pro. So you don't see that coming down. It is all about holding off Kevin Est. In GTR, the gaps 13.7 seconds, first to second. Antonio Throco looks to have the legs on Riccardo Perra. And uh, Francesco Castellacci yeah. is third. Four seconds back. But under investigation for full course yellow procedure. Oh, and so too is the Glicken House of Ryan Briscoe, which is probably less of an issue for them. Yeah, they're not going to finish on the podium by any stretch of the imagination, whereas uh, well, the AF Corsa Castellacci car certainly can. Actually, they could, because they're fourth in hypercar. If someone doesn't cross the line. There you go. Uh, yeah, true. <laughs> <I> just, true. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's a, one venture we don't want to head down, I'm afraid. And they are within 75%. So, lap one of the race. Racing Team Netherlands had already got around Tom Blomqvist. Blomqvist trying to cut back inside underneath the yellow car. Not enough room, because Antonio Felix da Costa was still there. Lopez is catching, catching. So Blomqvist went from first to last, almost last of the entire field, actually. And now the Jota Sport car with Tom at the wheel and Antonio Felix da Costa right behind him in second. They're running first and second. That lead gap overall has halved. 2.2. Pechito Lopez bringing it down to Sebastian Buemi. Last lap of 32.4 to a 33.2. He has really got the bit between his teeth. Alan, where's the traffic ahead of the number eight car? Eight's on the straight, he's got a little bit of clear air. Both of them are together, but yeah. it was actually the traffic behind that I think really held up uh, Boemi, yeah. and that allowed Lopez to come close. It is going to be traffic, and that will create the opportunity, if there is going to be one, for Lopez to overtake. I don't think we're going to see, you know, a gung-ho last lap dive down the inside because they're two teammate cars at the end, and, you know, they understand the overall picture of things. But uh, if there is an opportunity with traffic holding up Boemi, then I'm very sure Lopez will try and take advantage. You're absolutely right. You saw Antonio Fuoco still leading in GTE Am. Right with there it. There he is. Leaders are behind, and he's holding up Buemi. Not intentionally, but he's got to take the racing line to survive here. And Buemi is basically down at the speed of a Ferrari, and suddenly Lopez is there. There's two car lengths in it. Who gets to lead the World Championship after this race? Big points, remember, on uh, offer for this yeah. 100th World Championship race in sports car racing for Tota. Well, chances are very strong that they'll have a 1-2. Either that or Alpine will win. 
Ooh, this is lots of pressure now for both of these drivers. Whoever finishes in front will be the points leader. This GT car is going to come into play in the middle of the corner. Lopez yeah. has got to think here, back off just then, keep a little bit of extra momentum and to try and have a nicer, cleaner run. It's been actually played reasonably okay for Boemi, but it's that situation, just that wrong point where you catch the car. Boemi's got to strategically maybe back Lopez up so that doesn't happen. However, Lopez has got to make sure that he keeps him honest all the time. They've got three further GT cars they're going to catch on this lap. The question is, at what stage do or would Toyota say, OK, guys, enough. 1-2, please. It's our 100th race. We want a 1-2 result. We want a photo finish. We're going to hear from the number seven Toyota team. OK, we're going to swap ourselves five. We're going to swap ourselves five. What now? OK, now I want to hear what Sebastian Buemi's reaction to that radio message was. Well, we did see uh, a radio call being done, whether it was internal or whether, what it was, uh, just a little bit earlier on by Pascal Vasselon. He was yeah. speaking into his microphone, and uh, then 30 seconds later, they've got a switch of cars. Well, well, well. Now, that I was not expecting. Let Pichito go because he's quicker. No, not a chance. Is Buemi going to let him go? He will make the point and have an overlap at the line. He's been told to give away not just this centenary win, but also the lead in the World Championship. Yeah, potentially the World Championship. Yeah. Well, whoever finishes in front will have the lead. I don't understand that call. No. Well, I think it was clear that Pachito was a little bit quicker, but at the same time, there's 16 minutes to go. And he hadn't even got to the stage where he was able to think about putting in a pass. I, I would like to be inside the debrief room this evening when they're talking about uh, the race strategy point on right. it. But well, anyway, we're, this we're is the way they've played it. I'm going to send Duncan Vincent now and plant him under the table, <laughs> and he can just record all the effing and jeffing, because I think there might be a bit. Well, the only thing I can think here is he took four seconds out of that car in two laps. Yeah. That was traffic a little bit as well. Yeah. And we know that Buemi's been told they were good on fuel. It's not like he was marginal. Drive-through penalty for the 54 Ferrari, but it's all about why Toyota did that. No, Alan Allen is just shrugging. And uh, I have to say, well, I, they did I'm it. sure it, Buemi's not shrugging. There's a way to control the race, and I'm not sure why they would switch it. To control the race. Yep. Just say, guys, no, no more racing. Basically, hold position, yep. no more racing. One, Absolutely. Two. And uh, so, effectively, they have done that, but they've given it towards uh, one of the other cars, has given it to car seven. Anyway, that's their decision. There's maybe internal reasons, internal backgrounds to it that we're not aware of. Mm. I think this thing, uh, drive through penalty for 54, though, because of full course yellow procedures, that takes Castellacci from the podium. Uh, no, it uh, doesn't. It not keep, quite. It just keeps yeah, him out of the fight. Uh, hold on a second. It's a 28, 30 seconds. He's uh, he's one minute six, so he's going to bring him back towards the fourth Gomez. place. Car. Yeah, yeah it, it is. And Gomez has been at times quicker than him. It should be reasonably comfortable as long as he keeps his head. 56 car here. Ricardo Pera is not catching the leader. This is the lead car in GTM. Yeah. Gomez needs to be three seconds plus a lap quicker than Castellacci to catch him, and I don't think he's going to do that. So Castellacci should still hold on. But for Chetila, again, Graham, is it going to be their first ever win in yes. World Endurance? I mean, what a day that will be for them. Yep. Remember, new sponsors of the factory Ferrari team, very proud Italians. And uh, wow, they're, well, they're only their second race in GTEM. That's some result. Antonio Fuoco, here comes uh, Castellacci as the Joda cars along the pit straight and the gap still under one second doesn't look to me as if Paul de Resta is either able or indeed the team are pushing to close that gap no. two very fast guys here that's not going to help uh, the uh, 
Attack. No, 38 car, we're on board with Antonio Felix da Costa. Has never won in Portugal in his professional racing career, that I can tell. I haven't looked at the go-kart results, but certainly not in a car. He's got 13 minutes and maybe one lap to sort that out. There is some small recompense, by the way, for high-class racing. They are back out and running. We got the car back to the pits, and that car is back out and running. Has not yep. lost a podium position in Pro-Am. No, four laps behind them, still racing Team Netherlands. So, uh, Jot van Oeyter isn't going to close that unless High Class have another total failure and don't finish the race. Hey, of course, is Alessandro Pierguidi on a massive fuel save. That full course yellow will not have hurt them one iota. Could well be that birthday boy James Collado gets a very pleasant gift at the end of this. After qualifying, they may have thought we're going to have a tough race on our hands trying to rein in the rampant Kevin Est. In race trim, though, the tyres, the Porsche was going through just always looked like it was going to swing the balance in favour of Ferrari. No matter how much they were blistering, Porsche were blistering a lot more. And Alessandro Pierguidi has been nursing the tyres and sipping at the fuel as parsimoniously as possible to try and get through to the end of this race with just enough to avoid the final stop that his teammate Daniel Serra has had to take. Yeah, Pierre Guidi is still fuel saving. Yeah. I think the previous lap was a 41, maybe even a 42. This one's almost a 41. There's not enough time for this to be done on pace. No. If they've got it wrong, then they're close enough to put it to a disaster, but they're not going to get it wrong. Yeah. Well, if they drop by the wayside, 52 is there to scoop up the result for Ferrari. It's extraordinarily unlikely that Porsche will somehow outfumble Ferrari and end up on the top step of the podium. But Ferrari would definitely want it to be a 1-2 result. They've worked very hard for this through a very tough race on tyres and drivers. Puergidi's done 40 lap stints before under full green, and this is going to be a 38-39 lap stint, depending on where they are with the checkered flag. So. so that should still help him. He might well be freed of the shackles of having to save. He's got a 30 second advantage over his teammate. And in the remaining 10 and a half minutes, or 11 and a half minutes, the teammate has first got to catch and then think about passing. Jose Maria Lopez leads from Sebastian Buemi. Toyota Gazoo Racing. GR010s are first and second. Boemi has changed back, back again. Front. They've changed back again. Yes, they have changed again. You missed that there, but Boemi's back in the lead. So why did they bother swapping them in the first place? OK, so we swap back, breaking into turn five. We swap back, breaking into turn five. Stay tight. Turn five, breaking. We swap. Now, there are occasions where you do think, what on earth are you thinking on the pit wall? I've never seen a situation where you think, what on earth were you doing? Why did you take one car out of the lead and then put him back in? Both were good to go, neither needed to save fuel. All you've done, basically, is just alienate and confuse the viewer. Well, we can hope that they're both allowed to free to race to the end now. Well... For the last 10 minutes. We were hoping that. that would be a great option. Yeah. We were hoping that 15 minutes out. Now, 10 minutes out, they've shuffled them forwards and backwards and forwards and backwards. Has Lopez got an issue? Buemi is pulling away. And I would have expected Lopez to have his nose firmly up the exhaust pipe of the car in front. Depends if he's allowed. see if there's any response from Toyota on exactly what on earth was going on there. I think there will be radio silence, but we'll find out. Under 10 minutes to go. Still, the Jota cars nose to tail. No sign of team orders there. Uh, bewildering team orders at uh, Toyota. I, I just can't think of a reason why they'd have done it. No. They're probably not going to tell us either. Nope, but anyway, Jota are <laughs> on it. it Half looks a second between the two. I know that Antonio Felix da Costa at home 
will want to try to bring this one home. Yep. I know that at the same time, Tom Blomquist has actually had the performance this weekend to keep his nose ahead. And that's no easy thing to do whatsoever. But uh, he's in a position where he's able to sort of keep the Costa behind. At the same time, for Jota, it'll be a superb one-two. Absolutely incredible performance because you've got to say United have been so so dominant over the last 18 months two years at the same time WRT have came onto the scene swinging and punching and done plumbing well but they're in fourth place right now and so therefore there's been some great competition to bring a one two from a singular team against the might of uh, the, the people they're fighting against. Absolutely. Well, Joshua have always been very good with their engineering and their driver lineups, but it's it's been a, an impressive race. Don't forget, in the first turn, or the third turn on lap one, yeah. that 28 car that is leading in the final eight minutes was facing backwards as everybody went past him after contact with his teammate. And now here we go again. He's Antonio racing. has he's he's not, racing. He's not been closer up until this stage. This is the closest they They've been Sam Hignett on the radio will be going boys I trust you you're professionals but I'm going to kill you dead if you touch again well that basically means boys I don't trust you yeah no, it means I trust you but this is a point where if you unless you're going to Blomqvist. unless you're going to say hold position then you don't get on the radio yeah no 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 I'm sure I'm sure he won't be on the radio either. He'll be leaving that to somebody else to make those calls. No, you just leave them to do it. They yeah. know what they've got to do. You've got to either give a hold position or you let them race. You can't do anything in between, or you shouldn't do anything in between. All right, now it is the two of them, first and second. Three tenths of a second between them, and there's nearly 30 seconds back to the United car in third place. The WRT, the only other car on the same lap. That is the number 31 car in fourth place. Into Europol, top five result again ahead of the Richard Mill Racing Team. Sixth position, they have worked their way steadily up the order. And again through traffic, Blomqvist held up behind the GR Racing Porsche. Just manages to squeeze around the outside. Antonio's going to have to go outside, inside. Gets underneath Mike Wainwright and through he goes. That's Tom Gamble. And nothing gained, nothing lost there. Uh, Six minutes, Graham, how many laps? Well, not, a ma not many, but the, the key thing here for the two Jota cars is not a lot of traffic either now, but a pretty clear run on, the, on, the, on this, uh, this lap. Yep. Just the 47 car, the GTM leader ahead of them. Then they've got oh, two or three turns with no traffic whatsoever. Yeah, so that'll be, they'll probably complete most of the next lap before they catch slower cars. There's the Chetelar car. Our AM leader, Antonio Fuoco, and he will be absolutely nailed on the line. He won't be focused on anybody else. So, oh! <laughs> Jose Maria Lopez nearly slamming into the back of the number eight car of Puemi, and there's Antonio. He's gone through. Da Costa has passed. The 28 car is in second. 38 is the leader. Just as we were watching near disaster for the Toyotas, Antonio Felix da Costa dive bomb Tom Blomqvist. Here we go. They got held up by the Chetelar car. Blomqvist with the gold nose didn't get the drive off the turn down into the hairpin. And through goes Antonio Felix da Costa. He leads at home five and a half minutes of the eight hours to go. And Davidson, wow. <laughs> Roberto Gonzalez can't believe it. Wow, wow, wow. It's not over. It's not over. Blomkist won't take this. Oh, oh yeah, tripped out now. wide. That's him got dirt on his tires. Yeah. I think it's, a, it's over now. Five minutes to go. Very good move, opportunistic. We knew that they were going to fight. It was quite clear by the nose uh, attitude of uh, Antonio Felix da Costa. And also from Bonk Blomquist's point of view, but that little bit of traffic, it can just be the difference to give you enough momentum to be able to take it. Right, now, has Pachito been told to back right off on the number eight car because he is a long way back? He's gone from hundreds of a second to 4.1 seconds behind. Yeah, it's done. I, the, the, the explanation, we believe, is given the opportunity, as they were telling uh, the team they could uh, pass and pull away, they were given the opportunity to do so, 
to secure the win with comfort. They couldn't, and then they were told to reverse the position again. That's yeah. what they were told. So the phrase is, we don't allow them to bang wheels. So what we say, so what Toyota is saying here publicly is, we don't allow them to race each other. We decide who's quicker and who goes. We don't the allow them to risk. We don't allow them to risk the win with a banging of wheels at this point in an important race, I guess is what the position is. We don't trust some of the highest paid sports car drivers on the planet not to crash into each other, so we will rule with an iron rod. Well, OK, fair enough. Meanwhile, in the race, Chetelar still out front. Antonio Foca, there's, I think there's probably several Italians just a few minutes away from some fairly major hangovers. <laughs> <laughs> I don't you think it's going to be apoplexy in that garage if they bring it to the line and both GT categories will have been won by Ferrari because AF Corsa run 1-2 Alessandro Pierguidi half a minute ahead of Miguel Molina and Ale is just still just allowing that gap to to shrink to shrink to shrink just to make sure with Chetila sponsorship yeah it's, uh, <laughs> this is going to be Roberto Lacorta's uh, day of days Yep. Um, excellent well, run from them. Uh, until Hypercar, when, when the Ferrari well, Hypercar may well <laughs> have his sponsorship on as well. Who knows what will happen in 2023. But right now, yeah, he probably doesn't know what he's more excited about, supporting the factory team to a 1-2 or having his own team and driving his own car to victory for the very first time. And, and what a success for them it's been, changing away from from prototypes and into the GT cars. It looks like they've enjoyed themselves more and they are producing the goods better as well. Chetel our lead from Team Project 1 and AF Corsa as Jota are 1-2 in LMP2. They've been competitive straight away in GTM and this has been a convincing performance as what's, what's been a, a, a class, gentlemen, that has entertained from the very start. I just sort of say something. Uh, Mikkel Jensen is closing in significantly quickly into the back of uh, Marcus Gomez. Yeah. No, he is going to run out of time. Six though, and a half gonna... seconds back. He might have two laps to do it in. Two minutes on the clock. The eight hours of Portimao is fast approaching its conclusion. Toyota number eight out front. And only a catastrophic misjudgment by Sebastian Buemi in traffic can affect that. Two seconds back is Jose Maria Lopez. Again, you said that out loud. Hey, whatever. Uh, with the uh, Elf, uh, Alpine Elf Matmut in third place, a minute back now. Their pace right at the end has just kind of flagged a little bit. I'm not sure that that is entirely driver related. And as they cross the line, a minute and 21 on the clock. It's a minute 30 lap. This is the final lap of the eight hours of Portimao and the fourth placed hypercar is lapped by the first place hypercar the Glickenhaus has had a number of problems not least the collision with the D station and Dempsey Proton cars the only two retirements from the race are those cars they didn't retire on the spot but they did retire as a legacy and the uh, Glickenhaus pulling to one side Ryan Briscoe to let the Toyotas go through and I imagine, actually, he might then pick up speed and try and stay with them a little bit to uh, get in the nice red-white photo at the end. For Toyota, nice their line. 100th World Championship race should end with a 1-2 result. And they'll do it with 300 laps of this circuit. Wow. That's a nice little round number as well, isn't it? In LMP2, Toyota also looking for a 1-2 victory. In GTE Pro, AF Corsa a 1-2 win. And it is Chetelar and Team Project 1 ahead of AF Corsa in GTE Am. The Pro-Am category, real team. Matthias Besch, who's been in the car since lunchtime, ahead of Dragon Speed and High Class. Henrik Hedman and Anders Fjordback will bring those cars to the line behind Besch as the podium in the Pro-Am category. But out down the hill for the very final time, asking just one last effort from the tyres. Come Sebastian Buemi, Toyota win the eight hours of Portimao. And across the line in second place has come Jose Maria Lopez. 
you saw the Glickenhaus just behind Ryan Briscoe, they complete their first race in the World Endurance Championship. So it's the number eight team that won in Spa extend their advantage. Chetelar win from Team Project One in GTE Am. Third place across the line, United Autosports. Here's the GTE Pro winner, Alessandro Pierre Guidi and birthday boy James Collado lead an AF Corsa 1-2. Miguel Molina and Daniel Serra will be in second place. Porsche vanquished as they could not keep the life in their tyres. Ferrari struggled, Porsche really struggled. And in LMP2, it is a first racing win at home in Portugal in the number 38 Jota car for Antonio Felix da Costa, the reigning Formula E champion, claims his first win in his first race here in Portimao. Roberto Gonzalez and Ant Davidson all put in stellar efforts to take that victory along with their teammate. Yep, the Alpine home in third overall. The, uh, so it's a 100% record there yep. for uh, Antonio Felix da Costa on uh, around Portimao. Yep, time to retire. <laughs> oh, and, uh, <laughs> Um, and on Port he's, I'm not sure he's raced in Portugal. I can't think what championship he'd have been in that raced in Estoril. Surely at some point in his career. I don't think so. He's never raced on the streets in Porto or Villarreal. I don't think he's raced at an international level in Portugal. Well, there you go. I might be wrong. Formula 3 Euro Series didn't come here. World Series by Renault, so two litre Formula Renault. Formula Renault 3.5 wouldn't have been here. Not in Formula E, not in GP3, not in GP2, not in... None of them raced in Portugal. Hasn't been a Portuguese Grand Prix for decades before last year. So anyway. real, team, real team home as the LMP2 Pro-Am yeah. winners. And who'd have thought that with the race that they'd had? Well, I, I know. Multiple if, incidents. If anybody's got a long list of incidents, I think it's real team. They have, must have the longest of the lot. Here's Sebastian Buemi, our race winner, though. The 100th World Championship race. And Cetila, Roberto Lacorte, Giorgio Senna, Giotto. What a great result for them. And Antonio Fuoco, the young boy, comes through at the flag to take it. So real team claiming victory, and of course they share uh, the engineering of TDS with racing team Netherlands, who could so easily perhaps have won overall, but ended up with that uh, drama contact with the Ferrari costing them uh, nearly a dozen laps. Sebastian Buemi, the team of number eight, winners in Spa. Now, points and a half here as well in Portimao. They are the comfortable championship leaders. That is the 19th WC win for Sebastian Buemi. Wow. That means he joins Pedro Lamy, another of our Portuguese uh, WC drivers, uh, with the most wins, of course, with Sebastian all overall. It's uh, the fifth win in WC competition for Jota under their own name. Level now with KCMG United. First one, two? Uh, no, they've had no. one twos before, but not, not, uh, not as Jota and Jota. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's uh, but, Davidson's 13th win. But I have to say, it's been one of the most uh, best delivered one twos, I think. Oh, yeah. Because they did it, nailed it, absolutely nailed it in qualifying. And then, uh, considering the problems they had at the beginning of the race, strategically came back, but also from pure performance as well. And so there's no question in my eyes that uh, the team delivered the performance, the drivers did as well. And it was a fantastic race all the way to the end to the checkered flag between the two of them. Uh, by the way, first GTE sweep for Ferrari uh, since Fuji in 2017, would you believe? GT Pro. Yes. Yep. Yeah, Porsche, in the end, flattered to be just 45 seconds behind the leader. Should have been a lap and 45 seconds by the safety car, I think. But, you know, racing is what it is. You can't say, well, the safety car changed that, and so we should change it back. Headlights on, coming down pit road there in the shadows, but here at just after 7 o'clock in the evening, local Portuguese summertime, it is still, it's still 24 degrees outside. It's still a warm evening, and uh, the end of... What was a pretty adventurous race. Look at the Chetelar team there. <laughs> yeah, baby. I'm not sure what the Italian for yeah, baby is, but that was it. That car.
car's going to need uh, dent master by, by the time this is over. And Antonio, I'm pretty sure he may have won here in well, he won't have won here in karting because when he was in karts, this circuit didn't exist. He may have won in Portugal in karts, maybe in something very small and, uh, and local, but in his international career, he has not had a race win. I don't think in Portugal, certainly couldn't find trace of one. It's a big day for him. And uh, 32nd birthday and victory in WEC for James Collado with Alessandro Pierre Guidi. And there's so many strings to a racing driver's bow. You've got to be fast, you've got to be brave, you've got to be committed. Sometimes you've got to have lead foot, sometimes you've got to have the feather boots on. And he certainly managed to eke out what they had going. There is Roberto Gonzalez on the left-hand side, and Davidson, and in the center, Antonio Felix da Costa. Well, let's get down to our race winners. Toyota Gazoo Racing, car number eight, and Sebastian Buemi. Sebastian Buemi, I can see you're in pain, actually, but uh, taking that 100th World Championship win, the checkered flag on, across the line, that was just great. Yeah, it was a tough race. Obviously, uh, we had a bit of a different strategy to car seven. We saved, uh, we saved a lot more a lot more fuel and I was able to uh, avoid the splash. However, they got really lucky with the full course yellow. Mm. So uh, yeah, they were coming strong. And then we have some, uh, you know, internal rules. Obviously it ended up in our favor, so I'm, I'm really happy. But I, I had big pain in the end. I had a big cramp on my front arm, so it was not easy. So I'm really happy. What was that swapping all about? No, oh, it's, uh, it's a long story. It's uh, internal rules, obviously but uh, I'm happy that uh, it ended up like that. Well done, guys. They were quicker and they were allowed to shuffle in front and have a chance to run away and leave the number eight car. But Buemi clung to the back of them. Well, there you are, five very happy Ferrari drivers, two wins with the AF Corsa car in uh, G2 in Pro and uh, Ferrari, Porsche, Ferrari in the AM class, the Aston Martin, Bessie Aston's in fourth place, Kessel fifth on their debut, Michael Jensen finishing off the run and pumped up forearms, cramp for Sebastian Buemi. The one thing that racing cars are not built for, Alan McNish, is comfort. Oh, they are very comfortable in there, but uh, certainly it's a pretty tough environment. And around here, it's the high G of the last corner, a lot of workload. It was hot. It was hard for everybody. We knew it was super hard for the tyres. So from the driver's point of view, it wasn't as if it was a free and easy run as it maybe. But ultimately, it did give us uh, some close races. I have to say, I think the, f uh, the safety car really brought it alive again. That was a great. Well, not obviously for the reason for the safety car, but for us as fans, it was really good to bring the whole, all the classes back together. And then we had a really nice fight at the end with the two Jota cars and uh, clearly a switching of position for the Toyota, which one was going to win. And of course, actually the safety car was just an innocuous spin that didn't damage the car, but the car got beached and then needed to be dragged out. The one big collision only brought out local yellows. So one full course yellow, one safety car in eight hours. And there are your winners. Chetilar on the left in GTE Am. The 38 Jota Sport car in LMP2. Uh, the, in the red suits, you can see the Ferrari drivers from the 51 AF Corsa Ferrari in GTE Pro. And our winners from TGR Toyota Gazoo Racing on the right-hand side, the overall and hypercar class winners. Our Pro-Am winners also get their on, own podium. So uh, Matthias Besch and the real team racing crew also there. Buemi. Have an awful lot of physical training all day, every day, and it's just to survive situations like this.
Portimao, the venue for race two of the FIA World Endurance Championship. The eight hours of Portimao at the circuit on the Algarve that is a rock and rolling roller coaster. From the first ever French pole position, the Alpine led the field away. The top hypercar in qualifying, the top three cars on the grid were hypercars with the 28 Jota car leading the LMP2 field. But around the outside, out of turn one, came the racing team Netherland car to take the lead in LMP2. Tom Blomqvist in the 28 Jota car then trying to cut back inside into turn three, but his teammate had already gone for the gap and the two Jota cars made contact. Blomqvist, the LMP2 pole sitter, rejoined last. Porsche's qualifying pace evaporated on race day. Ferrari got in front very early on. The first and only really major incident, Ryan Briscoe misjudging the width of the Glickenhaus, clattering the D-station Aston Martin, which hits the 77 Dempsey Proton Porsche, which nearly took the United Autosport car out of the race, but missed it. Two GT cars would end up out of the race early on. Chetelar were right in the hunt at the front of the GTE AM category from the early going, but the end of an effective charge for the podium for Racing Team Nederland when Jot van Eytert made contact with a GT uh, a Ferrari, didn't do any damage to the Ferrari. High class in front in the Pro-Am class as a result. hours left but Toyota would always have a fuel advantage. United kept Jota honest, they finished in third place, the 28 Jota Sport car in second place as Antonio Felix da Costa took the lead late in the race. The Alpine continued to push the Toyotas right to the closing stages. High class lost their win in Pro-Am as the car ground to a halt bringing out a full course yellow in the closing stages and the Pro-Am win went to Real Team Racing, who inherited that position. Antonio Fuoco, Ferrari to the line to win in GTE Am. GTE Pro, a Ferrari 1-2, 51 ahead of 52. And the final five minutes sort out, saw 38 take the lead in LMP2 from sister car. 28, Jota went 1-2. Toyota 1-2 at the end, the number eight car winning the company's 100th World Championship Endurance Motor Race ahead of the sister number seven and they take a substantial championship advantage away from Portimao. Well, it was a busy race all the way through. Lots of activity. GTEM was manic for at least six of the eight hours. LMP2 no less frantic. Alpine made sure that Toyota always had to be right on their A game to take the 1-2 victory. And Jota, well, 28 went from last very nearly to first. AF Corsa had tyre problems, but Porsche had tyre disasters. The two Ferraris 1-2. And Chetelar, what a day. They claim their first ever World Championship win. Just the two cars involved in the Glickenhaus battle uh, uh, collision didn't make it through to the end of the fight. Alpine in third in the overall standings. And in second, the number seven Toyota, Mike Conway, Kamui Kobayashi and Jose Maria Lopez. But our winners, Sebastian Buemi, Kazuki Nakajima and Brendan Hartley from Toyota Gazoo Racing. Ryan Briscoe, Roman Dumas and Richard Westbrook, fourth in the hypercar class as the Glickenhaus makes its race debut. And we will have the national anthem of the winning team, Toyota Gazoo Racing.
So in third place, Andre Negrau, Nico Lapierre, and Mathieu Vazivier for Alpine. Second place, Mike Conway, Kamui Kobayashi, and Jose Maria Lopez for Toyota Gazoo Racing. And our race winners, Sebastian Buemi, Kazuki Nakajima, and Brendan Hartley. So the first World Endurance Championship race here in Portugal. First time for a lot of these drivers at the circuit do Algarve here in Portimao. And a very good, combative and close hypercar battle. Yes, the safety car brought Alpine right back into it, but racing is racing and these things happen. And for Toyota Gazoo Racing, a 1-2 in their 100th World Championship win. And Graham Goodwin, that's pretty much what they would have hoped to achieve from today. Whichever car was in front, the management probably weren't that worried about. But the number eight team have taken a big step forward on their teammates. Uh, they have indeed. It's a big change around here. This is the points gap now. Brendan Hartley, Kazakajima, Sebuemi, top of the table. 20 points ahead now of the sister car. Yeah, they're very nearly a win in front, but just one point behind is the Alpine. Yep. I think there, though, it's got to come down to Le Mans. That's the only opportunity that that other car has got to get this World Championship. And so I think the World Championship effectively was decided today in the last 15 minutes of the race. Of course, don't forget that when we get to Bahrain, that'll be an eight-hour race, point and a half are there, but double points for Le Mans, so... Yeah, whoever comes out on top in Le Mans suddenly has a bit of a stranglehold on the, the opposition. James, James Collado, I thought that I would, um, I would bring some champagne for your birthday. Oh, brilliant. <laughs> brilliant. No, I haven't been drinking all year, so um, I might make an, ex an exception and uh, have something tonight uh, to celebrate. This has been a long time coming, hasn't it, for Ferrari and for you? Yeah, I mean, it's been tough. Uh, we were, we lacked pace in Spa, but we still finished second. And the Porsche was quicker than us here. We just managed to get the strategy spot on. The team did an amazing job to get uh, both cars at the front, first and second. It's the best possible outcome. So over the moon, still a long way to go in the championship, obviously. But uh, we, yeah, we, scored, we scored good points here. And um, yeah, just uh, already looking forward to the next one. Uh, Alessandro, it has been great for Ferrari here in Portimao. Uh, it's great, it's great, it's really incredible. Honestly, we did an incredible job, Ferrari and I, of course, make an incredible strategy and we won, the key was the strategy. And the uh, victory before the home race is, is very nice. So we look forward to go in Monza and, and repeat uh, the success. On to Italy. <laughs> Thank you, well done. And as we know from European Le Mans series racing, GTE Ferraris have habitually been very strong in Monza, so that Gee. bodes very well for the team indeed. This is the GTE Pro podium. Mm -hmm. Third place for the three Porsche drivers of the 92 car, Kevin Escher, the pole man, Neil Jani, his regular teammate joined by Michael Christensen, Daniel Serra and Miguel Molina in second position. It's the AF Corsa Ferrari, but our race winners after a six-race winless streak, Alessandro Pierguidi and birthday boy James Collado. So Batty Pregliasco, the boss of the uh, AF Corsa Ferrari team, will be a happy bunny today. They looked like they were going to struggle after qualifying but they somehow made their tyres lift just a little bit better than anything Porsche could come up with.
national anthem of motor racing and coincidentally of Italy. And if it ain't, if it ain't ringing out over at least one of the podiums here uh, in uh, Monza, then I will be very surprised indeed. A one-two for the AF Corsa team. Impressive stuff. It's not like their tyres didn't suffer, like they didn't struggle. They somehow managed to mitigate against the real drop-off that Porsche was suffering and just crept enough fuel out as well in that 51 Ferrari to avoid a final stop just to cement their position at the top of the pile and really sort of blunt the challenge of the sister 52 car. There's the points. It's, yeah. Uh, yeah, the 51 crew, 56 points now, six ahead of Kivadestra and Miliani. And again, that's points and a half there. They should be behind Estra and Gianni, but they jump ahead now, so that helps them. Daniel Serra, Miguel Molina in third, and Jimmy Bruni and Richard Leitz in fourth place. Their part-time teammates are also picking up points. Well, let's get to possibly one of the happiest Portuguese in Portugal today and hear from our LMP2 winner. What can I say? Antonio Felix da Costa, I have to start with you. That was incredible. And also, Ant, I saw your reaction. <laughs> Are you not expecting it? You, you surprise me every time, mate. You surprise, <laughs> I, I, should, I should expect it by now, but... Um, amazing. I mean, it's, it's down to team effort, really. Uh, we all did our part. We, we had a lot of setbacks, but so did anyone else. But as a team, we, we kept doing more laps. Uh, we kept going longer than anyone by saving fuel a lot. And in the end, you know, we trusted the process, which oh, it wasn't always clear in the car. Um, and, you know, it, the team made us, made us be up there at the end. And then I, I had a lot of fun fighting with, with Tom. I had contact with Tom there in lap one, which really disappointed me in a way. You know, I felt sorry for it. I, I got boxed in. And, uh, and it was nice to, you know, get a clear, clear, clean fight there at the end to kind of settle things out. And uh, huge respect to him and to the, all, the, all of the 28 crew and these guys and my team. It's been, it's been such a cool weekend to win at home. is amazing. Exactly what I was just about to say. Come on. It's your first time racing here in Portimao and, so and you've taken the no win. I'm just so sad that there's no one here, you know. It's, uh, it's, it's being here or in Fuji at the, uh, right now, it's almost the same thing. But, yeah, it's... Uh, another one I cross off my list and uh, so so happy to share the guy with these guys it's I think we have a lot of fun off the track and that makes us faster in, in on track Roberto how were you feeling when you <laughs> were seeing that last those last few minutes playing out actually it was amazing the last few uh, minutes of the race were incredible uh, at the beginning I was quite uh, a bit of upset because uh, on my first stint I think um, I did a terrible job, to be honest. I got spun out and then I ruined my tires, so I had a terrible time. But uh, congrats to the team that on the run, they changed the strategy and, and we decided to change our strategy. So I was in and out for uh, three stints and uh, we tried to do the best. And then these guys carried on and like always, and they, they did a great job and I'm so happy for this guy winning at home. Well done. Thank you. Uh, he's too humble. He's, he, we live on Roberto's re, uh, results in the car, and uh, he's, he's always too hard on himself. This and guy was so quick he's, the yeah, he's the backbone of our team. <laughs> We've got to go. Thank you. Well Thanks. done. Well done. Well, congratulations to Jota Sport, a 1 2 result. And here is the national anthem of Great Britain. British teams, United Auto Sports based in the UK, but that is United Auto Sports USA. They finished third here with the 22 car. And Antonio Felix da Costa, Graham Goodwin, not only never a winner in Portugal, never on a podium Correct. in his home country before. So a great first for him. Yeah, only four race meetings in cars in Portugal in his career, and his best result fourth twice in single seaters in 2008, and then a fourth place in the GT Open in 2017 
uh, but has never won a race in Portugal before today. And Antonio, my friend, there will be better days, not necessarily in terms of the win, but when your home fans can celebrate with you. Yep. And I'm, I'm sure that's a slight disappointment here, but that was a great race at Peter. Just going to have to come back and do it again. That's all there is to it. Jota 1-2, the 28 car from pole position, coming up just very slightly short. Antonio Felix da Costa with his teammate Roberto Gonzalez and Anthony Davidson on the top step of the podium. Tom Blomqvist started the car that he qualified on pole, the number 28 car, and shared it with Stoffel van Dorn and Sean Galal. Nothing at all wrong with their race, but they were just eased out in the final reckoning by the 38 car that is our championship leader with, in third place, the... Uh, yeah, OK, Sean Galel and Stoffel van Dorn, the new boys, in with Phil Hansen. So Phil Hansen, the only United Auto Sports driver who could win the title, and United in second place now behind the 38 Jota Sport car. As we said, points and a half here, otherwise they would be tied for the drivers and teams' championships. Our GTE Am battle was always in doubt right down to the final 30 minutes but victory went to Chetilar Racing's Ferrari. I imagine there are going to be huge celebrations for you tonight. Yeah, yeah. France uh, is very special this moment because a uh, long time working for a big result. Finally we gained the, this result. We deserve after four years working for a uh, a big, big day. This is uh, our big day. I'm very happy for uh, the drivers, for the team. We have the best uh, combination to reach uh, result. Today is the day. And a great battle with the Porsche as well. Yeah. That was so good. <laughs> I, I think it was really tough race. Uh, we pushed until the end, even with the Porsche. They, they were really close. I think the team they made really uh, perfect strategy with the call. We went out uh, in front. Uh, so I think uh, we need to thank all the team. We need to thank this guy because they, they did a really good job today. So now we, we enjoy the moment and, uh, and we will push for the next one. Well done. Very well deserved. Thank you. Thank you. Definitely three Italians in the very early stages of a major hangover. Well, congratulations <laughs> to all three of them. You can hear the emotion in Roberto Lacorte's voice, couldn't you? He oh, was yes. really already just, yeah, fully choked. And Giorgio Sena Giotto there as well. Absolutely so. And, you know, they've, they've raced hard. They've really plugged on. And motor racing is just a series of disappointments with a very occasional high spot. And make the most of that. And they are our points leaders. Antonio Fuoco, Giorgio Sena, Giotto and Roberto Lacorte ahead of Francesco Castellacci, Giancarlo Fisichella and Thomas Floor in the 54 Ferrari. So the Porsche, Gidio Perfetti, Matteo Carelli, Riccardo Perra second here but closing in in the point standings. There they are. They'll be disappointed uh, and probably the only ones on the podium to be disappointed. Yeah. But, uh, just got away from it at the end there, didn't it? Uh, but you can't be disappointed with a win for no. this trio. You certainly couldn't begrudge it. And oh, the top three in the championship are these three cars on the podium here. Points and a half have had a big effect. They have overhauled the podium finishers from spa franc -Cachon. Well. Pack-up day tomorrow is going to be starting far too early for everyone in Chetelar, I think. of the gentleman driver. Yeah. Uh, uh, th there's few more passionate than this. Well, they're the backbone of sports car racing. Always have been, always will be. And even the FIA president, Jean Tot, when we spoke to him in Spa, recognised exactly that. You know, it's the, it's the passion and enthusiasm 
And, you, and, and it's not just these guys, Roberto LaCourt and his teammates, the men like Jim Glickenhaus bringing a brand new car. He's not a, a major motor manufacturer. He makes some sports cars, sure, but he loves to go racing and loves to create. And now there's somebody who doesn't need, well, he needs one more lesson from Tom Coronel <laughs> on, on uh, how to get the most out of a bottle of champagne. But congratulations to all three teams. Now, no Aston Martin on the podium for four hours of the race, you'd have put good money on there being at least one Aston on the podium. In the end, it wasn't to be. I think they ran out of tyres, perhaps, towards the end. But Ferrari, Porsche, Ferrari, the familiar names back in the frame. Team Project One taking second spot. Chetilar on top of the pile. A 47 car, 53 points for Chetelar Racing in the teams. And they are now 18 points clear of the 54 car. Wow. With Team Project 1 a further seven back. What a good season they're having so far. Can you imagine how they will be if they ended up winning the title on their debut? Of course, the 83 uh, AF Corsa car winning last year, they had a really wretched time of it. And we have one more podium left to go for our Pro-Am drivers. They, of course, are the Pro-Am lineups in the LMP2 category. But well, it was a pretty busy race from start to finish. Kind of calmed down a little, maybe around hour four. Just as I was about to say, you know what, nothing much has happened in LMP2 in a couple of minutes, then suddenly it all got crazy again. And it was the LMP2 Pro-Am battle that dealt up the late race drama as well. With, Some uh, of it, yeah, for Old sure. Brief, yes, with the 29 car and then the 20 car racing Tin Nedland from the lead. Yep. High class from the lead. Yep. That was the poison chalice, wasn't it, in Pro Am being in front. Plenty of action as ever in LMP2, whether it's more Pro lineups or Pro Am lineups. These are very even cars to race. In third place in Pro Am, the very disappointed high-class racing trio. They had a really strong run, though, the Danes. Anders Fjordback and Dennis Anderson have raced together for years, joined this time by Jan Magnussen. And for a while, it looked like he would emulate Kevin and claim a win here. Kevin, his son, taking pole and winning in IMSA in Belle Isle, Michigan. Second, Dragon Speed Racing. Henrik Hedman and Juan Pablo Montoya with Ben Hanley. But our winners in the Pro-Am category for the first time, Real Team Racing. So Real Team, Esteban Garcia, Matias Besch, and Norman Nato on the top step of the podium. They are our LMP2 Pro-Am winners. I rarely heard anthem in motorsport, the Swiss national anthem for the real team racing crew who win our Pro-Am category, newly introduced for this season. Racing Team Netherlands disappointed with that, but their garage mates, real team, both cars run by TDS Racing, claim that Pro-Am victory. Yep, great to see the Pro-Am mp 2 is getting a justified podium after what was a fine battle. Yeah, absolutely right. There was an awful lot going on, and real team, boy, what a race they had. Up, down, back to front, left and right, everything in sight. And those are the Pro-Am points. Esteban Garcia, Norman Nato, ahead of Fritz van Eyde, Gerda van der Gaard, Jop van Eutert, with Ben Hanley, Henry Hedman and Juan Pablo Montoya in third spot. Well, that's it for a month.
We will head to the Autodromo Nazionale di Monza, Italy's Temple of Speed for round three of the FIA World Endurance Championship next time out. Until then, on behalf of Graham Goodwin, Alan McNish, Duncan Vincent and Louise Beckett, I'm Martin Haven saying thank you from the entire WEC TV team. We will be back in Monza in July for round three. Siamo pronti a dare spettacolo nel Tempio della Velocità. Felicissimo di poter correre a Monza. Love endurance? Then what are you waiting for? Download the FIA WC app today.